This is Audible. Lost by the Billionaire. Alpha Billionaire Romance. Written by Cynthia Dane. Narrated by Sierra Klein. Part 1. Ordered by the Billionaire. Chapter 1. Alyssa. Finally. The weekend. No classes. No intern errands that make my calves swell in muscular size, but break my ankles in the heels I force myself to wear every time I enter the offices of Bradley and Marcus. No late dinners of leftover Chinese and cold pizza my roommates left out for two days straight. It might only be Friday evening, but as far as I'm concerned, this is when the weekend truly begins. I may be twenty-one, but the amount of responsibility foisted upon me weighs so heavily on my shoulders, more so than my bra straps when I'm stuck at a desk all day. Not like I have a damn choice, though. Education is too important to slack off on, and job experience is a must, even though what constitutes it is a joke. If it weren't for the loans that will fuck my ass in a few years from now, I wouldn't even be able to go to college. It's the catch-22 from hell. How did my parents pay for their college educations with nothing but part-time jobs back in the 80s? It's so unfair. Calm the fuck down, girl, I say, stepping out of the shower. Gotta relax. The world's problems will have to wait for you to get your shit together this weekend. Maybe lose your virginity, hmm? Ever think about that? The sun is setting, and the view outside my small studio is amazing. A pink and orange-hued sky, something you rarely get to see this time of year in Portland. Usually the skies are a dreary shade of gray that depresses you until you're diving inside for the rest of the season. This past winter has been especially harsh. At first, I loved the snow. Then it refused to go away and a city that couldn't handle it to save everyone's life completely shut down. I was going to miss those measly paychecks from my shitty job. Too much drama hanging above my head. Ex-roommate trying to take me to small claims court over unpaid electric bills at the last place we lived. Mother hounding my ass about networking, because my college classes and my prestigious internship aren't enough. Dad blowing up my phone because he wants me to show his niece around the city. A niece I love as much as a nice corn on my toe. And my bosses. Oh, both halves of Bradley and Marcus are pieces of work. Pieces of sexy, hot work, mind you. But that barely lets them get away with all the demands they put on their lowly interns. I walk into the main room of my studio and gaze longingly at my bed. Maybe I should go to sleep early tonight, pop on some Netflix, and chill with myself. Speaking of which, I got some mail today, something I've been waiting a long time for. The package holds no damning information on the labels, but even so, I have it turned upside down and thrown my scarf on top of it. I don't live with anyone else anymore. Nobody has the key to my place, so what am I trying to hide? My own embarrassment? Should I really be so embarrassed to have purchased a sex toy off the internet earlier this week? As my hair dries on the towel wrapped around my shoulders, I grab a knife from my efficiency kitchen and slice open the packing tape. I already know what is inside, but my heart still quickens when I see the picture on the front of the box. I have to find some humor in this moment. I'll hate myself later if I don't. My first real dildo. I really have grown up. I pop open the top and pull out the plastic packaging. Uh, wow. Maybe I should have bought a smaller one, because I'm not sure my poor body can take this hefty shit dropping into my hand. Apparently... My eyes had been bigger than my pussy when I went shopping the other night. What can I say? 
I spent an hour in the bath thinking about one of my hot bosses. Wouldn't it be nice if a guy like that asked me out, whined and dined me, and then made sweet, thrilling love to me? I've never had something like that before. I've barely been on real dates before. Never done intercourse, although I've been eager to try it. Except, do you know what dating is like in this city? A girl can only take so many hipster beards and man buns before she runs away screaming. Or, in my case, runs to the internet to buy a sizable dildo to make up for the lack of a love life. Imagine me, curled up in bed with popcorn, a homemade gin and tonic, and a webpage open to some of the raunchiest sex toys you've ever seen. Until now... My masturbatory expeditions have only included my hand or the occasional makeshift cock. Like a nice hairbrush handle I bought solely to use as a fake cock because yours truly was so embarrassed to buy a real dildo. Until now. That hairbrush is about to be retired into the trash. Apparently, however, my imagination had been too kinky to be realistic. Guess I thought that if I was buying a new dildo, then I should make it worth it. This will be the closest I get to losing my virginity in a while, probably. You know, if I don't count that lackluster fiddling and oral with my ex-boyfriends, which I guess technically counts, but I'd rather forget. No, what I want is the feeling of being filled up, overpowered, taken. Too bad this dildo can't do other things. Only a real man can touch me, spank me, nibble on my ear, and come so hard that I'm shuddering for a week. Look at me, giggling like I'm twelve and discovering an old harlequin for the first time. Too bad I'm only twenty-one. A real man wouldn't date someone my age, not unless he's a total creep looking for his next mark to manipulate. I'm conventionally attractive enough that I've had gross old guys hitting on me since before puberty. I've seen my young friends get mixed up with men who made them feel so mature, only to be the least mature guys on the planet. Guess what? There's a reason no women their age date them. None of that matters right now, anyway. I've got a huge cock to play with, and it won't treat me like a kid or a quick lay meant to be forgotten by lunch the next day. Complimentary lube is in the box, thank goodness. I had forgotten to get some when I was in my lust-induced haze the other night after work. What had me so worked up? Well, I work in an office full of hot guys in suits. The temperature is good for me to think about those gorgeous guys. The bed is so comfortable beneath the weight of my body. All I have to do now is breathe, embrace myself, and think of really, really hot moments I am probably never going to have in real life. That's why they're called fantasies, right? My pajama shorts are on the floor. My legs are spread. Images of my bosses are in my head, but I'm not scandalous enough to fantasize about them both. I need to pick one. That way there's at least one guy who doesn't make me want to die of embarrassment when I see him. Preston Bradley? Or Julian Marcus? Oh, like there's a choice. They're different kinds of hot, and one definitely does it for me more than the other. Julian, Mr. Marcus, the more standoffish, colder of the two, is more likely to bite my head off than slather on the positive reinforcements. He's in charge of the numbers at work, and me? I work on the numbers that eventually pass his huge desk in his corner office. More than once, he's held my work up in front of the class, excuse me, staff meeting, and talked about how we need to follow better protocols, because the work is shit. The man needs a Xanax, but 
Damn, is he fine in his bespoke suits and dangerously silky ties. Do you know how many times I've thought about straightening his tie for him? Walk up and play with it while talking to him? He'd probably put me in a headlock, but it would be good while it lasted. In my fantasies, Julian Marcus channels that attitude into the bedroom, where he fucks me raw and makes me feel like the dirtiest girl in a city full of dirty girls. The head of the dildo teases my slit. I'm already wet from thoughts of Mr. Marcus. Doesn't take much for the crown to press into me. Bit by bit. Oh, shit. This is good. No, I did not tell my phone to ring. With a ringtone that tells me it's work-related. Who the hell is calling me on a Friday night? Damn it. With the dildo still halfway inside me, I reach over and grab my phone. I answer it without looking at the caller ID. Hello? Who is this? Can this person feel my ire on the other side of the line? Because they interrupted something pretty important and can put up with my sass. A pause. I swear to God, if this is a wrong number, or someone using a work number to mask a sales pitch... This is Julian Marcus. Oh, shit. Are you fucking kidding me right now? Damn me and my short temper. This is the kind of shit that gets a girl fired right when the weekend is starting. Sir? I jerk up, forgetting my pussy is stuffed with half a dildo. I clasp a moan of pleasure in my mouth. Am I... wetter? No way. Like Mr. Marcus's voice can do this to me. It was a fantasy. Just a fantasy. Apparently, my fantasy has summoned this guy from the depths of his office to call me on a Friday night. What is it? I need a folder, he says with his usual curt attitude. Authority oozes from the audible presence of Julian Marcus, a man worth millions upon millions and used to getting his way. He wasn't one half of one of Portland's biggest corporations for no reason. I wait for him to explain, but the irritation accompanying his tone is only making things worse. Which folder? I bring five of them home any given night. Sometimes I'm convinced I'm going to get ahead on my facts and figures, but I'm always fooling myself. Yeah, right. Not when I can watch my favorite TV shows, take baths, and fuck myself silly for hours on end. My voice shakes more than I anticipate. You see, I rarely talk directly to Mr. Marcus. He's more likely to send out a memo or use one of his direct underlings to approach me about one of my screw-ups. As for seeing him... Also, more likely to see him in magazines or on billboards around town. We work only one floor apart. But the only time I go up to his floor or he comes down to mine is when he needs to get a correction. Nobody likes the corrections. Because then someone's job is on the line and it's not his. Bring whatever ones you have. I'm told you're the most likely candidate to have what I fucking need right now. Shit, son. Do I wish he was talking about something else? Get here. Now. He hangs up before I can confirm I'll do as he orders. I stare at my phone in utter disbelief. Doesn't help I'm still half-stuffed with a dildo. Fuck it. I pull it out and set it aside. Why is my body shuddering? Is it from the sensations of the dildo? Or from Mr. Marcus's voice? Anyway, there are folders I'm supposed to be looking for. Most of them are in my work bag, but I think I left one under a stack on my coffee table. Where the hell is it? I'm stumbling around my apartment in a total daze. 
This shit must be important if Mr. Marcus is directly calling an intern like me. I scramble for everything I can find, praying it's what he's looking for. After throwing my work clothes back on and fixing my makeup, oh, fuck it, I can fix it on the max. Also, my luck that I don't have a car. If I did, I could be there fifteen minutes faster. I really, really hope that my boss knows that I don't have a car. Talk about my world exploding. This is what it feels like, too. Ever since Julian's called me. A billionaire tycoon calling my cell phone. What the hell can go wrong? Chapter 2 Julian You can't do it. I don't care how good you think you are, man. I don't care if your dick is big enough to make her use a wheelchair for the rest of the year. Don't care if your bank account makes half the block fall in love with you. There's no way you can order up one of your interns and fuck her within two hours. Our interns. How many times do I have to remind Preston that we share equal responsibility for the people under our employ? I'm sure I could make it happen either way. Preston Bradley, no, not the other way around, advances on my desk, both hands splaying across the oak. His cologne is a spicy concoction compared to my more subdued but powerful musk. His hair is a mess, because he's never bothered to comb it after walking in out of the wind. Whereas, I'm not above spending five minutes in my private bathroom making sure I'm perfectly presentable. His cufflinks don't match his tie clip, and it pisses me off. Could he at least pretend to try? Excuse me. I'm a perfectionist. One of us has to be. Where were we? You are not God's gift to women. Sorry. Hate to break it to you. I push aside his tie as it attempts to smudge the forms I'm signing at eight on a Friday night. Neither are you. Yet it doesn't stop you from bringing such stupid topics up to begin with. Hmm. He stands up, grin, taking five years off his age. Wanna bet on it? A bet? How old are we again? I'm not betting anything, I say can't even look at him right now. I'm serious. Call up any female intern you want. See? I'll let you have the advantage of choosing which one. Preferably one of the ones leaving at the end of the quarter, though. I know your dick loves to cause drama from here to Miami. I sigh. I don't understand why we're discussing this. Preston invites himself into my office, both during and after work, all the damn time. Yet this is probably one of his most annoying impromptu visits in a while. He walked in, talking about going to a club later to pick up chicks and, oh, that I want to tag along. Because, as he was keen on reminding me, I haven't gotten mad pussy in a couple of weeks. For shame. Been cooping myself up in my offices trying to get caught up on the quarterly reports. I do this every three months. You'd think Preston would be used to it by now. Because we need to spice some things up around this office. Remember college? <laughs> we got into so much trouble. Yes. And it's years later and we're not acting like that any longer. Preston needs to grow up. He's a brilliant businessman, but his personal life is a mess. Usually, it's not my problem as long as he keeps it clean for our corporation. Shit like this, though? Frustrating. I do not want to pick one of our female interns to fuck. Yes, many of them are beautiful young women, and yes, I do love to sleep with beautiful women. Young or not so young but I also like to keep work and pleasure separate. I've learned my lessons about that. Come on, just this once. Humor me. You know you want to. My eyes glance up at him. A snort shoots through my nostrils. What, I pick a random woman and fuck her right here? Sure, two-hour time limit. 
If you can call her here under the pretenses and get in her cunt, all dick, no fingers, bro. By the time I get back at 10.30, you win the bet. What the hell do I win? Besides sex with a hot young thing? Whatever you want me to do. Because I'm trying to prove a point here. I say the first terms that come to my mind. You're heading all the staff meetings for the next month. The next month? Deal. Maybe that's not a big deal for him, but it is for me. I hate every social aspect of this job, particularly those that demand me to talk to people who are way below my level. I have to explain everything. Be patient with them, talk to them like they're five. And that's only their jobs. God help me if we're at a social function and they make an ass out of themselves. I had to take etiquette classes growing up. Why didn't the fools we employ? I know Oregon has some of the worst public education in the country, but really? They can't swing a diplomacy lesson here or there? Besides, so many of our ignorant interns come from out of state. I really expect more of the New York and Boston ones, but here we are. I sigh again. I'm sure you have something up your sleeve if I lose the bet. Well, if I win? Oh, hmm, let me see. Preston taps his chin in faux thought. If I win, you have to come down to Rio with me so we can actually get you laid. I'm not going to Rio. Preston's been planning an excursion to Brazil for the past month. He gets around the PNW, but our jobs are demanding enough that we rarely get real vacations. And this trip to Brazil is supposed to be a giant bachelor come that he keeps inviting me to. Please, like, both of us can go on vacation for a week. We don't have time for that. I'm working double to cover his ass during that week. Besides, if I'm going on vacation... I'd rather go to Europe and appreciate some fine art and cuisine. The party scene is not me. Give me a few good friends, a private room with a poker table, and let the cigar smoke kill us all. You'll come with me to Rio if you lose the bet. We're shaking on it. He holds his hand across my desk. Reluctantly, I shake it. This is the last stupid bet we're making for a while. Preston pulls a stack of personnel files from one of the corner cabinets. Some things are still analog around here. Admit it. You like the challenge. I thought my argument was that getting women to sleep with me wasn't a challenge. It's not, either. I've never had a problem getting laid when I feel like it. The only women who turn me down are either that committed or gay. Even the sick ones try to get some of this. That's what I'm saying. It's gonna be a fun challenge. Preston hands me the stack of files of our female interns. Go on. Have your pick. Call her up here for some stupid reason, like you need a file. Then seduce her. I'll be back at 10.30. I want to see her panties as proof. Preston Bradley would want to see a pair of panties, whether a woman had worn them while I fucked her or not. He is perpetually fifteen like that. Fine. Whatever. I wave away the files. Pick for me. I need to finish this column. I go back to my spreadsheet as if I don't care about the woman I'm doomed to seduce. Preston takes his time going through the files, occasionally whistling, chuckling, or bemoaning that he wants to try with a certain young co-ed. We employ five female interns and five male interns. They come from all over the country, most of them graduated or attending the local business schools. The one he shoves in my direction is the youngest, and still an undergrad. Alyssa, huh? I barely make note of her last name. Her headshot is enough to make me snort. Wavy chestnut brown hair frames her round face. Beautiful, bold, daring me to ask her up to my corner CEO's office so I can fuck her. It's an HR nightmare. But our HR department is a joke. 
Good enough to keep the employees in line, but there are ways around legalities. Preston was right. This would be a fun challenge. All right. The one who fucks up her figures more than any of the other interns. That's the only reason I recognize her at all. She's one of the few people I've personally sought out so I could fuck her a new asshole. I hate cleaning up sloppy intern work. I wouldn't even allow interns if they weren't such cheap labor salivating for experience. As the man who works with numbers around here, I love cutting costs and still maintaining efficiency and productivity. Two good things interns are good for. If they're actually good at what they do. Makes my plan easier. Now, now, be nice to her. Don't have to be nice to her pussy, but be nice to her. Preston puts the files away. With a smirk, he shows himself to my door. I'll be back in two hours. Get her here and fucked by the time I get back, and I'll take care of those pesky meetings for the next two months. Not being the ante, hmm? When we go down to Rio, we're getting you a woman for every night of the week. You wish. I wait for Preston to vacate the office before picking up my phone. This bet is a joke. But he's right. I do love a challenge. Now where the hell is Alyssa's number? Did that bastard put her file away, knowing I'd have to waste time looking for her number? Of course he did. Because Preston will do any annoying thing to win a bet. Chapter 3 Alyssa the bus comes to a halt. I bolt out as if bullets pepper my steps, and no young mom with a stroller or little old ladies are going to get in my way. One of Portland's tallest high-rises lurks before me. On a good day, I enjoy taking in the pristine architecture, the marble flooring, the silver-lined mirrors, the state-of-the-art security systems, and the executive elevators gilded in gold. This is not a good day. I was here a few hours ago. When I left, embracing a Friday evening, I barely took the decor in. I was in such a hurry to get out of here. Two security guards are on duty in the lobby. I flash them my ID badge and show them the stack of folders in my hands. One nods and motions for me to take an elevator up. Just my luck. It won't budge. Stuck again, Elevator 2? Wouldn't be so bad if Elevator 1 went to the top floors and Elevator 3 hadn't been down all day. I glance at my watch as Elevator 2 finally gets its ass moving. 9.30. My boss hadn't given me an ultimatum, but I knew that tone in his dark and dangerous voice. He wanted these files yesterday. What if I'm preventing him from making a big business deal? What if I'm costing him thousands... No, millions of dollars. He's going to blame me. Then what? I lose my job in the aftermath because he has to punish somebody? Fuck, fuck, fuck. I'm not going to have a job by midnight, am I? The lights are off in the executive suite, all but the low-energy ones illuminating the way to Julian Marcus's corner office. The one belonging to his partner, Preston Bradley, is completely dark. Pretty soon, cleaning crews will move through here. Will they work around my boss, or are they dismissed until later? Why the hell do I care about that when I should be worrying about my own job? The fact that the double doors leading into the suite aren't opening? I wrestle with the glass door as if my life is about to be snatched from my body. I can't afford hang-ups like this. The door clicks, and I practically fall into the central office. If the secretary had been here, he would have laughed at my dumb, clumsy ass. If he wasn't trying to glimpse at my panties, anyway. The guy has a terrible reputation around here. Although, he usually leaves me alone. I'm not as pretty as the other female interns. Positively average compared to them. Even so, the secretary would have totally laughed and stared at me. I'm glad Mr. Marcus and I are apparently the only ones here tonight. 
Someone pushes aside the blinds shielding the window to his corner office. That someone is named Julian Marcus. I stop halfway there. One critical look sideswipes me, startling me, scaring me, arousing me. So sue me. I'm human. I'm a heterosexual female looking into the dark eyes of Julian Marcus, one of the most prime specimens of young bachelorhood around. Even at this late hour, he's wearing his dark navy blue power suit with the gray and white striped tie, perfectly cut and tailored. Dare I say, bespoke. He's got the money for it. L.A., New York, London, Paris. I hear from his personal assistant he gets the measurements done right here in his office, and the tailor sent him fabric samples. Lucky bastard. What's it like to live that kind of luxury? Based on the stern face waiting for me on the other side of that glass, it's terrible. Awful. I should never fantasize about it. The door opens. Good. Now I don't have to knock or buzz because I sure as hell don't know the key code to his office. It changes every week, anyway. Melissa. Holy shit. That's my name. And it's not happy to greet me. Come in. I had started walking again, but now I come to another standstill. His hand continues to motion to me. Why am I sweating? Am I short of breath? You'd think I ran up the stairs to get here instead of taking the elevator. The man is so much bigger in person. His presence alone is enough to fill the entirety of the executive office. If he did things to me over the phone, getting a whiff of his cologne as I approach him has my legs trembling and my heart racing so quickly that I'm afraid I'll pass out. Would Julian Marcus give me CPR until the ambulance arrives? Oh, my God. Is my insurance good enough to afford an ambulance? I have the folders. My eyes never break from his as I shove the humble stack of folders forward. I'll look inside my office. He turns, further motioning for me to follow him. Really? Into his office? I've never been in here before. The few times he's personally addressed me... It was downstairs at my meager desk, or in the center of the greater executive office. The only people who get to come into Julian's private office are his business associates, assistants, sometimes the secretary, and the barrage of girlfriends he dates. Julian Marcus has been through as many girlfriends as I have fingers, and that's since I started working here a few months ago. I swear, every week, a new woman in her twenty-somethings, the occasional thirty-something, parades through this office wearing something Mr. Marcus has recently purchased for her. The hair colors change. Sometimes their physiques change. Some of them are educated, and some of them are so stupid, you wonder how they put their bras on in the morning. Then you realize they're not even wearing one. Yet aside from any women he does business with, those are the only ones I see coming in here. Now me? Mr. Marcus's large personal office is spartan at best, drab and impersonal at worst. The furniture is your usual assortment of black wood and black leather. A few tastefully abstract paintings hang on the wall. Lots of potted plants, but none of them real only deceptively fake because who knows what business associate might be allergic. The only visible sign of tech is his huge computer monitor and the ergonomic accessories. A dark finished bookcase lines the wall behind his chair, full of law books, business books, economic books, and a few spare copies of Victorian literature. Later, I'll find out that he keeps first edition copies in his waterfront penthouse. He sits on the front edge of his desk. It takes a few inches off his imposing height, but he's still the powerful, dominant figure of the room. The building. I am nothing compared to him. 
his station, his status, the snap of his fingers that could have men killed halfway around the world. I'm Alyssa, a nobody, a lowly intern who comes from a decent background, but that's the story of a billion people. There's a reason nothing remarkable has ever happened to me. Until now. Julian peeks at one of the folders. Alyssa. Uh-oh. Did I forget something? Yes, sir. The stack of folders ends up on his desk. He's not going to look at them? After I busted ass to get here? You've been interesting to watch around here. He's going to fire me, isn't he? Because there's no way that voracious look in his eye is about anything other than firing me. He looks me up and down like a piece of scrap about to be thrown into the trash. I've screwed up too many times. They're cutting me loose. I can say goodbye to this nice opportunity to seriously pad out my resume and get a decent job with my degree I'm still attempting to get. I'm sorry if I've done something to upset you, sir. I step back. Might as well make it easier to get the hell out of here when he fires me. That way he won't be able to see my tears. Gotta save some sort of face around here. Upset me? His voice takes a slight upturn. It surprises me, but isn't enough to make me feel any better. I'm not upset, Alyssa. I'm far from upset. Honestly, though, if you think I called you here for some folders, you're not as quick as I thought you were. Quick, sir? Quick-witted, of course. He pushes off the desk and comes closer to me. His cologne magnifies. His presence is overwhelming. I am a meager person compared to his cool confidence. This is the kind of man who gets whatever he wants. Whatever he wants. Why the hell does that turn me on so much? I'm a mess. I'm embarrassing. I haven't been in this man's office for two seconds, and I'm already fantasizing about things I have no business fantasizing about. Namely, I'm fantasizing about him kissing me hard against his desk. He'd be a hell of a man to have a first time with. Not a first time kissing, since I've obviously done that before, but a first time, you know, fucking. Don't want to think about anything. Don't want to have to do anything. Just want to lie back and let a man who knows what he's doing have me and take me. I want my first time to be special, you know? It's got to feel good. It's got to be with someone I see myself spending the rest of my life with. Or someone so out of this world, I have to jump on the chance to jump his bones. Julian Marcus definitely fills one of those descriptions. I've been keeping my eyes on you since you started working here, Alyssa. The man is a master. He rounds on me, sending me back against his desk. My fingers grip the edge of the mahogany, oak, cherry, whatever the fuck it's made out of. Because I can't be asked to get details about wood correct right now when my otherworldly boss is looming over me. Is it? Possible for men to have a come-hither look in their seductive arsenal? Because I swear he's doing it right now. Something about you caught my attention. I think it's your different personality. You're a breath of fresh air in this office. I'm blushing so hard, I'm about to combust. I honestly didn't think you knew me that well, sir. Or if you did, you were only annoyed with me. Annoyed? How can I be annoyed when you're the hardest worker around here? You work harder than my useless partner. The only one who works harder than you is me. I can't breathe. He's coming closer. 
His body encloses around me. His lips lower toward mine. I can't fucking breathe. You captivate me, Alyssa. That's not something I say easily. Because I am not an easy man to captivate. My sweaty fingers slip off the desk. Julian catches me as I fall off balance. The moment I'm in his arms, I know I'm a goner. If I had a clear mind, I'd tell my boss to fuck off, because this is so not legal, or ethical, or realistic. I'm not in a clear mind, though. I must not be, because I think kissing my boss is the best idea ever. Chapter 4 Julian When I see something I want, I began, backing Alyssa up against my desk. I get them. No other alternatives. Period. She's young. Slightly younger than I like most of my women, since I've always preferred someone either right at my level or a little above it. Aspirations and all that. Even so, a bet is a bet. And for a one-night stand, I could do way worse than Alyssa. She's beautiful, anyway. I've never noticed it before. All right, maybe I have. I've seen her come and go around the office with her perfectly rounded derriere and the breasts that threaten to spill out of her blouses every day. Her round face framed by locks of chestnut brown hair, perfect for styling and pulling, a throat that begs to be sucked posture that entices a grown man like me whenever he walks into the room and sees her, legs crossed at her desk, updating spreadsheets and flipping through reports. If I were a baser version of myself, I'd slam her against the back of her cheap swivel chair and fuck her until she stopped begging for it, which would only happen when I've completely worn her cunt out. Then I'd either fuck her ass or ever blow me, depending on my mood. Thinking about that with her already whimpering beneath my body, gets me harder than I expected. In the small amount of time I had between calling her up and Alyssa's arrival, I contacted the investigative head of my security team and had him run a quick background check on her. I'm not only talking her legal history. We're talking social media, high school newspaper articles, inter-office comments from her professors, whatever the man has on hand at the last minute. He got back to me saying that... Melissa is fairly boring in terms of her social life. No boyfriend. A short string of guy friends who may have been boyfriends but are now out of the picture. Good. A bet may be a bet, but this will be so much cleaner if she's unattached. She comes from a middle-class family. Strong name. Nothing insidious there. Her record is clean, of course. Otherwise, she wouldn't have a job here. She's not like anyone I've dated recently. Hell... Since I was in middle school. Not seriously dated anyway. I don't count the random hookups I have when I imbibe a lot and take the first pretty woman I see back to my hotel room. Alyssa is safe. Somewhat boring. Maybe there's more beneath her surface, but, well, I'll have to look, won't I? I kiss her again. The first kiss had been perfunctory, to gauge her reaction. She hadn't resisted me. She has that glazed-over look now. When I kiss her this second time, it's with the determination to seduce her panties off so I can win my bet. Instead, the first thing I think as my lips sink against hers is... mine. I cut the kiss short. Her breasts heave up and down beneath me and I'm too distracted to admire her cleavage. Mine. It's been a long time since I felt that way after a first kiss with a girl. Way, way too long. So I kiss her a third time to make sure. She's not a shy kisser, which is good because it means she can sense, for now. She might be making one of the most foolish mistakes of her life, but she also knows it's a mistake worth making. Because it's me. 
I wouldn't be surprised to find she's already in love with me. Half the women in this damn building fantasize about me betting them. Mine. She's mine. You're right, brain. She's ours. Our perfect little submissive darling. For tonight, anyway. I do love it when women instantly melt in my arms. That look burning in her heavy-lidded eyes. Ah. She's responding to my drive to dominate. Her legs ease open without a single thought on her part. I almost wish she had her hair up simply so I could rip it down for her. Not only is this going to be one of the easiest bets I've ever won, but I'm going to enjoy every moment of it, too. What to do? What to make her do? I can't wait. Alyssa is going to submit to me. In her own way, but she will submit. Tonight. Julian, sir. I correct her. The urge to dominate her in this tryst runs deep in my veins. It surges through my body like sexual adrenaline. I won't let her ruin the moment. From the moment she walked through those office doors and into my professional abode, she became mine. Mine to tease, mine to play with, and mine to dominate. Sir, that's more like it. The way that word blows off her breath reminds my cock how hard it can get. I glance at the clock. Forty-five minutes to close this deal. More than enough time. Although I'd love to take Alyssa home and toy with her some more after this. I don't think this is a good idea. I'm your employee. My hand tickles her thigh. She quivers. Eyes slowly closing as she relaxes against my desk again. Yes, part your thighs, my sweet. All the easier for me to inch my fingers towards your sex. Uh -huh. She shudders so hard I almost worry she's going to lose her balance again. Damn, you think no one has ever touched her panties before. Those panties I'm going to rip off her and present to Preston later because I'm a grown, mature adult. Sir. Her heat pulls my finger beneath her cotton underwear. My fingertip patiently dips into her slit, my eyes absorbing every one of her subtle reactions. She continues to relax. Her nether lips open and draw my finger in. She's wet. Damn wet. I'd almost think she was wet before she got here. What was she doing when I called her? I want to believe she was touching herself, fingering this cunt like I'm about to do. I press my finger into the first knuckle. Her whimpers now echo in my office. Cheeks flushed, Alyssa's tongue ekes out of her mouth and flicks against her lips. I wonder what they feel like around my cock. Only one knuckle, yet she tightens around it. She's hooked. I knew it. Few women can say no to me. Even fewer can come to their senses once a part of me is inside of them. Mr. Marcus, she moans, leaning so far back against my desk that I could lay on top of her. I think I will later. Sarah. Keep saying that, Alyssa. Yes. Yes, suck more of my finger into your cunt. Grip me. Take me deep inside. Preview what is to come for my cock. Let your legs give out so I am forced to pull out my finger and rip off my tie. Go ahead and slip toward the floor. The closer your face gets to my cock, the happier I am. Mr. Marcus, I'm your employee and barely twenty-one years old. Do you really want to do this? I take her by the wrist and help her back up. Right into my arms, of course. What does your age have to do with anything? As if I don't know how old or young she is. You have to be twenty to work here as an intern, outside of exceptional cases. I don't think you're too immature for me, if that's the problem. Please, you should have seen me when I was in college. Embarrassing. I'm a virgin. Our widened eyes meet. This is the most alert I think either of us have been in the past ten minutes. 
A virgin. Preston Bradley would pick me a damned virgin to bone on a whim. Well, she'll be damned once my cock is done with her unmarried cunt. Honestly, aside from any women who may have never divulged the information before, I don't think I've ever fucked a virgin. Still, a bet's a bet. I want her. Now. That doesn't concern me any, I mutter. I'll get you a drink first. I leave her against my desk and go to my stocked bar in the back corner of my office. The scent of whiskey hits me before I open the bottle and pour two shots. One for me, one for her. She probably needs it more. Me? I simply want a drink before I fuck her. Cheers. We clink our glasses together. I down mine in one shot. She makes the mistake of sipping hers. Still, I watch her take every drop between pursed lips. Someone doesn't like whiskey, but she'll drink it anyway. Both shot glasses end up on my desk. Alyssa attempts to get her expression under control. She really is beautiful. Her hair accentuates both her changing expressions and her voluptuous body so well. Thin red lips drive me up the fucking wall. My cock yearns to teach her the ways of dominance and submission. One look from her demands to know the touch of a dominant man. Close your eyes. I grab my rejected tie off my desk and walk behind her. The tie wraps around her eyes my gentle fingers tugging against the edges to make sure she's completely blindfolded. It may be dark in my office, but I don't want to risk anything. Perhaps it's best if she can't see what's going on. Too much stimulation. She should focus on physical pleasure, first and foremost. The taste of sex. The smell of sex. Beholding it with her eyes can come next time. Deary me... Already thinking of next time. I pull her ass up onto my desk and part her legs. She snaps them shut again. Don't be shy, Alyssa. Her nipples poke through her bra and blouse, enticing me. I don't bother unbuttoning this useless blouse. I rip it open and gaze upon what's beneath. What's she going to do about it? I'll buy her another one before she leaves. I pinch her nipple through her lily-white bra. It hardens twice as much as the other one. Has a woman ever wanted me so much before? My cock throbs to be inside her, to show her how wonderful sex is, let alone sex with me. Then, I'll teach her the joys of submission. Let's see how she responds to this first. I lean in and whisper in her ear, You belong to me, Alyssa. Every part of you. But I'll start with your cunt. Chapter 5 Alyssa Julian has already torn open my blouse. Hard nipples, blindfolded, and finger-fucked until I'm wet enough to take every inch he offers me. It's quite the combo. I sit on his desk. Must be worth thousands of dollars. Yet here I am, legs spread open, waiting for his next touch. Either he'll touch me and make me come all over his expensive desk, or I'll sit here and do it myself. Sir? Quiet. He hushes me with another light kiss. That same finger from before teases my slit again. I fall back on his desk, wanting to writhe if it gets me more pleasure. I am certainly hungry for it now. I'm not even embarrassed or ashamed. Go on, Mr. Marcus. Give it to me. I've already been a bad girl and gone way past our professional boundaries. Might as well close the deal. Sir, go ahead, take my virginity, but it turns you on. He does one better in this moment. 
his clothes slip against my skin, his breath hitting my thighs. Before I can beg for it, his tongue snakes against my wet slit. I gasp back, arching. I almost lose my fucking mind as I hear his belt buckle snapping and his zipper coming undone. He's going to do it. He's going to go down on me to get me wet and then fuck me. This is it. This is how I lose my virginity. Not in the back of some high schooler's car, not in some guy's dorm room, but in the billion-dollar office of a catch like Julian Marcus. Clearly, I knew what I was doing when I accidentally saved myself for this moment. Only one other guy has gone down on me before. An ex-boyfriend from my underclassman years. He was... acceptable. I was the first woman he ever did that with, and even though it was my first time receiving, I could tell he was nervous. You'd think my clit hides behind five walls of folds because my ex couldn't find it. Ever. He also pulled away every ten seconds to pull hair off his lips and tongue. Nothing sexier than that, ladies. I also rarely came. Julian is... talented. Experienced is the word. With one flick of his expert tongue, I'm sucking in my breath and wiggling on his desk like I've never had my clit stimulated before. I seriously can't believe it. Me, Alyssa Pendleton, completely average girl compared to all the others who work here, getting her thighs bathed by Mr. Marcus's tongue. How many pussies has this man pleasured? Uh, no, no, don't tell me that. Let me feel special for now. Special enough to have this billionaire's mouth all over my pussy. He's not shy around it, that's for sure. His tongue sinks between both folds, swirling around my clit, sometimes flicking directly against it. That same tongue dips inside me more than once. Wet, soft, curious. A triad of new experiences for a young person like me. It's not enough to be blindfolded, blouse torn open, and legs spread wide, is it? I have to take whatever pleasures he gives me. And he's giving it. As his hands rub my thighs and wrap around my gently thrusting hips, I sigh from the peace it gives me, my whole body trembling for more. Anything... As long as it's more. Fuck me, I whimper. Please, sir. I wish I could see him right now. The man blindfolded me, saying it would be too much to handle if I witnessed my deflowering with my two eyes. Julian was right, though. This is certainly more intimate. His tongue caressing me, his breath heavy upon me, Thumbs, fingers pressing into my wiggling hips to keep me in place, marking me in the process. I can't see his face, but I can feel his intent. He was right. I belong to him. Maybe only for tonight, but at least for tonight. I'm his. He can do whatever he wants to me. God, this is so stupid. I'll probably regret this Monday morning when I'm fired for fucking the boss. But I'd probably regret not doing it now. Losing my virginity to a man as amazing as this. I'd be crazy to turn it down. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that other girls would kill for. The experience is mine. For free. I can get another job or internship. I can't get another hot, talented billionaire to eat me out, and then... Mind yourself, he growls against my thigh. I'm the only one talking right now, understand? I nod, barely comprehending what the hell he said. Yes, sir. Good. Julian stands, his legs keeping mine spread open. I know how wet I am. Even if I didn't, 
the hum of approval on his lips as he kisses me, my scent crashing against my face, tells me all I need to know. I'm going to fuck you. Now. I tense up at his words. He must sense my apprehension, for he kisses me gently as his hand parts me open and guides the firm head of his cock against my wet skin. I'll ease you into it. So kind to hear. My body instantly relaxes. Although he doesn't say it, I hear the implied, if it hurts too much, if you want to stop, say so. Julian controls every second, but I have the power to stop it. Great heavens, I really am a lucky woman. I try to tell myself this isn't a big deal. So what if I've never been penetrated by a man's cock before? So what if I don't know the difference between a real cock and a dildo? So what if he's going in without protection? I'm not worried. I'm not ovulating. I think. I could tell him to put a condom on. I think I keep one in my bag. But... But I can't do that. I can't tell Julian Marcus to put on a condom if he wants me bare. I mean... Yes. I could physically tell him to stop and put on a condom, and he probably would. But do I want him to? Really? Do I want to ruin every fantasy playing through this moment right now? The hottest man I know. The most powerful man I know. Come on. He's so powerful, both in and out of the office, that he'll probably tear through a condom anyway. He'd probably decimate any birth control I'm on. I want him to fuck me. I want the whole experience. I want to be able to say that I fucked a man like this when he was in his sexual prime. That my first time was so hedonistic that we both succumbed to our base instincts that told us to fuck, 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 consequences be damned. I like that. Consequences be damned. Fuck me, Julian. Fuck me with your warm, hard cock. Now. Oh, I'm still not prepared for the invasive sensation pushing into me. It's so slow, so deliberate, that I can't help but believe this would be a different experience if I never told him this is my first time. He'd probably slide it in as quickly as possible and thrust as if I knew what to expect. Maybe next time, if there is a next time... Relax, he says again. So I relax. How can I tense up with that soothing voice bidding me to lie back and take his body into mine? I was right. This isn't a big deal. It's just sex. People do this every fucking day like it's no big deal. I'll treat it the same way. Nope. Not a big deal. Not big Oh my god, it's... it's big. That's it. I can hear his smug attitude in his purring voice. Take it all. I thought that dildo I bought was big. I don't care if you tell me Julian Marcus has an average-sized dick. I am not prepared for how much it splits me open in this position, or how deep, deep it slowly slides bringing him closer to me until I cry out from the overwhelming sensations. Yet at the same time, I don't think I've ever experienced something so damn satisfying. Nothing. Nobody has ever filled me up like this before. One moment, I'm hyper-focused on my body doing something it was born to do, and the next, all I can think about is grabbing his collar and begging him to fuck me. To show me what a man can do with his body. Show me what I've been missing out on until now. Tell me you like that, Alyssa. He's not out of breath. He's high. On me. On my body squeezing his because I'm so fucking tight. 
I should know because every slight movement of his cock stretches me wide open. Even though I know my body's meant to do that, it still freaks me out a little. Holy shit, right? This is how hungry I am for him. This is how much I need him. My body will do anything, anything to take him and make him fuck me. Yes, I whisper. I want to be louder, but my voice won't work with me. It, like the rest of me, is overwhelmed. Tell me you want it. I want it. My breasts are so tender and heavy on my chest that I swear I've never been so aware of them before. That is, until Julian slowly pulls his cock out of me again. Shit. It's strange. He hasn't been in me for twenty seconds, and I'm already feeling like a part of me is missing. We had it. We had some primal connection that I may never get to experience again. Please, give it to me again. My beseeching pleases him. In ways I cannot anticipate. Julian pushes me down on his desk, my back hitting the wood with such force that a resounding thump blasts through the room. My heels are on the edge of the desk, knees pointed in the air as toes curl, and my inner walls contract with more arousal. Fuck me, I'm so wet. I think my body might want him more than my mind does. He clasps my wrist together above my head. My fingers can grab the other side of his desk, but they're too busy fidgeting together in excitement. His breath caresses my mouth. I've already been inside you. You're no virgin anymore, Alyssa, but I can make sure the job is done, if you'd like. I whimper in relentless need for him. Yes, sir. A million jokes enter my mind. Cool and collected Alyssa wants to joke that she knows he's a Capricorn and Capricorns always finish the job. That same Alyssa wants to quip that his hefty cock has already opened me up, so what the hell is going to go in there if not him? Yet I'm not that Alyssa at the moment. I'm inexperienced Alyssa, and she needs to be guided to be shown the ins and outs of sexual intercourse. Finish it, sir. That word slips off my tongue so easily. We're not simply boss and employee anymore. He gets off on me calling him sir. I admit, I get off on calling him that, too. It gives me security in this situation. I don't have to be amazing. I have to be willing and ready to learn. Mr. Marcus will show me what I need to know. The tip of his cock draws lazy circles around my entrance. It gets us both wetter. I know that much. But it also teases me to the point I am writhing against his desk. The desk he's pinned me to with one strong hand. The other hooks beneath my thigh and forces my legs wide open. I can't close them, even if I want to. Fuck, fuck, fuck. I didn't know he could get deeper. Nope, I am definitely no virgin. Not only in pedantry, either. He could pull out and send me packing right now, and I would confidently proclaim my lack of virginal qualities from here on out. You want me to fuck you? He slowly grinds within me, his rigid cock manipulating my whole body. I want to touch him. I want to grab my breasts and quench my nipples that beg for relief. Except I can't. Julian's pinning me down. He is not releasing me until he finishes the job. You want me to make you all mine? Yes. My back arches. Maybe if I shove my chest in his face, he'll get how badly I want him. Don't hold back. I don't know what I'm asking for. How can I? 
Even if I had been with other men like this before, I still wouldn't be prepared for the way Julian Marcus makes love. Hard. So damn hard. My cries are a mixture of pleasure and surprise. Every thrust crashes through my whole body, his cock splitting me, sinking into me, taming me like I'm some wild, hormone-riddled mess he's discovered. I can barely stand it. Not because it hurts. And it does, but in such a delectable way that I'm actually begging for more. But because it's suddenly become like air to me. There's this man, this volatile, virile man that can have anyone and anything he wants. Tonight, he wants me. My whole body screaming for his. My pussy squeezing his cock until he comes. My moans expressing how impressed I am. How much more I want. My breasts swaying up and down my chest in time to his thrusts. My arousal drenching his cock and spilling all over his desk every time he pulls out all the way. I groan when he slams himself back into me. I think... I think I'm gonna come. Seriously? It's that easy? A guy fucks me like he owns me, and I come? The only stimulation my clit gets is from the cool air and the occasional graze of his shaft as it moves in and out of me. This is purely a product of penetration. What are the fucking odds? Apparently, they're amazing. Do it. Julian sucks one of my nipples, and there I go. Without my permission, my body takes his cock to the hilt, attempting to squeeze every fucking drop out of him. Yes, please. I am such an embarrassing slave to lust that I don't see the problem with this situation. I don't care what happens as a result. Do it, Julian. Show me what it's like for a man as worthy as you to come in me. Okay, now I'm giving my body permission. It's got all the permission in the world to milk that cock. This may be my first time riding a stallion, but I know what his thickening cock means. He's going to come, too. I'll get what I want. That's it. My boss pounds me harder. He's slowed down, but the intensity... He's going for my G-spot, isn't he? That's it, baby. Come for me. No matter what I want to say, I can't say a damn thing. My breath has left my body. I'm riding some incorporeal high that I can't even describe. I'm both here in the moment and gone somewhere far, far away. It's almost exhausting, really. Was the human body meant to take this much pleasure at once? Was it meant to feel so full, so satisfied? What really are the limits of the meager human mind? When does pleasure become pain, and then pleasure again? It's all happening at once. Does Julian feel it too? He must, because that's no sound I've ever heard a man make before. I really am some naughty nymph, aren't I? If I can make a man like this come undone, what else can I do? Shit, he growls in a long, drawn-out breath that almost makes me come again. As I brace myself for his orgasm inside of me, Julian pulls out, leaving me empty and shaking for his presence again. His hands grab my breasts, squeezes them rolls his thumb over my nipples until I'm practically crying from how good it feels. Julian pushes my breasts down. While I stare at the back of his silk tie, he shoves his cock between my tits and fucks them until he comes. All over me. It's not what I expected, but I will take it. I'll take every drop he wants my skin to have. My tender breasts are drenched in his seed. 
My throat grows warm as quick, heavy spurts hit it. Don't ask my face how it's handling it. More than a little has landed on my cheeks. Some even touches my mouth, dribbling past my lips and onto my tongue. Most of it is on my chest. Julian's cock hits my thigh and stays there as he catches his breath. He releases my wrists. I lower them, the rest of me frozen from what I have experienced. I think it's over. He's going to clean himself up and send me home. Touch it, he softly commands. It takes me a moment to realize what he means. A long enough moment for him to gently take my hand and press my fingertip against his hot cum slipping into my cleavage. You wanted it. I did. Maybe not like this, but I am still turned on. My body still yearns for one last round, one last orgasm. But I will take this. My bosses seed all over my skin, my fingers spreading it across my chest and up my throat. It's thick, hot and thick. A lot of it. Julian did not hold back how much he had inside of him. If only it had gone where it belongs. More of it touches my tongue, mingling with the salt of my finger. Julian growls to see me taste him. Can he blame me? He tasted me. It's only right I taste him, too. You sure you were a virgin? He asks, pulling his tie off my face. My eyes open to see him looming above me, sweat on his brow, but his hair still perfectly kempt. Because I would have never guessed. Is he doubting me? No, <laughs> I don't think so. Perhaps he's enthralled with me. If only. My underwear slides down my closing legs. The look he gives me insinuates I'm never getting them back. Oh, he can have them. Keep them in his desk and smell them throughout the day for all I fucking care. Here's what's going to happen now. Julian speaks as carefully as he does during meetings, but his visage looks ready to tear me apart again. We're both going to get cleaned up. I need to stay here for fifteen more minutes, but you're going to wait for me at my car downstairs. My driver will be expecting you. We're going back to my place for the night. I'm going to fuck you again. Julian kisses me not giving a single shit that his lips are tasting himself in the process. And again. I gasp when he pulls away from me. Do you understand? My eyes may be glazed over, but I see clearer than I ever have before. Yes, sir. His smirk rules my thoughts for the rest of the night. Chapter 6. Julian Tell me that wasn't the best sex I've had in months. Maybe years, if I dare to be so bold. Alyssa is more woman than I've encountered in that long, anyway. She may be younger than most of the other women I date, and she may be inexperienced in a few things, but there's a spark in her I've never recognized before. I thought it was a passing attraction. She would be a convenient fuck to hold me over until I found someone worthier of my time. I didn't expect her to be more than worthy. I'm still thinking about her after she leaves my office. She may have washed up in my bathroom, but her flushed face and the careful way she walked broadcasted that I had made her mine. Anyone who saw her would know my cock had been in her. Hell, it had made her come so hard... I almost lost complete control of my own orgasm. That never happens. Ever. I text my chauffeur that Alyssa will be coming down to my car. I include a copy of her company ID so he'll know what she looks like. Because Alyssa is going to obey me. She's going to be waiting for me when I get downstairs. She'll do whatever I tell her for the rest of the night. Maybe the weekend... 
I'll focus on tonight, for now. It's been a long week of dealing with international business politics and the even stranger workings of local business politics. I deserve a night or two of unwinding pleasure with a woman of the moment. By the time Alyssa comes to work Monday afternoon, I'll have taken every one of her holes at least twice over. She'll be mine in everything but legalities. If I wanted, I could make that happen, too. Preston returns at 10.30 as I'm cleaning up the last of my raunchy rendezvous off my desk. My clothes are in order, and I'm as composed as ever. But I can't yet hide the scent of Alyssa's sex and my semen all over her soft skin. One step in my office, and Preston takes two back in mock disgust. Open a window, man. I'm already ahead of him. I'll let the office air out overnight. Staff will close it for me early tomorrow morning. Alyssa's black cotton underwear pops out of my top drawer. I toss them at Preston, who catches them with a start. Some tangible proof, my offer. In case you think all I did was jack off. We once shared a place in college. I know what the room smells like after you've done that, thanks. Do other men talk about that? Preston does. It doesn't bother me anymore. There are a lot of things he does that no longer faze me. Wow, you did it. I guess you really can fuck any woman you want. I'll be fucking her again tonight. I pack up the last of my things for the weekend and adjust my tie in my illuminated computer monitor. I then turn that off, too. You have good taste, Preston. She was more than adequate. Which means she was amazing. He tosses the underwear into the air. Good for you, man. Me? I'll be licking my wounds over a lost bed and no girlfriend of my own at Kitty's Corner Club. Your latest and favorite strip joint? You haven't seen the women there. I don't need to. Strip clubs do not amuse me. Those women aren't actually interested in me, for one. Second, I can find women more than willing to take their clothes off for me anywhere. I'd rather hire an escort for a night of no-frills business than be surrounded by men and lethargic women wanting to pay their bills. And besides, I'll be plenty busy for a while. Right. Right. Next you'll be telling me you're taking your new girlfriend to your brother's wedding. I shrug. Maybe I will. I'll need a date to keep the other women off me. I've slept with women I've met at weddings before. Never again. Better to take a woman posing as your girlfriend than to go stag. Even better if she actually is your girlfriend. Enjoy yourself. Preston gives me a half-assed salute before showing himself out of my office. I'll get you in Rio soon enough, though. You can't escape a vacation forever. Watch me. I wait for Preston to get the hell out before turning off my monitor and tucking the leather strap of my briefcase across my chest. That way, I can use both hands to carry the extraneous folders and books I don't have room in my briefcase for. When I'm not exploring the depths of Alyssa's virginal body, I plan on getting some decent work done at home. Glad I cleared my schedule. I was going to relax, because spending a weekend at home with a stack of work is my idea of a vacation, but I don't mind exerting myself with a beautiful woman in between bathing, eating, and poring over figures. Like Alyssa's figure. Damn me for still thinking about her. The last time a woman has occupied my mind like this was... Damn. I don't think one ever has. I've had women that completely captivated me whenever we were in the same room together, but I rarely think of specific ones when I'm alone. I suppose there is some hyperbole in there, but as far as I'm concerned, I speak the truth. Women don't interest me outside of the occasional bouts of fun. That isn't to say I don't care about them. I vote, I donate, I stay educated on causes, particularly the ones my mother hates the most, since that probably means they're worthwhile. Yet outside of the occasional date, the only time I engage with women is in the office. My father encourages me to at least get engaged, 
especially now that my brother's wedding is on the horizon. But I've never much cared about marriage, wife, children, perfunctory. No dreams of mine. Perhaps one day I will find a decent enough wife who will agree to an arrangement that is beneficial to the both of us. Her job will include having my heirs and keeping my image agreeable to the public. Otherwise, I don't care what she gets up to behind the curtains, and I expect the same in return. So these thoughts of Alyssa, haunting me as I step into the elevator and head down to my car, where she will be waiting for me, must be the result of great sex. I'll be over her by the end of the weekend, surely. What that means for her position in my company. Too early to tell. If she's willing to stay but keep quiet, I don't care. Or if she's willing to go with a small, under-the-table settlement to tie her over until she finds another position, even better. I nod in farewell to the security personnel on the ground floor. One steps out from behind her counter to open the glass doors for me. I barely spare her my thoughts as I hurry to my limo parked alongside the curb, motor purring. My driver opens the door as soon as he sees me. The back seat is empty. I refrain from entering my own vehicle. Where is the woman I sent down here? I have not seen her, Mr. Marcus. The dark sidewalk is empty this time of night. Buses roar by in the background. A few blocks up, parties let out, drunken revelers booming their voices until they echo between the buildings. A few drug dealers are surely out tonight. Somebody's probably biting at the chomp to ask me for money. Portland is insufferable even during the day. At least at night, it's a bit quieter. Too quiet. I should hear Alyssa's voice greeting me as I slip in beside her. Drive her on the block so we can look for her. I already know I'm not going to see her again tonight. Either the woman's so daft she can't find a huge limousine waiting right outside the buildings, or she's disappeared on purpose. I'm too annoyed to give a shit. Yet I still give enough of a shit to contact my private investigator yet again. Something is wrong with me. Something so incredibly vexing that I'm unable to get any of my work done. Alyssa has not left my mind. I thought a good night's sleep would make me forget her, or at least forget how she slighted me. Instead, I woke up this morning with a dream suspending me between a blissful slumber and a stark reality. I dreamed about screwing her. Again, again, again. My subconscious couldn't decide if it wanted her tied up in my bed or bent over my kitchen counter. Either way, she was mine, and I made sure she knew it. Absurd. Almost as absurd as the hard-on I woke up with. What am I, fourteen? Because this was no ordinary morning wood that I'll get whether I want it or not. This was a direct reaction to Alyssa's mere existence. So I did what any other man in my unique position would do. I meditated, until my mind was clear of such bothersome, unproductive thoughts. Unfortunately, they came back only two hours later, when I was in my personal gym. So it went for all of Saturday. I even called my brother, which should tell you how badly I wanted to get Alyssa off my mind. My brother and I don't get along, even on the best days. And yet we still converse as if we've always been old pals talking about girls and cars. Naturally, all Ted wants to talk about is his wedding. For as similar as my brother and I are in a lot of aspects, the fact he's actually involved with the planning of his wedding is one significant difference. Make sure you bring someone acceptable, he says with a drawl. I can't have my best man bringing one of his usual tawdry stewardesses or bar girls. When was the last time I brought a low-class woman like that to a wedding? Last year? Henry Warren's wedding? I struggle to remember who I took to that particular function. That was my accountant. Well, one of them. When you have six on one team, who keeps track? 
Even worse, Jules. I'll make sure that whoever I bring to such an auspicious event has your stamp of approval. Give Jordan my best. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Save it for the bachelor party. I cringe. Something else that is absolutely not my sort of thing. My brother laughs at my obvious discomfort on the other end of the phone line. One day, Jules, it'll be your turn. You're not getting any younger. Cupid will snap your ass with his love towel at some point. Only Ted Marcus will talk to me like that. He gets away with it only because he's my older brother. At least he's the distraction I need. After I hang up, I'm still fuming over my circumstance with my brother. The man hasn't had to work for much. Since he's six years older than me, he's had ample time to take over the family business that splits its time up and down the Pacific coast. Right now, Ted is in L.A., where he met his intended. Jordan's decent enough, I suppose. I don't care about that. I care that my brother doesn't take his job as CEO of my family's business more seriously. As for me, I've worked my ass off for the business I established with Preston, and that was with minimal capital from my father. I come from privilege, naturally, but I used up most of my own money establishing my now lucrative career. How the hell would I have had time for this love bullshit Ted loves to dabble in? This will be his first marriage, but far from his first whirlwind romance. He's rather infamous for his serial monogamy, so we'll see how long this marriage lasts. Meanwhile, I'll continue to obsess over a woman I currently don't have. That must be what it is. Obsession. Every once in a while, a woman comes along whose body is enough to hypnotize a man until he's a mere shell of his former self. It was bound to happen to me at some point. Unlike my brother's assertions, however, I won't succumb. This is a mere temporary annoyance that I will get over in due time. One terrific way to do that would be by having her here with me. My investigator has long returned the information I required. Personal information, of course. Contact information. I start by personally calling Melissa. I'm sent straight to her voicemail. Instead of leaving a message, I hang up and text her. This is your boss. I would like an explanation for your disappearance last night. When you're done apologizing, I want to meet you somewhere. Tonight. Nothing. No reply. For hours. Hours I could spend working. Instead, I continue to obsess. The curve of her throat the mounds of her breasts, the little sounds she made as I opened her up to a brand new world she's always desired, but never tasted before. The scent of her body as it begged for me. The damn feeling of her wrapped around my cock and turning me into a man I rarely indulge in. I'd be disgusted with myself and my complete lack of self-control. But fuck it. I'll nip this in the bud by continuing to fuck Alyssa until I'm finally sick of her. All right, that was harsh. When I'm finally bored with her. A part of me worries that something happened to her last night. She disappeared without a trace or a word. She won't respond to me. The only reason for that must be something unfortunate happened. Back to my phone I go, calling my investigator and asking him to confirm Alyssa's safety. Two hours later, he emails me photos of her sitting by the window in a cafe. A pen is in her hand, a large textbook opened before her. I had forgotten she was still in college. That's how young she is. Even more reason to be over her soon. Really, though? She's blowing me off for homework? I could hire her a tutor or a Pulitzer Prize-winning author to write her term paper. There's no reason for any woman to reject me when I have enough money and the right connections to take out whatever obstacle is in our way. The investigator gives me the name of the cafe. It's a few neighborhoods away from here, but I could drive there within twenty minutes. No. No, that's ridiculous. And a complete waste of my time. 
It's late Sunday evening. I should be in bed, resting up for my early morning meeting at the office. Besides, Alyssa will be there, and the sooner I go to sleep, the sooner I'll see her. Assuming she hasn't quit. She hasn't responded to any of my messages. Today, I sent a dozen red roses with a note asking her to get in contact with me. Nothing bad, I assured her. I want to see her again. I want her again. I'm reaching critical mass here. Every five minutes I get hard at the thought of her body pressed against mine, aching for me, her tender voice begging me to fuck her again. I'm her first, after all. Before, that would have meant nothing to me. But now, I want her to be obsessed with me back. Aren't women supposed to obsess over the first man they have intercourse with? My ego is honestly not on the line. The only thing on the line is my goddamned sanity. How dare she reject my offers of communication? The least she could do is openly turn me down. That's better than this silent treatment. I'd rather have her scream and yell at me that I'm an awful man than hear nothing at all. It's ten at night, but my personal assistant Vern is used to me calling him around this time. I go over the usual bullshit for the next day, particularly pertaining to the meeting. But before he becomes confident that our conversation is over, I say, I need you to type up a memo to distribute to the offices tomorrow morning. It needs to go out as soon as you get in. It must be the first thing every employee sees when they open their company email. Yes, Mr. Marcus. The pause tells me Vern is opening up a new note tab on his computer. Go ahead and tell me what to write. First of all, I'm taking on a second assistant, at no risk to your job. As of tomorrow morning, Alyssa Pendleton is my second assistant. I adjust my Bluetooth as I approach my window and gaze out at the blinking lights of the sleepy northwestern city. There's something else, too. Vern asks me to repeat myself multiple times regarding the second note, because his disbelief is that overwhelming. Am I stuttering? I'll say what I have to say a hundred more times if that's how long it takes for his brain to work again. After I hang up, I call the head of my company's HR department. There are a few matters we must sort out. Now. Chapter 7 Alyssa Oh, man, I've made a huge mistake. I spent the whole weekend freaking out that I had ruined everything, and all because my boss's dick got the best of me. I ain't saying I didn't want it. I'm saying that... I shouldn't have, because one night's fantastic fuck is going to haunt me for the rest of my professional life. I'm gonna get fired. I can feel it in my shaking bones. My internship is tied closely to my degree. If future employers find out I was fired from such a prestigious internship, I will never work in my field again. I've completely fucked my career before it's even happened. And all because I wanted to fuck my boss. It was great. I dreamed about it that night. I keep thinking about it in intervals, my body shuddering from the memory of the pleasure he gave me. He wanted me to go home with him. He was going to give me more. What did I do? I ran home like a little girl who couldn't handle adult things. I'm not proud. I should have at least said something. I'm also not proud that I've ignored his messages and immediately threw the roses away. Those beautiful, lovely-smelling roses bathed in gold dust. Okay, so I didn't throw them away. I couldn't bring myself to do that. I threw away the note and gave the roses to my next-door neighbor, Melinda, who works three jobs so she and her son can live in a studio apartment. She needed them brightening up her life more than I did. What do I do now? Well, right now, I sit in my econ lecture. But my head isn't one to listen to facts or absorb charts regarding world and local economies. Sucks, because this is one of my best subjects. 
I'm also not too shabby at statistics. I like to think my skills in these areas are how I got my afternoon internship. But now I wonder if it's because my boss thinks I'm hot. He must still think I'm hot if he's constantly inviting me out this weekend. I'm supposed to go to the office this afternoon. How will I do it? How will I walk through those doors without collapsing in embarrassment? Does anyone else know? Was I initiated into some club I didn't know about? Are there other female interns who have been on the other end of Mr. Marcus's erection? Do I work with them? Will they know I fucked him the moment I walk into the office? Because I walk a certain way. Because I look nervous. I drop my pen at the thought of everyone I work with knowing I offed my virginity with my boss's help. Why, oh, why couldn't he have been a random encounter I met at a party or something? Something strikes me. Something that makes me feel ill. He specifically called me to come to his empty office late Friday night. He didn't even care about the files I brought. Didn't even look at them. Mr. Marcus went right into flirting with me. How long did it take him to get under my skirt? Fifteen fucking minutes? I mean, I know I'm pretty desperate for attention, let alone hot, sexual attention at times, but that's sad even for me, especially my first time having intercourse. My friend elbows me in the back of the lecture hall. Hey, pay attention, you know this stuff's gonna be on the midterm. Yes, yes, I know. Fuck me, do I know. I can't pay attention. I should call out of work, tell them I'm feeling too ill to come in. I should at least take one of Julian's calls, though. God knows, I won't. After class, I grab some lunch and stare at the high-rises in the near distance. I can easily see Mr. Marcus's building. He's probably up there right now. I pull out my cell phone. There's one last text from him. If I don't see you at work today, I'll be very cross, Ms. Pendleton. Fuck. Fine. I'll do it. I'll go to work and face the music. By the time I reach the office, I've convinced myself that my fears were all in my head. Nobody knows. How could they know, unless someone told them? The only person who would know what happened between Mr. Marcus and me is Julian himself. He wouldn't tell a soul, let alone at work. Right? There you are. Cher Lieberman, one of the other interns, leaps up from our caddy corner desks and rushes toward me. How could you not tell us on Friday? Huh? What is she talking about? Everyone else in the office comes to a slow stop as well. They're staring at me. Dozens of eyes. Some of them judgmental. Some of them curious. All of them wide and jealous. This doesn't feel right at all. Someone get me a pail to throw up in. Cher snaps a piece of paper off her desk. Looks like a memo. This went out this morning. You weren't going to tell us before you came in? What are you talking about? Tell you what? She can't mean having sex with one of the bosses. No way. Nevertheless, I take the memo, headlined and signed by Julian's personal assistant, Vern. We get memos from Vern all the time. The fact I see my name in the first line does not sit well with my stomach, which is ready to throw up. Now. Did he fire me and broadcast it to everyone in the office? What the fuck has Julian done? As of this morning, Alyssa Pendleton has been absorbed as an official employee of Bradley and Marcus. Starting today, she will act as second assistant to Mr. Julian Marcus, alongside Vern Jones. Ms. Pendleton has also been promoted to the position of Mr. Marcus's... I look up, gasping. Mr. Marcus's partner in all events. This new position is titled Executive Liaison. Does that mean I'm 
his girlfriend or something? The fuck is an executive liaison? What's even going on? You had no idea? Cher laughs. No wonder you didn't tell us. When did you find out? Now? Yes. Didn't even realize that was a position available for filling, says Courtney, another intern. Otherwise I would have signed up. Be the professional date for Mr. Marcus wherever he goes. Her heavy eyelids look up at me and down. She's boning him, she mutters to Cher. I am not. I'm such a dirty liar. Sad thing. I don't even think I'm lying when I say that. How could I? Because of course I'm not boning my boss. Are you kidding? Except I am. I totally am fucking Julian Marcus. The man waltzing into the secondary office where the plebs like we interns hang out. Mr. Uh, Mr. Marcus. I sputter. Him. The man. Dressed in a black bespoke power suit with a crimson red vest and steel gray tie. I never noticed the golden pocket watch before. I only do now because I'm too ashamed to look him in the face. That face with its perfectly groomed facial hair, fiery dark eyes, and hair that must have been trimmed this morning. Probably in his office. I've seen hairdressers come in and out of there before. There you are. He gestures for me to come to him. I stay right where I am. I've been looking everywhere for you. Did you get my messages? I... I pass out. Well, not quite. I don't mean I suddenly find my face on the carpet, although I would really love to right now. Instead, I find myself propped up against my desk, my body so overwhelmed by the news by Julian's presence, that I need smelling salts. Here. Vern hands me a glass. Looks like hair of the dog, except I'm not hungover. This will help put some spunk back in you. Those words may sound good-natured, but Vern has a default expression to rival Mr. Marcus's. Except he's not as hot. Rather homely, but we can't all be hot billionaires in Portland. Thanks, I mutter, glancing out the open door to see my boss. And lover? Explaining something to his other subordinates. Meanwhile, I'm kicking it in here in Mr. Marcus's office, where I lost my virginity Friday night. Right there on that desk Vern leans against. He's got no idea, does he? Or maybe he does. Maybe this is another day ending in Y for one of the most overpaid personal assistants in the PNW. His blue and red striped tie bleeds right into his royal purple shirt, jacket off and draped on another chair. His closely cropped hair makes Vern look like Julian's little brother. Does he even have a brother? I think he has an older brother. I sip the drink. It's as putrid as puke, but hopefully it'll keep me from puking. Julian glances over his shoulder before showing himself back into his office. Thank you, Mr. Jones. I'll take it from here. Vern leaves, closing the office door behind him. Julian and I are alone. Again. I still can't look him in his handsome face. Ms. Pendleton. I continue to nurse my nasty drink. Whatever happened to Alyssa, huh? You were pretty chummy with her the other night, sir. Oops. I said, sir. Julian sweeps next to me. I barely have time to register his immediate presence before he's sitting beside me, his powerful body looming over me, even though he's closed the height difference between us. My body still yearns for him. If I thought I was embarrassed before, I am all but humiliated now. Why am I being betrayed like this? By my own body? I've been trying to get a hold of you all weekend. He hisses, sending chills through my traitorous body. We need to talk about what happened Friday night. 
I sigh. I know about what we did. I was thinking more about what you did. Excuse me? I sit up with a jerk, the very last of my drinks spilling on my hand. What did I do? You left me high and dry with no explanation. He's serious, isn't he? Julian Marcus is pissed the fuck off because I dumped him the other night. Is that the real reason he's been calling and messaging me all weekend? Why he's promoted me to his side? Why he's made me his professional girlfriend? What the hell? I don't owe you any explanation. Why is he putting me on the defensive like this, for God's sake? Did I do something to displease you? Oh, no. Nobody, least of all me, signed up to have Julian's breath ringing hot in my ear. I certainly didn't sign on to have his presence get all up in mine. Not only is he invading my personal space without my express consent, he's also making me feel things that I am not in the mood to feel. Namely, I am not in the mood to start thinking about sex. I'd much rather you tell me what I did wrong instead of running off like that. My body is fully turned toward the arm of this love seat in his office. Why do you care so much? You got what you wanted. I snort. I don't want or need anything from you, Mr. Marcus. I certainly don't need a promotion because we had sex. I wasn't expecting something like that at all. Honestly, I'd rather forget about it. Let's pretend it never happened and get on with our personal lives. Never mind the fact I'll probably be jealous the next time a girlfriend sashays her hot ass through the office. Forget about it? His hand touches my leg. My pantyhose tickles my skin. Fuck. Fuck, no. Don't. Stop making me feel good. You want to forget about me? You think it's that easy? You think I can forget about you that easily? He stops touching me. I'm both relieved and already missing his fingertips marching toward my pelvis. Damn it, Alyssa. Julian gets up and paces in front of the love seat. I spent this whole weekend thinking about every second we spent together. And you want to forget it happened? I cock my head to one side. You have? Whoa. How could I be so memorable? Is he kidding me? Of all the women he has ever been with, I'm the one he's been thinking about? Whatever. It's only because I'm the latest. Maybe the latest and greatest, but I'm not naive to think it would last. I may be young, but I'm also cynical. Of course I have. Have you looked in a mirror recently, Alyssa? You're gorgeous. My eyes widen. Okay, now I know he's lying. I'm barely wearing any makeup today. My clothes were thrown on because I was barely paying attention this morning. I haven't slept a whole night in three days because I'm so weirded out by what's going on between us. My hair's the only thing that looks nice today, but that's because it's blissfully low maintenance. Oh, and I've been stress eating this weekend, so I'm bloated as fuck. My hips, gut, and face... The unholy trifecta. I am far from gorgeous. That's okay. I'm okay with not being gorgeous right now. What woman wants all that attention 24-7? The kind of woman who dates a man like Julian Marcus, I suppose. What do you want from me, I ask, to meek for my own good? Like I don't mean to look gorgeous, I sure as hell don't mean to sound meek. Talk about something that will only complicate our situation. Tell me so that I can go. If I told you what I wanted, you wouldn't go. Julian lowers his arm and turns toward me. Shit. He's so much more powerful now. Those clothes, that pose, that sturdy frame towering over me, I... I want him on top of me. Right now. No. No, I, I can't breathe. 
I get up, attempting to run out of his office. He grabs my arm but doesn't pull. I merely stopped. I could shrug him off and keep going, but I don't. Because his touch has me enraptured once more. His dangerously possessive touch. I've known men like Julian before. Even dated one before I dumped him once I realized he would be a control freak in our relationship. Jealousy and possessive natures may be hot to some women, but they scare me. Who really wants a relationship like that? One touch like that has my heart fluttering, though. It was one thing to feel like this when we were having sex. It's quite another with our clothes on and gazing into one another's eyes. What I want is for you to be right here with me. I wish I could claim this moment romantic, but there's nothing in his tone that implies romance. It's sex, first and foremost, and that possessive nature I mentioned earlier. He wants me here because, as he told me Friday night, I belong to him. I honestly don't know what to make of that. Should I make anything at all? What I should do is run away. But my feet are glued to the carpet, my body growing weaker by the second. My willpower is a far-off, distant concept. Mr. Marcus, I try to shrug him off me, but my arm won't move. It's like the stupid thing wants him to keep touching me, squeezing my wrist, trying to draw me closer to him. I don't think this is a good idea. I don't know what you think I'm thinking, but it was nothing like this. His hand moves over mine. I think he's going to yank me, but instead, he lifts my fingers up to his lips and kisses them, eyes holding mine. His ruthless gaze tears me apart from the inside out, like a bomb blowing away my heart. Imagine waking up to see this gaze every morning, Alyssa. Imagine seeing it before he kisses you, caresses you. Goes down on you? That's right. He kept me blindfolded during our encounter. I have no idea what he actually looks like during sex. I could find out, couldn't I? You said you were a virgin, he says thoughtfully. Didn't you? <laughs> like he could forget something like that. In most ways. You weren't the first man to polish my pearl. In the most important way. That also means there are other things you have yet to do. This time, when he draws me closer, it's with a gentleness that wins me over. I go, my whole body pressing against his, our lips dangerously close. Give me a chance to initiate you into a world you've only fantasized about. I almost fall for it. After all, a part of my subconscious clearly wants me to. Why not? Julian Marcus is a hell of a man. Meet of guy who could approach you in Starbucks, at the airport, in the middle of a damned shopping mall to ask you out. And you would say yes without a second thought. Even if you're married. That's how powerful his aura is. Why? What do you get out of this? Do you get off on doing this with a girl like me? I offer you much, but I'm the real winner here, Miss Pendleton. I'm the one fooling around with a beautiful woman who's experiencing things for the first time. Even in my position, a man doesn't get to witness something as beautiful as that very often. I'd consider it an honor. An honor? Getting me off to a good start in my sex life? Is that it? He chuckles that low rumble making his chest vibrate against me. You have no idea. But you would love to give me some ideas. I know the kiss is coming, but I'm still shocked when it happens. Perhaps it's his mouth ravaging mine, tongue sinking deep into my mouth that shocks me the most. I'm not prepared. 
I wasn't prepared for how good he felt inside of me Friday night, and I'm not prepared for his heavy, delicious kiss that almost has me ripping off my clothes right here. He'd fuck me if I asked, wouldn't he? Throw me down on his couch. No, <laughs> no, bend me over it. I'm supposed to have new experiences. I've never had a man make love to me like an animal. Not like that. Him in that suit. Him naked. Julian Marcus, ready and waiting for me. Waiting to initiate me in his world of sex and billions of dollars. Julian's hands cup around my head, holding my face against his. I can't move my head. I don't want to. I want to keep my lips parted so he can plunder my mouth and get to intimately know every inch of me. The beautiful force of his tongue has me yearning for more. Between my legs, please. Tongue, fuck me. Not only to get me wet for your cock, Mr. Marcus, but to make me die. A tongue this talented could do nothing else, I'm sure. So what do you propose? Really? That's the first thing out of my mouth the moment he breaks the kiss? He nips my lips before stepping away, heading toward his desk. I already made you my assistant. That gives us unlimited opportunities to be together. You saw that memo, I hope. Vern did a remarkable job with what I gave him, as he always does. You're to be my partner. My date, if you will. At all future functions I have coming up. Not like I have a girlfriend, anyway. So I guess that means I'm not his girlfriend. That's okay, I suppose. We barely know each other. We're... dating. Yeah, I'll go with that. How long will this last? Julian looks at me as if I've asked a ridiculous question. As long as we find it mutually beneficial. So until he gets tired of me. Or I get tired of being his fuck buddy. How long could that take? He'll probably get tired of me before I tire of him. I promise to make it worth your while, he says. I wish we could get started right now, Alyssa. You could say the word and I'd whisk you away from here into one of my rooms. Yet we'll have to wait. He brings up a digital planner on his huge computer monitor. Even from halfway across the room, I can see the details of meetings and events coming up. Including one tonight. Tonight, you will accompany me to a small party being held in honor of a friend's retirement. I will? Yes. But first, you need to go down to HR and take care of some paperwork. You are no longer an intern, Ms. Pendleton. You're officially my employee. And there are things to sort out with them. Before I can respond, he continues. Afterward, I'll be sending you somewhere to get appropriate evening wear for the event. I'm sure you have lovely clothing, but... I'll feel better knowing I bought you something from this year's trends. There may be photographers. Talk about an onslaught of information. So we're clear. I stand before his desk, where the wooden structure hides my shaking legs from his critical view. Is this like a sugar daddy situation, or... He briefly looks away from his monitor and relents from his endless clicking around his schedule. The thought of me being anyone's sugar daddy is a rather deplorable one. Julian pulls open one of his desk drawers and shows me his personal address book. Consider yourself my girlfriend. Your girlfriend? The book flips open. Under P for Pendleton, he writes me in between someone named Parker and someone named Penstock. The only people I write in this book are those I consider important enough for me to remember. Considering how you've consumed my thoughts these past few days, I suppose it's safe to assume that you and I are having more than a fling. Things could change. For now, though, he puts the address book away. You're mine. I slowly turn to leave, aware that he's watching my every movement. Those eyes undress me. They fuck me. They leave me wanting more. I turn back around again. So, 
You're my boyfriend, Mr. Marcus. Julian. If you're my boyfriend, I get a kiss whenever I want, yeah? Around his desk, encroaching on personal, confidential space. He doesn't flinch. Can I give you a kiss goodbye? If it pleases you. Julian leans back in his chair, muscles flexing beneath his suit. I'm a goner. Bye. And I want you pleased. My waist almost topples me over as I bend down to kiss his sweet-smelling, ticklish cheek. His facial hair dances against my lips the more they linger together. His hand shoots up my skirt and slaps my ass. The sharp, sudden pain is more exhilarating than the kiss from earlier. Sir, I whisper. The word is as effortless as my desire for him. Julian's hand remains on my ass, squeezing it with vigor. You do unprecedented things to me, Alyssa. Let's see where this goes. Perhaps we'll both be surprised. I do it. I kiss him again, initiating the moment as if it's something I've done a dozen times before. He lets me. He tips his head back against his tall, regal chair and lets me kiss him as if I have every right to do so. Julian wants to talk about me doing unprecedented things to him? Maybe he should take a look in the mirror. Now go. HR is expecting you. Take the rest of the afternoon off to get ready for tonight's party. I'll arrange transportation for you. The first thing I encounter in the central office is a sea of curious faces, including Vern's, and Cher's, and Courtney's, and Preston Bradley's, who is standing outside his own office door. I'm not halfway across the silent room before Julian's business partner slaps a do-not-disturb notice on my boyfriend's office door and enters without invitation. Wanna share what's going on? Cher asks me before I can hop into the elevator. I have to go see HR. A brief look of satisfaction covers her jealous face. Sorry to see you go, hon. Yeah. Mr. Marcus is sort of my boyfriend, I guess. Gotta get that taken care of. I steal that look of smug satisfaction from her. It's mine now. Just like Julian is mine whether I'm ready to handle him or not. Chapter 8 Julian What in the bloody hell are you up to? I look up from my work to find Preston already in my office. I don't recall inviting him in. I must have pissed him off because he's speaking bloody to me. Right now, I glance back at my computer monitor. Trying to strategize our capitalistic attack on new light Enigma electronics? Preston approaches my desk with an uncharacteristically stern expression on his face. First, I find this memo on my desk. Then I hear from everyone in the office that you've hired Ms. Pendleton as your new assistant. Oh, and you're openly boning her. He chortles. Excuse me taking her to functions as your plus one. I do love it when things work out like that, killing two birds with one stone and all. Come off it. Preston sits on the arm of one of my chairs, his body language so palpably rude that I am forced to sit back in my chair, lest he knock me over. And we can't have that. You're creating an HR shitstorm. I've already cleared it with them. Alyssa's speaking to them right now. I bet she is. Telling them about what happened Friday night, I'm sure. Preston really has no idea, huh? They already know. Well, not the details. They know enough, though. It's been taken care of. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about what? You randomly dating one of your employees after boning her Friday night? If Preston scoffs one more time, I'll be tempted to smack the next one out of his throat. Is her pussy really that fantastic? 
I almost don't deign that with an answer. But Preston is supposedly one of my best friends. If I can't tell him, then who can I tell? It's up there. I'll be able to tell him once I sleep with Alyssa some more. Who knows? I might be over her within a week. In the meantime, however, I'll enjoy as much of it as I can. Ms. Pendleton really doesn't know what she's in for. I never thought I'd be so intrigued with dating a young virgin. Well, she's not anymore. A virgin, that is. Yet, if she was a virgin to intercourse, then what else is she inexperienced with? What could I teach her to do? How could I mold her into the perfect lover? She's like a blank slate. Whatever minimal experience she's had before doesn't matter. It wasn't enough to support bad bedroom habits I have to break for us to have fun in the bedroom. I can teach her how to do things the way I like them. In the meantime, I'll be opening her mind and body to new experiences she's never had before. There's something powerful in that. I really hope you know what you're doing. Preston hops off the arm of the chair and goes to my window overlooking the heart of downtown Portland. It's another cloudy day in the city of rain. Not sure what he's looking at out there. The view is far from great during the day, unlike at night. This isn't you at all, Julian. You're never this impulsive. There's a first time for everything. I mean, I'm used to you going through girls like they're only to gnaw your nads off, but not publicly. What's different about this intern? Don't know. I'll get back to you when I figure that out. Preston slowly crosses his arms. Occasionally, I glance at the back of his head. Too bad I can't read his mind. Does this have to do with your brother getting married? I stop scrolling through web pages. Excuse me? Preston scrutinizes me. You've always been jealous of what he has. He got the business, he gets the family property, and now he gets the marriage and kid along the way. My business partner is one of the few people to know that my brother has planned everything so perfectly that he's having a baby and a new marriage only a few months apart. And the marriage first, of course. He and Jordan decided that was the proper course of action. As long as the baby's Ted's, my family doesn't care. They'll show up drunk to any wedding. The hell are you talking about? This has nothing to do with my brother. Sure, man. Tell yourself that. Your brother drops two bombs at Christmas and you turn around and start openly dating an intern you've just met. Would you judge me, even if that were true? Judge you? Shit. As long as you don't hurt the business, I don't care if you marry a professional drag queen in Vegas tomorrow. You always have a penchant for the dramatics. What can I say? I'm usually the only one with a personality around here, according to our employees, anyway. Hmm. I get up from my seat and join him by the window. How about that? Preston has been watching the window cleaners a few floors down this whole time. They're not quite as small as ants, but their careful movements remind me of insects. Don't worry about me. Worry about yourself. You're the one showing up in Portland's best and grimiest strip clubs, which you were missed at this weekend. Sighing, Preston pulls out his phone, littered with messages from various women who are probably online only, and maybe a few in the flesh, sex workers. The man isn't happy unless he has three cam girls blowing him up with texts all day. He pays for the privilege, too. Nice party, too. Invited you out lots of times Saturday night, but you never responded. Because I was at home, agonizing over Alyssa's refusal to talk to me. I was preoccupied. With your new honey? I decline to answer. Have fun. I mean it, too. Maybe this relationship will be good for you. Help you increase your emotional output a little. Shrugging, Preston wanders back to the central office. 
Just don't get us in trouble with the public. Or HR, for that matter. Especially HR. They can be dicks. He gives me a half-hearted wave on his way out. I don't need Preston's advice. I'm perfectly secure in what's going on with Alyssa. I'm also confident that she knows what's going on with me. If not, I'll set her straight. I'm good at that in all facets of my life. I spend another hour in my office, occasionally barking for more coffee while returning phone calls I've been neglecting since this morning. By three, I get a hankering to see Alyssa's beautiful face again. Besides, isn't she supposed to be working for me? Then I remember. I sent her out shopping while giving her the afternoon off. I fire a text to her. Where are you? It only takes five minutes for her to respond now. I just got done with HR. It took that long? I'm in the lobby. Do you need to see me, sir? Need to see her? That's like asking me if I need air right now. Time for a break, anyway. I inform Vern that I'm heading downstairs for a few minutes. Kiss my woman a little bit. Remind myself what I have to look forward to tonight. I think about her supple body as I ride the private elevator down to the lobby. Imagine the reverent faces she'll make when blowing my cock. Pretending she's here with me now, waiting for me to rip off her clothes and fuck her against the wall. Damn it. I'm hard. I might extend my break from ten minutes to twenty and give Alyssa the first real quickie of her life. I have my own private room attached to the lobby I can cart her off to. Might be good for her to walk around in public after having me. The door's open. There she is. The woman I've decided is mine. Talking to another man. I don't know who the hell he is, but he's young, attractive, and possesses a bravado I instantly recognize, because I have the same kind. Alyssa animatedly points in some direction with a helpful smile on her face. The man pretends to glance in the appropriate direction. But we men know this trick. He's checking out her cleavage, and his body language is inviting her to come closer to him. He's flirting with her. Alyssa probably doesn't even realize it. Since I don't know who the fuck this prick is, I don't feel bad about squaring my shoulders and marching up to the person I've decided belongs to me. Excuse me. I don't mean it, of course. How can I, when I've parked my body between some grad school dropout and my girlfriend? I make him look me up and down. He doesn't instantly recognize me, and I don't expect him to. It's actually better if he doesn't. I want this intimidation to be entirely organic. Anything she can help you with, I can also help you with ten times over. Was just asking where the lost and found was, bud. The man holds up both of his hands. One has a glove on it. The other doesn't. How clever. Except, unlike Alyssa, I can see the matching glove poking out of his back pocket. Sheesh. Didn't mean to summon the resident douche overlord. He stalks off. But it's with his tail between his legs, so I've done my job here. Was that necessary? I turn. Alyssa Pendleton remains enticing in her white blouse and emerald green skirt. Two things that should be off her body as soon as possible. I want to see her naked. I want her nudes on my phone for me to peruse whenever the hell I want. I want her mouth on my cock and my fingers up her cunt, working her to orgasm. Instead, we're standing here in public, clothed. He was flirting with you. He needed to understand that you're already spoken for. Shit, Julian. We've been dating ten minutes and you're already turning into a possessive freak. Funny. She made that sound like an insult. I don't think you understand what's going on here, I say, careful to mind my temper. You're my girlfriend now. You do not get to flirt with other men. I wasn't flirting. You were, 
even if you didn't realize it. So, now I can't talk to other men? We'll discuss it later over dinner. Why don't you drop a business contract while you're at it? Is she walking away from me? That way, I know all the rules of this relationship, Julian. I don't pursue her. Because she's given me a fantastic idea. Alyssa Pendleton, you really, truly have no idea what wondrous things you're in for. Part Two Seduced by the Billionaire Chapter One Alyssa I am sitting in one of the most exclusive restaurants in Portland, the kind that requires an annual membership that totals into the hundreds, no, thousands of dollars. And that's only to guarantee you a spot on most of the nights you want to dine. You still have to pay for the food and drink at the end of your stay, and looking at this menu has me shaking in my brand new Prada heels. I don't know how I've ended up in this restaurant, eating this food, wearing these clothes, and gazing upon one of the hottest men I've ever met. A man I happened to lose my virginity to only a few days ago. Well, that's how this all started, isn't it? Julian Marcus, billionaire and corporate president, alongside his business partner Preston Bradley, called me up early Friday evening and asked me to bring by a folder. Well, I thought it was strange, and... Totally unnecessary, like, come on. At the time, I soon realized he didn't care about the folder at all. He wanted under my skirt, fucking me against his desk, and then demanding I go back with him to his penthouse for round two. I may have panicked and ran out on him before he realized I skipped out on the limo ride. But by this Monday afternoon... I was agreeing to be his new personal assistant and girlfriend. One of the first things Julian did was send me to get some nice clothes. I showed up at the designated department store where he had a credit line and walked out with three new outfits, two new pairs of shoes, and a palette of new makeup. I never thought in a million years I would wear a designer dress like this on someone else's dime. Because my Prada shoes aren't cute enough, I'm wearing a matching Chanel dress that hugs my body and covers my skin at the same time. I'm not stupid. I know what this sapphire blue does for my new... new... Dear God, is he really my boyfriend? No way. This is a lark. This will be over the moment he's bored with me. Although... <laughs> Can a guy who looks at me like this really get bored with me? I'm like a blushing virgin all over again every time I meet his eyes across the table. One hour ago, we were at a business function thrown by one of Julian's biggest business associates. We weren't staying long, not when we were both hungry and the only thing available to eat was finger food. As soon as it was socially acceptable... Julian put his arm around me and swept me out of that small gathering of men in suits and the beautiful women they slept with. Who knew that even a small city like Portland had that kind of rich life lurking beneath its rainy streets? You are so gorgeous, Julian says, leaning across our intimate table in its own private room. The only people we've seen since sitting down are the sommelier and waiter. Julian ordered for me, after asking if I had any allergies. Granted, the man ordered me a salad. But it's one of the biggest, most delicious, heartiest salads I've had in my life. I won't be going hungry. Not that I have much appetite now. I'm still reeling from the magic of the day. Our first sexual encounter swimming in the deep recesses of my memory. The way he kissed me, dipping his tongue into my throat and caressing every inch of my mouth. The way he pinched my skin, sensually, easing my legs open and making me wet. The way he fucked me. Can't forget that. You're a handsome man yourself. I feel brave saying that. 
Who am I to tell Julian Marcus that he's handsome? Of course he knows that. He could be a model for any Italian designer desperate enough to have him. Look at him. The healthy glow of his skin goes perfectly with his milk-white dress shirt and blue and gray striped tie. His jacket hangs over the back of his chair. His legs spread wide in that way casual men espouse after work. A huge Philippe Patek watch glistens on his wrist. I remember how cool it felt against my thighs Friday night when he pulled my legs open and went down on me. Down. On me. Shit. Now I'm blushing. I had told myself I would keep this relationship professional. Because I don't delude myself into thinking it's forever. Or that even he takes it seriously. So it's safe to say, I have no idea what's going on when he opens a moleskin notebook and pulls a hefty pen from his pocket. My father has a pen like that. He keeps it locked up in his office because it's so nice. And expensive. Says it's only for signing important documents or writing personal letters that need an extra touch. It doesn't make sense that someone like Julian Marcus would thus treat his own pen so flippantly. He could lose that thousand-dollar pen at any moment. And he doesn't care. He probably has ten more around his office and in his penthouse. This is too much. No wonder I need wine and a fan blowing across my flustered skin. As much as I would like to gaze into your delightful eyes, Alyssa... I'm afraid there are some things we must go over if we are to have a relationship like this, let alone a public one. I fold my hands on the table and give him my meeting face. Too bad my co-workers often say it makes me look constipated. Absolutely, sir. A smile briefly flashes on his visage. Ah, yes. I said, sir, which he likes. A lot because Julian Marcus is the kind of man who takes charge in all areas of his life, including his sex life. With me. We need to talk about the terms of this relationship. I nod. Yes, it's a good idea, isn't it? This isn't a conventional relationship. We literally hooked up Friday night, and he decided I'm his new girlfriend. I'm playing along because... Oh, do you see this guy? He's like sex walked into a tailor's and said, Put me in a suit. I've got women to fuck and I need to look good doing it. Make me smell good, too. The fact I might get spoiled in the process has crossed my mind. I mean, I get to keep this outfit. Even if we broke up tomorrow, I could still shove this in the back of my closet until I need it for a wedding, job interview, whatever. Julian slides his moleskin across the table, careful to avoid our empty wine glasses and my plate. I've jotted down some rules as they've occurred to me over the past few hours. Let me know if you have any questions. Rules, huh? I keep my reaction neutral as I hold the notebook up in my hands and study Julian's handwriting in the candlelight. 1. Exclusivity is key. No other men. I expect to be the only one involved. Finding out about another boyfriend would be grounds for dismissal. What a businessy way of putting that. Don't worry, Mr. Marcus, I say through my full red lips. I can't say I'm seeing anyone else right now, nor do I want to. Before his smugness can choke me, however, I continue. I hope this is a two-way street, though. I wouldn't feel fantastic knowing you're still ordering up other interns to do the deed with them on your desk. I worry about offending him, but I can't let it go unsaid. If Julian wants to be exclusive with me, that's fine. Like I said, I'm not seeing anyone else anyway. But I'll be damned if he gets to still fuck other women while I'm expected to be Miss Pretty and Chaste, except for his dick even if it's a great dick. I'm just saying. That is ideal, yes. Is that all I'm getting from him? I think you'll be more than satisfactory for me, Alyssa. 
His eyes linger on my breasts, perfectly outlined in sapphire blue in this dress. I may not show off any cleavage right now, but he knows what it looks like. Fabric be damned. I would worry more about you. Me? He's kidding, right? Of course. You're a beautiful young woman who is only beginning her sexual journey through life. Men can sense that. He shrugs as if I should be happy with that answer. All right, then. What the hell do I make of that? Keep reading, please. I glance down at the moleskin. Two. There will be no fraternizing or flirting with members of the opposite sex. Oh. Was this about what happened earlier today? There I was, standing in the lobby of my boss's building, when a young man in a nice suit approached me and asked for directions to a specific office. Since I knew exactly where it was, I was more than happy to help him get to his job interview or whatever. Except Julian chose that moment to approach and turn into Mr. Jealousy, because how dare I talk to another man? I had almost forgotten about that, thanks to the other nice things that have happened today. But now that he's dragging it up, all I can think is that I'm involved with one possessive man. This is one of those things that requires trust, Julian. I clear my throat. I may only be twenty-one, and my boss is in his early thirties, but I'll be damned if he makes me feel small right now. I know about trust. Granted, not in a relationship like this, but does it really take rocket science? You have my word that I will not fraternize or outwardly flirt with any other men, or women, for that matter, while you and I keep this arrangement going. That's common decency. Now that's not going to stop me from talking to men, you know? I don't care if you're convinced that they're flirting with me. If I'm not flirting back with them, you have no grounds to get angry with me. His face is set in half scorn, half amusement. Does he think I'm cute? Or is he obsessing over sex? It's both, isn't it? Fine. I'll trust you. He squeezes his pen in his hand. There's more. Three. You are to accompany me to both formal and informal functions as your schedule permits. Seems fair. Well, except for one thing. You do know I'm still in school, right? There's a reason I only work at his office during the afternoons. Because I've got classes in the morning. I vaguely remember something about that. Only a couple here and there, correct? Forward Vern your usual schedule and he'll work it into mine. A couple? Here and there? Julian, I'm going to school full time. I spent my time this weekend thinking about him and doing my homework. I have a paper due soon. I have no intentions of taking a sabbatical because I'm dating someone. No, he grumbles through gritted teeth. Of course not. Like I said, forward your class schedule to Vern, and he'll make sure it works out with mine. I'm not sure how I feel about his executive assistant scheduling our banging, but okay. When does your term end? June. June. You're serious? Absolutely. Fine, but once your term is over, I get to have you whenever I want. This summer, you belong to me. Do you understand? I swallow. Hard. Whenever he speaks with such authority, I admit it, I get... wet. Damn it. That's not healthy, is it? I'm not supposed to get turned on when a guy shows me his possessive streak. Are we supposed to discourage that? Isn't it unhealthy? Why am I surprised, though? A man like Julian... Born into privilege and used to getting his way, is going to think I'm his damn possession he gets to do whatever he wants with. I should probably be blessed that he's willing to work around my school schedule for the next two to three months. For one thing, he continues with the same tone of voice. 
My brother is getting married in a few weeks. I'm his best man, and I wouldn't mind having a date. I don't care if you have a final that day, Alyssa. You're coming with me to my brother's wedding. I'm sure it will be lovely. Where's it going to be? Some vineyard near Salem. God knows if I remember what it's called. Then it's nearby. That's good, right? Good for you and your school schedule, I suppose. Please. Like this guy didn't go to a nice university that expected him to show up at least once a week. I'm probably being generous there. There's more written in the moleskin, but I'm not in the mood to read it right now. I close the notebook and hand it back to him. I think three things at a time is more than sufficient, Mr. Marcus. He studies my face before snatching the notebook out of my hand. Very well. When initializing new negotiations, it's good to let things digest for a couple of days anyway. I'll pretend he's not talking about me like I'm a new merger and acquisition. Exclusivity and pledging to not flirt with other people. Sounds all right to me. We'll discuss the other things later. Julian shrugs back into his jacket and checks his phone. It's getting late. We should head back to my place now. He presses a button on his phone and stands up, offering his other hand to me. Your place, is it? I swear to God. You bucked me Friday night. You're not getting away from me tonight. I swallow again. What? Am I swallowing? Certainly not wine. It doesn't taste like bile, either, thank goodness. Perhaps it's some of the last of my innocence slipping down my throat. As I take his hand and stand up, my tight skirt keeping my thighs pressed together, I think that's exactly what Julian wants to do to it. He's going to fuck the last of my innocence away. That gleam in his famished eyes says it all, and it sends a thousand currents through my body, heart, and soul. I am reaching the point where I can't tell the difference between the three, and that's dangerous. Yet not as dangerous as wanting to walk away from Julian Marcus and his promises of pleasure and earth-shattering experience. Chapter 2. Julian My cock's been warring with me for the past five hours. Ever since Alyssa was in my office, looking like the prettiest thing to ever grace my presence. Then she dared to return after I got off work, dressed in this curve-hugging dress that inspires me to rip it off and fuck her raw. Raw. I want my cock in her, fucking her deepest crevices. Unleashing everything I've built up inside of me like we're two wild animals who can't control themselves. What am I supposed to think? They started as a lark to prove that I can bed any woman I set my sights on. When she told me that she was a virgin. When I experienced how damn good she felt, looked, and sounded when we had sex. My brain went in a different direction. This is it. This is my chance to take a sweet little spring bud and coax her to bloom into the most pristine, most exotic flower I could ever ask to have in my garden. Even men of my station don't have many opportunities like this. There aren't many women out there who get our blood roaring and volunteer to be molded into the perfect lovers. I know what I want from a girlfriend. In the bedroom, out of it. So many of my previous lovers promised to offer me those things, but in the end... Their own baggage put a halt to it. I'm not saying a virgin is best, but how could I pass up an opportunity like this? Alyssa is my untouched bloom. She's willing to learn, willing to forge through the adult world of sex and relationships, and willing to let me be the man who opens her mind. And legs. If I thought she was delectable before I knew this about her, she only turns me into a ravenous wolf now. So many ways to take her. So many ways to blow her mind and remember me for the rest of her life. No wonder I can't keep my hands off her all the way back to my penthouse. My driver knows better than to intrude. 
The partition is up in my limo, and he won't say a thing unless there's an emergency. I've had plenty of women in the back of my limo with me, and perhaps I'll have plenty more. But right now, Alyssa Pendleton has me so wound up, and I refuse to do anything but kiss her and rub her cunt through her underwear. She's hot, wet, gasping for more. My fingers, my cock, anything. I want to give them all to her. But it's a short drive home. Besides, there's plenty of privacy in my penthouse. The cleaning crew and my chef are long gone. Security will be out in the main hall and riding up and down in my personal elevator. But they won't disturb me in my actual home. Which is good, because I have a long night planned for sweet, virginal Alyssa. When do I get to stop calling her virginal? I don't want to think about it. Maybe after I finally take her ass. Not tonight, though. One thing at a time. Like in business dealings, it's best to have things to look forward to and further negotiate as we near sealing the deal. My penthouse overlooks the Willamette River. Not that you can tell with all the lights off. I keep them off until we get to my room, which I've half-hauled Alyssa to because she's not walking in those heels fast enough. Her wrist is delicate in my hand, and the way she bites her lip is exquisite. The more I look at her mouth, the more I want to kiss it again, and the more I want her to start doing things with it. Fucking hell. My cock is stiffer than the pen in my pocket, and ten times as thick. Does she even know she does this to me? Do women like her realize the power the potential they have inside of them to completely make a man like me come unhinged. All she had to do was show the hell up, walk into the room, flip her hair when it broached her line of sight, cock her waist to the side, distributing the weight of her luscious, hypnotic hips. Shit fucking hell, damn it, do I want her ass on my bed right now. I want her legs spread. I want her pussy out. I want her breasts in my face as I fuck her with everything I've got. Do you understand me? I want my body in Alyssa Pendleton's. I want to know that I'm the only man who has ever done this. The only one who gets to do this. For the rest of her life. Yes, that's the fantasy. Sit. I speak as if she's a disobedient pet. She's been far from disobedient, though. Oh, but wouldn't I love to see that side of her. The side of Alyssa who goes out of her way to be disobedient so I can give her my punishment? Her ass begs me to spank it every time I look at it. She sits. She's waiting for me to act. To push her down and fuck her until we're both coming in torrential waves of pleasure. To tell her to take off her clothes and touch herself. To suck my cock until she learns what my power truly tastes like. Yes, that one. I want my cock in her throat. I want to feel her struggle to take all of me. I won't do that to her, of course, but damn if the fantasy isn't making me too hard to bear. I need to come. Now. There will be no other playing until my seed is dripping from the corner of her mouth. Hands flat on the bed. She obeys so well. Between tonight and Friday, I'm almost inclined to believe she's a natural submissive. That would be too good to be true. Too good. I will assume she obeys because she doesn't know what else to do. And because she wants to keep me pleased, because this relationship is very beneficial to her. Not because she gets off on me ordering her around. Her hair is so gorgeous, long, full, and a delicate chestnut brown that has to be natural. I want to grab it. I want it to shroud her pretty face. I want her to tie it back so it no longer taunts me, so it doesn't get in between the way we have sex. Stop thinking about her hair. My hands caress both sides of her face my thumb dipping between her red lips. I didn't look like this Friday night. Whoever did her makeup today needs a raise. I'll see to it. 
Her eyes flutter shut. My touch awakens her, flushes her cheeks, makes her skin burn hot enough to scald my hands. How does the rest of her feel? How warm is that breath? Tell me you want me, Alyssa. I love saying her name. Alyssa. So beautiful. So feminine. So satisfying to let it hiss from my teeth. Tell me you need me tonight. Those lovely eyes look up at me, full of adoration. It can't be an act. She's not experienced enough for this to be an act. I need you, Julian. I wasn't expecting her to say my name. It's so personal. For a moment, one of my hardened heartstrings practically sings. I want you, sir. That brings me back to what I hope to experience tonight. You want my cock? Something glitters in her eyes. It's hard to tell in the darkness of my room, but I think they've glazed over. She's either thinking about what my cock can do or escaping to some other realm. If it wants me. Damn it all to hell. I'm weak. Her mouth stays slightly parted as I unzip my trousers and grab my stiff cock. My boxers don't stand a chance as I pry my cock free, and I have to focus on restraint to keep my hand from automatically jerking me off to relief. Now don't get me wrong. I'm salivating to come on this pouty face of hers. Some other time, though. Why waste my seed on her face when I can have it in her mouth? You're going to swallow my cum, I tell her. You can use one hand. The other better be touching yourself. I need the image. I need to see how Alyssa touches herself, so I know how to touch her. It's the only way to learn about a new lover. Besides, I get off on telling her what to do, on exhibiting this fucking display of prowess and power. I'm one of those assholes and I don't have an ounce of shame admitting it. Yes, sir. Her little whisper is far from pitiful, and I hate to say it because it jerks me from my fantasy. Her hand knows exactly how to grip my shaft. While I'm sure many women are able to wing it and go by instinct, something tells me she's not a virgin to this. Her lips part further, her tongue touching the tip of my cock. I try to hold it together, but between her hand gripping my base and her tongue flicking against my tip, it's a fucking miracle I don't lose it right now. Probably because I'm distracted with thoughts I didn't think I'd have tonight. How's that? She asks. Her tone implores me to give her praise. Good. It is good. Almost too good. I don't have to tell her what to do or give her pointers. All day I had been thinking about that. I can't help it. I have to ask. But I'm still somewhat in a sane frame of mind to make sure I don't offend her. Last thing I want to do when a woman has her mouth on my cock is offend her. Women have teeth, and women know how to use teeth. You've done this before, haven't you, Alyssa? Her tongue slips off my shaft with a flick that has me reeling where I stand. Do you want me to lie? Never. Never lie to me, Alyssa. You won't be in trouble if you tell me the truth about your experiences before me. I force back a laugh. Or your lack thereof. I want to know. I also want her to trust me, like I'm expected to trust her. I have, sir. But you never had sex before me. Not intercourse, no. But you've blown other men. Only a couple, sir. Only a couple. A couple more than I previously believed. While I know this shouldn't irk me, it does. It's my own fault, really. The moment Alyssa told me she was a virgin, my stupid, sex-addled man-brain insisted she was a virgin to everything but maybe kissing. I never figured she might be familiar with oral sex. 
Does that also mean I wasn't the first man to go down on her and give her oral pleasure? It shouldn't bother me. But already I see my fantasies turning into wisps of unobtainable smoke. Then why don't you show me what you know? And to make me feel better, I'm going to push her a little farther than I had planned. It would be my pleasure, sir. Admit it. You've been aching to suck my cock. A smile curves around my tip as she teases my underside with her rolling tongue. That's all the answer I need. Alyssa Pendleton may not be a virgin to blowing a man, but she's still inexperienced with me. I'm not like other men. I fuck in ways they can't. I please women in ways they can't. My cock is big enough to have made me the envy in locker rooms, and to make women way more experienced than Alyssa grin in glee. I may not be porn star huge, but experience also tells me that most women don't want to accommodate porn star huge. So you better believe I know that I am the best of both worlds. I know I'm the biggest she's ever taken into her mouth, from the way she adjusts her tongue and cheeks. I've seen many women make this same face, but thus far, hers is the best. Tell me, which is the biggest power trip? A woman humming on your dick with that look of unbridled lust in her eye, or mounting a woman and giving her the ride of her life? Right now I'm settling on the former, because Alyssa makes sucking my dick look like the best thing in the world. It certainly feels like the best thing. My orgasm is quick to build. I've been carrying so much in my mind and loins all weekend that I did not doubt I'd spend myself almost right away. I will it to happen. Melissa's lucky that I tell her I'm going to purposefully come in her throat, and she better be prepared. I even go so far as to grab the back of her head and bring her mouth forward. I want to feel my tip in the back of her throat. I want her mouth sucking on me as she whimpers from the pressure, her gag struggling to take all of me. I want her moaning on my cock because my musk makes her wet as she strokes her thighs and grabs her tits through her dress. I want her looking into my eyes when I come. I want to see her immediate reaction. But I can't, because my eyes slam shut from the relief bursting through me. Her moans grow stronger. Even though my hand grabs her head in an effort to keep my cock deep in her throat, I still relent, giving her ample opportunity to pull away if she needs to. I want her swallowing my seed. I need to see her throat swallow it. But I'm also not a monster. She may not be a virgin to oral sex, but she still needs more experience, doesn't she? When she leans back, my half-erect cock slipping from her lips... I growl in pride from how much of my seed still lines her mouth. Alyssa sighs, her legs slowly opening. I don't think she realizes she's doing it. But I needed her to do it. I grab my cock and fist it back to full erection. Alyssa continues to whimper as I shove her back down, talking like a crazed man of sexual deviancy, as I tell her to stay still because I'm going to have my fucking way with the rest of her body. I don't even care that cum spills down her cheek and gets on my bed. Good. Her little coughs make her chest shake. I'm not about to rip this dress off her, but... Ah, fuck it. I reach beneath her back and unzip her. I pull the sleeves, the bust of her dress down, kissing her breasts the moment I see them popping out of her push-up bra. My mouth is all over her nipples, sucking, stimulating, pulling up her skirt like I did Friday night so I can get to her cunt and fuck it until I come again. This time, it will take longer. The second time always takes longer, which is exactly what I want. Once I have her down on her back... This dress ripped from her body, and her legs spread wide for me. I become someone else entirely. Someone I'm not entirely familiar with. I've wanted women before. God knows I've spent most of my post-pubescent life getting up to no good with every woman I fancied. 
Even the prudiest ones put out once I turn on my seduction. And let me tell you, there's nothing more satisfying than penetrating a total prude and watching the ecstasy take over her face. Almost nothing. Look in my eyes. Words. Words are terribly difficult to say as I spend so much thought and energy on pushing my cock into Alyssa's wet and tight cunt. You know you fucking want to. I blindfolded her with my tie last time. Now, I bind her wrists together, placing her hands above her head and taking full control. I don't need to take off my clothes. It's more important that I get inside her, feel her sweet pussy around my cock, and entice her tightening inner walls to work me until I come again. I'm hoping it will take at least a few minutes of thrusting. I want to enjoy it. I want her to enjoy it. Her eyes widen before glazing over, my cock now so deep within her, and meeting that tantalizing joy of little resistance that I'm not sure how much more of me she can take. Friday night, she had me at the hilt, my balls rubbing against her every time I thrust forward. I was in a more awkward position against my desk. Now I have her on my bed, the way humans have been fucking for thousands of years. My hand grabs her breasts. All I can think about is pounding her until she can't walk anymore. I think I'll do that. Oh my god. I haven't told her to keep quiet, and I'm not going to. I want her chomping on her bottom lip, moaning like my tainted princess while I plunder her depths and make her mine. All mine. I'm in a place no other man has been. The thrill gets me hard. Her body keeps me hard. I can't explain what goes through a man's head when he's fucking a woman who does to him what Alyssa does to me. My mind goes blank. A thousand thoughts explode in the back of my brain, but I don't retain them. I can't. I'm so focused on her outrageously perfect body that everything wipes from me. The only remnants I recall are based on the most primal, the most animalistic aspects of sex. Fuck her. Make her come. Make her make you come. Come in her. Make her feel you. Make her know you own her. You possess her. She's all yours. Yours, man. Yours. She wants your cock like she wants air to breathe. Look at her. You're giving her exactly what she wants. She can't live without you anymore. Some of these thoughts are borderline frightening. I push them aside. I untie her hands and tell her to brace herself against my shoulders because I'm going to thrust. She comes. Alyssa moans so loudly when I kiss her neck that I almost go deaf. Her hands squeeze my shoulders, nails digging through my shirt. Her slick G-spot reacts to the head of my cock by trying to get away from it, but I continue to thrust into her, making her take me, accept me. Be seduced and pleased by me. The strain in her voice says it's almost too overwhelming for her. For me, too. The way she grabs and milks my whole cock has us both reeling. I don't understand how much I want to come inside of her. My balls tighten up, preparing to unleash my seed for the second time tonight. I could stay right here and fill her up. Pump this hot, curvy body full of me like it spilled from her mouth earlier. I want to roll her over after we're done and watch it run down her leg while she gives me that look of, this is the first time it's ever happened, sir. What do I do now? Please. She's begging me. For what? Please, sir. I'll let her decide one thing tonight. If she doesn't give me the option I pine for, I'll know it's a sign. Where do you want it? She doesn't hesitate. My chest. Alyssa groans in that intoxicating mix of desire and relief when I pull out of her. I'm half tempted to shove my cock back into her, but I'm past the point of no return. I'm coming. Her hand strokes her clit as I come on her breasts. 
I did last time, too. At least I know how hot it is. Oh my god, she whimpers again. Julian. I wince. Every time she says my name like that, I'm reminded that this can easily become personal. Look at you, my dirty girl. Exhaustion plagues me. I may be young and virile, but two orgasms in the span of ten minutes will knock out any man. Covered in my cum. She licks the finger that was on her clit. Legs still spread wide open. Alyssa massages my seed into her skin, between her breasts and over her erect nipples. I don't even think she knows she's doing it. Those eyes are still glazed over and her head rolling back. I can't help myself. I plant my face between her legs and tongue her cunt until she has one more orgasm. Then we can shower. Suppose I have to take my clothes off for that. Chapter 3 Julian If that's what you want me to do, sir, Vern says with only the slightest crack in his otherwise professional voice, then I will make sure that it's done. I know I can always count on you. My tone, like his, changes. You must know that there is no negotiation here. I will warn him, not once, but twice. If he offers any of his personal judgment about what I've asked him to do, then he's out the damned door. Executive assistants are a dime a dozen. Granted, hiring a new one means training them to the level I expect, but one of those levels is don't fucking judge me, Vern. He won't. He values his job in this shit economy too much. God knows I pay him too much money and give him only the best benefits. Aren't he and his wife trying for a baby? <laughs> There's no way he'll jeopardize his job with me, even if I ask him to perform certain tasks. Like finding out Alyssa's class schedule and making sure she and I will have plenty of alone time in the future. I know how it looks. Not only have I hired her as my second assistant, a position I should have delegated long ago, because Vern is only one man taking on the world around here, but we're openly in a relationship. I don't pussyfoot. I won't give any personal details that aren't absolutely necessary, but I also won't withhold them if I deem them necessary. I'm sure Vern thinks there are better uses of his time. I don't think there are. Go ahead and give me the status report. I sit back in my chair, taking the pressure off my feet. I barked the new order at my first assistant the moment he walked in for our morning meeting. I might as well get everything else out of the way on this fine Tuesday morning. And what a fine morning it is, honestly. All I have to do is look out my large panel of windows and enjoy the bright spring sunlight spilling through the patchwork clouds. Since spending the night with Alyssa, my life has become quite sunny. Even my driver commented on it when we got in the back of my Audi this morning. Decided to take a normal car since we had to drop Alyssa off at her campus for her morning classes. Most of those parking lots can't accommodate limos, and I wasn't about to dump her on the end of the street. You know why? Because if I lust after her to the extent that I do, then what are other younger, baser, dumber men thinking when she walks by them? I should have sent a bodyguard to tail her on campus. You'll be happy to know, Vern begins, and I'm already taking bets whether or not I'll be happy to hear whatever he has to say. That I have finally managed to arrange a meeting this time next week between you and Mr. Ethan Cole. So happens that the meeting with Mr. Damon Monroe will be taking place the next day as well. Trust me, it wasn't easy to fit them both into your schedule, or you into their schedules. Vern sighs. He doesn't let me see the frazzled side of his job very often, but when I do, I know it's that bad. I don't doubt him when he says it was difficult. Cole and Monroe arguably have more money than I do. They have to have more money if they're the kingpins of the East Coast. Back-to-back -back meetings with the two men most interested in financing our next venture? God help us all if they cross paths in the hallway while one goes out and the other comes in. 
Their silent rivalry is a legendary topic of conversation in the cigar lounges and country clubs. One of them will be chosen over the other in the end, however. I'd rather not be around when that voicemail of mine goes through. I should make Preston do it. I'll make sure that their paths do not cross, sir. You do that. I lean forward again, elbows propped up on my desk. My large computer screen dings with new email alerts. I almost fall prey to distraction when I realize Vern isn't done yet. What else is there? Your brother called shortly before you reached the office. He asked me if you're available this Saturday for the wedding mixer. Well, I open my email browser. Am I available, Vern? I rearranged a few things that we had listed as not pertinent. You and your plus one are due at the Willamette Wine Club by one in the afternoon on Saturday. To think, Ted called you instead of me. The man knows me, that's for sure. That's fine. It will be a good opportunity for the family to meet Alyssa. Vern lingers in the doorway, his eyes widening and his hands clutching his tablet with enough strength to break it in half. There go his judgments again. I know what he's thinking. Me? Taking my latest squeeze as a Friday night to meet my brother, the person he's marrying, and some of our family? I've got balls. Yes, I'm well aware of them. But my family won't be shocked. They're used to me bringing whatever woman I'm seeing to these functions, because god damn me right now if they're not boring otherwise. Some men of my station prefer to keep their affairs under the radar, until an affair turns into a moving-in-with-me material. As long as I don't believe my date will embarrass me or my family, I bring them. I have a feeling Alyssa will not be much of a liability. Her willingness to keep me pleased has been noted. The way she submissively deferred to me last night, even after we went over the first half of our relationship terms, told me everything I need to know. If I tell her the rules, she'll follow them. I reward effort. In business and in love. Even if she screws up, as long as I believe she didn't do it out of malice, I won't be angry. That doesn't mean I'll go easy on her, however. Vern leaves me to my emails and thoughts of Alyssa. He was even nice enough to leave my door mostly closed so I have a little privacy. Where is my girlfriend now? What is she doing? What class is she in? All I know about her schooling is that she's after a degree in business. Otherwise, she wouldn't be working here. Perhaps I should ask her about her classes and gauge the effectiveness of her education. I'm not about to let my woman go to school and learn absolute bullshit. I would expect the same of my children as well. Is Alyssa wife material? Is she mother of my children material? I contemplate these thoughts with careful consideration at first. But as always, my thoughts quickly devolve into a sexual nature I can't escape. Last night had been heaven. Even with my disappointment, that I set myself up for, of course, I still had one of the most wonderful times I ever had with a woman. Something about Alyssa excites me beyond a single night. Playing a long game with introducing her to new avenues of sex and pleasure entices me to keep her around. Get to know her. Maybe I'll ask her about what she does during spring break the next time I'm balls deep in her. It should be now. I don't care if she got down on her knees, naked, and blew me again in the shower before curling up next to me in bed. I don't care if I woke up with another raging heart on and she didn't say a thing when I suggested she take care of it with her hand while gazing into my eyes. The sunlight on her pretty chestnut hair was like an impressionist image. I want to hire someone to paint her, so I never forget how lovely she looked when I came. I can't take it anymore. I text her. Still thinking about these past twelve hours, my sweet. Tell me, your thoughts are consumed with me. She responds immediately. I can't stop thinking about you either, Julian. I can't wait to get into the office this afternoon. 
As soon as you arrive, I'm fucking you. Do you understand? I want you to show up wet and ready for me. We're not going to waste time. You sure are virile, sir. Call me sir one more time, and you'll ensure some role-playing on top of your lay. All right. Sir. Confound it all, I'm hard. How am I supposed to focus on my morning emails and whatever meeting I have before lunch with images of Secretary Alyssa taking my cock on my desk again? I'm thinking of the sound she makes. The way her cunt accommodates my vigorous thrusts when someone storms through my door. You stupid jackass! No one knows how to kill a boner like Preston Bradley does. Problem, Preston? He stands before my desk with that petulant look he thinks makes him look serious, angry. <laughs> right. Preston is a genius in a lot of areas, namely making me money, but he's not a good actor. Your dick is going to get a sued, idiot. If this has to do with HR, I've already cleared it with them. So has she. Just tell me what the fuck you were thinking. It was a stupid bet we made when we were horny. You were not supposed to drag her into your public life. I'm not in the mood for his lectures, but I doubt I'll be able to stop him by simply ignoring him. What the hell is this about? You made your grievances clear yesterday. Did you see this? He holds his phone out to me. A text from our mutual PR advisor has sent him photos of Alyssa and me, taken by the press at last night's party. Isn't she gorgeous in that blue dress? I had to refrain myself from tearing apart so I could get to her body beneath. She looks even better on my arm. Her look is so luxurious, so effortlessly sophisticated that I could easily see the headlines announcing that she's my fiancé. And not that I'm thinking about that. Is there something embarrassing about these photos? I'd love to hear it. There are whole articles being written about you two right now. This is worse than when you dated that actress last year. You mean the one I dated because I knew the producer? It was genius, really. That beautiful, sensual woman tried to play hard to get until I revealed that card. She wanted into a big summer blockbuster movie? Well, I happen to have gone to college with such a producer. I could easily introduce them, but it would be easiest if she were my girlfriend. Before Alyssa... It was some of the best sex I ever had in my life. When a woman bargains like that, it's always better. Especially when she realizes how much she likes it. Cut the crap. Do you actually know anything about this girl? Besides what the background checks tell you? Besides what she chooses to share, that's all I need to know. Is she even clean? My cheeks flush red in anger. How fucking dare he? You didn't have these thoughts when you sent her my way Friday night? One time fling or some ass on the side is different from your public squeeze, Julian. How? If she has gonorrhea, I got it either way, right? Throw some chlamydia and syphilis on there too, buddy. I'm sure you've heard about the syphilis outbreak in Portland. This is absurd. Really? Because I know you ain't wrapping it up, pal. I'm sure you practice only the safest sex with your stripper friends. He throws his light brown brows at me. I'm not as cavalier with my health as you. Why does it matter? You're a hypocrite, Preston. Just because you screwed on a new head doesn't mean you get to chew me the hell out over this. Is she on birth control? Get the hell out. No. I need to be the cool one right now. What is this really about, Preston? I can't believe you're acting like this because I'm seeing someone new. He sighs. Sorry. Sorry. Preston hesitates before pulling a folded piece of paper from his back pocket. Someone shoved this beneath my office door sometime between last night and this morning. I don't know how true it is, but it made me think, you know? I snatched the paper from his hand. The writing was typed in standard font, standard size. 
From the timestamp in the bottom corner, I can tell it wasn't printed in our office. God only knows where it came from. Thought you might want to know that Alyssa Pendleton has a medical history that might harm both Mr. Marcus and the company's overall image. It starts with an H and ends with an S. Signed, a friend to the company. How charming and mature. I wad up the paper and shove it to the bottom of my trash can. This is bullshit and you know it. Even if it is Julian. You're reaching an age where you can't play like you do. And, he interrupts me, I don't care if you're the king of pulling out. You're playing Russian roulette with more than your own health. I don't want to admit that he's right. Admitting that means making changes, both for myself and for Alyssa. Chapter 4 Alyssa See you next time. I wave goodbye to my lunchtime study group, comprised of other young twenty-somethings who are convinced they're going to change the world. I used to think like that. Before my thoughts became consumed with Julian, anyway. One of my friends I don't get to spend enough time with waves back at me. Lunch tomorrow, girl, Kelly calls. My other friend, Selkie, yes, that's her real name, also waves and gestures that she'll join me for lunch. I barely have time to yell a confirmation before I hop on the bus that will take me to the offices of Bradley and Marcus. It doesn't help that I instantly forget them when I pull out my phone and see more texts from my boyfriend. I have something I need you to take care of when you arrive. Someone will meet you in the lobby. You've been excused from work. I'll catch you up to speed when you're released. Well, that wasn't sexy. Nothing about the next hour is sexy. I had visions of reaching the office, sashaying past the other interns as I head up to my new work position, and brazenly closing Julian's office door and getting fucked like he promised. What can I say? His cock hasn't been between my legs nearly enough yet. I walk into the lobby and instantly encounter a woman who looks like she's been waiting for me. She introduces herself, but I never remember her name. Next thing I know, we're in some doctor's office on the fourth floor. Can't say I've ever been here before. She says she's offering me a free physical on my boyfriend's dime. Sounds weird, but I go along with it. Maybe it's an insurance thing he wants out of the way. Except they want a blood test. And some other test I don't dare mention here. Suffice to say... I get Julian on the phone before anyone can bring any needles near me. What the fuck is this? My sweet... No. No, don't say that. What the fuck is this, Julian? They're testing me for shit. If it makes you feel better, I'm having the same tests done. That doesn't make me feel better. We'll discuss this later. I swear to God, Julian. If you think I'm consenting to an STD test like this... It was my mistake for not clearing it with you first. My apologies. You can't apologize your way out of this. Fuck you. You'll be grateful we did this. I can't believe you right now. There's more we need to discuss later. I need you up here for work in half an hour. If you absolutely do not want to consent to a test, that's your prerogative. But it will impede our relationship until it's done. He hangs up on me. He hangs up on me. I stand here, appalled, embarrassed, and on the verge of tears. What the fuck am I supposed to think? The man never once asked me about this before he stuck it in me. I thought the pulling out was a kink of his. Apparently, he's simply a fucking idiot. A rude idiot, because no, I don't care if refusing to take these tests means our relationship is put on hold. He should have thought of that before calling me up to his office Friday night. Honestly, I should have thought of it first, too. But I didn't. Because I was so over the moon that someone like Julian Marcus wanted me to become his girlfriend. 
I'm the real idiot here. Do I really expect a man like Mr. Marcus to think those things through? He's never had to. He has people reminding him that he can't throw money at everything like some viral outbreak. The fact I'm being thrown under the bus and treated like a diseased mutant doesn't help. But it does put things into perspective. And as I am about to find out, this perspective is only going to get more fucked up. I text Julian. No longer do I think of him as my boyfriend. He's my boss. A man who is essentially paying me with a job and sex to play a role for him. I will do it. If you promise to go over everything with me tonight. I think we've had a miscommunication about what we both want. Sounds great. I'll get us a reservation somewhere private. I'm not excited when I go up to see him. That excitement has died. Like the last of my naivete. Chapter 5 Alyssa Dinner with Julian has a completely different air from last night. The decor of the restaurant isn't as sultry. The food isn't as sumptuous. The only thing that remains as wonderful as the night before is how good Julian Marcus looks in his business suit. I avoided him for much of the afternoon, which was easy enough since he had meetings, and Vern trained me to use the executive office network. I had to avoid Julian, because every time I saw him, I suffered such a mixture of anger and lust that I barely recognized myself anymore. Suppose it was good for me, though. I needed to ground my mind, heart, and loins from the high they had experienced for the past few days. Julian Marcus is not my boyfriend. No matter what he says. He's got some twisted ideas about dating if he's presenting me with a nebulously legal contract stipulating the major points of our relationship. You heard me. He presents me with... A contract. At least nothing's been left out. The first half is an HR-approved job contract detailing my administrative role in Bradley and Marcus. Standard stuff, like my insurance, other benefits, rate of pay, and the general expectations of my job. And what I'm not allowed to do, both by law and the rules already laid out by Bradley and Marcus. This is something they could have gone over with me at the office. But the reason I'm seeing it now, in private, is because of the second half of our contract. Julian has gone out of his way to detail every aspect of our relationship. To be fair, he's offered many concessions so I can stay on top of my schoolwork, and, I guess, have my own personal life. Not that I had much of one to begin with. <laughs> Between school and work, I could only go out with friends maybe once every other week. My mornings, regardless of whether I wake up at his place or not, are mostly mine. When my job starts in the afternoon, however, I'm his. Almost literally. I keep my expression neutral and my anger checked as I read over the contract in silence. Julian gets up to use the bathroom, confer with the maitre d', order another bottle of wine, and shoot the breeze for five minutes with someone else in a nice suit. When he returns... I've read through most of the contract and consumed another glass of wine. I needed it. How many women have been in this position before? I honestly want to know. This is beyond some sugar baby, sugar daddy shit. I mean, he's only paying me for my actual job. I don't get some million dollar bonus for sticking it out. I do, however, get a lot of financial benefits like... Free trips in his private jet. Luxurious dinners like this one. A shopping budget so I can deck myself out in the finery of a billionaire's main squeeze. And he's silently agreed to help me cover my living expenses so I can save my paychecks. This means my rent, utilities, and even my grocery budget are covered. I'm no longer expected to take TriMet since I have access to his car and driver whenever I need to get around. Screw that. 
I'm still getting next month's pass. I don't know how long this is going to last. If there's anything this contract makes clear, it's that any relationship we have is purely about sex and his image. I get to be his public lover. And I suppose I have to play the part of a real girlfriend when we go to functions. But behind closed doors, I don't expect him to be a loving, caring boyfriend. He wants me for sex. Good sex, I hope. From some of the things written in weird jargon, he wants some kink, too. As long as I feel that I can get out of it if I'm uncomfortable, I'm fine with it. That's what my logical side tells me. But also I know that aside from relationships that lasted up to a few months when I was in high school in an undergrad, I don't have a lot of relationship experiences. What I think might be fine right now may very well turn into something that breaks my heart later on. But I can't think like that. Especially when Julian asks me if I made it to the end yet. I nod, flipping the contract shut. I haven't signed it yet, although I see his fresh signature at the bottom of the page. Compelling stuff, Mr. Marcus. If you have any issues with it, tell me now. I'd like to get it fixed up before we move on with our relationship, particularly by this weekend. I'm taking you to the wedding mixer on Saturday. I want to make sure we fall exactly in line with one another. No surprises. I can agree with that. I want Julian fully on my side if he's taking me to meet his folks. His folks, damn it. Even if it means a bit of a performance on my end. I can do that. This isn't about love. It's about constructing a mutually beneficial relationship between two consenting adults. My brother's wedding mixer is the next biggest event before his bachelor party next month. Then his actual wedding. After that, we can stop caring. I would laugh at how effortlessly he says that, but I don't want to be rude. I am fine with going to all of those if you want me to, sir. I do. That said, I am having Vern arrange for you to be fitted for appropriate clothing. My mother especially would expect any woman I date to only exhibit the most flawless tastes. My mother is an otherwise insufferable woman, so if we can please her on that front, it's worth the hassle. No idea what to say to that, either. Sounds like a blast. First impressions are everything in my family. I don't doubt that's where he learned it from. The only other thing I know about Julian's family dynamics is that he has an older brother named Edwin, who runs the Marcus family business. The pictures I briefly googled spoke of an older, more rugged version of Julian, who already has salt and pepper in his facial hair. And he's not even forty yet. If that's any indication of what Julian might look like several years from now, I may have to stick around. Alyssa, my sugar daddy says, with the slightest inflection, I want to apologize for earlier today. I suddenly realized that we hadn't cleared our medical histories and wanted it out of the way so we no longer had to worry. I choke on my wine. You know, I had been willing to forget about that for the rest of the evening, for the sake of propriety. I wasn't happy, no. I gleamed as much from our conversation. I didn't think it would bother you that much, though. Think of it from my position, Julian. This is it. This is one of my rare chances to put some of my own rules down and assert myself in front of this man who already has so much power over me. We've had sex twice. You never once asked me if I was even on birth control, which I am, by the way, or when I had most recently been tested. To be fair, I didn't ask that either. But can you imagine my shock when your on-call nurse hauls me into a doctor's office for a physical? I thought it was for my new insurance. But once I realized what I was really there for, Julian, I lost it. I haven't been so angry in a while. You're right. I apologize. I should have briefed you beforehand so you were prepared. No. What you should have done 
was ask me. I'm a big girl. I can make my own appointments with doctors I know and trust already. Sadly, I can't say that for some of my friends. You can't be cavalier like that and suddenly decide it's important. Or, if the brain in your head finally does outreason the brain in your dick, you talk to me. Treat me like a human being for fuck's sake, not like your breeding mare. I had no intentions for you to do- That was figurative. Sheesh, how dense is this guy at social interactions? I know that we have to be formal about a lot of things, but my health is not one of them. Like I said, Julian growls through gritted teeth. I am also willing to share my medical history for your own peace of mind. He clears his throat. Why the hell are you on birth control when you were a virgin anyway? Really? Really? A woman can only furrow her brows so far down her face. There are other reasons to take hormonal birth control than for baby prevention, Julian. Besides, I sit up in my seat, but no matter how much I puff myself up, I'm still too embarrassed to look him in the eye. It's always a good idea to be prepared. I had no way to know when I would lose my virginity. I wanted to be ready. He studies my posture, my mannerisms for a few seconds before clearing his throat again. I can hear his thoughts now. Here I thought I was so special being your first. Now I realize it could have been any big ignoramus. That's one less thing to worry about, I suppose. I'm not interested in beginning progeny before marriage. I snort. What an idiot, right? He could have still knocked me up. Men, I swear to God. This guy needs to go back to sixth grade sex ed. Just because he knows how to fuck doesn't mean shit about anything else, I guess. As it so happens, neither am I. And I'm not interested in getting married until I'm at least 30. That sounds good. He snorts back at me. That long, huh? Hold your tongue, sir. I'm only 21. I've got shit to do before having kids. Well? He relaxes back in his seat. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it. What does that mean? He can't be thinking long term with me. Certainly not nine more years long term, right? Or does he mean what would happen if he does knock me up somewhere along the line? I... I'm gonna have an anxiety attack thinking about that. There's still the matter of sex when we get back to having it. Julian finishes his drink. Which better be sooner rather than later. What about it? The terms in the contract were pretty explicit. This is absolutely a sexual relationship, and Julian Marcus expects me to be rather open about what we do and how often. While the wording was definitely in my favor and ability to say, fuck no, bro, was there, I'm under every assumption that his voracious sexual appetite will find me on the other end of his dick about as often as it was last night. This was the man who promised to fuck me in his office this afternoon, before suddenly remembering what safe sex was. At some point, I would prefer if our sexual relationship evolves above vanilla every single time. Told you he was kinky. One thing at a time, I implore. I'm not opposed, but I don't want to jump into it. Absolutely not. I agree. I don't want to think about it. Sure, fantasies are hot. Julian pinning my wrists down and talking dirty while he pounds my pussy sets me on fire. Whips and chains and paddles and latex are a different level, though. Maybe I'll like it. Maybe I'll find it abhorrent. Either way, I'd rather it not be sprung on me. It's definitely not happening tonight. Nothing is happening tonight. We have a mutual agreement. No sex until everything comes back clear. 
Julian takes me home, and I'm left with my homework. And erotic thoughts about him. I'm not ashamed to say that I go to bed with my other boyfriend. I'm sure you remember him. The guy I was seeing the moment Julian first called me and told me to get my ass to his office Friday night. Suffice it to say, the real thing is that much better. Fuck my life. Chapter 6. Julian I hate admitting that I'm wrong. So I don't. Not unless I think it will truly elevate my relationship with someone else, and that doesn't happen often. When I apologized to Alyssa for my actions on Tuesday, I expected that to mean we were fine, we could move on, and we could get back to what we had previously agreed to. Apparently, I'm an idiot. I'm not used to people, especially women, laying into me like that. The only person to really do that is my mother, and nothing she ever had to say was worth remembering. Certainly not worth her flushed cheeks and the spittle between her teeth. But when Alyssa looked at me like that at dinner, I realized that I had fucked up more than I had previously thought. I thought she would commend my foresight, my ability to look after us. What else have I been doing besides offering sexual pleasure, financial security, and all the protections I can afford? If one of those protections is ensuring our health, then it's the right thing to do, yes? People are complicated, and that fact pisses me off. So, Alyssa is angry with me. Still. She plays it off at work, but her texts to me are terse and completely devoid of the flirtatious nature she once displayed. Damn it. I want that Alyssa back. None of this is worth it unless she's genuinely attracted to me. What do I have to do to get her back? She doesn't respond to my romantic advances, like flowers on her desk or expensive chocolates waiting for her at her apartment. She acts like she's running a work errand when she heads to the seamstress for her dress fitting. When I coyly text late at night that it might be nice to share photos to tie us over, she responds with a selfie of her without makeup and in her PJs. No, there is no cleavage. She knew what I meant, too. Well, I won't say the picture she does send me goes unappreciated, because, as I've said before, Alyssa Pendleton is an exceptionally attractive woman, regardless of what others may say. This is a huge message that she's not getting any sexual satisfaction out of this. At first, the only blame I take is in my assumed lack of sexual prowess. Then I realize that's ridiculous. She was more than satisfied both times we hooked up. It's not until I'm halfway through a video call Thursday afternoon that it hits me. It's my fault because I offended her so badly. Exactly how much does a man have to apologize and explain himself? I'm not even excited when my recent test results are delivered on my desk early Friday morning when Alyssa is still in class. Theoretically, she will receive hers when she arrives later. The only relief I feel is that immediate satisfaction that everything is exactly what I expected in the health department. I should be ecstatic. This forced celibacy I suggested we follow could end tonight. When I bring this up to her at the end of the day, Alyssa implies that we should wait until tomorrow, after the mixer. We have an early day tomorrow, sir, she says with robotic diction. We should get to bed early. If you have your way, neither of us will get to bed early. That sounds flirtatious on paper, but with her body language so closed off and her tone clipped, I know it's anything but. She's treating this like a business deal, which normally I would be all for. But even the best business dealings have an element of humanity to them. I'm starting to rethink this arrangement. As I settle into my penthouse for the night... I decide that tomorrow night is my chance to seduce her again. It will be over a week since I first seduced her. If it was that easy a week ago, it should be a piece of cake now. 
I'll have to step up my game, however. No more vanilla. I'll show her a side of myself that will suck her in and keep her here. Chapter 7 Elisa I shouldn't be this nervous meeting Julian's family. It's not that serious, right? I mean, the relationship between him and me. I'm not his real girlfriend. I'm arm candy that's meant to blend into the background and gives him someone to sit next to. So why am I sitting in the back of his Audi, shaking from head to toe as we cruise down I-5 to wine country? Wish I could blame the weather, but it's actually sunny and warm today. I'm wearing a sweater over my springtime baby pink dress, so I can't blame the A.C. making me shake. I don't even pay attention to Julian, who is likewise ignoring me in favor of his tablet. Stocks from around the world, his PR advisor wanting more information about our relationship, and emails that can't wait until later. I'm sure I could rub his thigh and get his attention focused back on me, but do I want to? We've reached an impasse again. Our push and pull is mostly push right now. Julian Marcus is smoking hot and continues to plague my nighttime fantasies. But the real-life man gives me a bigger headache than he might be worth. I'll give him one more shot. I may have signed his stupid contract, but I made sure a clause was put in so that I could exit the whole thing whenever I wanted. It should have bothered me that he didn't put up more of a fight over that. For pretense, of course. Come on, Julian. Show me that you give a flying fuck about me. Me. Not just the sex and wonderful experiences I might offer you. Me. The woman behind the vagina, you know? Whatever. I can deal with Julian hilariously enough. What I might not be able to deal with is already meeting his parents. But it's one of those things that further proves we're not a real couple, you know? No man would take his real girlfriend to meet the family one week after meeting. I'm as good as an escort. In fact, I've heard a number of murmurs around the office that that's exactly what he did before. Escorts. Can you believe it? I can. Now. The Willamette Wine Club is one of the most exclusive wine venues in Oregon, despite the simple name. It's nestled deep in the Willamette Wine Country, where even on the drizzliest day, everything is lush, green, and rolling in agricultural prospects. Farmers have been using this fertile valley to sell sustenance to the world since it was settled thousands of years ago. The wine ain't that bad, either. This particular clubhouse is far away from the freeway, and even from a single highway cutting to the coast. Apple trees line the private road, leading up to a Mediterranean mansion, overlooking some of the most pristine parts of the Willamette Valley I've ever seen. Rows of expensive sports cars and safe black vehicles like Julian's Audi have already beaten us to the party. Nevertheless, an elderly valet greets us. I give him a little wave as we drive on. He nods his head towards me, and that's the last I see of him. Did you read those dossiers I gave you? Julian asks. I show him the bottom of my tote bag, which I'll leave in the back of his car. I've got a change of clothes in there, too, because I know I'm staying the night at his place. Wish it made me even a little excited. A part of me almost dreads it right now. Not as much as I dread meeting his family, though. The dossiers were full of information about his immediate family. His mother was the main one Julian wanted me to learn about, since, apparently, she's the one making most of the decisions about the family behind the scenes. His father is retired and doing whatever the hell he wants around the world. His older brother, Edwin, although I'm told we call him Ted, now runs the family company. But his mother? Wow. Serena Marcus 
has her hand in almost every pot up and down the coast. While her husband does whatever he pleases with his money in retirement, Julian's mother co-runs a plethora of ladies' organizations in the Pacific Northwest, the kind that has had to rebrand themselves over the past half a century due to certain images no longer standing in society. I knew everything I needed to know about Serena Marcus when I saw she was the main dissenter regarding Asian women joining one of her more prestigious housewife groups back in the 80s. Julian's handwritten notes to me suggest that I don't say anything to his mother other than my name. With any luck, she won't acknowledge my existence while we're there. I know what that means. She'll see me as her youngest son's latest hussy who shouldn't even exist. Well, at least I know it's coming. Did I tell you I brought a gift for Ted and Jordan? I asked Julian as we ascend the front steps to the club. The gift is at the bottom of my bag. I read on an etiquette website that you're supposed to give the engaged couple a gift when you first formally meet them. Since this is a wedding mixer... I'm sure they'll love it. They're rather easy to please. Julian wraps his arm around me the moment we enter the wide-open foyer of the main mansion. A woman in a white uniform offers to take his jacket and my sweater. Julian refrains. I shrug out of my sweater and hand it over. Chill claims my shoulders. Julian rubs my left one for me, yet before I can appreciate the somewhat romantic gesture, he steps forward and flags down a man popping out of a nearby room. Jules! I recognize Ted's voice, even though I've never heard it before. How can anyone mistake Ted Marcus for someone else? The man oozes more charm than my own boss. Granted, I wouldn't call Julian charming, per se, but when compared to his big brother, all I can think is, sheesh, someone got all the real genes. Julian religiously shaves and combs his hair naturally every morning. Ted, on the other hand, keeps a healthy amount of perfectly plucked fuzz on his face. His richly black hair is full of products that keep it in place, and the scent alone screams that he's worth a billion bucks and more. If you get to know him, I'm not ashamed to admit that I have a smile on my face the moment Ted has reached us, hand extended to his brother. Julian keeps his expression pleasant as he exchanges greetings with his big brother. Do I sense a little animosity? Who is this striking woman, Jules? Pearly white teeth poke out from Ted's lips when he speaks to me. Bright blue eyes look me up and down, a mixture of critical and overflowing with admiration. Do introduce me. She looks chomping at the bit to know your big brother. He leans in towards me. I'm bigger in every sense of the word, darling. I blush because I can't even imagine. This is Alyssa Pendleton, my new girlfriend. Julian puts his hand on the small of my back. At first, I think he intends to push me forward, but his fingers tug on my dress, keeping me close to his side. We became official only earlier this week, so go easy on her. She's not used to the circus we perform here. Oh, I'm sure she must be a smart and bright young woman to convince you to get official jewels. Ted finally releases my hand. If I thought his brother's skin was soft. He doesn't bother with the women. He's only interested in bedding and nothing more. I'm blushing again. This time, Julian intervenes. Where's Jordan? I'm sure Alyssa would love to get more introductions going. Jordan will be here shortly. I'm so invested in this exchange that not even I miss the vexing flash on Ted's chiseled face. Held up at the airfield because of the weather back home. They live in California, Julian tells me. Much sunnier than the crisp gray fog here in Oregon. I keep telling this man to move to L.A., but he won't have it. At least Seattle, man. Portland's fine. Centrally located. And full of beautiful women, it seems. Forgive my brother. He's an atrocious flirt. Pleasure to meet you, I finally get to say. 
Julian talks about you all the time. You mean rants about me? Because that's the version I'd believe. Ted says that with mirth in his voice, but Julian tenses next to me. What kind of relationship do these brothers have, exactly? All I know is that Ted is six years older than Julian. I suppose that sort of age difference could be challenging, particularly in their kind of family. I brought you and your fiancé a gift. I pull out the small gift bag from the bottom of my bag, but Ted gestures for me to keep it for now. Jordan loves presents. Let's wait so we can open it together. Thank you, by the way. Before an awkward silence can settle over us, Julian says, Are mother and father here? Dad's flirting with half the wait staff, and mother's already half drunk on mimosas. Just another day in the Marcus clan. Welcome to the fold, Alyssa. Must not be too terrible if you've snagged someone to marry. Ted does a double take in my direction before completely turning away. Ah, I like her jewels. He points to us on his way down the hall. A billion dollars is excellent lubrication against the in-laws, sweet Alyssa. Julian and I continue to stand in the middle of the welcoming hall while uniformed staff come and go around us. So that's my brother. Mind that he doesn't try to seduce you? That would void our agreement for exclusivity and would require me punching him in the fucking jaw again. Excuse me? Julian doesn't answer me. He walks ahead and I follow again. Doesn't... seduce me? Punch him in the jaw? Again? We find the rest of the attendees, including the wedding party and some of the couple's closest friends, enjoying a round of billiards in a bright, sunny room complete with an open bar. A woman approaches with a tray covered in skinny champagne glasses. Can I interest you, ma'am? She asks. You might want to have one, Julian urges. I'm going to need something stronger. Scotch, please. Yes, sir. As soon as I have a glass of champagne, the server takes the request for a scotch to the bartender on duty. A woman's sharp and penetrating voice slices through the room before anyone has the chance to come up and introduce themselves to me. Julian, is that you? Come over here. Sighing, my boyfriend silently informs me that the woman is his mother. I can't see Serena Marcus through the group of people drinking champagne and playing billiards, but her voice alone, like Ted's, is instantly recognizable. Unlike Ted, she is far from happy. Stay here, Julian says. I'll get you for introductions as soon as I have a quick talk with my mother. He's gone before I have the chance to ask any questions. I'm sensing a pattern here today. My nerves make me drink the champagne faster than I usually would. A few people give me curious glances, but nobody approaches me or offers introductions. Perhaps that's how things work at this level of society. After all, I'm a nobody, right? I came here on Julian's arm, but apparently that doesn't bring any kind of prestige with it. I shouldn't be surprised. Everything I hear about Julian Marcus suggests that he unapologetically gets around with any number of women that please him. I'm only the latest in a long string of one-time dates. People don't want to get to know me because what's the point? I'll probably be gone this time next week and they'll never see my face again. I finish my champagne. It's already going through me. Excuse me. I say to the server with Julian Scotch. Where's the ladies' room? Julian told me to stay here, but fuck it. He's busy smoothing things over with some croaking gargoyle on the other side of the room. Nobody will care if I sneak out and use the bathroom, especially since it's only down the hall. I take my time. The ladies' room is cozy and smells nice, so I'm not in a huge hurry to get out even after I finish my business. Since I'm the only one in here, I spend twice as long washing my hands, rubbing the flower-shaped soaps over my palms, and smiling when I smell lavender and rose on my skin. It reminds me of what I bought for Ted and Jordan. 
I still don't have a lot of money, so I couldn't spring for the kind of stuff one would normally get a rich couple. Whatever that is. I figure everyone loves bath stuff, right? So I bought a couple of things from one of my favorite bath and body stores and hoped they would appreciate it. A hint of the romantic, while also appealing to a bride who probably likes to be pampered. And then again, maybe I shouldn't have brought a gift. Julian hadn't said anything about it. Damn it. I'm so stupid. Can you blame me? I am stressing out here. Serena probably wishes I were dead, and I haven't even met her yet, and Julian acts like his big brother is going to cart me off in front of his bride. What kind of woman is Jordan, anyway? Julian hasn't told me anything about her, other than her family is from California. Would it be too far-fetched to think that she and I could be friends? Comrades in this crazy world we're wrapped up in. Ah, oh, hell. She's rich like the rest of them. I'm sure that family in California is loaded as hell. We don't have anything in common at all. Sigh. I finally step back out before Julian can ring my phone demanding to know where I am. The door swings into the hallway due to some terrible design flaw, I'm sure. Naturally, I hit someone. Oh my god, I'm so sorry. I slam the bathroom door shut. Are you okay? It's a man I have yet to see. He's taken two wild steps back, disoriented and brushing something off his black three-piece suit. Fine, fine, he says in a chipper tone. Thank you for the free nose job, though. You'll save me a bit of money. I've smacked this guy with a bathroom door, and I'm laughing. You're not hurt, are you? Speaking of his nose, he keeps rubbing it. His shaggy, yet delightfully full and silky hair bouncing with every movement. I cock my head to the side in case I can see blood coming from his nose. Leave it to me to debilitate a member of the wedding party or someone's cousin. I'm fine. A hearty sniff has the young man in front of me recomposing himself. I don't believe you and I have met before, young miss. And I know everyone here. I laugh again. Is it nerves? Or is this guy genuinely funny? I'm Alyssa. I came here with Julian. Surprise tickles his face. That's so. You and Julian. Well, how about that? Good to see he has excellent taste in women. Much better than that brother of his can say. Oh, well then. Excuse me. I really must be getting back to the party. If you're with Julian, then I'm sure you're off to meet Mrs. Marcus. Good luck, hon. I don't think much more of the man as I steal back into the ballroom and find Julian looking for me. Relief consumes him the moment he approaches and takes my hand. My hear Jordan's finally arrived. Let me introduce you to the couple before making you face my mother. I square my shoulders. All right. Sorry for taking so long in the bathroom. I check to make sure I still have my bag and the present inside it. Yep, still there. Ted. Julian calls to his brother, whose back is turned while looking out the window. Let Alyssa meet Jordan before you two are caught up in the party. Ted's face lights up. But it's not because of me. It's because of the person approaching from behind, whose hand grazes mine on his way by. Allow me to introduce you to my fiancé, Jordan. Ted says with excitement in his guttural voice. I dive into my bag and pull out my gift. Julian groans beside me once he realizes what it is. Jordan, this is Julian's new honey. What do you think? Should we invite her for tea and crumpets while we're in Portland? Pleasure to finally meet. I hold my gift out to Jordan. The man I smacked with the bathroom door not five minutes ago. You. Oh my fucking god, girl, be cool. Jordan and Ted exchange married people glances. 
Thanks, Jules, Ted says to his brother. I see you yet again. Haven't told one of your girlfriends that I'm gay. Chapter 8 Julian I honestly didn't think it was pertinent. It's 2017, isn't it? But apparently, I left out some crucial information somewhere. I was so caught up in making sure Alyssa knew about my mother's unflattering personality quirks that I completely overlooked that Jordan is a man. And maybe my girlfriend might like to know that. Especially if she planned on bringing a gift, which I never told her to do. I brought you a present, Alyssa says through gritted teeth. The grit is for me, not for them. My fault, is it? Even Ted is giving me one of his classic big brother looks that says, he's going to womp my ass as soon as mother and father are looking in the other direction. Granted, I made stupid assumptions. She's embarrassed. So embarrassed that she goes beat red as Jordan takes the small gift bag of frivolous bathing items. Doesn't everyone love these things? Jordan takes a whiff. Ted's shoulders ease in tension. Thank you so much, Alyssa. We'll make sure it doesn't go unappreciated. Look over there, isn't that Carla Langley? We should say hi. Ted gently nudges his fiance in the direction of a young socialite dressed to kill in this Oregonian fog. Isn't she cold in that sleeveless sundress? Even Alyssa had the foresight to wear a sweater in this drafty place. We'll catch up with you two later. My brother winks at my girlfriend. Thank you for the gift. The happy couple moves on, leaving Alyssa and me to stand here, appalled with ourselves. You didn't say... Sorry. Let me tell you what happens when your big, masculine brother, who is smarter than Harvard and better looking than a supermodel, comes home and says, Mom and Dad, I'm a queer nothing. Nothing happens. We don't talk about it. We're not supposed to talk about it. When I was a kid, we didn't talk about homosexuality because it was verboten. My mother called it a stain on good names, but men can't help themselves. Women, though, they should know better. These days, when gay marriage isn't only legal but celebrated by even the most well-to-do families— we don't talk about it because it's unbecoming for other reasons. Political correctness tells us not to make a big deal about it, especially if your mother is someone who fired a lady-in-waiting for having a short haircut and refusing to wear a skirt. Ah, uh, yes. Imagine how my mother took the news of Ted's coming out a few years ago. I had known much longer, of course. It's always been normal, more or less. Dad had girlfriends when I was growing up, but he preferred to spend his free time with other guys, and had a stash of contraband in his room that I unfortunately came across one day when I was looking for shit to get back at him with. As I recall, he called me a pussy-whipped shithead in front of my then-girlfriend. You don't do that to a thirteen-year-old without expecting to sneak into your room while you're out at a party. I had gone in there to look for girly underwear, marijuana, anything like that. Instead, I found gay magazines. Not even porn. Political and lifestyle magazines for the discerning and young gay male. I don't know exactly how my brother identifies anymore. Gay, bisexual, one of those. His last girlfriend was two years ago, and after they broke up, he told me that he wasn't interesting in marrying a woman, anyway. That'll be for you, Jules. You'll do the whole getting married and procreating thing. Me? I think I'll find a cute fella who can keep up with me in the business world. What do you think? Told him he should stay out of my love life. He got with Jordan shortly after the girlfriend. This past Christmas, they announced their engagement, with the added bonus of a surrogate baby shortly to follow. They had received word of the surrogate's pregnancy and decided to tell us before the public New Year's announcement. So my brother is getting married and having a baby. It's probably his, too, since 
That would be the only way my family would recognize it as a legitimate heir. It's not unusual for your big brother to do all that before you have the chance, right? Ted really does get everything. The business, the properties, besides what I've lobbied for in my father's will, the marriage, and the family. He may not be a hundred percent traditional, but he gets it nonetheless. Our age difference makes me feel like I have to hustle to achieve things I'm not even sure I want. Oh, I want a hot business and properties. I'm still not sold on the marriage and family quite yet, though. Like I've mentioned before, my ideal situation would be finding a socially acceptable woman with good genes and her own money willing to have an arrangement with me. One that is beneficial to the both of us, of course. Again, I'm sorry. For some reason, I thought you already knew. Alyssa shakes her head. It didn't show up when I googled his name. Of course it hadn't. My mother pays SEO experts good money to keep that stuff off the front pages. Not that I think Ted knows that. My brother is in a homosexual relationship. They're having the biggest gay wedding of the spring around here. That's all you need to know. Does not help that Jordan is a unisex name these days. Is it? Alyssa rolls her eyes. Yes, Julian. I mean, I've had more than one person ask me if I'm a lesbian now because they keep misreading your name as Julia in the news. I should hope you're not a lesbian, sweetheart. That would be bad news for me. Hmm. Sounds like I'd fit right in with your family. Alyssa doesn't know it, but she's spoken of the devil. It's like my mother heard a joke that I might be dating a lesbian and decided she can't take it anymore. Julian! She's on my other side before I even know she's there. Introduce me! I bristle. My mother is one of the only people in the world who can make me bristle, but it's not because I'm afraid of her or anything she might do. It's because the jokes about her being a specter, a wraith, a damned demon are sometimes too true to make fun of. She'll magically appear in a wisp of smoke, her long, wrinkled fingers threatening to poke your eyes out if you don't choke on her perfume first. Even before she wrinkled, she was like this. My childhood was not a very maternal one. On the other hand, if I ever stay someplace genuinely haunted, I would be difficult to scare out of the house. I'd probably assume it was my mother come to annoy me. Mother. I put a protective hand on my girlfriend's back as I turn her around for presentation. I'm gladder than ever to ask her to wear something as conservative as this simple dress. The last thing I need my mother thinking is that Alyssa is a floozy. Although I don't doubt she'll call her that. This is my girlfriend, Alyssa Pendleton. She looks Alyssa up and down with her beady blue eyes. The only reason I know Ted and I are biologically related to her and not one of my father's many mistresses is because the three of us have the same exact eye color. I don't even know how you had two kids with her father, I once said a few years ago. To that, my father replied, She used to be that chilling kind of beautiful, you know. Element of danger that she'd rip your dick off halfway through making love to you. Now she's just chilling. She must be, for Alyssa shivers beneath my touch. I know it's not because of my fingertips stroking her soft skin beneath her dress. Melissa, this is my mother, Serena Marcus. Pleasure to meet you, Mrs. Marcus. Melissa extends her hand. My mother keeps one of hers beneath the crook of her arm, while the other, holding her most recent mimosa, which she continues to drink while drilling holes with her eyes. At least Alyssa is smart enough to keep her introduction short and sweet. Even if she did use the word pleasure, and that's one of my mother's least favorite words. All mine, I'm sure. My mother spits into her mimosa glass. What was your name? Alice... Alicia, Melissa? Alyssa, I supplement. Trust me, my mother doesn't want to hear my girlfriend speak. Right. How 1995.
Melissa keeps her lips pursed, but otherwise locked into a polite smile. You have a beautiful family, Mrs. Marcus. I suppose I should eventually tell Alyssa that my mother prefers the title Lady Marcus. But she'll learn in due time. Yes, beautiful and rich. Enjoy it while my son fancies you, girl. My mother doesn't say anything as she floats away in her long skirt. She has nothing else to say to us, I'm sure. Jeez, Alyssa mutters once we're alone again. This is a stressful party. Suppose I should tell her that this is one of the easiest parties I've ever been to with my family? Last time I brought a girlfriend to a function like this, she ran to my car crying because my mother asked how many abortions she already had. The truly cruel thing? My mother doesn't usually say that sort of thing to people she's met. Not unless she's done a lot of background research. My girlfriend at the time had a miscarriage before meeting me, so I do not doubt my mother preyed upon that. I don't want to know what she'll pick apart regarding Alyssa. For the most part, Serena Marcus is harmless. Verbally cruel, but... Uh, never mind. Tell you what, lovely. I'm not good at lathering on the charm when we're in public like this, but I'll force it for Alyssa's sake. I don't want her more uptight than she already is for our date tonight. I have plans for her, all right. Plans to make her like me again. There's no point to a relationship like this if she doesn't like me. She shows me a wan smile. All right. How much longer do we have to be here? She's been embarrassed twice this afternoon. Both times because of me. I'll have to really make it up to her tonight. Chapter 9 Julian We survive the party for another hour. I introduce Alyssa to my father, who is much more amiable than my mother and instantly takes a liking to her. Jordan and Ted insist on sitting down with us to go over last-minute wedding details and to discuss the dual bachelor party they'll be having in Tokyo in a few weeks. Tokyo, because that's where they met. Also, it has a rather infamous red light district that they probably met at while in town for a conference. I've already promised to go, although I can't stand Tokyo, and I'm not sure how much fun I can have at a gay bachelor party. But I'll go for my brother's sake. I'm also his best man, which means, technically, it's my job to make the arrangements. Jordan's best man has taken care of it, though. I only need to get on the family plane and enjoy my weekend. By the time Alyssa and I leave the party, she's teasing me about a gay bachelor party. Okay, but what if you meet my male equal there and suddenly you don't want me in the picture anymore? Good lord, it's a good thing I know she's joking because I can't believe it otherwise. I have never been interested in other men like that, and I somehow doubt I ever will be. My brother got all of that, and he can have it. We're in the back of my car heading back to Portland. We're going straight to my penthouse. I'm texting orders to Vern and a few services so my plans for tonight can go off without a hitch. That's not going to happen, I assure her. How do I know that? I put my phone down and kiss her. Her rigid posture gradually goes lax beneath my kiss. Because I don't know how I could possibly kiss anyone else when I have you by my side. It works. She grins, flattered. I tell my driver to go the speed limit so we can get home faster. One kiss has me slobbering like a teenager on his first date. I don't know why Alyssa has this damned effect on me, but damn it, she does. Because she's new. Because she's exciting. That's what I tell myself as we enter the Portland city limits, and my cock grows hard between my legs. I drape my coat across my lap to hide my erection from Alyssa. I don't want her thinking about sex quite yet. Perhaps if she were in a better mood. Right now, though, I need to calm my dick down and focus on her feelings. Of all the F-words in the world, that one has to be my least favorite. 
You can probably guess which one's my favorite. How does dinner on my balcony sound? I ask on our way up in my private elevator. I've already had it arranged for us when we get there, but we can move it inside if we want. Might be cold outside, Alyssa says. I press her against the elevator wall, my body overpowering hers, making her mouth open and her eyes glaze over. Ah, yes. She certainly still wants me, doesn't she? Easy to make a man feel powerful that way. I'll keep you warm, Lissa. I meant to say, uh, oh, Lissa, of course, but my mouth dropped the fucking A-ball and now I sound like an idiot. Yet her eyes flutter in my direction, her hands clinging to my suit jacket. Lissa? It's my name for you, I've decided. Two syllables are more efficient than one. Three. Excuse me? You mean two are more efficient than three? Every time she grins, I seize up. Not physically, obviously, but something in my chest stops working properly, and I have to focus on my own body to feel normal again. That's time and attention taking me away from my sweet girlfriend. Who isn't so sweet, if you know what I mean? Now that we're alone, now that we're in my place, all I can think about is having sex with her. But I restrain myself. I mind over matter my biology screaming at me to take her into the bedroom like I did Monday night. I want my cock inside of her. Now. We must wait, though. First, dinner. She was right. It's considerably colder now that the sun is setting, but... The view over the river is stunning enough to make it worth it. Lights come on in the surrounding residential sky rises. Pleasure boats come to the docks down in the water. Planes litter the sky, taking off and landing at the International Airport. The sun sets behind us, but we still have a gallant view of snowy Mount Hood that has Alyssa snapping a thousand pictures on her phone. Can we take a selfie? She asks. Uh, what? She scoots her chair closer to mine. Her phone hovers above us, the camera flipped to the mirror setting. Or so I thought it was until now. The only time I set my phone to that is when I need an appearance check before meeting someone. I didn't know it was for taking selfies. I suppose. You're not posting it online, are you? I don't have to. I can keep it on my phone. All right. My mug doesn't need to be plastered all over her Instabooks and Facegrams, or whatever they're called. In my venture capitalist days, I founded a few social media websites and apps, only to watch them blow up or be acquired by some of my competitors. Since then, I don't bother. Smile. Alyssa's smile blooms across her visage like a sunny spring day. I twitch the corners of my mouth, and that's the best she's getting out of me. I said, smile, Julian. I am smiling. Oh, well. Click. A still of us swipes across the phone screen. Good enough. She pulls her phone down and punches buttons until that unflattering picture of us is her background photo. There. Now we're a real couple. I take my chances with those words in my ears. Does that mean you've forgiven me for this week's mishap. Her smile disappears. Chills claim her shoulders, and I'm there, wrapping my arm around her and nuzzling my nose against her temple. Ah, oh, her hair smells of jasmine and other such flowers. Beneath the shampoo and perfume, I get a whiff of her natural scent. The one that consumes me during sex, whether my face or my cock is between her legs. We've only done it twice. I need the third time, like I need air. I've learned to accept that there are some things about you I'll have to get used to, Julian. We move inside where the cold breeze won't bother us. I don't turn on any more lights, even though we're standing by the sliding glass door. What does that mean? You were being practical. In a most offensive way, but practical... Meeting your family today showed me that you were raised to think about these things differently. You've apologized. 
but you still haven't quite forgiven me. Oh, I've forgiven you, sir. I simply haven't forgotten yet. I pull her into my arms, kissing her hard. What do I have to do to make you forget, Lissa? Although she starts to respond to my kisses, it's not with gumption. This is a good start, though, isn't it? I've realized some things, too. I pull away, the taste of her lips still on mine. Namely, that there is no point to this relationship if we're not into it. If you don't want me as much as I want you, I can let you go, Lissa. What? Is that panic in her voice? Well, that wasn't what I wanted. I don't mind taking it. You heard me. If you're too angry at me or treating this like a work contract so you can take advantage of the situation, then I'm not interested. I want you to desire me as much as I lust for you. You make it sound like those things are different. Aren't they, though? A woman desires with her heart and loins, doesn't she? Men like me? It's pure lust, up and down. What our cocks want, we go after. I've never been insulted by the insinuation that men have two brains. I'm simply good at telling the other one to shut up when pertinent. It's not pertinent right now. I'll be as accommodating as you want me to be, Lissa. My hand curls around her wrist. She looks away from me, chomping on that lip like she does every time she's wrestling with her thoughts. Because I want you in my life. Don't you get that? I'm jumping through these hoops. I'm taking you to meet my parents. I'm doing everything as legally as possible because I don't want any obstructions between us. I want you to want me as unabashedly as I yearn for you. You've only known me like that for a week. I'm overwhelming her, so I back off. Maybe a week is all I need. I lower my voice. I have something I want to show you in the bedroom. She doesn't crack a joke as she follows me into the other room. As soon as I open the door to my private suite, I'm pleased to find everything I ordered already out. Jul Julian? Alyssa stands beside me, gobsmacked. I can't blame her. Even though I ordered everything in black, it's still a lot to take in. I step forward. On the far end of my bed is a white, lacy negligee in Alyssa's size. The moment my personal shopper sent me the picture, I knew I had to have it for my girlfriend. Let's start with you putting this on. I point to it, ignoring the tools and implements neatly lined up on my bed. We'll go from there. Holy shit. Julian, this is... You don't have to do anything you don't want to do. We don't have to do anything too intense tonight. I want to introduce you to some flavors beyond sweet vanilla. Don't get me wrong. Vanilla ice cream is my favorite of all the flavors. And there's something to be said for going with the old standard and knowing exactly what you'll get. I don't always want vanilla, though. Sometimes I want dark chocolate. Sometimes I want tarty strawberry. Sometimes I want nuts and candy. And sometimes I want sticky syrup that gives me a rush I never asked for. I want you to see everything we have at our disposal. You're in charge of tonight's choreography. I clear my throat. Except for the lingerie. Change into it. Now. She drops her purse with a start. In front of you or in the bathroom? I face her. Strip for me. My chair by my desk calls to me, so I go to it sitting down with a satisfied sigh. Seduce me, Alyssa, and I'll seduce you right back. Um... Her eyes continue to linger on some of the smaller materials. When she glances at the ebony nipple clamps, she makes a sour face. Guess we're not using those tonight. I knew you wanted to do some kinky stuff, sir, but... Well, that's a good start. I say with a chuckle. What? Calling me sir. 
Every time you do that, I get a little harder. Do you? A battle rages within her. One side of her wants to comply. To give in to the moment and enjoy herself. Enjoy me. The other side is telling her to slap me and run. I have to be careful if I don't want to scare her away. Do I do that to you? Oh, yes, Lissa. You may not see yourself the way I do, but trust me when I say you're... inspiring. I've been undressing her with my eyes ever since we got back in the car. This dress covers enough skin to keep my mother from muttering in my direction, but it doesn't leave that much up to the imagination. I can see every smoking hot curve waiting for me to touch it with the palm of my hand. You only think that because you found out I was a virgin. In a way, she has a point. My interest in her peaked when I realized how to my advantage it would be to mold her, shape her, create the lover I was meant to have, not to mention the thrill I enjoy knowing that I will always be her first. Never thought I'd get off on that before, but here we are. If you took that aspect away from you, I'd still want you, Lissa. I say with confidence. Because you are beguiling and beautiful. I sense that she still doesn't trust me. But I win. Because she unzips her dress and lets it fall to her feet. God have mercy on me. I have to cross my legs to keep my erection to myself. Her underwear doesn't match, although I can tell she tried. Perhaps she's not used to men seeing the difference between black and dark gray, but I can. I also appreciate it, however. I live for her breasts spilling out of her black push-up bra, enticing me to squeeze them and sink my face into her generous cleavage. I also yearn to nibble her solid silk panties and to inhale her scent. I'm turning into a base version of myself, and I'm not entirely opposed. Chestnut brown hair frames her face and cascades down her torso, outlining her arms and those supple breasts I can't stop staring at. She stumbles when she attempts to step out of her dress with her strappy sandals still on her feet, but she catches herself with such grace that I want to break out in applause. Everything? she asks. Take it all off. I want to see her naked. The lingerie might make her more irresistible, God help me, but I want to see her naked before I fuck her. She unsnaps her bra. Her light brown nipples are already hard enough for me to suck with benign satisfaction. Her short fingers tug her underwear down. Someone's been to the spa since we first made love. While she still has hair on her mound, it's been trimmed back and looks as neat as the rest of her. Not that I would complain about what I encountered our first time. I'm not picky like some ungrateful men. I do appreciate, however, that I have a better look at her delectably pink nether lips, begging me to part them with my cock and fuck her until she's screaming in pleasure. I unbuckle my pants. Come over here, Lissa. But I thought you wanted me to put on... In a few minutes. I can't take it anymore. A taste. Just a taste of her will be enough to help me power through the rest of the evening. I'm going to teach you something that will make me a very happy man in our future together. My dick may be hard enough for me to grip right now, but I still mind my words. Ones like, our future together because I know that's stroking her emotional libido. Maybe mine, too. Because if I can make Alyssa my perfect lover, mercy on me, tonight and forever. She comes to me, the light padding of her feet on my hardwood floors driving me insane. What would it take to get this every night? Coming home from work to find her naked, waiting for me, Already wet with thoughts of how I'll take out my stress on her. The thoughts are eating me alive. I need her. 
Now. My cock is out and in my hand by the time she reaches me. She glances down into my lap before making eye contact with me again. What in the world is it that I want anyway? I want you to tease me, Lissa. Tease you? Yes. With your cunt and nothing else. She flinches, toes curling into my floor. Does that word offend you? No. Melissa blushes. With how pale her skin is and how dark her hair, it's easy to see that blush overcome her skin. Kind of turns me on. You say it so harshly. Cunt. Ripples claim her. Yes. I did that. I'll do it again, too. Get in my lap and tease the head of my cock with your wet cunt, Lissa. I squeeze my legs together to make it easier for her. She braces her hands against my chest, fingers digging between my buttons and reaching my skin as she straddles my lap and slowly lowers her thighs. I don't care how angry she was earlier this week. I know she wants this. I know she wants me inside of her fucking her to orgasm. I don't have to ask if she's ever ridden in a man's lap before. I know the answer. I'm going to enjoy every sweet second of this. On my cock, but only a bit. If she lowers her hips too much and I sink into her, I'm a goner. And I don't want to be yet. Yes. Yes, what? Her eyes are closed as she grips my shoulders and rubs her wet nether lips against my tip. Shit. It's better than I thought it would be. Yes, uh, Mr. Marcus. She's going to kill me at this rate. Naturally, she's not perfect. She's lost in her own world, and I have to stay in this one to ensure I get exactly what I want from this experience. I want only my tip inside of her. I want the promise of more sex. I want to transform into the type of man who can't get enough of her. Not tonight, not tomorrow, not for the rest of my damned life. I want... No. I need... I need her. You want more, don't you? Every word I utter makes her gasp, her mouth hanging open sometimes scrunching her nose and brow as her body instinctively tries to take more of me. You want my whole cock taking your cunt. You want to ride me until my cum spills down your leg. A faint, oh my god, falls from her lips. Her fingers tighten around my shoulders. Yes, she says with the most gorgeous whine. Fuck me, please. Yes. Lissa, beg for me. Please, sir. Her head leans back. Her pussy attempts to slide down my cock, but I've got her by the hips. Fuck me like this. Like how? Let me ride you. You want to ride me? You want to know what it feels like to ride a man like me? Yes. As it so happens... I want to know what it's like for her to ride me, too. My cock is screaming for it. Only around her does it get this ridiculously hard. It's not her juices on my tip every time she pulls her nether lips away. That's my pre-cum spilling from my tip. My whole body is tense with the need to come. The need to come in her. I've got the all-clear to do it. She told me that I could do it tonight. Do I do it now? Shit. Would it be so bad if I... I'll let her decide. Tell me, sweet angel. Tell me to fuck your cunt. Say those words. My hands go from her hips to her arms, holding them behind her back. Her chest is in my face. All I smell is her sex in my musk. If we don't do this right now, I will lose my fucking mind in all the wrong ways. I want it, she says. Fuck my cunt, Mr. Marcus. Hey, 
when the lady asks. The sound cracking from her throat is hotter than how she feels around my skin when I shove her hips down into my lap. I take her in one hurried motion, eager to get inside of her as quickly as I can. It's been days, days. A man like me isn't meant to wait this long when I have a woman available. I also don't care how angry Alyssa was with me this week. The pleasure exploding on her face says all is forgiven. For now. That's it, Alyssa. I say through clenched teeth. Ride me. I want to take credit for being such an excellent tutor, but I know that most of her movements, her inclinations, her needs are based more in pure instinct. My sweet Alyssa has never ridden a man like this before. I know that. Yet she accomplishes it with no hesitation and a finesse that implies she's as eager to do it as I am to lie back and let her do the work for a few minutes. Is the kind of experience I expect with a woman who knows what she's doing. So either Alyssa has lied to me about her lack of experience in the world of sex, or there is some crazy chemistry at play between us. One good enough to make us come together like this. Her tits in my face, her eyes closed, her mouth parted, breaths heavy and wispy. Her cunt taking me all the way. Her thighs grinding in my lap as my cock burrows as far as it can go. Her hands tearing apart my suit jacket and shirt, nails scratching my chest. She's killing me. She's fucking killing me. I let her. Damn it, what is wrong with me? My brain usually reacts to sex like this in one of two ways. Either it's all about me, my pleasure, and my ability to come as hard as possible. Or it's all about the thrill of making a woman feel as good as I do. I don't know what's going on with Alyssa. She makes me want to fuck like I've only got five minutes left to live. But she also entices me to make the most of it for her, too. It doesn't help that I don't want her angry at me anymore. I want her invested in this relationship. I want her to want me every second of her agonizing day. Speaking of agonizing, fuck, my cock is hurting to come. Does that feel good, Lissa? I squeeze her hips, keeping her in my lap, her cunt forced to keep every inch of me inside of her. Her long, drawn-out moan shakes me inside. Do you want to come? She falls forward, hair landing against my face as her lips come for mine. Soft fingertips trace circles on my cheek. Yes, she says into my mouth. We're both still. Shit, do I need to come. My cock is so damn hard and surrounded by her wet, tight body that every instinct that makes up my male psyche begs to fill her with every drop that makes me a man. Too bad. If I don't get to yet, then neither do you. She groans in defeat, tightening around my cock, but not quite climaxing. Yes, Lissa. I like it when you do that. I want you to make me come. Make me feel like the most important thing in the world is giving you all of me. How? I'm dragging her back to reality, and she's fighting me every step of the way. How do I do that? Make me feel like you can't function without me fucking you, and that you can't let go until I've filled you up. Her whimper is deafening. Does she even know that she's pinching her nipple and biting her lip? You want me to, don't you? Yes, sir. You're thinking about it right now. You want to know what it feels like when a man comes inside you. She doesn't say anything, because she doesn't have to. Off, I command. Off my lap. We're doing what we originally came in here to do. Alyssa hasn't gotten off me yet. What's that, Mr. Marcus? Training you to have the best sex possible. Chapter 10 Alyssa Training me. 
I know what he really means. Everything has been couched in easier terms for me to digest, but he's talking about some dumb sub-shit with the side of BDSM. And I don't care. I'm drunk on him. He could push my face into his bed and drill my ass with his cock for all I care right now. He could tie my hands behind my back and fuck my throat, making me choke on his cum for all I care. Thoughts that I should care infiltrate my mind. They're not welcomed. Since when did I expect anything else? Since when have I wanted anything else? I see right through him. Julian Marcus knows how to carefully choose his words and actions, even during sex. He's seducing me. Again. I was angry at him, and now he's going to fuck the anger out of me until I'm slobbering all over his lap again. Don't I know that this is what everything's been leading up to? Pick two, Alyssa. He helps me stay upright in front of the bed his clothes slowly peeling off as his hard cock points straight out from his body. It's covered in me. I'm so fucking wet and eased open that I feel like I can take on anything of any size right now. But I only want him, of course. My eyes are drawn to two implements above the others, I languidly point to them, hoping he'll do something. Instead, he makes me bring the soft leather handcuffs to him. So innocuous, right? Of course I go for something as simple and easy as those. I assume he's going to cuff my hands behind my back and fuck me in the missionary position. Yeah, right. He's going to make me get on all fours on his bed and keep my hands close together. He doesn't even handcuff me to the headboard. My wrists are cuffed together beneath me. I can barely bend my elbows. I definitely can't easily reach in front of me. Open wide, Lissa. There were two different sized ball gags set out. I chose the smaller one. And I wasn't expecting such soft material that my teeth are in no danger of breaking or chipping, even when I bite down as hard as I can. It also doesn't choke me, although I certainly can't speak clearly. Enough to yell my safe word, but the point is to shut me up outside of some intense groaning and muffled crying in pleasure. My knees press into the bed, legs spreading a little wider to accommodate the man behind me. He's naked. Not the first time I've been with him naked. And we've showered together, after all. But it's the first time we've had sex totally naked. It's enough to make me even wetter. I'm ashamed a little. What kind of woman am I, anyway? Bound and gagged in a billionaire's bed with his cock teasing me from behind. Damn it, I want it. I want him to fuck me in that controlled yet animalistic way he commands so well. I've never had anyone pound me from behind before. What a fucking way to experience it. It's not going to be as easy as before. His hands curl around my shoulders, and his voice makes love to me before his cock dares to enter me again. I'm not going to just fuck you until we explode, Lissa. He licks his thumb and tucks my loose hair behind my ear. My head tilts in his direction. I don't even mean to do it, but I moan onto the ball gag, begging him with sex-laden eyes to do it. Do me. Do everything. I'm going to train you to react exactly how I want you to when we have sex. Because sometimes... All I want at the end of the day is to take my woman like this. He thrusts into me, sending me forward with a loud, muffled cry that I can't control. That's right. Julian's voice is strained for the sensations we give each other. But he hasn't completely lost control like I have yet. He holds my hips, 
keeping me on his cock, which he slowly moves inside of me. It's fucking torture. Because all I want to do is fuck. Be still, Lissa. Control yourself. My whole body needs it. It needs the movements, the sounds, the fucking smells of sex. I need Julian to take me like he would take the woman he loves. Or the woman he's using for one night. Either one. I just need it. If you can show me that you can respond to my commands, then I'll let you have your pleasure. It's a reward system with me, my lovely. He grabs a chunk of my hair and yanks my head up. The ball gag slips deeper into my mouth. A good thing, because I'm yelping in surprise. Do you know what it's like to get your hair fucking pulled while your hot billionaire boyfriend boss has got his cock balls deep inside of you? Have I mentioned the word torture yet? If we establish a flow with our lovemaking, then we'll have all sorts of fun in the future. I see right through you, Julian. Using nice words you're sure this woman wants to hear. I meant what I said earlier about you making me feel like I have no choice but to come. So let's start with something so simple. I want you to squeeze your cunt around my dick. What? Go on, Lissa. Do it. Don't think too hard about it. Fucking grab me. I... Okay. I'm sure this is something I've done a dozen times since we first had sex, but it's not something I'm wholly aware of in the moment. Squeeze? Does he mean with my kegels? Damn it. Knew I should have spent half my life practicing for this blessed moment. Here goes nothing. Nice. Very nice. You were doing that in the chair earlier. But it's different in this position. One hand grabs my ass while the other stays on my hip. If you need inspiration, though, let me know. I mumble something on the ball gag. <laughs> Shh. Shh, unless you want me to stop, don't say anything but sweet things, Lissa. Julian pulls my hair away from my neck. And spanking you will make you squeeze my cock. Spanking? Shit! Now do it again. You're convincing me to stay inside of you, Alyssa. If I'm not impressed, I'll pull out and we'll have to start all over again. Sad thing? I absolutely believe he can last that long. Julian has not led me to think that he has uncontrollable orgasms. As nice as that would be to make him do... Squeeze, baby. I imagine that disappointing him means never getting to feel like this again. Even the weirder aspects, like the handcuffs and ball gag, are adding to the moment right now. And I don't want to lose the crazy sensations eating me alive. So I'll do it, Julian. I'll kneel on your bed and pump your cock with nothing but the place you stick it. Damn it. It's not easy. I lack strength. I lack experience. I lack the ability to give him exactly what he wants when he asks for it. I don't know how to make him come with one squeeze of my inner walls. I don't even know what it feels like yet. I suppose that's my reward. Huh. Reward system, right? Yeah. I want to know what it feels like. I've always been curious, even though plenty of my friends over the years tell me it's gross. I don't get it. How can it be? If I swallow Julian's seed with a hum in my throat, then I can take him on down below, too. I bet it feels fantastic. A big man like him, already filling me up with his size alone. What else could he do? I want to know. I want that level of intimacy with a man who doesn't likely give it out that often. If he's going to be my boyfriend, even if only on paper, then I want 
that between us. Oh, Lissa. I know I'm doing too much in too short of time. But what else can I do? I'm learning here. Give me the chance, Julian, and I'll figure out how your mind and body tick. What do I do to make you need me? Fuck me? Lose yourself inside of me? I'll find out. Trial and error are admirable, right? Lissa, I'm the one doing all the work here, and that's all he can say? I feel so vulnerable, so submissive, so needy for sex that he can bind and gag me on my knees, and I'm still backing my pussy up on his cock and attempting to make him come from that alone. Is this what he wants me to feel? Like I'm the desperate one? Shit, shit, shit. I am desperate. I'm his dirty little slut who can't get enough of his big cock. All it took was one touch from him and I handed over my virginity on a dirty platter covered in my cum. This is what I get, man. This is what happens when you reach the age of 21 and are still a virgin. You're horny as shit and quivering for a fantastic dicking. But you're too stupid to know what to do. This debasement, this submissive sensation, driving me to serve this big, dominant man with my aching pussy. I like it. I'm getting off on it. I love it. I'm gonna come from it. The more I grab his cock and rub my pussy up and down his shaft, the more I want to orgasm. But he told me not to. He told me to wait until he told me to. If I fail, we start all over again, or... I don't get it at all. So much pressure for what I want. Shit. Baby. He's not the first man to call me baby. But Julian is the first to make me like it. Your cunt is so damn tight. Julian gently thrusts. I want to believe he doesn't know that he's doing it, that I'm making him fuck me without realizing it. But I'm not that conceited. You really want it, don't you? You want me to fuck you like you're my needy girlfriend. I whimper on my gag. Only now do I realize my tongue has been caressing the underside like I would lick his cock. Do you like this, Lissa? Do you like what we're doing? I nod. Julian pulls harder on my hair, my fingers pointing into his bed to help me keep my balance. He's so deep, so full inside me that I don't even think. I milk him with every muscle I have, determined to make him fuck me. My naughty little virgin wants it, doesn't she? His other hand caresses my cheek before lightly smacking my ass. I jerk forward again, the surprise, the little blip of pain shooting through me. Oh, God. It's exactly what I wanted. What's wrong with me? I haven't even touched your clit yet. Maybe I don't have to. Maybe you're so naughty, you don't need me to touch that swollen clit of yours. His words fuel my strength. I'm working this cock like I don't know how to do anything else. My hips, free to do as they please, with one of his hands in my hair, and the other smacking my ass, thrust back against his, and grind into his flesh. Fuck me, sir. I don't question the thoughts in my head. I want to call him, sir. I want to know how far he can push me when we're in his bedroom. I want to explore every corner of this aspect of my sexuality as I can. With him. He's my boyfriend. He's my fucking man. And I'm his inexperienced blossom he's deflowering one nasty night at a time. Julian snaps. I've got him. 
You like it when I talk dirty, he growls into my ear. My hands are still clutched to my chest, but I'm up on my knees, spread across his lap, and taking his cock as it hammers into me. Julian covers my mouth and grabs my breast. My moans bypass the ball gag and hit the palm of his hand. My nipple hardens between his fingers. Down below, I'm trapped across his lap, a willing slave to the way he splits me open and pounds into my depths. I am open so wide and so easy. I am so loose. I don't know which fluids are mine, besides all of them, and which are his. All I know is that his snarls of pleasure are blowing in my ear, and I'm so close to coming that I don't know if I can wait for his command. I don't want to fail. Lissa. My name has never sounded so beautiful as when he shoves me back down onto his bed and takes me. I brace myself. I don't even escape into pleasure because I want to focus on what's happening right here between us. His cock is so big. I keep opening up more and more, yet he swells within me, growing bigger and closer to the brink of orgasm. Everything is hard and hot inside of me. I need to come. Shit, do I need to come. Do it. His knuckles are white from holding me down so hard. I don't want this to end. I don't want to be anyone but the obedient lover of one of the city's most powerful men. I want to see this side of him every day. And I want to show him this submissive side of myself. How had he known we were perfect for each other? Do it, Lissa. I squeeze until I see nothing but stars in my fucking eyes. I've never heard a man roar like this before. I barely register it, honestly. I know Julian is losing his mind, but so am I. My climax is here. My whole body is alive and shutting down at the same crazy time. All I want is him. And he is what I get. Hot. So hot. It hits me in my core, sinking into me, spilling into me with every roll of his hips. I've got him. I've got the man, the body, and the only thing I've yet to feel from him. I wasn't a virgin before, obviously. But I'm definitely not now. This man has spent every last drop inside of me, as I've begged for. Who knew that two weeks ago I'd be in this situation? That I'd be coming on my boss's cock and so damn happy to have it explode inside of me? We slow. Exhaustion, both physical and mental, taking us over. I'm completely flat on my stomach. Julian is on top of me, his cock half out but still slowly thrusting into me as he empties the last of himself into my body. When he finally pulls all the way out, it's with a soft groan of satisfaction. I may already be too wet to function, but I still know that's him gushing from me. Fuck, baby. His arms wrap around me and brings me closer to his chest. I'm too tired, too overwhelmed from that round to really react. I was so hot. I don't know what's happening. All I know is that I'm crying. Chapter 11 Julian I should have known this would happen. I pushed her too far. I was deep in the moment and selfishly pushed her too far. Tonight was Alyssa's first time embracing the submissive's role, and I hadn't better prepared her for it. The thoughts, feelings, and shameful sensations taking over her were nothing she expected. It was so stupid to think she could handle it this early in our relationship. After I calm her down with reassurances, I suggest we take a bath together. 
The warm water will soothe her nerves, and we can be together without the expectation of sex or certain behaviors on either of our parts. Color returns to her cheeks. The tears are gone. Alyssa leans back in my large tub, her nipples floating above the water and her long hair scraping the floor from how relaxed she is. I kiss her and I don't know why. Suppose I couldn't help myself. Feel better? Yes. Her eyes flutter open again. I'm sorry, Julian. I honestly don't know what happened. I had a good time, but... But nothing. You were overwhelmed. It happens even to experienced people. Were you overwhelmed? I steal myself. A little. I've never had a woman seduce me like she does. All Alyssa Pendleton has to do is wiggle her naked ass and I'm emptying my sanity into her cunt. The image of her trying to take all my cum for the first time is going to stick with me for the rest of my life. I pull her closer to me. So you see, there's nothing to be ashamed of. I tip her chin up so she looks into my eyes. We'll figure it out. So, you still want me to be your girlfriend? Ah. I suppose there would be those concerns, too. Yes, Lissa. Let's forget the bullshit from this past week and move forward. There's a whole world I want to show you. She lets me kiss her so hard that my hand goes between her legs. I don't know what she's thinking or feeling, and I don't care right now. I'd rather be consumed by my rising need for an otherwise nondescript woman named Alyssa Pendleton. Things are about to get wild. Part 3. Played by the Billionaire. Chapter 1. Julian. Hot coffee in my hands, I burst into the executive conference room, where my business partner, Preston Bradley, is already speaking with our esteemed guest. So glad you could make it on such short notice, I say to the man sitting in one of the twelve leather office chairs. His commanding presence overshadows even Preston's charming facade. And then again, it's not often we get men who look like Damon Monroe in Portland. Unless they are my brother. I've suddenly set myself up for the biggest gay joke I've ever conspired in my own head, and I have five seconds to redirect my thoughts to something more appropriate. It's my pleasure. Damon stands up and shakes my hand across the table. Strong and sturdy. Excellent. One thing my father always taught me was that you can learn a lot from a person's handshake. All right, so back then he meant a man's handshake, but the same can be said about all people from my own experience. I'm always looking for excuses to come visit the West Coast. You have more breathable air than we do back east. I don't take a lot of stock in my American heritage, but whenever East Coast big shots like Damon Monroe compliment my city, I'm inclined to puff myself up. Of course we have wonderful air. Of course we do. This is my assistant, Ms. Alicia Aduya. I shake hands with a lovely woman wearing a colorful blouse and skirt that makes me wonder how my girlfriend Alyssa would look in such an audacious pattern. I'm half tempted to ask Ms. Oduya where she gets her makeup as well. The bright red of her lips and the pink on her eyelids matches perfectly with her dark skin. She absentmindedly pats the very top of her afro after shaking my hand. I'm afraid my usual assistant couldn't make it. Besides, Ms. Oduya has never been to Portland before. Make sure you give her a bit of a break this evening, Mr. Monroe, Preston says with a fresh, charming smile in Ms. Oduya's direction. I can already hear it now. I made sure her break from Monroe was good and hard, if you know what I mean, Julian. One day, my business partner will stop hitting on every beautiful woman who comes into our offices. But today is not going to be that day. Portland's a small city, but we have plenty to do downtown. A sunglassed man flexes his muscles in the corner. Ah, that's right. The Monroes are big on personal security. 
I had bodyguards as a kid, but since opening my own enterprise, I only hire them when I go out of town for business, or if we get the odd threatening letter in our inboxes. Can never be too sure these days. Preston is even more laissez-faire about his security. That man will stumble drunk through Chinatown and make friends with every panhandler he comes across. They love him, because he's loose with the Benjamins and loves to buy out the old stock from Voodoo Donuts to pass around. This is assuming, of course, he had a fun night at the nearest strip club. The bodyguard implies that we should be wary of asking out Ms. Oduya. I don't see a ring on her finger. My assistant Vern will be joining us soon, I assure the table. My other assistant, Alyssa, will be joining us as soon as she starts the afternoon shift. This meeting had to be done right after lunch to accommodate Monroe flying in earlier this morning. I would like Alyssa to sit in on the whole meeting, but we don't always get what we would like. Unless you're me. Recently, I've been getting everything I like from Alyssa. Ask me what we did last night in my hot tub. Go on. Ask. We can go ahead and get started. Sounds good. Damon swings one leg over the other and folds his hands in his lap. A golden wedding ring glistens on his left hand. I went to a lot of executive weddings last year, but Damon Monroe's hitch at the Justice of the Peace and the subsequent to-do in the Czech Republic was not something yours truly was invited to. I was, however, invited to and attended Ethan Cole's wedding back east. I bring this up because that's who walks through the door with his wife, acting as his personal assistant. What. The. Hell. Cole and Monroe are in the top position to help Preston and me fund our next big venture. Cole and Monroe are, for lack of a better term, rivals. They're both in the same line of business, even if they don't always tarry in the same industries. Monroe is more hospitality and technology-based, while Cole gets his kicks from publishing and hedge funds. But they both have vested interests in funding the next greatest and latest ventures around the world. Why not? Preston and I have a wonderful track record of getting projects off the ground and making our other investors millions of dollars without lifting a finger. Of course, Cole and Monroe both want a piece of the Bradley and Marcus pie, if they can swing it. Suffice to say, both men knew they would be meeting with me this week, a day apart. Cole wasn't supposed to be here until tomorrow. Gentlemen, Ethan Cole says with a surprised smile on his young face. Out of all the businessmen in this room, he is the only one who is completely self-made, and it shows in his unrefined manners and expressions. Oh, he's very good at mimicking his new peers like Damon Monroe and myself, but we old money boys can smell new money coming from the other side of the tracks the moment they put a single toe on those rusty rails. Didn't know it would be a full house this fine Tuesday morning. The confusion, irritation, and frustration mounting the conference room almost throws me off my game. That never happens. I see we seem to have had some scheduling confusion, I say through gridded teeth. Burn. Damn it. He never messes up like this. In fact, he had assured me more than once that Monroe was scheduled for Tuesday and Cole for Wednesday. Yet here I am, looking into the young faces of Ethan Cole and his busty brunette wife. When Vern walks into the room, he has to do a double-take. Apparently he's as shocked as I am. He also looks at me with the biggest... Oh, shit face I have seen on this otherwise placated man. Jasmine, Ethan says to his wife, please tell me we don't have the wrong day. We seem to have been misled. Her confusion is the worst in the room. On the other side of the table, Damon Monroe chuckles and exchanges a quintessential alpha male look with his biggest rival on the East Coast. It says Wednesday right here, hon. Can I see? She hands him her iPad. Ethan Cole scrolls through the email from my office and looks up at me, his boyish facade finally crumbling. Ah, there's the power-hungry capitalist who made himself a billion dollars in only a few years. Well, he says with a devilish smile. I'm always up for a challenge, anyway. He looks to Damon Monroe and his equally confused assistant. 
If you'd like, we could come back later when he's done throwing you out, Monroe. Careful, Cole. Those be fighting words. Mr. Cole, uh, Mrs. Cole. Vern claps his hands together after putting his things down on the table. I have no idea how such an error was made, but I take full... Vern, I say. Hallway. Poor chump is scared witless. He thinks I'm firing him, doesn't he? Oh, well, maybe. Excuse us, gentlemen. Mrs. Cole. I nod to her before escorting my assistant out into the hallway. Preston jumps in and does what he does best. Damage control between conflicting parties. He's got everyone laughing within thirty seconds. Vern has pulled up an old email on his phone. I can confirm that this is the correspondence between us, sir. I take his phone from his hand and look over the dates. Sure enough, it says Wednesday. Mr. Cole's assistant replied to confirm. I would say this was an error on Cole's end, but the email his wife shows him definitely said Tuesday. My head hurts. Any other emails between us since then? Vern hurriedly goes through the sent folder, his face paling. Yes, sir. Uh, looks like there was one Thursday afternoon with the new date. He shows it to me. We both see the same damning detail right away. No, not that the date for Cole's appointment is wrong, but the person who signed off on the email was not Vern. It was Alyssa, my lovely, usually smart-as-a-tack girlfriend and second assistant was the one who sent a follow-up email on my behalf. She was the one who messed up the dates and made sure Cole showed up on the same afternoon as Monroe. Alyssa, who isn't here right now for me to hold accountable. Well, I say, flushed. I hand Vern his phone back and glance into the conference room. Cole and Monroe sit on opposite ends of the table, trading jabs and laughing at Preston's increasingly stupid jokes. My business partner sends me a look that implores me to get my ass back in there and figure something out. We've got some hands to shake and cocks to blow. I got most of those epithets from my gay-ass brother. Oh, Ted would love this. He would also be a bigger man than Preston actually is and smooth everything over with his oozing charm that even gets me sometimes. Guess that's the one advantage of being a gay man in this line of work. He knows how to stroke those alpha male egos in ways even I cannot understand. Hopefully not too well, though. Gentlemen, I say again the moment I enter the conference room. Both Cole and Monroe glance in my direction. I am... So sorry for the mix-up. We have located the source of the confusion and can unfortunately say that it came from my office's end. I turn toward Ethan Cole. I know you're one of the busiest men in America. How can we fix this for you? As much as I wish I could say we'll come back later, I unfortunately have another important appointment up in Seattle tomorrow. It's either today or some other week, I'm afraid. I grimace, afraid he was going to say that. Then let me propose that you and my business partner Preston take up the other conference room. We can all reconvene later. Dinner and drinks are on me tonight. I flash a smile to Mrs. Cole and Ms. Oduya. That goes for everyone in this room, of course. I owe it to Vern, too, for giving him that mini heart attack. Even so, he and I are going to have a long chat about his responsibilities such as how it's his job to perform oversight on anything Alyssa does on an administration level. Something was left amiss, and Vern should have caught it. The Coles agree to go with Preston. I think it's best for me to conduct the meeting with Damon Monroe anyway. Preston can talk to literally anyone, old money or new money. I, on the other hand, work best with men with the same background as me. I continue to apologize to Damon until he can't take it anymore, and insists that we continue with our meeting as planned. For the next ninety minutes, I pitch what we're selling, and he talks about how much money he has. Well, that's the basic gist of what we're up to, anyway. 
Nothing super interesting. Unless you're me and think venture capitalizing is fun and games. The Coles and Preston rejoin us for the final half hour of the meeting. That's also right around the time Alyssa finally joins us, her own office tablet in her hand and a little skip in her step. I almost forget what she's done when I see her. Shit. I had seen her this morning when we left my penthouse, my arm slung around her and trading knowing looks with my driver. She was all over me until we got her to campus and let her out so she could go to her nine o'clock class. I'm sure some pap somewhere clicked a shot of me making out with her, forbidding her from leaving me until I copped one more feel of her ass and stuck my tongue down her throat. The way she acquiesced to everything was the epitome of what I wanted from this relationship. Ever since Saturday night, our relationship has changed. These past three days have been Alyssa and I seriously discussing what we want, both sexually and emotionally. I think she finally realized that I am serious about taking care of her in return for her taking care of me. And she's embracing that submissive side of herself she never even knew was there. Which is why she's become more docile, more agreeable in my presence. Now, I'm not out for a hardcore lifestyle with my girlfriend, or any woman I decide to spend the rest of my life with. But I am appreciative of a woman who has a certain personality that jives with my own. Alyssa is to give all of herself to me, little by little. There are jokes about young feminine virgins falling head over heels for the first man they sleep with. I suppose that was me. Oh, fuck it, I know it was me. I had no idea when I seduced her, of course, but since then, I've been making the most of it. I want to kiss her the moment she walks through the door. But this is business. Cole brought his wife, but they're not making doe eyes at one another. Shit, they haven't even reached one year of marriage yet, and they're showing more professionalism than me right now. Allow me to briefly introduce my second assistant, Alyssa Pendleton. I motion for her to sit on the other side of Vern. Don't mind her, she'll be helping Vern take notes. Then we're all having a nice... Lovely chat. Both men glance at me and then at Alyssa. Damon Monroe leans back in his chair and smirks as if he's won another billion dollars. Ethan Cole spares himself that charade by glancing at his wife. She blushes. Never let it be said that I don't keep good company. Chapter 2 Alyssa, I am so embarrassed when my boyfriend takes me aside and holds me accountable for a mishap I made last week. I own up to it. I didn't do it on purpose, but I fucking own up to it. This was Thursday afternoon, right? It must have been when he made me go to the doctors and get tested for STDs out of the blue. I was so angry. So irate that by the time I started my actual job, I was liable to subconsciously sabotage some of Julian's work. If only I remembered actually doing it. Fuck. Poor Vern. I'm informed that he'll be keeping an even closer eye on what I do around the office. Why do I have to embarrass myself like this? I have nothing against Vern, and I could have gotten him fired if I had signed his name instead of mine on that email. Burns married, and trying to start a family with his wife. What kind of monster would I be if I let him lose his job? The men meeting with him today are both too gorgeous and rich for me to deal with. Honestly, when I googled Mr. Monroe, I got a photo of his indisposed father, and assumed I would be seeing an over sixty years old man sitting at the table. I was not expecting a thirty-something heartthrob with the most manicured facial hair I have seen in my life. Seriously, he puts Julian to shame in the beard department. And those eyes. Holy shit. Julian, if you're listening to this, you can seriously learn a thing or two about loaded gazes. 
We'll start by implanting your steely blue eyes with those topazy ambers Mr. Monroe has. I could feel him boring a hole right in my gut when he looked at me. Mr. Cole and his wife are ridiculously good-looking, too. He has a youthful energy to him that is at complete odds with his deadpan humor. And she's so bubbly with curly black hair and a chic sense of style that I felt like a total mouse next to them. I actually thought she was his business partner at first. Then I remembered that Mr. Monroe is the one who is business partners with his wife, before learning that she often accompanies her husband on trips to be his personal assistant, because that's how they met. She used to work for him, like I work for Mr. Marcus now. I am so overwhelmed, both by these people and what I accidentally did, that I can barely function during the meeting. It doesn't help that Julian is my boyfriend, and every time I look at him, my breath is stolen from my body as I reflect on what we've been doing these past two weeks. At first, I thought our relationship would be entirely a facade. Now I realize that he actually wants more from me. And I want more from him. He's awakened something within me. It's not just discovering real sex for the first time. When we're together, as we have been every day since Saturday, I am naturally inclined to give over to him, to give myself to him, and to beg for whatever he deems fit for me that day. He calls all the shots. He tells me what to do, what to wear in the bedroom, and how I should do everything. I'm completely submissive to him as soon as we're behind closed doors. Julian could take me into the adjacent room right now and tell me to suck his cock, and I wouldn't be able to get down on my knees quickly enough. I think we're in some sort of dom-sub relationship, and I have no idea what to think. I tell myself to simply enjoy the ride. Julian is the experienced one here. There's so much that I can learn from him. Assuming our relationship outlives my gaffes. Julian doesn't say anything outside of our short meeting afterward, but I know he's pissed. I don't blame him. Mr. Cole and Mr. Monroe were not supposed to have run into each other today. I've read up enough on the both of them to understand why. I'm so stupid. How could I have let this happen? Even though I was angry at Julian at the time, my professionalism should have stepped between us. At five, Julian calls me into his office for nothing but work. And a little pleasure, I suppose. No plans tonight, right? No, sir. We're in private. But if there's anything I've learned about myself these past few days, it's that I like having him treat me like this even when we're in private. It fucking turns me on and I don't feel the least bit bad about it. Do you want me to come by your place again tonight? <laughs> don't know why I wouldn't. I don't need a break from him yet. I'm ready to keep having sex and exploring whatever he has to teach me. Good. You're coming with me to the after party with Cole and Monroe. I promised them food and drink on my dime to help smooth this problem over. What do you think of LaGuardia's? That's one of the most upscale, exclusive lounges in Portland. The kind of place that's always packed, but never advertised. Even so, Julian could easily get a private room for everyone at the last minute. I think it sounds wonderful. Excellent. He gets up, shuts off his computer monitor, and grabs his jacket. Then let's go. My driver is waiting to take us all there. Six people pile into Julian's stretch limo, waiting curbside. It always cracks me up to see his ridiculously nice limo in the middle of downtown Portland, where the blocks are short and everyone points and stares at the smallest whiff of billions of dollars. I'm not even sure Phil Knight drives around in a limo here. But Julian Marcus? He always takes the limo if he feels like it. He even dropped me off at school in it this morning. 
gave me so many kisses that people were staring. People who smelled like they hadn't bathed in weeks, yet had parents who could pay their tuition. Go figure. Welcome to Portland. The Guardias is exactly what I expected. A small, intimate lounge stocked with the greatest spirits from around the world and enough finger food to fill us up for dinner. Nice finger food, of course. We're not getting chicken wings and nachos. We're getting seasoned prawns, oysters, sushi, you name it. There's even slices of Kobe beef making the rounds once we're through the door. Julian has arranged for us to have a large table in the back. The place is as packed as I expected. Packed with tech giants in both suits and casual wear. And packed with local celebrities who can't wait to get their photo ops and leave. The staff are more polite than anyone working at Bradley and Marcus, and that's saying a lot. Even the waitress who takes my drink order is all smiles once she addresses me. Every man at the table checks out her ass when she walks away. Cad, Jasmine Cole mutters to her husband. They laugh. Can't stop a red-blooded man from doing what men do best, Mr. Bradley says from the other side of my boyfriend. He's the only one here without a guest, but he made sure that Mr. Monroe's beautiful assistant is sitting next to him. I won't comment on the fact that Mr. Cole and Mr. Monroe are sitting next to one another for the course of our light dinners. For a couple of hardcore rivals, they seem to get along well enough in a social setting. Neither the assistant nor the wife seem bothered by it either. Even so, Julian keeps a careful eye on everyone's attitudes. When someone gets a little grumbly, he orders another round of drinks. When someone looks bored, it's time for more food. We're done doing business. This is pure entertainment at this point. So, Marcus, Mr. Monroe says at the other end of the circular table. Another whiskey has been placed in front of him, but nobody aside from perhaps Mrs. Oduya is the slightest bit tipsy from the drinks. What's this about you and this lovely young woman here? Two weeks ago, you were minding your own business. Next thing I see in the society pages are photo ops of you and your new girlfriend. Julian genially smiles. You're one to talk, Monroe. He turns to me. Damon here had a rush wedding last fall, with a woman he only met a few weeks earlier. More like several weeks, thank you. We all can't wait around a year and a half to marry the woman we love. Mr. Monroe spared that line for Mr. Cole beside him. Honorable, however. I promised my wife the wedding of the year. Didn't know you were going to try to upstage me, Monroe. Jasmine rolls her eyes in my direction as if to say, These men. Am I right? Anyway, yes. Julian continues. Alyssa and I are together. He drapes his arm across the back of my chair and rubs my shoulder. I can't help it. I'm a blushing virgin all over again. Only a couple of weeks, though. That's how it starts, Mr. Monroe says. Next thing you know, you're getting hitched at City Hall and having a baby. Congratulations, by the way, I say, remembering that Mr. Monroe's wife is about to have their first child. Timeline's a bit sus, honestly. She was definitely pregnant when they had their wedding in the Czech Republic. Thank you. He raises his glass. A toast to all of our happiness, both in business and our personal lives. Nobody can turn that down. So we clink our glasses together and down our scotches, martinis, cosmos, and whiskeys. The scent of Jasmine's gin and tonic is stronger than my martini. She's also the first at the table to go full-blown tipsy. Babe... She slams her hand against her husband's arm. Be right back. Bathroom. She starts a chain reaction. One by one, people get up and mill around the crowded lounge. One of Mr. Cole's local friends is stopped by after hearing someone is in town. Ms. Oduya sits in a lonely corner and gets some work done. Mr. Bradley occasionally flirts with her before turning attentions to groups of men sitting around tables and... Waitresses in need of attention, clearly. 
Julian gets up and motions for me to walk with him through the crowded lounge. He keeps one arm around me until we reach Mr. Monroe sitting at the bar, complimenting the bartender for the excellent drink. Someone's getting a nice tip tonight. My further apologies for the mix-up today, Damon, Julian says. Mr. Monroe gives him his undivided attention, but keeps one eye on the goings-on about the room. Alyssa has assured me that it won't happen again. Mr. Monroe gives me a look I've yet to see from him tonight. Critical. In one glance he's both undressed me and punished me for my gaffe earlier. Now, I know this man owns a BDSM sex club on the East Coast, but... What are we mixed up in, exactly? Julian senses the same look from our guest and tightens his grip on me. Possessive. The kind of possessive that's been turning me on as of late. But this is different. He's both protecting me from Mr. Monroe's critical, domineering gaze and making a statement. I feel like a sacrificial lamb, honestly. One that is about to get the knife if I don't bleat loudly enough to rouse some sympathy from the surrounding wolves. Mr. Monroe catches on fairly quickly. My off-the-record advice is that you truly make sure it doesn't happen again, Marcus. I don't come out all this way for sloppy scheduling. As much as I enjoy giving Cole a good-natured ribbing and staring at his gorgeous wife, I'd much rather have my business associates to myself, if you catch my drift. He finishes his drink and shoots me another critical gaze. Although I will say I'm a little jealous. Wished I had as lovely of a lady to punish tonight. He slips off his stool taking his empty glass with him toward the bathrooms. I'm frozen, shocked. Julian clutches me to him so tightly that I can barely breathe. Julian, are you... Gonna let him say things like that? His lips touch my hairline. Yes, Lissa. You know why? No. His hand slips down my ass, squeezing until I'm almost completely knocked off my heels. Because he's right. You need to be punished for what happened today. I could have been in serious trouble. They both could have pulled out their promises of funding and left Preston and me high and dry. It would have been big trouble. I'm so sorry. I swear it will never... He gently taps the bottom of my ass. Chapter 3 Alyssa It doesn't hurt at all. In fact, the motion itself is so nothing that there's no way anyone else in this lounge saw it happen. But I felt it. I felt the intentions. He wants to. Punish me, that is. I should do it right here, Lissa. That growl fills my veins with both dread and arousal. I don't doubt that he's at least a little bit hard. Maybe full-blown hard. I should bend you over right here in front of all these nice, well-to-do people and spank your ass red until I'm good and sure you'll never do something like that again. I... He's spanked me a little during sex. I really like it when he does it while he's fucking me from behind. Makes me tighten up, you know? I thought that was the real reason for a little spanking in the bedroom. This, though? This is... different. This is him flexing his power in our relationship. A part of me tells me to run. That this is a red flag. That him insinuating he should spank me in public, humiliate me in front of Portland's high society and their guests, is a huge sign that he doesn't respect me and only sees me as a plaything. So why the fuck am I turned on right now? Is this part of my transformation into submissive Alyssa? The one who likes serving my boyfriend in the bedroom? Am I so far down a dark well that 
I'm liable to drown if someone doesn't pull me up soon. What the fuck do I do? What do you have to say for yourself, Lissa? Every time he calls me that, I'm reminded of what's really going on here. This is a sex game. Nothing more. Certainly nothing less. I'm so sorry, Mr. Marcus. I... I'm also a little nervous. Scared? Perhaps. I squeak. It's natural. But at some point you're going to have to understand that things like this... He lightly taps the bottom of my ass again. Happen. There will be occasions where you will need to be punished for your bad behavior. I have a billion dollar business to run and you compromise that with your foolish actions. I... You think Cole and Monroe aren't thinking the same thing? That I should do something about this? I've bothered them both because of what's happened. If they were in my shoes, you should damn well bet that they'd smack your ass until you fully understood what you've done. Okay, but would they do it in... I glance over to the other side of the lounge. There are the Coles, having a good old time talking to their local friends. Mrs. Cole happens to catch my sight. She immediately recognizes what's happening, her smile disappearing, but not in concern. The way she puts her hand on her husband's leg, caresses him through his trousers, says that Julian and I have inspired certain thoughts in her. Is everyone here a kinkster? I attempt to whisper my words, but they come out in a demure squeak instead. You pick your associates well, Mr. Marcus. Takes a certain man to make it to the top. His hand lingers on my ass. Anyone looking over can see his fingers hovering above my skirt. Neither of them are lifestylers, though. One day I will have to introduce you to a couple like that. I shiver. When I look over again, I spot Mrs. Cole whispering in her husband's ear. He tips her chin up and lightly kisses her lips, her hands slowly sliding between his legs. I wouldn't consider myself a voyeur, but this is kinda hot. They're not even doing anything and I'm turned on. Lissa, my boyfriend says, his teeth grazing my earlobe. I still don't think you understand what kind of trouble you're in. You're lucky I don't sit on a stool and take you over my knee. My lip succumbs to my teeth, chomping on it. Now, if Julian actually slammed me across his lap and smacked my ass, I would die. And not in the sexy way. But the fantasy? The thought of my boyfriend punishing me with his firm but fair hand? I'm going to embarrass myself again. One last time, he smacks my ass, hard, while a small group of people, half tipsy on expensive alcohol, push past us and argue over who is paying the cab back to their downtown hotel. Julian lightly kisses my cheek before muttering, Would you like that, Lissa? Me spanking you in front of all of these nice people? My fingers are caught in his lapel. Maybe some other time, sir. One day, hmm? For now. He grips my wrist, gently turning me around in his arms. We'll keep it in private. Come with me. Now. The rest of the people in the small lounge disappear as he leads me to another room. A nice unisex restroom from the looks of it. I barely pay attention. I'm so wrapped up in the effortless way he moves me around, commands me, that I can barely contain the arousal spiking in my gut and exploding through my body. Who knew I was such a sucker for an expensive guy, in an even more expensive suit? And he smells so nice. And his voice? The way he growls into the crook of my neck when we're alone, the door locked behind us the taste of desire crossing my tongue. Damn it. We're going to do it right here, aren't we? 
Didn't think we would be screwing in a public restroom this early in our relationship, to be honest. Yet this isn't your typical bar bathroom. While it's pretty cramped in here, it smells like a flower garden, and... Well, <laughs> how many bar bathrooms have tiny, tinkling fountains and the toilet cordoned off by a Japanese screen? Oh, sure, Julian and I barely fit in here without knocking over the screen, but... But it's fucking hot. Look at yourself. Julian stands behind me in front of the mirror hanging above the sink. My fingers grip a marble countertop. The top buttons of my silk blouse come undone. I wore a push-up bra today, and we can both tell. Especially with my hair down and framing both my face and my chest. I look like a girl who is in way over her head. If I didn't know already what Julian was capable of, then I'd be freaked out of my mind right now. But I do know what he's capable of. I know what he wants from me. I am so turned on that my nipples poke through my blouse, and I can't figure out how to close my damned mouth. You know what I see in that mirror, Lissa? I'm a wreck compared to him. So nicely put together in his three-piece business suit, that sapphire blue vest twinkling in the lavender lights of this bathroom. His aftershave smells so good this late in the day, although his five o'clock shadow has completely grown in. That self-assured stance is something I can only aspire to mimic. What? I breathe. He nuzzles my ear. I see a young woman that's still rough around the edges. A diamond in a sea of lackluster jewels. You know what that means? No. That means I find you the most fascinating and the most beautiful. You only need a little shining up and you'll be absolutely perfect. That says a lot, because you're just shy of perfect already. I swallow. What needs shining up, sir? Well, you could be better behaved, for one. He caresses me. My hips, my ass, the inside of my thighs. My bare skin tingles beneath his touch. I can only imagine what this is doing to him inside of his pants. Do you apologize for the spot you've put me in today, Lissa? Nodding, I look into the eyes in his reflection, silently begging him to do something about my sullied behavior. I'm sorry, sir. It won't happen again. Ask for it. Again, I swallow. Ask for what? Your punishment. I'm frozen where I stand, my fingers digging into this countertop to the point my knuckles whiten. I... The perfect woman for me wants her punishment when she's done something wrong. But she never ever does something wrong on purpose. Otherwise, how is she learning? These are things I've never thought about before. Why would I ever want to be with a man who wants to punish me? For doing something he didn't approve of? For screwing up something so important? I've apologized. I've learned to take certain things in his business more seriously. A skill that will follow me for the rest of my life, regardless of whom I work for or who I sleep with. But do I want a boyfriend who wants to punish me? And gets off on it? Before I would have said absolutely not. Isn't that grounds for breaking up? For running far the hell away? How could that possibly be a healthy relationship? Now, I'm not so sure. When I look into Julian's visage, I don't see a control freak. What I see is a man who wants to make me into his perfect lover. And I... I want to become that perfect lover. He's right. I'm rough around the edges. I've got a lot of learning to do if I want to be the girlfriend and possible fiancé material of a wealthy, well-bred man like him. Julian and his peers live in another world. 
they don't play by society's usual rules. This means they're not playing by normal dating rules. How unfortunate for me. The girl who has been trying to learn the modern dating scene since the day her boobs grew in. One thing's for sure. I should not be afraid of Julian. If he ever freaks me out, I can tell him. He'll back off. Make it better. Listen to me and my concerns. That's what separates him from someone I don't want to be around. So if he gives me this kind of command and I... I'm turned on. Is there anything really wrong with it? Please. The words fumble in my mouth. Am I really asking for this? Please. Punish me, Mr. Marcus. Phew. That wasn't so bad, was it? How am I going to punish you? Damn it. He wants me to say the whole thing, doesn't he? This guy is getting off on me, begging for my just-deserved spanking. You need to spank me, sir. It's the only way I'll learn. If I could capture the look on his face when I say that, and shove it into a bottle, I bet I could sell it for a million fucking bucks. That's the amused face of a man who's about to give it to me. Good. It starts with him saying, Let's not interrupt those nice people out there. Don't make a sound when I spank you, and I'll make sure you get a reward in the end. I'm... Doomed. Chapter 4 Julian I've never enjoyed spanking a woman so much before. Alyssa chomps on her lip to keep from crying out in both pain and ecstasy. My hand hits her with a firm touch I always employ with my partners, but this time, from the way her ass jiggles and her whole body shoots up in surprise... I'm entranced. And dear God, do I want her. She's such a trooper. Here I am, introducing her to spanking as one of the greatest kinks for both of us to enjoy, and she's jumping right in as if she were born to be my sweet submissive. The more I'm with Alyssa, the more I'm convinced this is the relationship we were both meant to have. Maybe she didn't know it. Hell, I didn't know it when she walked into my office a couple of weeks ago. I tell her to make no sounds. The only thing I can hear is my hand hitting her skirt. Once. Twice. Three solid times. Every time my hand meets her ass, she lets out a tiny wail of surprise. Her nipples harden. Her face flushes. When my hand lingers between her thighs after the third spank, I feel the heat of her cunt. A heat that wasn't there five minutes ago when I looked for it in the lounge. Those men out there, the ones I'm trying to suck money out of, they're like this with their wives. They do this behind their closed doors. Everyone's heard of how Ethan Cole's wife humiliated him in his own office two years ago. I bet that when they got back together, Mrs. Cole got the spanking of her life. As for Damon Monroe... He owns one of the most exclusive BDSM clubs on the East Coast. Need I say more? It's as much about my girlfriend as it is about me. Those men are judging me for her faux pas that fucked up their schedules and mine. Dear Alyssa, I simply can't let you get away with it. Especially with your tight body reacting the way it is. I have to have her. My cock is hard in my trousers. Easy enough to fix with a little mind over matter before I go back out into the lounge, but why not take care of it the old-fashioned way? After what she put me through today, I deserve to get my dick a little wet before we go back to my place. Besides, didn't I promise her a reward for taking her punishment well? Like I said, this is for both of us to enjoy. Julian. Yes, yes, I know, lovely. You're happy to have me between your legs, too. Shh. 
My hands happily find their place snug around her breasts. What are they doing in her blouse, anyway? Time to pop open those buttons and lose myself silly in those lacy cups. Alyssa closes her eyes and leans back against me. Her skirt rides up her ass. All I have to do is unzip my trousers and move aside her underwear. And away we go. Her eyes remain closed, mouth hanging agape in ecstasy. The only sounds she makes are sweet little whimpers when the head of my cock breaches her cunt, sliding effortlessly into her, every inch begging her to take me more, deeper, farther than we've ever gone before. It's easier to fuck her if she bends down, so I push her over the sink, her tits sliding against the glass and her body instantly opening up to more of me. Ah, oh, yes. This is definitely what I've been after all day. I had planned on taking her home and having my way with her all night. This will have to do because I can't help myself. When she's acting like this, how can I? That's right, Lissa. If there's one thing I'm good at, it's keeping my cool. Even when my cock is so hard I'm liable to explode at any moment. But I won't. I'm better than that. It's a rare moment when I come long before I intend to. Like my business life. I'm in full control of everything. I'll climax when I damn well want to. And I'm not going to until Alyssa is on the brink, her muscles milking my stiff cock until I have no choice but to join in on the fun. Take it, my lovely. Take your reward for being such a good girl. I don't intend to spend much longer in here. People must be getting suspicious. There are two bathrooms, but wherever men and women are drinking, people need to go. They also need to fuck. Besides, as hot as this is, it's not the most comfortable position I can be in with my girlfriend. This is about making a point, anyway. I will have her wherever I please. Whenever. However. We will reach a point in our relationship where I can get her on her knees in the middle of a Sunday service with one look. And it won't be to pray. I've been with acclimating women before. I've been with lifestyle submissive women. I've been with those dabbling in bedroom kink with no intention of going harder than some fuzzy handcuffs and a spank here or there. I don't want either of those extremes. I want a solid straddling of the middle. I want a woman who is her own, but also mine. Do you think Alyssa knows she's mine right now? You messed up, lovely, I say, enjoying the curve of her spine as it bends before me. Yet you got me to stick my cock in you. How does that make you feel? I don't give her time to formulate an answer. I'm bending down, my lips, my breath on her ear. I bet it makes you feel pretty powerful. And it should. You weave your spell like the best of bewitching women. She whimpers. I soon realize why. Her nipples are dragging across the glass sink every time I thrust forward. The woman's in sensory overload. She comes without any prompting. I barely survive it. Her whining, her writhing, her inability to control her inner muscles as they go crazy on my shaft and rub against the head of my cock. Everything about her young, feminine body screams at her to take every bit of me down with her. It's biology, right? Right. So I should probably get busy enjoying my own biology. I unabashedly let loose inside of her. Orgasm feels good anywhere, but always best when it's inside of a beautiful woman. Last time I did this to her, she made such a beautiful face that I dreamed about it all night. She makes it again. She may not be a virgin to what I can do to her in there, but it obviously turns her on. Suppose I'm too controlled through all of this. One of us has to be. I'll let her reap all the physical, emotional benefits while I stave off my insatiable appetite for her body. I'll lose myself in her, body and soul, later tonight. For now. 
I'll up the kink factor by pulling out and leaving her to deal with the mess. She'll know what to do. Chapter 5 Alyssa My head is spinning. My ass is sore. My stupid pussy is still dripping from the sex I had with my boyfriend in the bathroom. He left me in there after freshening up, and I quickly locked the door behind him. Yet, no matter how quickly, how thoroughly I cleaned up, I can still feel some of him inside of me as I move around the lounge. Julian is talking with Mr. Monroe. He told me to go to the bar and get a drink on his tab. I can't decide between a Coke to help me sober up or a hard shot of vodka to settle my nerves again. I order a small beer to rationalize the two. Maybe if I sit down, I'll stop feeling like a slut, advertising the fact her hot boyfriend fucked her full of his semen in a public restroom. Okay, so thinking about it that way is kind of hot. Nope, no, not doing this here. I am swearing off horniness until we get back to his place. Thanks. I guzzle beer until I can't anymore. Moment I put my bottle down, I look up to find Mrs. Jasmine Cole on a drink run for her husband. All the color drains from my face. She looks me up and down and chuckles before placing her order with the bartender. You are so in over your head, aren't you? I drink more beer. When will it hit my system? Hurry, alcohol. You can tell, huh? You've got that look. Jasmine leans against the bar while she waits for her drinks. Her wavy black hair tumbles down her arm and grazes the bar top. Me, on the other hand? I can't get my stringy brown hair to do anything but tangle. I've been using the best shampoo on the market ever since I started dating Julian, but... Fuck me, I can't get my hair to cooperate. Would it make you feel better if I said you get used to it? Assuming you're into it, that is. Is she really talking about this with me? The wife of a billionaire is talking to me about rich guy kink like we're in the same sorority. I... Um... The color comes rushing back to my face. Fuck me, too. I'm so red, I'm doing nothing but embarrassing myself. I'm kinda going along with the flow. The drinks land in front of Jasmine. With a sweet smile, she kindly thanks to the bartender, both drinks securely in her grip. Word of advice, she says to me. Learn when to get firm with them, too. These types of guys don't usually know it, but they need a woman like us to keep their egos in line. That's especially true for you, dating some guy born into money. At least my husband can remember humility if I sass him enough. My face must be dying from the thought of sassing Julian even more than I usually do, for Jasmine laughs before walking away. Trust me, hun. You've got more power in that relationship than you give yourself credit for. If you're that worried, consider the fact I married the man I publicly humiliated at one of his boardroom meetings. It's not because he has a secret humiliation kink, either. She stops. Or at least, I don't think he does. I'll get back to you on that. When I finish my beer, I look around the lounge for my boyfriend. The place is starting to thin out. The Coles say goodnight and leave. Ethan Cole's arm wrapped languidly around his wife as she leads the way. Mr. Monroe spares me a cursory glance before saying something to Julian. Next thing I know, he beckons me over. What do I do? Sit in his lap? There are no other chairs, and neither man is getting up. This man doesn't believe that you're my girlfriend, Julian candidly says. Beside him... Mr. Monroe snorts in amused disbelief. I've told him five times over the course of the day. Don't suppose you could convince him, could you? I glance at the man in question. Damon Monroe shrugs, his signal that I'm under no obligation to play along. 
Doubtlessly, this was a topic of conversation meant to stay between two grown men sharing a drink after a long day of mishaps and meetings. But my glorious boyfriend has dragged me into it. Thanks, Julian. Not sure what he wants me to do, but Jasmine Cole's words echo in the back of my head. I should show them both who's really boss around here. Maybe it's the alcohol that's made me this brazen, and maybe I'll pay for it later. But I have no qualms slamming my lips against Julian's, grabbing his head, and shoving my tongue down his throat. I knock him off balance, a genuine gasp of surprise exploding between us. When I walk away to go to the bathroom for the last time before we leave, I say, Only his girlfriend could get away with that, Mr. Monroe. Back at Julian's place, I get spanked until we're both going nuts from how hot it makes us. Mission accomplished. Chapter 6 Julian Neither of them have pulled their offer, so I suppose things worked out, even with the faux pas. I push away from my computer and regard Preston with a sigh. It could have gone better. On the other hand, having an open Wednesday was nice. Yes, yes, you got to come into the office late for the first time ever. Can you blame me? Oh, yeah. And then if you want to come in late because I was up all night getting drunk on pussy, it's no big deal, right? That's different. Uh-huh. Preston kicks back from his seat and shakes his head. If I didn't know any better, I'd think you were falling in love. But I know better, because you're the last guy to ever get clocked by Cupid. Don't know what you're talking about. Me? In love? I certainly adore Alyssa, I'm not going to deny that. She's the giant breath of fresh air I've been dying to have in my life, even if I didn't know it before. Women? Women make me happy. Their mere existence puts a skip in my step. But until Alyssa, many of the women I've dated since my teenage years haven't been anything more than distractions. That's uncouth of me to say, but when we're done having sex, and that terrible need to fuck is out of my system, I don't see what the point of hanging out is. Until Alyssa. Now I enjoy having company at dinner for the sake of having company. Now a sleepover isn't an inconvenience in the morning. It's a reason to stay in bed. Like I did this morning when I realized I didn't have my usually scheduled meeting. In a way, Melissa's mishap was a boon to our relationship. We stayed up all night having sex and washing away the stress in my shower. Woke up to find her scrolling through Facebook on her phone. After I asked her if she thought it was a good idea to face her phone camera while naked in bed with me, she tossed her phone aside and kissed me until I spent an extra two hours in bed with her. I'm not going to say, however, that I'm in love. That would be absurd. I've only known Alyssa for a few weeks. Also, I hate to say it, but she's ten years younger than me, and that becomes evident once in a while. I don't usually think about it. I especially don't think about the fact that she was in preschool when I lost my virginity at an average age. I jump into a lot of things. It's my personality. My nature. It's how I've made a billion dollars since opening my own business. This isn't the first relationship I've jumped into, either. Although it is my first one with this setup. One day... A reporter will track down a woman named Gloria and ask her about that summer I whisked her away to Paris and made all her dreams come true. And minus marrying her, anyway. And just like I can jump into anything, I tend to jump out of a lot of things, too. Ending relationships, when I feel they've come to their natural end, is easy for me as well. Only once have I been dumped. I can't say I felt terrible afterward. I moved on, and she's married now. While I can't say I see things ending with Alyssa anytime soon, I am in no hurry to make a commitment. Think I've got her hooked, anyway. I'm not in love, I say, ignoring that massive eye roll coming from Preston's direction. 
He's one to fucking talk. The man's in love with a new woman every week. His definition of love is so loose it's spilling the beans every time he walks into the office. You'd never guess that he's technically my best friend for as much shit we give each other. A hundred bucks says that light blowing up your phone is from your girlfriend who should be working. Preston opens the door to my office and steals a peek outside. Ah, yes. There is Alyssa, sitting near Vern. While Vern is diligently at work between his computer and his laptop, Alyssa sits with her legs crossed, texting on her phone. Preston's right. My girlfriend isn't doing much work. She's making my phone blow up with messages. Sorry. I unlock my phone to find a few messages from my girlfriend. Gotta take care of this. I don't care if you're paying her to sit around and look pretty for your amusement, but at least throw Vern a bone for putting up with it. I'll consider it. Preston leaves my office, closing the door, and my view of Alyssa behind him. Ample opportunity to check my messages from my flirty girlfriend. Can't stop thinking about you, Mr. Marcus. Tell me that you're also thinking of me. Am I thinking of her? Is she kidding? When do I stop thinking about her lately? I'm thinking about us in bed. I erase that, because of course I'm thinking about that. Why the hell wouldn't I be? I need to expand my conversational horizons. Thinking that we need to get out of town for the weekend. I have a meeting early Monday, but we could get out of here Friday evening after work. I also erase that. I don't feel like traveling. I want to stay home with her. That's what I look forward to on the weekends now. Lazy time at home with my girlfriend, with bouts of gym time, also known as me time. Before I can get an actual text sent to her, another one comes from Alyssa. Let's play a game. A game? Now? Via text. All right. We get to ask each other one sex question, and the other has to answer honestly. What kind of game is this? I'll start. Do guys usually jack off before a date? How real is that? I put my phone down and get up. I hit the button that controls the shutters and catch a new glimpse of Alyssa at her desk. She happens to glance up and meet my gaze. Her phone waves in my direction. Is she kidding me? She's not even hiding it. She has something else. I close the shutters and return to my desk. Fine. We'll play her stupid game. Although I have a feeling that her end goal is to get me thinking about sex. I know how she is by now. I can't speak for all men. I also can't say that this is a topic of conversation that happens often. What do you think men talk about? Relax on the details. All I've told Preston about my love life is that it's good. Likewise, I don't need him to tell me how much he enjoys watching women bounce on his dick while blowing smoke rings. I don't give her time to respond with whatever cutesy words she has stashed in her mind. I've done it. Sometimes it's good to gain a little clarity before going out on a date. It's also nice to last a little longer. As I'm sure you noticed last night. I answer an email while waiting for her response. Interesting. When was the last time for you? I want to imagine you touching yourself. Cute. Very cute. No. It's my turn to ask a question, isn't it? So I'm going to ask you a question, Lissa. Go for it. Oh, what to ask. How about we start with... How good does it feel when I'm inside of you? I know. So original. When in doubt, go with the classics. So good that it's all I can think about, even when I'm satisfied. Then you're not satisfied and I'm not doing my job. Preston steps through my door without knocking. Again. Put down that phone and hear me out. He locks the door behind him. I put my phone to sleep and leave it upside down on my desk. My abandoned computer likewise goes to sleep, while my business partner takes up the spot across from me again. But instead of relaxing, he pulls out another printed sheet of paper and slides it across my desk. 
I can't say that I like what I see. A week ago, I treated the assertion that my girlfriend is an STD-ridden slut as a prank. One that made me have a couple of realizations, but a tasteless prank nonetheless. I didn't launch an investigation, even though I probably should have for the sake of the peace in the office. Hell, for all I knew, Preston did it himself to make a point. After all, these flyers keep showing up in his office. Where are these coming from? In-house, obviously, Preston grimaces. I stepped out to see you for fifteen minutes and someone managed to slip that beneath my door. Nobody noticed. So it's someone who flies under the radar and wouldn't look suspicious around here. That narrows it down to about twenty people at this time of day. Lovely. Could be one of our staff. Could be a courier. Could be fucking security, for all I know. No matter what, someone in my office is causing problems for me. And Alyssa. I look back down at the paper. Perhaps the boss would like to know that Alyssa Pendleton is fraternizing with the male interns. So nice to know that we have a spy on our payroll. I crumple up the paper and shove it in the bottom of my wastebasket. I don't even bother shredding this one. What do you think they want? Besides our attention? Who knows? Someone looking to sow discord in our midst. Preston leans back into his chair, sighing. Look, Julian, ultimately I don't care what it's like with your intern-slash-girlfriend as long as you're jamming along as usual when it comes to business. Knock her up and start a family for all I care. Just don't fuck up the harmony of our office. So, basically, don't lose you money. That's all I ask. And don't get us in legal trouble. How many times do I have to tell you this has all been cleared with HR? And how many times do I have to ask you how much you strong-armed them into agreeing to this? To not press charges? I'm not answering that. I don't want my words coming back to bite me in the ass one day. Back to the matter is, HR is looking the other way as long as Alyssa remains placated. And I will make sure she's not unhappy with our arrangement. I suppose if she really wanted to, she could force HR's hand on the matter. But at the end of the day, I am king of this corporate castle, and HR's end goal is to not get us all sued. Not to protect every hurt feeling in the building. Unless they're my hurt feelings, of course. The question is, I steer the conversation, why are they giving you these juicy tidbits? Who's trying to stir up discord between us? Preston shrugs. I'm the personable one, remember? Either that or they're trying to rile me up so I get pissed at you. Is it working? He narrows his eyes at me. You don't want to know. Preston and I have our squabbles like any other pair of friends in the corporate world. But I don't want to think that this is going to be what puts a rift between us. Women should never come between us, and honestly, they haven't yet. I put up with his philandering, and he puts up with my stuffy heiresses, actresses, and women like Alyssa who come in and out of my office and hang on my arm at events. We both have our seduction styles, as polar opposites as they can be. It's official. I have yet another item on my already long list of shit I need to do. Namely, I need to get to the bottom of this crap and find out who the hell is trying to sabotage my relationship with Alyssa. I can't wait. Let me tell you. No better use of my time than playing these petty games with my underlings. Chapter 7 Alyssa I've come up with a cozy routine these days, and it's not too shabby if I do say so myself. More often than not, I wake up with Julian... Sometimes I cook us a quick breakfast. Most of the time, however, he has a personal chef who has already come and prepared his seven o'clock breakfast based on whatever his nutritionist has arranged for him to eat. After my recent physical, from hell, his nutritionist has taken over my diet as well, and now arranges my breakfasts and whatever dinners I have at Julian's place. His driver drops me off on my campus right before my nine o'clock economics class. I usually slip into my seat before the prof has a chance to enter the room. 
For the next three or four hours, I attend my classes, have lunch either by myself or with my friends, and pop into the offices or the student store to grab whatever I need. At one, Julian's driver waits for me where he dropped me off, and I ride a few blocks over. On nice days like today, I'd rather walk, but Julian says it's a security issue now. You think I haven't noticed the cranky, muscular women lurking around my campus with eyes for me? They ain't looking to flirt. They're making sure other people don't flirt with me. Oh, and I guess if someone gets some funny ideas about messing with me to get to Julian, they'll intervene with them, too. I roll my eyes by this point. My friends have never noticed them, and I'm not about to bring them up. Work is from 1.30 to 5. Now that I've graduated from intern, I get to spend most of my afternoons sitting in on meetings, answering my boyfriend's business emails, and hoping that he'll spare me some extra attention while I type up notes and do whatever leftover work Vern doesn't want to deal with. And again, I'm on probation after what happened earlier this week, so I'm not doing anything too exciting. I leave with Julian whenever he's ready to head out of the office. Sometimes we grab dinner. Sometimes we have a small business function to go to. But mostly, we go back to his place and relax. Sex is always on the menu. We fooled around most days. Yesterday, Thursday, was the first day all week we didn't do anything sexual. And that's only because Julian was up late dealing with a business matter before crashing in bed. At least, it let me get caught up on my homework. Today, when I walk into the office, I'm immediately tasked with going back downstairs and delivering memos to the interns before I even have the chance to see Julian in his office. But the person who gives me this order sounds like they have the authority to tell me what to do, so why not? Not like I'm a slave to my boyfriend. Well, until I see him for the first time all day, anyway. My intern position was never replaced. Not sure they're going to replace it either. This means my old desk is cleared off. Barren. Empty. It also means that the other nine interns, both women and men, have to pick up the slack for my absconded ass. Not all of them are fans of mine. Well, Cher, who I didn't like when we worked together, and I definitely don't like now, shuffles some papers neatly together at her desk. Look who has come down to slum with the rest of us plebs. Got tired of the caviar upstairs, Alyssa? What is this? Are we still young enough to bully each other? I wonder what would happen if I told Julian about her behavior. Oh, nah. <laughs> Think I'll pass for now. I gotta fight some of my own battles, you know. Stop by to drop off some of these files, I say, depositing her copy into her lap. Thought you might like to see them. Did you type them up yourself? Not sure I want to trust them if it's anything like what happened earlier this week. Mr. Bradley was so mad that you screwed up like that, Alyssa. I don't know how Mr. Marcus didn't cast you out into the street. What's funny? She didn't used to be this bad when I was another face in the office. Oh, don't get me wrong. Cher has always been a total bitch from the first day we started as interns this year. But she mostly left me alone unless I actually did something to offend her. Honestly, I don't know how she got a position here, other than because she's conventionally attractive with long, silky black hair, a small waistline, and perfect skin. She really does look like her namesake, aside from around her face. So while Cher and I have never gotten along, Really, it's still easy to see that it's pure jealousy making her bully me now. But I also know she won't push it far enough to get herself into much trouble. Unless I feel like getting her in trouble, of course. As I said earlier, I can still fight some of my own battles. I did not write that memo, no. I snort. I could go back and add some addendums for you, though, Cher. <laughs> she stands up with the memo in her hand. She doesn't even look at it before letting it drop to her desk. One of the male interns glances up from his own desk 
and decides he doesn't want to get involved with our drama. Maybe he's scared of Cher. I know I usually would be right now. So, how serious is it between you and the boss? I'm taken aback. Excuse me? Please, I'm not looking for gross details. It's clear you two are up to no good. What is that face for? I'm asking to find out if he's got you on a leash behind the scenes. He doesn't. No. So you wouldn't mind coming out clubbing with the other girls and me tonight? Huh? The rest of us are going out tonight after work. Drinks, dancing, meeting up at that new place, Blue Sky, that's supposed to be all the rage. You should come, if Mr. Marcus lets you. Is this a trap? I'd have to clear it with him first. I'll text you the details. Your number's the same, right? Yes. Julian bought me the latest and greatest phone because, as he swore, the slow speed, or my old one, drove him crazy. Like I said, I'd love to go with you. I simply need to clear it with Mr. Marcus first. Make sure you do that. Cher twiddles her fingers in my direction before heading for the copy room. Bring some of those hunky bodyguards, too. We need all the man meat we can get to pregame. I'll work on it. I'll also head back upstairs to put my name on Julian's list of people who want to speak with him when he has a moment. You'd think that, since I'm his girlfriend and his assistant, I'd be allowed to see him whenever I want. Yeah, right. I put my name on the list like everyone else. Vern is the only one allowed to barge in, and that's only when there's a legit emergency. Me asking for a night off from his libido does not count. It's a half-hour wait. I bide my time catching up on work and doing some homework on the side, until Vern taps me on the shoulder and says I can go in. Julian is still on his computer when I enter. The man types faster than Vern, and that's saying a lot. It also says a lot that Julian isn't afraid to write most of his own emails, and this includes the parts of contracts he comes up with in tandem with his lawyers. I'm still getting used to everything going on in this office, let alone on the executive level. As an intern, I did such menial work that it's laughable now. What was checking for typos, making copies, and doing bottom-tier research when he's up drafting business contracts and brokering deals that will be taught in business school classes 20, 50 years from now? Lissa, he says with a flirty growl in his voice. Even so, he doesn't look away from his monitor. For a brief second, I'm entranced. My boyfriend is so... strong and rugged that I can barely contain my youthful hormones attempting to embarrass me in front of him. Fuck. Here I am asking if we can have a night off from each other. A Friday night, no less. To what do I owe this pleasure? It is pleasure, right? Finally, he gives me his undivided attention. Even business pleasure is a joy on a long afternoon before the weekend. I blush. It's a personal matter, yes. Oh, then do go on. With as much detail as possible. <laughs> Afraid it's not that kind of personal matter, sir. I love it when you call me that. When will I stop blushing? <laughs> I know. Anyway, I knew we had plans tonight, but... Granted, we were only going out to eat and then having a movie screening with some of his billionaire buddies three months before the movie actually hits theaters. But how much do I care about some action movie anyway? Julian only wants to stroke my thigh and see if he can get away with me sucking him off in a dark theater. The other interns were going out tonight, and they invited me to come with them. Is it okay if I go? Lissa. He leans back, gesturing to his lap. For once, I don't think he wants that dark theater sucking off. He wants me to sit on his lap, and boy, howdy am I inclined. Seriously, 
You've never sat on my boyfriend's lap, have you? I'm not the most petite woman in the world, and it makes me feel like a tiny million dollars. I could sit here all day. You don't have to ask me permission for something like that. What, do you think I control you that much? Well, no. Where are you going and who are you with? That's all I need to know. Cher and the other female interns. They said something about going to a club called Blue Sky. Do you know it? I see a flash of a frown on his face. I'm not sure how to take that. Preston actually owns that club. I'm sure it will be more than fine. Just... He rubs my thigh and electric sparks fire through me at the most inappropriate time. Don't stay out too late, my sweet. Buzz my driver when you're ready to leave and he'll bring you by my place. I'll be waiting for you. But not waiting up for me, right? Of course not. But I will look forward to seeing your beautiful face, Lissa. In whatever enticing club wear you feel like wearing tonight. He tips my chin up, his delightful fingers tracing my throat. I'll find ways to keep myself occupied until we meet up again. Preston's been bugging me about giving him some attention. He'd think he was my boyfriend, but I keep reminding him that I'm not my brother. Speaking of, I need to get more details of this wedding we're going to soon, but I can ask about that later. I should get back to work. I slip off his lap. Talk to you later, Julian. He slaps my ass the moment I turn around. Thanks, Julian. Now I'm aroused when I should be thinking about screaming at HR for that. Chapter 8 Alyssa Get a whole round, Cher yells over the throbbing club music. No, I said a whole round. Good Mother Mary, the server gestures to her ear one last time, but... The music is so damned loud that even I can barely hear Cher, and she's sitting right next to me. Like I'm her best friend or something. The server spits something back at us. Oh my god, not spinning around a whole round. Finally, the server understands that the five of us want a round of drinks to start our evening with. I'm not sure what we're getting. A round of tequila? <laughs> Probably. It's not Pabst Blue Ribbon, that's for sure, even though half of Portland is probably crying for one right now. This place is way too swanky for store-bought beer. Preston Bradley loves his nightclubs, bars, and strip joints. He owns like ten of each in Oregon alone. Blue Sky is his latest venture that opened earlier this year and caters to the hip 20s crowd that I belong to. Well, maybe I'm not hip, but... You know what I mean. It's not a huge place, but then again, few places in Portland are. Instead of volume, this club is making mad money off drinks and the local celebs who frequent it because of the great food and request-friendly DJ. Every table is VIP. Or at least makes you feel like you're VIP. Our seven-person table is surrounded by carefully crafted iron barriers that give us a vague sense of privacy as we gab about sex, shopping, and school. You know, the three S's of the average college girl. Both Cher and another girl are in sororities and talk up the pledging that happened earlier this semester. That they missed. Because they were working their asses off at Bradley and Marcus for so little pay, we probably don't have to pay tax on it. Three of us have boyfriends, but one wouldn't mind breaking up with hers or cheating on him with some hot guy tonight. There are quite a few good-looking guys here. The night is young at eight in the evening, but I definitely smell cologne and aftershave as guys in fitted t-shirts and tight jeans filter in with high fives and knowing looks. Most of the men here tonight are athletic. Maybe they play for one of the two pro sports teams, or they're student-athletes from another school. Can't be sure. All I know is that they look loaded, even though they're wearing casual clothes. Most of them are covered in tattoos. Some of them bring dates with them, but most are stag. The other women who come in are likewise looking for a good time. 
a small bachelorette party explodes in the far corner of the room. Lots of guys elbow each other and waggle eyebrows. That is, until they find us, anyway. The girl sitting at the far edge of our booth is named Heather. The mousiest of us all, if I'm being honest. She's only slightly older than me, but has a worldly look in her eyes the moment a man approaches her. She glances at his jeans before chomping on her lip with a shit-eating grin. Wanna dance? That's all he says. Wow. The rest of us goad her on to dance with him. Before any of us can say bon voyage, Heather is off to grind against some footballer inked from head to toe, and with a package that says he's been in a few women. To be fair, Heather looks comfortable enough with him, even without a second drink, but I'm thinking she's not a virgin. At all. Lucky, Cher sneers. Our second round of drinks arrive. Let's toast to Heather getting plowed in the back alley tonight. She holds up her drink, and we follow suit. And let's toast to our sweet Alyssa. I almost spit my drink back out. Come again? Come on, girl. You're boning the boss. We all know it. You think we don't know that you ain't getting his billionaire D on the reg now? Apparently, everyone else has drunk enough now because they sagely nod, as if they've been thinking the same thing this whole time. I haven't drunk enough. I need a third drink before committing to sharing any of my personal information, let alone about Julian. Tell us, someone named Lizzie says. How big is he? We've got a pool going. Heather says he's eight inches. I think he's a full ten. Cher snorts beside me. Please. Six. Tops. He's compensating. She looks at me. Well, how big? How big is what? Oh, you mean that? They look at me expectantly. I have no idea. Come on, they all yell in unison. You're such a lucky bitch, Lizzie says, already tipsy. That man struts around the office barking orders and threatening to chop off everyone's heads. And all I can think is that I can't wait for him to call me into his office for a spanking. I shift in my seat. <laughs> fuck spanking. I want him to fuck me, says Jackie, the fifth girl in our group. She's the oldest out of us all, a nice and haggard twenty-five. He looks like a power driller. She almost slams her palm against the edge of the table and uses her other hand to mimic hot, raw, doggy-style sex. Am I hot or cold here, Alyssa? I'm so red that I can't even blame the alcohol on my complexion. What I want to know is, why you? Cher scoffs. If he wanted to fuck an intern, you'd think he'd pick me. You would say that, Cher. You're so up your own ass. I'm only saying. I'm way hotter than Alyssa. Both Jackie and Lizzie see how uncomfortable I am and decide to vindicate me through Cher. <laughs> Not everyone is into you, Cher. There's a reason you don't have a boyfriend. It's because you're a bitch and Alyssa isn't. You're the bitches, she mumbles. Besides, Mr. Marcus isn't really my type. I'm more of a Mr. Bradley kind of girl. Now that's the real surprise. Heather stumbles back toward our table, her visage lush with dance fever and probably whatever fever the footballer covered in tats gave her. Oh my god, you guys. That man practically fucked me standing up. With her clothes on. My turn, Jackie says, getting up. Someone find me a dick to suck. Mama's got an oral fixation in need of placating. These are the straightest guys in the world, Heather continues. They're all DTF and looking for their hookups of the night. Get going. I'm in. Me too. Don't you have a boyfriend? I ask Lizzie. Fuck him. 
I'm breaking up with him right now. I think that's the drink talking. I think. Even the alcohol is starting to get to me, and I'm not a super lightweight. But what can I do besides refuse another round right now? Cher gets a third drink before mumbling about finding someone to screw that night. You don't know how good you've got it, she mumbles to me. We're the only two left at the table. I don't know why she didn't join the others. Having a hot and rich boyfriend? Ugh. What I would do and who I would kill. Did you mean what you said? I can't believe I'm opening up this kind of conversation with her. About crushing on Mr. Bradley? Why do you care? You gonna hook me up with him? I honestly can't see them as a couple. Mr. Bradley is so carefree, compared to Julian anyway, that someone as uptight as Cher would drive him up the wall after a while. I've also never seen him around women who look so posh as her. Cher is off the runway, old money heiress pretty. Mr. Bradley likes his women a bit more down to earth from what I can tell. I mean, I could probably put in a good word, I say. But he's really against Mr. Marcus going against HR with me. So I keep hearing. Cher snorts into her empty glass. So it's true. You and Mr. Marcus are a real deal. He's my boyfriend, I guess. There's no guessing on my side, but I have to be careful with what I say. I don't need Cher knowing every sexy detail of my relationship. You guess? Girl, either you are or you aren't. I guess we are, then. She's about to say something else to me when two of the hot men dancing on the floor approaches our table. Ladies, a dark-skinned hunk with shorn hair and two piercings in both ears leans against our table. His buddy, a Portland blonde with more tats than an actual tattoo artist, waggles his eyebrows at us, as if that's supposed to turn us on. What are you two lovely vixens doing at this table by yourselves? Your friends are over there having fun. He jerks his thumb toward the dance floor where Heather, Lizzie, and Jackie are in the middle of a muscle-bound ape sandwich. The shrieking and laughter coming from their midst gives me shivers. Come dance with us. We'll show you a good time. Sorry, I'm taken, I say. But she's not. I nudge Cher. How about we want both of you? Come on, your guy doesn't have to know. What if my guy is the business partner of the man who owns this place? <laughs> they wouldn't believe me. He'll find out. He's got eyes and ears everywhere. Sure enough, a man wearing all black approaches our table. Do you gentlemen need help? The lady says she doesn't want to dance. This isn't a bouncer. Well, not one employed by the club, anyway. Even Cher instantly recognizes one of Mr. Marcus's head bodyguards. No doubt he's been assigned to tail us. I mean, me. Fuck. Hey, man. This is our table to work. You're not working anyone. Particularly not Ms. Pendleton. He nods toward me. It's okay, Stu. I put on a fake smile to make sure the bodyguard knows I'm not threatened. They were mostly flirting with Cher here. You remember her from the office, yeah? He keeps his muscular arms crossed and says nothing. Duh, he knows Cher. I'm sure he knows the names and backgrounds of everyone working in the office. It's sort of his job. I'm not interested right now, Cher says. Maybe later. The guys tuck their tails between their legs and go hit up some other table. Our friends wave at us from the dance floor. Stu backs off into the shadows. I turn to Cher and say, Sorry, I think he's here because of me. She doesn't say anything. Not until the server comes by and she orders us more drinks. I know I shouldn't have a third drink. Two is my limit if I'm out partying. Two regular drinks? And I'm tipsy enough to have fun, but... 
sober enough to make sound, moral decisions about my life and relationships. Three, and I'm like my old friends on the dance floor, grinding ass against random dick and hoping to get laid. Obviously, I never got laid. Never had the guts for it, even when I had three drinks in me. And now I've got a boyfriend. Oh well. So I really shouldn't have this third drink. I know I shouldn't. Especially with Stu babysitting me tonight. I do it. I have a third drink. I mean, <laughs> Stu is babysitting me, right? Cher downs her drink and says we should go dance together. I think, why not? Nobody will care if I'm dancing with my friends and have a good time in my sparkly tube dress I bought on the cheap a year ago. It's scratchy, I'm sweating, but I'm also half drunk and don't give a fuck. Bring on the strobe lights and the thrumming club music. I'm sure I don't have to tell you what happens. As soon as we hit that dance floor, it's not her and me anymore. Well, Cher is there, but so are about three other guys who hone in on us and decide it's time to move in on some hot asses in club dresses. We're drunk, right? This is what happens when people get drunk and want to bone each other. It's like, I know Stu is there. I know Julian has told him to keep guys off me. I know he's been told that I have a no fraternization with other men clause in our stupid relationship contract. But damn it, I'm 21 and wanna party. No way I'm gonna sleep with these guys. I'm barely going to dance in between them. I'll maybe tell them they're hot and accept a compliment if they tell me that I'm hot. Hey, Julian can't be the only guy that thinks I'm a smoking hot beauty. Maybe a girl likes to hear it from other guys once in a while. It's good for my confidence, damn it. All it takes is one guy brushing against my ass, and suddenly the party is over. Excuse me. Stu puts a firm hand on the guy's arm. I don't believe you have permission to do that, sir. Everyone stops dancing around us. Except for me. I'm still happily hopping to the beat and hoping for someone else to compliment me in my hot dress. When I finally stop moving, it's only because I've realized that everyone else isn't moving anymore. Nobody except the guy Stu has put his hand on, because he throws a drunken punch. At least my Friday night is interesting. Chapter 9 Julian I'm enjoying dinner with Preston when I get a call from my head of security. I know it's not good. Got into an altercation at the club, he candidly reports. Everything's taken care of. No police. Your girlfriend's pissed, though. What happened? Did someone try to touch her? Some frat guy tried to move in on her while she was dancing. I attempted to put a stop to it, and he slung a wild one at me. No damage done. Nothing but his pride, sir. Good work. How's Alyssa? Like I said, she's pissed. Ruined the fun for her and the other girls. She'll get over it. Make sure she's put into my car and taken straight to my residence. After that, sir. I hang up and shove my phone into my jacket pocket. Preston looks up from his dinner, still chewing on his steak. Problem with your girlfriend? He asks. Nothing Stu couldn't take care of. A few men didn't know how to keep their hands to themselves at your newest club. Is that a specific jibe at my expense? Because I'll have you know that the bouncers at the place are top-notch. Or so my manager there assures me. Typical Preston. Beyond the initial preparations, he has nothing to do with his properties beyond dropping in once in a while to party and to make sure his coffers remained filled. I don't have anything to do with them. I've got my own money-making projects on the side, and so does Preston. The only reason I was so blasé about letting Alyssa go out with her girlfriends tonight was because he owned the club she name-dropped. I should have known better. Then again, maybe I subconsciously did. Hence why I sent Stu after them while I kept to old haunts I knew I could count on to watch my back. 
I push my chair back and stand, politely asking the server who swings by to box up the remainder of my dinner for me to take home to finish. I do not doubt that Alyssa will be heading back to my place shortly, especially if Stu is in charge around there now. I need to beat them there and make sure she comes home to the perfect image already in my head. Alyssa needs to learn a few lessons. Sometimes I forget how young she still is, since I'm at a point in my life where I don't usually fool around with women whose brains aren't fully developed yet. I should have known this would happen. A group of young women at a nightclub full of men loaded up on testosterone and alcohol. The only way this night could have ended was with them being flirted with to the point of depravity. I don't care what those other girls do. I only care that Alyssa knows she is not to fraternize with other men. Ever. That is one of the hardest lines she could think about crossing around me. Otherwise, I don't ask for much, other than her time and attentions. She wants to clear going out with some friends, study groups, or family? It's fine. I'm willing to work with that. But the moment a man in her vicinity starts sniffing around her, and she humors him, she needs to know how to recognize those moments and shut them down. Looks like I'm going to have to show her how. I call Vern the moment I'm in the back of a cab back to my place. I tell him what I need, and when I hang up I already feel a ton better. I'm not calling Alyssa. I also don't get a text from her. I don't need one. Stu briefly calls me back and confirms that he and my driver are about to drop her off in the lobby of my building. Before I continue, let me make one thing clear. I had not planned on digging into this level of our relationship so soon, if at all. I enjoy a lot of unconventional pleasures in my life. I don't see women as being beneath me, but I do recognize the unique place they have in the world. Now, whether that place is because of biology or the intrinsic fates of our society, I can't say. Nor do I desire to jump deeply into it. That's for men and women in other fields of academia to explore. I'll sit on the sidelines and absorb what they decide and apply it to my own life however I please. Fact of the matter is, many women enjoy submitting in relationships, and many men enjoy dominating. I'd say that Alyssa and I are definitely on the road to enjoying those types of pleasures as well, particularly in our personal lives. How she desires to conduct herself at work is something we can go over together later. For now. I want her to understand how things work personally. There are items in my possession that will do that. But I'm not interested in many third-party tools and toys. Not when most foreplay is psychological. I'm waiting for her in my living room when she arrives. Her sparkly blue tube dress is both trashy and chic. Trashy because of the poor, cheap quality, and chic because of how good it looks on her curvy frame. The rest of her has looked better, however. Her hair is a little tangled from the wind, light rain splatter and the sweat lining her forehead. Her makeup isn't as fresh as it was this afternoon. Her shoes are in her hand the moment she walks into my penthouse, and the sigh of relief she exhales screams that she's happy to be barefoot again. I let her have this small reprieve. We need to talk. Julian! Has she only now noticed me? Not like I'm sitting in the dark or trying to hide in the shadows. Honestly, I'm rather put out that she's so entrenched in her own reality that she doesn't see me right away. I can explain what happened tonight. No need. Stu filled me in after he had to get involved. Someone tried to put their hands on you? She drops her clutch in one of my chairs and leans against my furniture. I don't know if I would put it that way. I was dancing with Cher, and these guys decided they wanted to dance with us. Stu was the one who made shit awkward and antagonized the other guys. What my fair and young Alyssa doesn't realize is that those men would have been antagonized by anything. Better for my bodyguard to be the one to do it than any of the women there. At least Stu can physically defend himself with no issues. You were dancing with other men. I know what that sounds like, but I swear... No need to swear anything, Lissa. I was under the impression that you were going out with your girlfriends to blow off some steam with female company. 
That was fine. What I'm not fine with is you fraternizing with strange women we don't know we can trust. But, Alyssa, I stand up with the same authority I command in the boardroom. It has the desired effect. She takes a step back, eyes wide. Don't be naive. I didn't have to be there to know that at least one of those men had decided on sleeping with you tonight. Even if you had no intention of doing so, the fact of the matter is you would have been in a dangerous position. She throws her hands up. So what am I supposed to do? I told those guys I had a boyfriend. What do you want from me? Her anger is beauty personified. Passionate. Determined. Ready to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with me, and I damn well deserve it. That doesn't mean I won't put up a fight, however. If Alyssa wants to continue growing like this, then she needs someone who will always challenge her to rethink her positions and to make compelling arguments. That person is going to be me, by the way. I am going to challenge her every step of the way. It's what she obviously wanted when she started working as an intern in my office. Come with me, I say, gesturing her toward my bedroom. There's something I want to show you. That's what I want from you. Oh my god, Julian. She rolls her eyes before falling in step behind me. What is it this time? More whips and chains? No, not that. Something like that, though. I turn on the light in my bedroom. She stops in the doorway, flummoxed, gasping. Too far gone in disbelief to be of any use in the world of conversation right now. You have got to be kidding me, she finally says. Oh, dear Alyssa, no man is ever kidding when he presents you with a comfortable collar and a pretty leash to go with it. That's simply not how we function. No. When we present our dearest women with these implements, we mean a different kind of business entirely. The night's still young, Lissa. Why don't you and I explore what it truly means for you to belong to me? Honestly, I'm shocked she doesn't slap me, but that's a good sign. It means we're on the same page. Whether she wants to admit it or not. Chapter 10 Alyssa it's a miracle that I didn't slap him when he flat out implied he wanted to collar me like a dog. Because apparently, that's what Julian Marcus thinks I am. His bitch. I may have been a virgin when we first hooked up, but I wasn't innocent or naive about relationships or men. He thinks he's some big brother figure right now. Some pervy, incestual big brother figure, I'm sure, who is going to teach me what men are really thinking when they start grinding on me at the club. Like I don't know. Seriously, he thinks I didn't know that guy wanted to fuck me? Like I said before, I had one drink too many, but I am sobered the fuck up now. How else could I feel when there is a leash dangling from my throat? Yeah, that's right. I put it on. Why? Moment of weakness, I suppose we could call it. An intense, stupid moment of weakness, because how am I supposed to look at this man and not fall prey to his stupid whims? I'm wearing that sheer white negligee he bought for me a while back. You know, the one. Was supposed to wear it, but he had me ride his lap instead. Yeah, that one. I'm wearing that. No underwear and my tangled, sweaty hair from the club piled on top of my head, with nothing more than a few pins and a crystal clasp holding it together. The color is comfortable enough, I suppose. Not that I've worn any others before, of course. But this one has a soft leather lining that caresses my skin, even when I quickly turn my head around. Otherwise, it's a simple sterling silver collar with no add-ons. A basic but nice piece of BDSM jewelry bought straight from the manufacturer. The leash is likewise sterling silver and adjustable for play. The end of it wraps tightly around Julian's hand as he looms from the edge of the bed, staring into my eyes. 
Think this would clear a few things up if I took you to the club like this? I shudder. I'm on my knees, skin rubbing against the carpet whenever he slightly yanks that chain. I gotta admit, there's a little thrill to it. But I'm also terrified. Not of him hurting me, but of what this could possibly mean. What if this is some point of no return I'm never coming back from? We're never coming back from. I think I would be mortified, honestly. I mutter. Now, now. He pats my cheek. At first, it's soothing. But not two seconds later, I'm fuming beneath this collar. How dare he, honestly? It's one thing to spank me. It's quite another to be patronizing me with a cheek pat. This isn't the kind of thing we would do in public. This is the kind of thing we do at home so we can further build our bond. He's kidding, right? Build our bond? While I'm on my knees with a leash around my neck? He's got to be kidding. Lissa, he says to get my attention again. I'm not doing this to humiliate you. I'm not doing it to make you hate me or, God forbid, yourself. This is both a trust exercise and meant to make us enjoy our relationship on another level. Namely, he tugs on the leash. Like his pet, I lightly move back, compelled to put my hand against his leg for leverage. We look like the most fucked-up romance book cover since 50s pulp fiction. Whenever we are apart, you will always be thinking of me. When another man approaches you, I will be the first thing you think of. Do you understand? Oh, I understand. I think of you already, sir. That's what you say. But tonight's actions imply otherwise. What do you have to say for yourself about that? What the hell else is there for me to say? I'm sorry that I shook your trust in me tonight, sir. I never said anything about shaken trust. If anything, my main concern is that men thought it appropriate to approach you like that. It doesn't matter what's in your head if I'm not assured you're protected when out there without me. What is this? Does he want a five-mile radius free of men around me? Because not only is that impossible, but it's offensive to me. He does realize that I talk to guys every day, right? It doesn't matter if they secretly or not so secretly want to fuck me. As long as they keep their hands to themselves, they can ask me whatever they want, even if it's a guise to get closer to me for a few seconds. Smell my perfume, shampoo, whatever creepy shit guys do. Last I checked, I had a bodyguard following me around to keep weirdos from touching or harassing me, and nothing more. I wasn't being harassed in the club. I was barely being touched. Some harmless dancing. Who the hell cares if that guy got hard from dancing with Cher and me? Julian's not the only one who gets hard around me, damn it. When we're not together, Lissa, he further explains, the world needs to feel and see our connection. This, he caresses the leash connecting my throat to his hand, is everything. It's there, even when you can't see it. You. Me. Together we are one. It's as beautifully simple as that. I scoff. Somehow I have a feeling this isn't only about the club. You've been thinking about this for a while, Mr. Marcus. You bet your gorgeous ass lovely. For a moment... I see the real him behind the bossy billionaire facade. Yes, folks, there's a real person behind the stoic businessman Julian Marcus always presents himself as, even to me. I get rare glimpses of it. But as the days go on in our relationship, the more I become acquainted with the excited boy lurking behind brilliant blue eyes and a stoic poker face. He looks like a man I could comfortably kiss. A man I could cuddle up with on the couch and want to spoon me in bed. He doesn't look anything like the man who seduced me in his office not too long ago. 
He almost sucks me in. This has two effects on me. The first lulls me into a fun sense of security, a reminder that at the end of the day, this is nothing more than a sex game, a fantasy he wants to enact. But it also scares me. Because what if the man I'm falling in love with isn't this one, but the facade? Yes, falling in love. Like I know he's falling in love with me. This? I wrap my hand around the leash, so close to his hand that I could touch him if I want. I'll let him initiate that, though. The link between you and me, sir? A glimmer of the facade returns. Yes. Even when it's not physically here, it remains between our hearts. Is that a hard concept to understand? Not at all, sir. I close my eyes when he lightly kisses me. I'm ready. To throw myself into this fantasy, that is. Julian wants to feel perpetually connected to me? I'm not a girl who is about to turn that opportunity down. I can hear the other interns yelling at me right now. Do it, girl. Lock that shit down. Make him love you long enough to make you his first Mrs. Marcus. He kisses me harder, hand giving my leash a firm yank. He pulls me forward. I'm at his mercy now. Before, my eyes were open to these behind-closed-doors possibilities. I never thought of myself as submissive in the bedroom, but had I a real chance to explore that before? I wouldn't trust any of my ex-boyfriends to help me learn about that, let alone be a good partner in the realm of soft BDSM. Julian, though? A man as strong, dependable, and assured as him? He knows what he's about. He knows what he wants from his relationships. His older, wiser experiences scream that he is ready to show me everything I've been missing in my life. How fortunate I am to meet him when I'm still young. How proud would you be to be seen like this with me? Out there. I remain kneeling before him, my lips against his while my knees and palms dig into the carpet beneath us. He is truly the dominant one in this situation. And me? Submissive to my excited core. He has his powerful, gorgeous suit on, and I'm in nothing but this sheer negligee. If we walked outside right now, I'd freeze. And that's before the public would see my nipples and pubic hair beneath the white of this barely-there fabric. I'm his woman. His lover. His bedroom slave he gets to do whatever he wants with. At least, now I'm not ashamed to say that it's making me wet. His finger grazes my nipple. Well, now I'm really wet. I'm going to get you a real collar after this, lovely. Tomorrow we're going to the jewelers to pick out something we both adore. And don't worry, it'll be appropriate for public wearing. Unlike this outfit. Julian hooks his finger beneath my strap and forces it down my arm. My left breast almost falls out of this negligee. This outfit is only for me to enjoy. He turns my head back toward him before I can respond. Promise me that you are mine, Lissa. And I will promise that I am yours. My eyes widen. Truly? Even now, with all the demands he has of me, it seems impossible... How could a man like him be mine? I admit, I am prone to jealousy as well. Sometimes I see him in meetings with women. Beautiful, intelligent women who can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him in the boardroom. Women making deliveries who are so cute, he double-takes at them. Women passing us by in restaurants and on the street who are so well put together that they have a confidence I never will. Am I afraid that one day he will realize these women are way more his type and suitable for a relationship with him than I ever will be? Absolutely. A part of me, 
or many parts of me, worry every single day that Julian's gonna wake up and wonder what the fuck he's doing with me. Oh well, I spent a grand ride, right? Truly. I want to cry. I promised myself that I wouldn't be so taken in that I want to cry. Yet here I am, falling hook, line, and sinker for his promises that may or may not mean anything at all. I'm yours, I tell my boyfriend. I'm totally yours. And I'm yours, my sweet. When we kiss again, it's with the unbridled passion I've come to expect from a man like Julian Marcus. Dare I believe this isn't a fling? That this isn't only a passing interest that he has in me? That this could possibly last years? My life? Dare I believe? I am not shocked when he takes me to bed. I'm not surprised when he takes off his clothes and makes love to me with my collar and leash still on. I'm anything but confused when the urgency with which he makes love to me overpowers everything else and makes me feel like I honestly, truly belong to him. He wasn't kidding when he said we could be one, and yet it feels so impossible to me. How could we possibly be one when we're such two completely different people, when we've known each other for such little time. The way he kisses me doesn't betray the differences between us. If anything, I'm able to forget that we are who we are. That I'm Alyssa Pendleton, 21-year-old intern with nothing else going for her other than her boyfriend, and that he's Julian Marcus billionaire son of an old family fortune that goes back beyond when Europeans first settled the West Coast. When we're naked like this in bed, you'd never guess that we were anything more than two simple people. He wants me so badly. I can feel it in the way he thrusts between my legs, urgently filling me up with his body, his heart, and pieces of his soul. This isn't like the first time we made love in his office. Back then, it was all about the physical, the sexual. Now, I dare say we're enjoying the finer fruits of actual lovemaking. I wish it didn't scare the damn piss out of me. I'm not ready to fall in love like this. I'm not ready to throw myself to the first man who comes along and says he'll have me. That's not healthy, right? That's not how it works in the real world. This is some crazy fantasy I find myself in. Every thrust into my body brings me dangerously closer to reality. And that's the last place I want to be. Ever. I don't even orgasm. I don't have to. Having Julian make love to me is enough to make me feel so good. I can't possibly come down from this high ever again. But he comes. Hard. I've never heard him make this sound before. For as much sex as we've had by now, I know I've definitely never heard this guttural groan before. It's not merely desperate. It's needy. For me... I'm but a mere woman, you know? I'm tiny compared to him. Yet I feel like a comparable vessel to whatever he wants to give me. When he climaxes, it's more than usual. One, two, sometimes three spurts, he's done. Spent. I'm always amazed, of course, but not as much as I am tonight when I get a fourth filling of his seed inside of me. Hot. Intense. All for me. Slow, languid kisses commence before we're allowed to acknowledge that it's over. The leash is tossed to the other end of the bed. Right now it's only me and Julian. We don't need the leash to show the world how connected we are. Wherever we go, I know he's there. In me. 
a part of me. I don't want this to end. Chapter 11 Julian I receive a call in the middle of the night. It takes me a few moments to wake up, disengage my body from Alyssa's, and turn over deftly enough to find my phone on the nightstand. The call is from Stu. He wouldn't call me after midnight unless it was truly important. Yes, I growl into the phone. He better make this good. Alyssa stirs beside me, half awake. Her hand strokes my chest, and it's almost enough to lull me back into sleep. I found out who was leaving those notes in Bradley's office. I do love how no-nonsense this man is. Since you asked me to look into it tonight, sir. Had I? Suppose I had. Once I decided on what to do with Alyssa tonight, I had forgotten everything else. Who is it? Cher Lieberman, one of your female interns. He pauses for effect. I honestly have no idea who this woman is. She was with Ms. Pendleton tonight at the club. What should I do about this? You're absolutely sure? Absolutely. I sit up. Alyssa snorts herself awake, although her face says she really wants to go back to sleep. I don't blame her. Then make sure she's fired by Monday morning. Call Preston for me and let him know, too. I'm sure he'll tell you the same thing. Technically, all of the interns were our employees, not only mine. He has every right to know the same moment I do that someone's getting fired, regardless of the reason. Yes, sir. I'll do so right away. Thank you. Good night. I hang up. If there was anything else, he can leave a voicemail or text me. What was that about? Alyssa asks. Who's getting fired? My yawn, settling back down to resume sleeping. One of your old co-workers? Cher Lieberman, I think. Stu found some incriminating things about her. I don't need to tell her what. Or maybe I do. What? Alyssa jerks upright. Cher? You're firing her? What for? Don't worry about that. I'll tell you more in the morning. Julian Marcus? She insists. Tell me right now. Well, guess we're awake. Thanks, Cher. Whoever the hell you are. Part 4. Needed by the Billionaire. Chapter 1. Alyssa. A lot has changed in my life since Julian Marcus called me up to his office one fateful Friday night. Two months. It has been two months, and I barely recognize the life I used to live. I'm still Alyssa, the college student. I'm still Alyssa, the office worker. But I'm also Alyssa, the girlfriend of THE Julian Marcus. Two months ago, I definitely felt like I was in the biggest sugar baby situation to ever slam into rainy-ass Portland. Everything was precarious. At any moment, Julian would realize how boring I was, how not a virgin I was since he first fucked me, and move on to another woman who whetted his appetite. I lived with that knowledge, and told myself I wouldn't get attached. Then a month passed, and I realized that not only do I have some feelings for Julian, but he has feelings for me. No, he hasn't told me about them yet. He's not the kind of guy to say, I love you, even a year later. I don't need anyone to tell me that, either. I can tell after spending almost every single day with him since we first hooked up. Other things have changed, however. While Julian and I grow closer, antagonism springs up in his otherwise peaceful executive office. While I learn my trade better and apprentice beneath Vern, one of the greatest assistants on the West Coast, 
Strife rips open between Preston Bradley and the other interns I used to work with. When I started working here, there were ten of us. Five men and five women. Ten of the most coveted intern spots in Portland, let alone the Pacific Northwest. I got the last spot by the skin of my teeth. I'm super at interviews, and I made sure my grades and references were the best they could possibly be when I applied last semester. When Preston Bradley personally interviewed me during the final round, his natural charisma made me feel comfortable enough to nail that interview. Who knew I'd be fucking the other half of Bradley and Marcus a few weeks later, though? When I was promoted because Julian wanted me on the same floor as him, I left a hole behind. A hole that everyone was able to cover because it wasn't like I contributed a whole lot anyway. Now, however, I walk downstairs on a bright late spring day and find not one, but two desks empty. The other interns scramble themselves a bit more ragged to cover the holes. When Vern doesn't have a whole lot for me to do, I sometimes pop down here to help fill in, especially if one of the interns had to call out for one reason or another. Not like I needed any training to do a job I used to do anyway. Hey, I'm actually a boon now because I know exactly what Mr. Marcus wants. Trust me when I say his personal instructions could be a bit clearer and not as loaded with his personal jargon. But yes, someone else has been fired since I was promoted. Cher. I had no idea she was so jealous of me that she started spreading lies to Mr. Bradley, who then passed them on to my boyfriend. When I discovered she was the reason Julian had me suddenly take a bunch of STD tests to be on the safe side, even I was pretty pissed at her. I knew Cher had a volatile personality who was good at putting on a front to get positions like the one she had, but damn, that was so not okay. And while we had a budding friendship by the time we went out partying together one fateful night— I couldn't blame Julian firing her once his personal security chief found out who was behind the rumors. I didn't like it, but I couldn't blame him. I don't know what happened to Cher. I mean, one minute she was here, being a bitchy thorn in my side but otherwise harmless, and next she was packing up her desk and calling me a skank-ass hoe on her way out the door. None of the other interns know what happened to her either. She goes to a different school from me, so I don't see her around my campus. On days like today, though, it's hard for me to come downstairs and see that empty desk by the window. Even with her tan skin and dark hair, Cher always wore the most colorful designer clothes, had loud earrings dangling from her ears, and rainbow-colored pumps that slammed against the floor whenever she walked. The other interns are so drab compared to her. A sea of black, navy blue, gray, light brown, and white. They also don't have the same colorful personality. Who knew I'd miss her crazy ass? I had actually felt sorry for her. Because, for a while, I thought she was jealous of me sleeping with Julian. Turned out, she crushed on Mr. Bradley. I heard something about you guys needing an extra hand? I say to Lizzie, one of the remaining interns. She drops her smartphone and leans back in her seat when I address her. Yeah, we're editing the new tech manual going out in a few days. All hands on deck. We've divided it up in chunks, but our brains are so fried reading through it that... She gestures to her chunk sprawled out on her desk. Highlighters and post-its litter everything... But that Candy Crush game has obviously been going on for a while on Lizzie's phone. Can't blame her. My head already hurts from staring at that tiny technical print. Kill me, Lissa. I flinch, because that's what Julian calls me when we're alone. And I'm not used to other people adopting it. Not even my parents ever called me that. Can't do that. So I'm here to help you. Give me the last section there and I'll get to work at my old desk. You'll want these too, then. She slides two highlighters in my direction. Yellow and pink. Classic. 
I'll also give you a copy of the instructions. I've memorized them by now. Yeah, well, I wrote them. I ain't lying, either. I did not envy these interns when I wrote up these monotonous instructions and emailed them to everyone. Now I'm feeling the irony like a crowbar to the back of my head. I take my section and the highlighters over to Cher's old desk by the window. The expansive cityscape of downtown Portland looks so much different than it did two months ago. Gone are the dreary gray clouds and ominous rain of a long winter. Now it's nothing but beautiful sunshine. Spring came late, but when it hit us, it was overnight. It makes me excited, thinking about the man I get to enjoy this summer with. I'm such a hopeless romantic, really. I imagine us sitting at outdoor restaurants, enjoying calm breezes, warm air, and the frivolous feelings a good IPA instills into us and the surrounding populace. I'm no fool. I know Julian's not going to be really into that, but I also think about his brother's wedding happening next month. Julian's the best man, and I'm his date. It's going to be the gay wedding of the summer around here, and I still don't have a dress. Miss Pendleton. I barely hear the voice calling out my name from the doorway. It takes another, louder, Miss Pendleton before I recognize Preston Bradley's tenor summoning my attention. Huh? <laughs> what does he want from me? If Julian or Vern needed something, they call me directly. This morning, Julian sent me a bouquet of fresh-cut roses from my desk, which I was kind enough to put on the receptionist's desk to keep things bright and beautiful on an equally beautiful day. He doesn't look happy. Then again, he rarely looks happy around me. Oh, I stand up from my seat. Yes? Can I see you in the conference room for a few minutes? He walks away before I can confirm that I'll follow him in there. Well, okay. I send Lizzie a shrug before picking up my purse and following Mr. Bradley into the conference room. He's already sitting by the window with nothing but a mug of coffee from the break room to keep him company until I get there. Oh, no. What the hell is this about? Have I done something? This guy has been unhappy with my arrangement with Julian ever since we blew up two months ago. Is this going to be an ultimatum? Have a seat, Miss Pendleton. I sit two chairs away from him. Is everything all right, Mr. Bradley? No. He leans forward, hands folding on the table. Everything is not all right. I gasp. Has something happened to Julian? Please, tell me I want to help. Oh, I know you do. He furrows his light brown brows at me. You're very helpful, Miss Pendleton. I dare say you're too helpful. I brace myself. I can tell he's going to change the subject before the words are even out of his mouth. How much do you actually care about Julian? All right, so I knew he was going to change the subject, but to that? Is he kidding? I care for him very much. You must know that, Mr. Bradley. Yes, yes, you care. But about what, exactly? Really? I'm used to these sorts of questions by now, but really? I care about more than his money and being spoiled, I assure you. I don't doubt it. There are also his physical assets that are far from subpar. Did he make a sex joke? I know this guy owns half the strip clubs in Portland, but a sex joke? With me? In private? When he's never shared that side of his humor with me since I started dating Julian? He's kidding. Flustered, I say the first thing to come to mind. I care about his whole package. Thank you. It's hard for a woman to not care when a man shows her as much attention as Julian has. At least you admit it, Miss Pendleton. The hell does that mean? 
Forgive me for prying into your motives. You have to understand that I've been put into a precarious situation since you and Julian started dating so openly. Does this have to do with HR? Not really. There are other issues at hand. I swallow hard. I'm gonna be blunt with you, Ms. Pendleton. Julian has not been as, shall we say, productive since becoming infatuated with you. He crosses his legs and folds his hands across his lap. Behind him, the bright Portland skyline illuminates his bespoke Italian suit. Preston Bradley looks as young as he is, but you would never mistake him for an imposter in good duds like these. He used to be the most dependable man I could ask to work with, to the point I often begged him to take time off so he wouldn't wear himself down too quickly. He definitely wasn't any use to the company if he burnt out. Do you see where I'm going with this? A bristle. This man is indirectly attacking me. And if you think that makes me feel anything akin to comfortable, give me a break. I have seen some of the numbers for myself, sir. Julian isn't performing as well in the boardroom as he used to. I would hardly say he's underperforming, however. You're right. His production levels are exactly where they need to be for us to carry on as usual. Mr. Bradley levels the full force of his gaze toward me. That's the problem. Both he and I need to overperform, or we lose money. I'm not dumb. I know exactly what he's getting at. Between my classes and my experience in these situations, I also know exactly what to say. You think I'm bringing him down? You think I'm bringing the whole company down? On purpose? No. What I think, Ms. Pendleton, is that you're a young, naive woman. And I don't say that to intentionally offend or upset you. Who is having the time of her life? He may not be going out of his way to offend me, but damn if he isn't nailing it. Very few people have to see this side of Preston Bradley. Makes sense, though, that it would be someone like me who has to deal with it. Suppose I deserved it, eh? You're right, Mr. Bradley. I am having the time of my life. Being loved by someone like Julian is very... Loved? He isn't scoffing. He isn't even laughing. That is genuine surprise in his voice. Like he can't fathom a world in which Julian Marcus, his best friend and supposedly greatest confidant, loves someone like me. Or anyone, really. I know what Julian was like dating other women in his past. Trust me, I've heard all the stories, including from him. That's what I said, yes. He's... Told you that he loves you. Again, what is with this tone? Well, no, but I can tell. Oh, Alyssa. He sighs into his seat. Mr. Bradley almost never calls me by my first name. He's professional to a fault like that when we're at work. If people tell him to call me Ms. Pendleton, that's what he's calling me. I honestly do not envy you. I could explain it to him. I could say that I can feel his growing emotions for me, but that I also understand that Julian is not the kind of guy who easily falls in love with people, if at all. Shit, I've met his family a few times now. His mother is a cold, witch-like woman. His father is off doing his own thing, and if it so happens that his sons have the same interests as him, then good. They can have a relationship. So happens that Julian hates golfing. Guess what Mr. Marcus enjoys the most? His brother is too much of a rival and living on another plane of existence for Julian to relate to. So for him, this concept of falling in love with people is not something that comes naturally to him. If... Julian ever gets around to pledging his love to me, let alone acknowledging it, it's going to be a few years, probably. 
I'm not going to try explaining it to Mr. Bradley. How could he understand? I'm reaching the point where I am the person who understands Julian the most. What title that used to belong to this man sitting across from me. Perhaps he still understands him on a masculine level. But I am turning into Julian's most trusted confidant. Whether Mr. Bradley likes it or not. That's gotta be weird. I see where you're coming from. That's what I say instead of anything else. You're worried that Julian is going to lose himself in me instead of focusing on your business like he's supposed to. I get it. I really do. But I can't say that I feel bad about all of the attention he's been paying to me. It makes him happy, if you haven't noticed. I can assure you that I've noticed his change in mood since you came into his life, Miss Pendleton. Is he mocking me? I honestly can't tell anymore. But I'm willing to work with you since I understand you so much, Mr. Bradley. If I notice Julian slacking off on his work to be with me, I'll make sure it's corrected. I am, after all, one of his assistants and tasked with making sure he, uh, stays on task. That sounded a lot better in my head. I appreciate it. Yeah, I don't think he believes me when I say that. But what can he do? It's not in Mr. Bradley's nature to chew me out or make me feel like a dum-dum. He's definitely a keep-the-peace kind of guy. He probably sat on his hands for a long time before finally deciding to talk to me about his concerns. We shake hands. Strange, isn't it? I'm conspiring with my boyfriend's business partner to take care of this shit. It's like going behind his back to make sure he's babysat properly. Because clearly Vern isn't doing a good enough job. Shit. Vern's too busy trying to work for three people right now. I think I added to his workload instead of making it easier for him to get his own work done. Do you know how much oversight he has to perform over me? When I return to the office, it's to Lizzie rolling her eyes like Cher used to do. Yeah, I know. I'm a terrible help around here. If I actually get shit done, I'd... Well, I'd be worth the paycheck I'm now getting. Trust me when I say I see this from everyone's perspectives. I only have this job because Mr. Marcus is fucking me. And likes it. Usually I don't feel bad about it. Right now, though? I think Julian and I have to have a little chat tonight when we get back to his place after dinner. Speaking of, that's him lighting up my phone. As soon as I'm finished with his task, I'm to report to him for a teleconference. Vern is busy doing other things, and he needs me to take notes. Just another day at Bradley and Marcus. Chapter 2 Julian I've never been so happy. I can't even tell you why I'm so happy. Perhaps it's the winter finally wasting away and turning into endless sunshine. I may live in the northwest, but the constant rain weighs down a man. I much prefer the summer, when the warm sun is out and I get to see my girlfriends wearing hardly any clothing at all. I really should buy more skimpy dresses and nightgowns for Alyssa. She has a body born for them. If you could see what I do, you would absolutely agree. All I have to do is step out from my bedroom to see her perched on the alcove of my living room, gazing across the Willamette River with one bare foot dangling down and her opposite knee bent up in the air. She cocks her arm against her knee and gazes pensively toward the sunset, her chestnut brown hair glowing in the golden light. On top of that, she's wearing what we agree is the best of all the negligees she keeps here in my penthouse. Sheer, milky white, a silk robe that falls off her shoulders and grazes the floor. If you took a picture of her and printed it in a magazine, it would sell out copies, I'm telling you. But I don't want her image printed in magazines. Not like this. 
It's one thing for carefully posed photos of us to appear in the society pages when we attend parties. It's quite another for the world to see this intimate, sexual side of her that I do. That's for me alone. Mine. All mine. She tilts her head enough to see me out of the corner of her eye. Hello, beautiful, she says with a confident smile. Little old me in my slacks, shirt, and slippers. That's my line, lovely. <laughs> Don't care. Sometimes I get to throw your lines back at you, sir. Have I mentioned what a natural this woman is in my life? I could not have ever asked for a better girlfriend. Patient, beautiful, smart, gorgeous, instinctive, elegant. I really like how she looks, all right. Most of all, however, she knows exactly how to fit into my life. We work together at the office and play outside of the office. We're to the point where all I have to do is give her a quick glance and she's on her knees, pleasuring me, using everything I've taught her to bring me to my knees. I can't pay for this kind of intimacy. I don't care what Preston tells anyone. When I first seduced Alyssa, I never counted on her becoming the foil to my alpha tendencies. I'm not saying she's weak or fragile. I'm saying she knows how to support me, and how to forge her own path with me by her side. What else could I possibly ask for? I'm positively on cloud nine. The best part? I don't even have to think about it. I simply adore her, and don't worry about anything else. Lissa, I whisper into her ear. Little shudders travel across her skin. Let's say we take this to the bedroom. She looks me up and down, and mostly down, because I'm not hiding what she's done to me in my pants. You're the boss, sir. You want some nookie before settling in for the evening? I live to serve. She always knows what to say. I sweep her up into my arms and carry her to my bedroom, where I drop her on my bed and rip my shirt over my head. No need to unbutton it. No need to loosen up my tie when it's already on the floor. There is definitely no need to undo my trousers when Alyssa's already doing it for me. One of these days I'm going to have to make sure the pleasure train starts at her station. But today is not going to be that day because the moment her mouth is on my cock, I'm done for. This quickly turns into the Julian Marcus show, and I have zero issues with it. What I do have issues with, however, is her going into overdrive with that eager mouth of hers. Does she want me to come before I've barely had the chance to touch her? I don't think so. That's not how this is going to work. What's going to happen? I'm going to push her down onto my bed, legs spread open and tits spilling out of her negligee. That look of surprise on her face inspires me to surprise her even more. Always keep her guessing, yes. Especially when my cock is rock hard, and I can already tell that her cunt weeps for me. I want my bed rocking. I want her rocking back and forth on my bed, completely unable to take all of me, to deal with my strength, to process what the fuck I'm doing to her. To us. Every time we have sex, my only goal is to make her come as hard as possible. Today, I want her coming quickly as well. I don't always do that. Sometimes I want such complete control that I tell her when to come. Not tonight. My only goal is to make those eyes roll back and that voice scream into infinity because I'm the best lover she's ever going to have. If I have things my way... I'll be the only lover she ever has. Julian? Her gasp of adoration strikes me right in the heart. No woman has ever whispered my name like that, let alone in bed. Perhaps it's how raw it is that draws me into her body, my legs splitting hers apart on the edge of the bed and my cock spearing her where she lays. Her whole body shoots halfway up my bed from how hard I take her. Good. It's making me real, too. The moment her soft, wet, warm body is around me, I know I can't let go. It's almost too much to bear.
for the both of us. Julian? I pinned down her shoulders, her hands grabbing at the air and her head flying back, breasts heaving up, cunt sucking me in. I barely have to touch her now, and she's instantly wet and open for me. She lives for me fucking her. What the hell strokes a man's ego more than that, I ask? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. When we have sex, I forget everything else going on in my life. I forget Preston breathing down my neck about this deal, that project, this opening, that closing. I forget my mother calling me up to demand I break up with Alyssa and date someone more my station. I forget the blasted bachelor party and wedding coming up sooner than I'd like. I forget everything. Sometimes I even forget who I am, and it's the best feeling of forgetfulness in the world. It's not only about having a beautiful young woman at your sexual beck and call. Yes, I get off on her asking me how she can please me when we're alone. Obviously. But it's not about that. It's about completely letting go whenever I need to. And I know that she's letting go too. Doesn't she have shit that she worries about? She doesn't talk much about her classes other than occasionally asking me to help her with her economics homework, but... I know that there are things that stress her out as well. So why not have sex to forget about those things for a while? We both benefit from this wonderful arrangement. So here we are. Having sex. Making love. I don't care what you call it. All I know is that I never want it to end. Even as my climax builds and that look on her face says she's on another fucking planet. Why don't I join her? Come for me, Lissa. I know she's on the brink. Maybe if I thrust harder, deeper, faster, she'll come good enough to push me over the edge, too. Let me see it. And feel it, but that's a given. A woman can't hide what her body does when it comes. She can, however, mask the expression on her face, contain her voice, or otherwise lessen the experience. I've had girlfriends like that before. They were so self-conscious that I would find their orgasms deplorable that they couldn't simply be themselves. Which is a shame. At least I don't have to worry with Alyssa. She'll never hide who she is from me. Ah, there it is now. Her climax. I've gotten good at seeing it before feeling it. That twitch of her lips, the squeeze of her eyelids that slight thrash of her head as she tries to control her erratic movements. I see that now before I feel her body clamp down around me in attempt for dear fucking life to end me. It's the crux of biology, isn't it? Women have tried to get my seed for one reason or another since I was old enough to fuck. I know what I am. A virile young man who comes from excellent stock, both genetically and financially. Even heiresses would kill to trap me with a baby. I knew I was in trouble when I reached the point where I was excited by this moment. Giving Alyssa my seed may not matter when she's on birth control, but the fantasy is still there. A fantasy that dissipates once the sexual fog lifts from my brain, but it's a fantasy I could see us living out a few years from now. At some point, I will want children. Perhaps with her. She says she's not opposed, only more interested in establishing her own life before tackling motherhood. I respect that. So much so that I'll give myself over to the more extreme fantasies the moment her inner walls beg for my seed and my cock finally relents. Her eyes always roll back in her head and her mouth always falls open when I empty myself into her. That's the definition of heaven for this bastard. Julian... She doesn't realize she's saying my name as I give her a few final thrusts. I want to make sure I'm done, after all. Shit. I decide to stay inside of her for now. Her body relaxing around mine. Delectable. I think I'll lie on top of her and kiss her pretty pink lips. Who knew this would be our fates when I took Preston up on that bet two months ago? Can I tell you something, Julian? 
I leave a large kiss in the crook of her neck. Anything, lovely. She doesn't hesitate. She's so full of good feelings that everything sounds like a good thing to share. I think I love you. She thinks. But does she know? Does she even realize that she's shared sentiments like that with me before? Maybe not so bluntly, but I've known of her genuine affections for quite a while now. To say I'm not shocked is an understatement. As you should. I'm the only man you'll ever need, Lissa. I'm serious. Her eyes flutter open. All right. She compels me to finally pull out and do a little cleaning up. Not because I'm trying to avoid the topic, but because I'm a pragmatic man. If Alyssa is going to get wrapped up in these thoughts, then I need to take charge and do what needs to be done. I can listen while I work. I'm not saying that to make you happier because it feels like the right thing to say. She sits up, robe falling off her body and legs slowly shutting again. She puts one hand between her legs, hand cupping her pussy. Doesn't she know that I'm trying to clean up? Is she going to be offended if I go wash up in the bathroom? I really do think that I'm falling in love with you, Julian. And I'm not sure how I feel about that. Why in the world would you feel upset about having nice feelings toward me? Sometimes women truly are a mystery. At least she's still blunt with me. Because I have no idea how you really feel about me. I suppose that is a conundrum for most women. I won't pretend to understand every little thing women worry about in their relationships. It's not my job to understand. Suppose it is my job to listen, though. Especially if I fancy myself having a serious relationship with such a woman. So if Alyssa is expressing any kind of doubt, I have to be right there listening to her. Right? I feel many wonderful things for you, Lissa. As tempting as it is to say that with a chuckle, I refrain. If my girlfriend is saying things like this, then I need to be so sensitive that no other respectable man would take me seriously. I'm fine if we don't say any big L words right now, as long as you are too. Julian, we've got many potential years ahead of us. That's right. I said the Y word. Years. Together. I suppose that's two words. Just because we had sex on the first date doesn't mean we have to rush through everything else. Although when your lease is up, I suggest moving in here. Although, now that I think of it, you could keep that little place and we could turn it into something else, if you'd like. Alyssa sits up, her tangled hair brushing against my skin. So soft. So, what's the word for it? Delightful? I think I'll go with that. It's not only about our pace, Julian. It's the fact that you're a relatively closed-off guy. You say a lot of nice things. You do a lot of nice things. But sometimes it's difficult for me to ascertain how sincere they are. Are you saying and doing nice things because you genuinely want to? Or because you know... That's what I want. With any other woman, I would have the perfect answer on standby. An answer that a clever woman would know meant, I'm saying whatever will make you happy. Alyssa's right. I'm a closed-off guy. When I do feel emotions, I bottle them up. Redirect them through work, exercise, sex. I was raised to keep any and all feelings to myself. For the majority of my twenties... That sage Marcus advice took good care of me. Now that I'm in my thirties, perhaps it's time to reevaluate what I want my emotions doing for me. With Alyssa, however, I need to change my tactics. Honesty is the best policy, yes? She narrows her eyes at me, exasperated. Of course. Then I'll be honest with you. I enjoy spending my days and evenings with you, Lissa. I enjoy what we explore with one another. I enjoy waking up to see your beautiful face, 
and you make my damn day when you strut into my office. Even if it's to talk charts and schedules and to not to bend over with your pussy in the air. My girlfriend rolls her eyes. This is the closest to a love confession I'm ever going to get, she mutters. Typical Julian Marcus. Is it so bad? I don't expect you to say that you love me right now. She rolls back onto her pillow and pulls the covers up over her breasts. So much for the view. But you wouldn't mind, I'm sure. Lissa, if there's a problem, please tell me. I don't want to play games. I also don't want her angry at me because I misread her mood. The more peace existing between us, the happier we can be. And what's the point of all this if we're not happy, damn it? No problem, Julian. Guess I'm as confused as you are, which is fine. I never said I was confused. She sighs. I am now. Soon we fall asleep. I don't know how my girlfriend feels, but... I know how I feel. Good. Chapter 3 Alyssa It's rare for me to have a whole Saturday to myself these days. Between Julian demanding more and more of my personal time, and finals creeping up on me, my weekends are usually packed with homework, sex, more homework, and those fancy gatherings my billionaire boyfriend insists on showing me off at. You should have seen me the second time we met up with his parents at a cozy villa up in Washington Park. He practically twirled me around his mother's Persian carpet and dipped me to the amusement of his half-drunk father. This auspicious weekend, however, I have so much precious time to myself. I've handed in a bunch of term papers that Julian so graciously allowed me to work on in the office, and I've permitted myself to take a break from studying to give my brain a rest. Julian's up in Seattle until later this evening. I'm supposed to go to his place around eight. But until then, shopping on him. When I said I planned to go shopping with my friends this weekend, he immediately reached into his wallet and handed me his little black card. No limit, he said with a yawn. Knock yourself out. Buy something cute that we can both enjoy. After I coyly suggested that my poor friends would only get so much enjoyment from watching me shop, he shrugged and suggested that I spoil them too. The day would be on him. Can you believe it? Not only is my boyfriend a hot billionaire, but he's so generous too. It's the perfect day for gal palling around Portland, too. We've had a mini heat wave as of late, which has been a godsend after the blustering cold winter hanging around way too long. The day is 80 degrees, and there isn't a cloud in the sky. I'm wearing one of my breeziest sundresses and a cute pair of comfortable sandals that allow me to walk everywhere without a single blister. If only my mom could see these super cool designer sunglasses. And don't get me started on my freshly styled hair that turns heads whenever we go on Northwest 23rd Street. Even since dating Julian, I don't get to come up here that often. A bit too out of the way for my boyfriend to deign going somewhere for the evening. And honestly, the vibe is hardly for him to begin with. Julian likes places that are the right kind of pretentious. Hipster and yuppie utopias don't really apply but it's right up my alley. I'd come here every day if I could. My friends Kelly and Selkie likewise love this neighborhood, especially on a beautiful day like today. We are quite the sight as we half frolic down the shady sidewalks, gaping in storefronts, realizing that we can actually afford to shop in these stores when I have my boyfriend's black card on me. And you know what? It's so much fun. I'm not overreacting when I saw Northwest 23rd as an expensive neighborhood to live and play in. The Alphabet District, bunched up against the famous Pearl District, has a reputation as the most expensive place in Portland. Rents are hilariously high. 
If you've got a cool million laying around, you can get yourself an old fixer-upper. The restaurants are reasonable, but if you plan on getting gourmet tea or shopping for a new dress, you better hope that you got paid. Even the simplest dress or t-shirt will cost you half a paycheck. My friends don't have a whole lot of money, but I go a little crazy. If they try something on that's absolutely them, I buy it when they're not looking, and they're refusing to take Julian's money. If nothing else, Selkie's birthday is coming up, and Kelly is going to study abroad next semester. She needs a new wardrobe, right? We step out of a cute boutique in one of the converted Victorian houses, sharing happy sighs as our shopping bags weigh us down. I've got a new gauche belt to cinch some of my favorite dresses. Besides, doesn't Julian love a good challenge when it comes to undressing me? Or maybe that's me who loves giving him the challenge. My feet are killing me, Kelly bemoans. Why don't we go upstairs and get some tea? Duh, has she been reading my mind? The best tea house in the city is on the second floor. I'm feeling some cool iced tea, but my friends want the best boba tea. And the sign saying they're out of tapioca isn't going to deter us from waiting for the stock to come back in. In the meantime, I order us a small pot of gourmet tea to share on the terrace overlooking the busy, touristy street. We're not the only ones out here. In fact, we grab the last table out here, up in a canopy of trees shielding us from the warm sun. A cool breeze tickles my aching feet the moment I sit down by the railing. I had no idea how much my feet hurt. Selkie pops back inside to use the bathroom. Kelly groans when a political news alert hits her phone. When she babbles about something I don't even pay attention to, I turn on my phone to find one message from Julian. Can't wait to see you tonight. I've been thinking about how good you taste all day. A squirm in my seat, crossing my legs, as if anyone else is going to have a shot at putting their mouth on Julian's favorite place to put his. Selkie returns the moment the barista brings us our small pot of tea and three cups to share it. Warm steam rises into the air as Kelly graciously pours us each a cup. We toast to having what may be the last free day of the semester. To studying abroad we say to Kelly. To graduating, we say to Selkie. To hot internships that lead to hotter boyfriends, they say to me. I blush. Well, when they put it that way, our conversations are perfectly meaningless as we take the loads off our feet and load up our bladders with excellent tea. Other patrons come and go, cool washes of air conditioning touching us every time, with the occasional flirty text from Julian that says he's thinking about me on his flight back from Seattle, I am so damned content that I can't help but feel that the other shoe is about to drop. Man, I really have no idea. A young woman steps through the door, carrying a little paper bag from Lush. Instantly, the scent of handmade soaps competes with the more exotic scent of our tea. Between that and the flowy, beachy pink skirt wrapped around the woman's long, tanned legs, my eye is drawn to the beautiful face, snorting at my presence. Kelly and Selkie stop talking. I, in my endless stupidity, think it's a great idea to acknowledge Cher's sudden arrival. I haven't seen her since she was fired from her internship at Bradley and Marcus. Lovely day, isn't it? That's all she says as she goes to sit by herself on the other side of the terrace. She leans back in her chair, Chromebook out and sunglasses down on her face. Her giant iPhone cover mimics pride and prejudice. Fitting, hmm? Friend of yours? Kelly asks. Both she and Selkie steal glances at Cher behind them. Damn. She blows us all out of the water in the looks department. And I say this while totally acknowledging that none of us are bad to look at. 
Kelly's a cute blonde with a bobbed haircut and a hot style that suits her curvier figure. Selkie can wear shredded jeans and a torn band tank top and still look like she belongs anywhere she goes. And me? I may be the plainest of Janes, but the glow of love emitting from my heart lights me up more than the expensive clothes and hairstyles I now have. We were in the same internship until... I text them so Cher can't overhear me talking shit about her. Until my boyfriend fired her for being a bitch. Kelly laughs once she gets her message. Selkie shakes her head. The barista brings Cher a large iced tea and tells us that they have tapioca back in stock. <laughs> Both of my friends rush inside to order their favorite boba tea flavors. The only other person besides Cher and me on the terrace is a man. He quickly packs up his things and takes his empty mug back inside. Now it's only Cher and me. She covertly glares at me from the rim of her Chromebook. I shuffle in my seat. Oh, seems like a good time to text Julian back. We still meeting tonight? Of course. He texts not a moment after. I bought you a couple of presents here in Seattle. I want to make sure you get them tonight. I giggle. What in the world has he gotten me this time? When I look up, I notice that Cher is no longer at her table. There's only one way she could have gone, and it's not in the opposite direction. Hey. Yep, she's standing right next to me. Hi. What do I do? On one hand, I'm sad she was fired from something I know she fought hard to get. On the other, bitch was talking shit about me to my boyfriend. She can rot. Hello, conflicting feelings. How goes things? Now I know she's not pretending that there's no animosity between us. Does she think I don't know why she was fired? Does she think Julian wouldn't have told me as soon as he knew? I mean, Julian wasn't going to tell me, probably. But when I found out Cher was getting the boot, I demanded to know why. Whether he hoped I would drop it or not didn't matter. Guy doesn't get to go around firing people at the drop of a hat without telling his girlfriend why. Things are good. How about you? Did you... Am I really going to ask her if she's gotten a new job for the summer? Wow, Alyssa. Nice. I got a job on my campus. Don't see you around my haunts very often. Oh, I'd forgotten that she went to college around here. Northwest 23rd is probably her home. Me? I'm a stranger encroaching on her territory. I suddenly feel like I'm at one of the Marcus estates imposing on Julian's parents. Take it Mr. Marcus is still treating you well. I flinch. Of course he is. Thank you for asking. Chill. I'm not trying to break you two up, regardless of what he might have told you. Cher stands up straight, towering over me with her long skirt and white crop top. I've got better things to do with my time. Although there's something you might want to know. This is going to be a nightmare, isn't it? Do tell. I brace myself for a load of bullshit to fall out of her mouth. She doesn't sit down. I glance into the tea shop and see my friends still in line, poring over the menu with their heads bent down together. While you and Mr. Marcus were the biggest open secret in town, she begins, Mr. Bradley and I were the biggest closed one. What? Seriously, what? You said you had a crush on him, but... But nothing. He and I have been fooling around almost as long as you and Mr. Marcus had been together. Not as serious, though, of course. And you bet your ass he dropped me like a hot potato once I was fired. That's so. Oh, yeah. And Preston was big on his pillow talk, especially if he had had something to drink. 
I heard some super juicy shit during the midnight hour. This smells like bullshit. You should ask your boyfriend why he really invited you up to his office that night you guys first fucked like monkeys. Because according to Preston, it was a bet. A bet? Oh, honey, you really don't know. Know what? I'm regretting this already. Shit. She grins. Whenever Cher Lieberman grins like that, watch out, world. She's about to drop some poison gas on your life. Preston bet Mr. Marcus that he couldn't seduce any woman he was set up with. Preston picked you for the bet, Alyssa. Some serious she's all that shit. What? Your whole relationship is founded on a bet that Mr. Marcus couldn't fuck you. Turns out you really are as easy as the rest of us. Who knew? That's absurd. Shut up. Offended. That's fine. I would be too. I don't have any proof on me besides my word, which I know is worth nothing, but... If your boyfriend really is as good as you think he is, you should ask him about it. See if he tells you the truth. And if you want some tangible proof, Mr. Bradley has your panties from that night. I can't speak. My throat is clogged with too much tea. Or maybe it's the heat making me sick. They were Mr. Marcus's trophy from that night. Proof that he fucked you, Alyssa. Shut up, I say again. What do you care? Care? How dare she laugh like that? Please, <laughs> I don't care. The closest I come to caring is thinking that it's bullshit you would be unknowingly led into a situation like that. Pretty fucked up when you think about it. Well, they thought you might like to know before you go off marrying Mr. Marcus or purposefully getting knocked up with one of his babies. I'm not relax. It's a joke. Cher goes back to her table and closes the lid on her Chromebook. Perhaps it was fate that brought us here together today, Alyssa. It had been weighing on me that I never had the chance to warn you. She finishes packing up the moment Kelly and Selkie come back out, gabbing incessantly about a cute guy waiting in line with them. They ask if it's okay if he joins us at our table. Something about him being new in town and looking for... friends. The guy isn't my type. Not that it matters. I'm too distracted anyway, particularly when Cher sashays by with her tea in hand and laptop bag over her shoulder. We make eye contact at the last minute. I wish I had never seen that stupid smirk on her stupider face. Chapter 4 Julian You're making the call. I tell Preston over cocktails, because I don't want to be the one to lick Monroe's taint. You have a much more gifted tongue than I do. Preston knocks back his second Manhattan of the evening. This is following the Long Island iced tea from earlier, of course. What can we say? It's Wednesday. We have to celebrate hump day somehow. Personally, I'm going home to hump my girlfriend after this is over, but Preston can do whatever he pleases. If I make the call, then you've got to put together the spreadsheets yourself. No delegating to Vern or the interns. You have my word. Great. One less thing for me to think about. We're celebrating the finalization of our deal with Damon Monroe, the man we chose to go forward with in our business venture. Both he and Cole made their compelling cases for getting in on our hot startup action, but in the end... Monroe Industries had the history and name backing up what we are setting out to do. 
Now one of us had to call the man himself and start sweetly asking for the money so we can move forward with our business plans. Meanwhile, yours truly was the one who had to call Ethan Cole and tell him that he had lost out this round, but maybe next time. It's only fair for Preston to take on this next call. Tonight, we're in the VIP lounge of Preston's most recent nightclub, Blue Sky. The same place my girlfriend came that fateful night, she learned that I am to be with her always, even if I'm not physically present. I can now see why that incident happened. Even on a Wednesday night, the club is full of horny kids looking to up their sexual partner count. I wouldn't be surprised if some of those same guys Alyssa encountered are here again tonight. I will say, though, that even if Preston Mine's tastes don't perfectly line up, he knows how to run a successful business. It's not easy to keep nightclubs open in a small city like Portland, but Preston has mastered the art of limited space versus space that is still functional for drinking and dancing. That's why he has three successful nightclubs throughout the metro area with completely different themes based on the tastes of the neighborhoods they're in. Blue Sky is in the heart of downtown. It's a hip spot for college kids and professional young adults looking to get drunk and smash their genitals against someone else's. You and spreadsheets sound like a hot date, Julian. Preston laughs into his empty glass. Speaking of, where's your girlfriend tonight? Got her at home doing her spreadsheets? She's home, but doing homework. I'll be so glad when Alyssa's term is over and she's mine for the whole summer. Then I have her overworked senior year to look forward to, but I'm not thinking about that right now. This finals business is not something I signed up for. Says she has a big test on Friday and wanted to study. You think she's telling the truth and not trying to ditch you? My mouth twitches. First of all, Stu is there doing his paperwork while also keeping an eye on her. I'm not a big fan of having my girlfriend being in residence by herself. We're a public couple, and that means someone could use her to get to me. I never cared much for personal security outside of what was immediately necessary. And now here I am, thinking about hiring a team for Alyssa. You'd be surprised how many female bodyguards there are for hire in Portland. I'm just saying. A lot of those college girls make up shit to hang out with their friends and be stupid young adults. Especially the girls. He chuckles again. Remind me never to date a girl in college again. Something's not adding up here. And then again, Preston has the loosest lips when he's been drinking, and he's had more than a bit tonight. When have you dated a girl in college since you were in college yourself? Preston likes his women younger than him, but he rarely goes college co-ed for more than a hot one-night stand. Can't say I blame him at this point, either. They're a handful. Um, well... Spill, man. We haven't talked much about Preston's love life lately. We're probably overdue since we spend so much time talking about mine. There may have been a girl I was seeing off and on over the first half of the year. Nothing serious, of course. She knew it wasn't serious, either. Sex, here and there. Of course. Not like I was halfway to marrying her like you are with Alyssa. I ignore that stupid joke. Go on. He looks away. That means he's embarrassed. Now, is he embarrassed because the girl he was dating is someone I would look down on him for? Or because he had feelings for her? Knowing Preston, it really could go either way. It was a fling, that's all. Must be more than that if you're looking that wistfully off into the distance. I laugh, because even yours truly can occasionally be swayed by good alcohol. But Preston isn't laughing. Instead, he candidly says, No matter what, I come off sounding like a huge hypocrite. And I'm not in the mood right now. Oh, no. He doesn't get away with saying only that. Time for me to employ the kind of gaze I rarely unleash on my business partner. Usually it's reserved for misbehaving employees, 
business associates who are on the verge of insulting me and everyday citizens who I am not in the mood to deal with. If Preston is getting my nasty eye, it's because he needs to fess something up before I find out the truth for myself. Trust me, it's best for both of us if he tells me instead of me finding out on my own. I suppose I finally get through to him. Preston puts his empty glass down with a sigh, smacks his lips, and gestures to the empty space between us. Shortly after you started fooling around with Alyssa, he begins, I may have had my own inappropriate romance with one of our employees. The intensity of my gaze is giving me a headache. I can only imagine how I looked my blubbering idiot of a friend. And business partner. May I remind everyone that whatever bullshit Preston gets up to can reflect upon me and lose me some fucking money. Forever? This is the man who has given me nothing but shit ever since I started dating Alyssa, let alone openly. This man is such a fucking hypocrite. And I'm not even sure what the whole truth of this matter is yet. Dare I even ask? Who was it? Preston waves his hand as if it's completely inconsequential. Someone who isn't even working for us anymore. That... That is something I really don't like hearing, because my brain instantly goes to one woman who might have some grievances to air based on the reasons I fired her. Damn it. I don't remember her name for the life of me, but from the look cracking between us, I'm guessing Preston immediately knows who I am thinking of. Now, Julian, it was not the woman I fired because she was acting like a petulant child. Yes. Cher. Her name was Cher. Damn it. Preston. I told you it was nothing. He dares to go on the defensive so quickly. She came on to me, man. Late one night, after you and Alyssa had already left and most of the office was empty. I was finishing some stuff up when she came by with a stack of... I swear to God, if you say folders. Anyway, I took her out for drinks. Stuff happened. Stuff, uh, happened off and on after that. Preston continues to act as if this isn't a big deal. Yet here I am, fuming between my two ears. It was never serious. She didn't even care that I was seeing other women as long as I... As long as you paid her favorite work and, let me guess, gave her some kind of financial compensation that quickly came to an end after we fired her. Preston kicks back in his seat. His empty glass teeters dangerously close to the edge of our table. When you put it that way, I sound like a fucking idiot. Because you are. Holy shit, Preston. At least I covered my bases before I continued to make a fool of myself with an intern. Did you get any kind of protection at all? Does paying half her tuition in exchange for her cooperation count? I smack the bottom of my hand against my forehead. This man is going to ruin me and my reputation before I have the chance to embarrass the whole lot of us with my romance with Alyssa. Excuse me while I throttle my business partner's neck. Apparently, I didn't do it hard enough the last time he almost lost me a billion bucks in legal fees. Chapter 5 Alyssa. My boyfriend has been a surly bag of sour grapes for a whole week now. Something about Mr. Bradley being a huge, stupid dick, which is the pinnacle of crass talk for Julian. It only happens when he's had a shit ton to drink and makes stumbling around his penthouse look like an Olympic sport. As it so happened, I was too distracted by schoolwork to give a shit. I finish most of my finals ahead of time, when possible, thanks to Julian's giant distraction and Vern not having much for me to do at this time of year. How many women get paid to sit around a high-rise office doing their homework in the afternoon? No better scene for typing eight-page papers about the American economy in 1982. 
Julian has a business trip this weekend. As a congratulatory present to me finishing my junior year, and as a way for him to chill the fuck out, he's taking me along instead of hopping his private jet with Vern like he usually does. Um, Julian and I have done some jet setting since we started dating, but nothing as glamorous as the East Coast. The most we've done is Seattle in parts of California. He promises to take me to Hawaii this July and anywhere I want to go in the whole world, right before I start senior year. How do I say no to that? It also tells me that he expects us to still be together then, which speaks to my young, romantic heart. If this is what young love is, then I never want to grow up. I take Julian's hand as we descend the stairs from his private golf stream and step onto New England soil. Stu follows us, on the phone coordinating his local team that will follow us around for most of the weekend. I have no ill feelings towards Stu, since he only ever does his job. And Julian is a tough boss. Trust me, I know. But I can't help but think that he's so unnecessary right now. Julian is more than man enough to protect me should some wacko jump out of the bushes and try to rob us. Mr. Marcus does not skimp out on his workouts. He stops to kiss me before lowering his sunglasses and turning to our temporary driver. We're heading straight to the hotel. Yes, Mr. Marcus. The driver already has the door open. Julian stands out of the way so I can get in first. It's the little things, you know? We won't be staying in the hotel for long, Lissa, he says to me, hand clasped firmly around mine. So once we get there, I suggest you freshen up and change into something nice but comfortable. It's going to be an interesting evening, to say the least. You said as much before we left. We're meeting with Mr. Monroe and his team tonight and tomorrow so they can finalize their deal. Originally, Mr. Monroe was supposed to come out to Portland again, but his wife went into labor, what, a week ago? So Julian decided to take me on a quick trip instead, because Mr. Monroe is not leaving the same city his wife and newborn are in if he can help it. What restaurant are we heading to? I'm his assistant on this trip, so I should know, right? Except that was left up in the air all the way up until we took off from Portland. I can only imagine what Mr. Monroe decided in the five hours it took us to get here. We're not going to a restaurant, Julian says. You'll see. The hotel suite is exactly what I expected. Big, airy, and sparkling clean from top to bottom. The view of the city core almost rivals Julian's view from his penthouse. Almost. That one is more romantic, of course because I've looked at it a hundred times after making love with him. Nothing can truly compare. But it's almost enough to distract me from what Julian had instructed. He's already in the bathroom, changing into a fresh suit and touching up his five o'clock shadow. I open my suitcase and search for the business dress I was going to wear for tonight's first meeting. Not that one, Julian calls from the bathroom. I know you packed a cocktail dress, Lissa. You do, huh? He pokes his head out, a mischievous grin that I can't interpret spread across his lips. Black? Slinky? Make it happen, Lissa. How about that? I happen to have a slinky black cocktail dress in my bag. Not sure how an open back, short skirt, and plunging neckline is going to pass at a business meeting— but I've long learned to stop asking questions. Like I really should nod and smile when he reaches around me and wraps a black leather choker around my neck. Told you I'd get something made for you. I freeze, looking at us in the mirror. My black dress suddenly gets ten times sexier with a black choker resting on my skin. What? Trust me, Lissa. It's part of the dress code of where we're going. He walks away in a cloud of sandalwood and cinnamon cologne. I'm left standing here wondering what the hell is happening. 
I have a feeling we're not going to the country club. Chapter 6 Julian One of the greatest pleasures in life is watching my girlfriend be constantly blown away by the places I take her. Like Damon Monroe's upscale sex club. A cozy little leather-clad getaway called The Dark Hour. I've only been here a couple of times before. For one, I don't come to this city very often, outside of in-and-out trips purely to get business done. For another, I'm not exactly hitting up every sex club I come across, even though I have nothing against the concept. When Monroe called me to announce the birth of his first child and the subsequent change in his plans, I immediately offered to come out here to meet with him instead. His wife is the one on maternity leave, not him. Surely he can do some crucial business, as long as his newborn is only a mile away. For fuck's sake, I don't even think they've been discharged from the hospital yet. He's got time. I was also the one that put the idea of his club in his head. I know he does a ton of business at the dark hour, as long as the associate is like-minded. And he knows I am. We've talked enough about it over the years we've known one another. This is also me deciding that this frazzled dad could use a night out to both do business and let loose for a while. No, I'm the last man on the planet who would urge him to cheat on his wife who has just given birth to his first child. But I also know that a new dad like him would most certainly appreciate having some time off before bringing the newborn home. Julian? Alyssa hisses. I'm going to hear her loud and clear above the happy rabble of club music and couples getting their freak on in the middle of a sex club. There are people having sex in here. I wrap my arm around her as we ascend the staircase leading to the diamond VIP room. They certainly are, princess. Princess? That's a new one. I have a million nicknames for my girlfriend, and I've definitely called her princess before. But that term is the one I think most appropriate tonight. You're my naughty princess. Even if we are conducting business, I say. Alyssa shudders beneath my touch. That's the exact reaction I want. Good to see you two made it here all right, Damon Monroe says the moment we enter the room overlooking the club. He gets up from his couch and extends his hand for a shake. Stu goes to join the small contingent of bodyguards lining up along the wall. Melissa also spares them a glance. Lovely to see you as well, Miss Pendleton. She snaps her head back around. Uh, yes. Pleasure to see you again as well, Mr. Monroe. She lightly shakes his hand before we're shown to our own couch on the far side of the room. A server, in a skirt shorter than Alyssa's, approaches us and asks us what we would like to drink or possibly snack on. I order us a couple of cocktails and ask my girlfriend if she's hungry. After all, we haven't eaten anything since we landed. When she doesn't answer, I ask our host what's good. I recommend the cucumber sandwiches, but that may be because my mother makes the best ones and we use her recipe. I can't relate to a mother's home cooking. The thought of my mother cooking anything aside from half-brained schemes to get her children-in-law out of her hair is absurd. Sounds delicious. Go light on the mayo, and Alyssa will eat half of them on her own. Monroe confirms the order with the server before she takes off down the stairs. He doesn't spare her a second glance before finishing off his glass of whiskey and checking his phone for messages. You'll have to pardon me, he says. Never know what I might hear this week. No worries. Congratulations, by the way. Monroe turns his attention to my girlfriend. Thank you. He doesn't ask what he's being congratulated for. He's probably heard that phrase a thousand times this week alone. But life goes on, yes. I'm not the one in a hospital bed recuperating from giving birth. We have business to conduct this weekend. I only hope that it's not too much for either of you. I'm right at home, I say, suppressing a grin. He really has no idea. I... Alyssa opens her bag and withdraws her work tablet. I'm fine. Shall we get started, gentlemen? 
Is she fooling us with this act? I take the iPad out of her hands and put it back in its bag. None of that is necessary tonight. To enunciate my point, I push a lock of her hair behind her ear and tickle the tip of her cartilage. You'll notice that Mr. Monroe's assistant is not here. In fact, one of mine has quit. Real shame, too. She was good. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. It wasn't Miss Aduya, was it? No, the other one. Melissa falls silent. Neither of us expect her to know who he's talking about. If anything, Monroe was trying to make light conversation to assuage my girlfriend's nerves. I appreciate it, but I'm the one who knows how to make Alyssa feel comfortable in a sexually charged atmosphere. Because she and I have both noticed the BDSM demonstration going on the main stage downstairs. The lucky audience is watching a pro-dominatrix take on two half-naked men, one of whom is seemingly obsessed with licking her boots. Simply another night in the dark hour. We came to do business on a good night, because nobody here, that I know of anyway, is into Dom strutting their stuff. More like the other way around. I may have withheld a few things from my girlfriend on the way here. Tonight's meeting is nothing but pleasantries. To steal yet another phrase from my brother, I am here to fillet this man's ego so he's primed to pump money into my venture tomorrow. I'm also here to gauge how Alyssa reacts to this sort of atmosphere. I've been contemplating going into a similar line of business to Preston and opening up my own club. A kinky one, of course. The PNW is severely lacking a cozy hub for rich men and women to congregate and get to know each other in a biblical way. Now, there are plenty of sex and swingers clubs in Portland and beyond, but they're not my kind of scene. I'd much rather come to a place like this. But only if Alyssa is on board. After all, I would be spending a lot of time there. And as much advice as I can take from Preston, who knows a thing or two about hosting, I'd much rather have Alyssa help me decorate and choose the right vibe of the place we might call our second home when it comes to work and pleasure. Right now, I'm not surprised to find her a bit shell-shocked. I'd been more surprised if she instantly took to it like a fish to water. Oh, do I ever enjoy opening my girlfriend's mind to the pleasures of the world. I don't want her working on anything. I don't want her distracted by business when there's a sensual world surrounding her. It's all well and good if Monroe and I make a few decisions that we'll wish we had written down tonight. After another whiskey from him and two cocktails for me, no less— but we'll live. We've done business like this with other men for years. Every once in a while I glance over and see her taking in the sights below. We have a protective vantage point from up here. She can spectate, but there is no expectation of participation. She gets all the thrills without any of the embarrassment. I keep my arm wrapped behind her, lining the back of this plush couch with my legs crossed in her direction. I advertise to both Monroe and his bodyguards that this woman belongs to me. Not that I think that any of them are going to try something. But it's not about that. It's about projecting the right image. To Alyssa. I want her thinking about me every moment that we're here. I want her to watch those millionaires and their lucky partners have the sexual time of their lives and imagine that it's us getting up to no good. Maybe not getting up on the stage and making a spectacle of ourselves, but at least enjoying the shows as they come and go. Excuse me, she finally whispers. Where is the nearest restroom? Monroe snaps his fingers. A server clad in all black steps out from the corner with a bow of her head. Please escort Miss Pendleton to the nearest ladies' room. Absolutely. The woman gestures to the staircase a few feet away. Right this way, Miss Pendleton. Melissa spares me one last glance before gathering her purse and stepping over my feet to get to the server. Likewise, Monroe and I exchange looks. So, I begin, pretending that my girlfriend isn't in way over her head. When does the baby come home? His gaze follows Alyssa to the edge of the room. 
His amused countenance tells me he's having pleasant memories of how he met his wife. It's not a secret that she was a server here for one night before he got his hands on her and ended her hospitality career at the grunt level. Now Mrs. Monroe opens clubs and restaurants almost as quickly as Preston does. Sunday, he says, turning his attention back to me. Now, tell me when your wedding is so I can clear my calendar for the event of the year. I smile, but don't say anything. In due time, at the rate Alyssa and I are going. Chapter 7 Alyssa Damn it, Julian. I should have known he was going to do something. He's always pulling surprises like this, and I'm pretty sure it's because he gets off on seeing how shocked I am. Every single time. The asshole took my unknowing ass to a sex club for crying out loud. I don't care how nice and swanky it is. There are people hitting home runs on a stage in front of me, and all I want to do is go to the damn bathroom and tinkle. And run into a couple of lesbians getting their sapphic freak on in the stall next to mine, but that's the least of my concerns right now. See, theoretically, none of this bothers me. I probably would have been excited to come if he had gone over it with me first. Maybe, I don't know, asked. It's such a strange concept for him, I know. My life basically revolves around this asshole springing me with surprises like... Put on your slinky cocktail dress, Alyssa. And, by the way, here's your color, princess. We're going to a BDSM dungeon tonight. What? It's for rich people. It's totally legit. Him telling me to put my iPad away sealed the deal. It's one thing to ask me to dress up like an expensive hoe because it was part of this place's dress code. Quite another to imply that we're here to get comfortable. Not to do business. Nope. I suppose that's for the big lunch meeting we're doing at a fancy restaurant tomorrow afternoon. What the fuck? I ask my reflection in the toilet paper dispenser. Beside me, one lucky woman is having the public bathroom orgasm of her life, and her female partner is encouraging her to do it louder. What... The fuck, Alyssa? I pull my phone out of my purse, even though the line is now out the door because of me and the lesbians squatting in our stalls instead of getting a move on with our bladders. Cheers as friends recognize each other, some with the lushest European and Latin accents you've ever heard, sound through the large restroom. At least they drown out the woman coming in the stall next to mine. I want to text someone. But who the hell do I text about this? My friends from school wouldn't be able to handle this. They barely handle me going out with a billionaire. A sex club would go way over their heads. When I emerge from my stall, I find a long line of the most beautiful women in the world. Supermodels. Heiresses. Lower-class women who are hot and submissive enough to get cheap admission if they promise to entertain the men here. Many of them are on their phones, taking selfies, texting friends, swearing at missing dates. And is one of them talking to her mom back in Taiwan? What a world. A world I'm not entirely sure I belong in. I mean, look at me. Or don't. God knows I'm not interested in looking at my reflection right now. I'm still kind of a wreck after the long plane ride here. I thought Julian and I would be meeting Mr. Monroe and his crew in a quiet place to discuss actual business. Heaven forbid. The server isn't around to show me back to the VIP room. I know where it is. Finding the stairs isn't the problem. The problem is finding my way through the growing crowd on this wild Friday night. No wonder Mr. Monroe is one of the richest men in America. He has one of the most successful clubs in the world, and for rich people. Drinks here have to cost a thousand bucks a bottle. Well, 
Some of them must. I am so out of my element. Jasmine Cole couldn't have prepared me for this. I don't think anyone could have, least of all Julian, who thinks springing surprises on me is the funniest thing in the world. It's amazing I survived April Fool's in his presence. Hey, sweetie. A tall, imposing woman in all black leans against the wall in the shadows. I don't even see her as I tried to pass. Don't suppose you came here alone because you've been fun to watch. I... Who is this? Why is she talking to me? Everything's loaded with double entendres, isn't it? Ones that I can't even understand. I'm here with someone. Sorry. Oh, well. She shrugs her lean shoulders. A look that implies I may have walked away from the night of my life hits me like a slap to the face. Maybe next time, honey. I'm here with Julian Marcus. Well, shit. Why did I feel compelled to say something like that? Do I think throwing my boyfriend's name at her is going to change anything? Why? Why am I touching the little leather collar around my neck? Deep down, I know why. Julian has practically trained me for moments like these. Other people are going to hit on me wherever we go. Not only do I have to know how to gracefully turn them down, I have to make sure they know who they are possibly fucking with. As if on cue, the alpha woman's confident countenance falters. I see. Didn't know he was in town. Yes, ma'am. Right. Grace and dignity. I don't want to insult this woman, even though she thought it perfectly pertinent to hit on me as I walked by her. In a sex club, but whatever. Excuse me, he is expecting me upstairs. In the Diamond VIP lounge? Absolutely. Should I also mention that he's doing business with THE Damon Monroe, the owner of this fine establishment? Nah. I'll let her figure that out for herself. I find the staircase without anyone else hitting on me. It's almost as if some silent signal has gone out in the club, marking me as taken. And it's not the collar people can't see until they get closer to me. It's something else. Like, oh, Julian, leaning against the railing above the main room, his powerful figure incapable of facing anyone but me as I carefully come up the stairs. Enjoying the sights, I ask him. Our host is having a small conference with two of his bodyguards. It doesn't look serious, but it may spell an early ending to our otherwise pleasant evening. Julian looks me up and down as I come closer to him. I always do, Lissa. I instantly enter his hold the moment he offers it to me. It may be fairly warm in this club, but there's nowhere I'd rather be than wrapped up in Julian's embrace, especially if it's his warmth doing most of the heating up around here. You'll never guess what happened on the way back from the bathroom. He doesn't miss a beat. Someone hit on you, didn't they? Nerves erupt in my poor body. How did you know? Because the party's starting on a Friday night in a sexually charged playground. I'd be personally mortified if no one hit on you when you were caught in the wild, Lissa. Well, I swallow. It wasn't just anybody. It was a woman. Oh? That has certainly piqued my boyfriend's interest. Now there's a thought. My lovely Lissa in the clutches of an experienced Dome. The East Coast doesn't hurt for them, that's for sure. And it's not only to perform for money and fame on the sex club stage. Pretty sure you don't want me cheating on you with a woman, though. Come on. <laughs> this is Julian. The one with a gay brother? If any billionaire would consider even homosexual cheating still cheating, it's Julian. Although... I was thinking more about something fun we might be able to do together one day.
Yeah, that doesn't surprise me at all, either. One thing at a time, please. Let's save the threesomes for a special occasion. With me, my sweet, Julian says with an extra squeeze to my torso. Every day is a special occasion. Instead of rolling my eyes, with a smile, of course, I look over Julian's shoulder. Mr. Monroe is picking up his small amount of things and stepping out with one of his bodyguards. To us, he says, Afraid I must be going now. We still on for tomorrow. Julian confirms. I wish Mr. Monroe a pleasant evening, although, knowing him and how money works now, he's off to the hospital for a late-night visit with his wife and newborn before wandering home. Make sure that Mr. Marcus and Ms. Pendleton are well tended to until they leave. Mr. Monroe says to the server. Whatever they desire, Lucy. She bows in his direction before turning toward us. Whatever we desire, huh? Considering what Julian said, I don't know how I feel about looking at this young woman through a new pair of eyes. Shit. Is it because of all the sex going on around here that's filling my head with horrible ideas? Or are they Good ideas. No, no. They're horrible. Because poor Lucy is only trying to work. And here, Julian and I are talking about threesomes with other women. I mean, it's probably nothing she's not used to hearing in this club, but I'm acting like she's some kind of escort who only doubles as a waitress at a club. For all I know, though, she is an escort. We're fine for now, Julian says. Thank you, Lucy. He nods to Stu, still on stoic duty, before leading me back to our couch. We sit down as the song changes from hard and feisty to slow and sensual. You may not believe me right now, Lissa, but it pleases me to not only know that other people see what I see in you, but that you were able to graciously turn them down. Or at least, I assume you did. He's looking at my throat when he says that. I slip my hand between his legs, my pinky dangerously close to coming into contact with his hard-on. Because, of course, he's erect. I know every inch of this man's cock by now, but I'm still shocked when I get this kind of reaction from him. And, hell... I may have been a virgin when he first stuck it in me, but I wasn't a stranger to Dick. Not even my previous third base partners got this ready for me. I once told Julian about my ex-boyfriend and how he couldn't stay hard for five seconds. To that, Julian had said, You'll never have that problem with me. And if I do get that old, I've got the money to afford the best medication. So like I said... Never a problem. When we first started this contractual relationship, I thought jealousy would be a huge issue with him. As it so happens, Julian only gets jealous and borderline possessive if he thinks I'm the one interested in someone else. Men, and women, I guess, being interested in me is a simple fact of life that can be a source of pride for him. After all... What man doesn't want to believe that he's dating one of the most desirable women in the world? I don't think I am. One of the most desirable, that is. I'm simply Alyssa Pendleton. If anything, the only thing I've got going for me is that Julian thinks I'm the damned bee's knees. Well, I guess that's the only thing that really does matter, huh? So what do you think of a place like this, Alyssa? I'm glad for the slight change in topic. It's certainly interesting. Wish you had given me some warning, though. Warning? His eyes widen. Who needs a warning for fun like this? Please, don't tell me you've got other surprises up your sleeve. His eyes are not getting any smaller. Not even when he grins at me. Welp. Chapter 8 
Alyssa. Never in a million years have I ever thought that yours truly would be tied up in the best VIP room in America while her boyfriend went down on her. All right, so I suppose a few details are in order. We're not in the Diamond VIP lounge. We've got more class than that, although I'm sure Mr. Monroe would have no problems with us getting bodily fluids in one of his favorite spots. That's for other people to clean up anyway. As I was saying, shortly after Julian informed me that he had other surprises in store for me tonight, he proceeded to ask our server Lucy if she knew of any private spots around here for us to enjoy. Before another minute could pass, we were in possession of a key to the nicest private room around. A private room with a bed and discreet bowls of condoms and lubes, but a private room nonetheless. Because what Julian Marcus wants... He gets. Like me, tied up with soft bondage ropes, completely helpless and at his whim. Keep in mind that I can make this stop whenever I want. Naturally, I don't want it to end. Because as I've gone over before, Julian knows what that tongue of his is capable of. I am spread wide open, my feet tied to metal hooks protruding from the bottom end of the bed. My arms are likewise above my head, the ropes gently wound around my wrists. I guess this is what they call spread eagle, yes? No idea. Can't say I've ever done this before, even though, as we all know, Julian is a complete cad who is likely to do anything the moment he gets the idea in his head. His idea? To tie me up, rip off my panties, maybe in that order, and tease my clit with his ravenous tongue. I can barely stand it. I'm not being rewarded for anything, unless it's for being a good sport today. I'm definitely not being punished, although he could probably come up with a few sexy reasons to punish me. Any other night, he would use that woman hitting on me as an excuse to punish me. Tonight, however... I get the impression that all Julian cares about is pleasure, and whatever he feels like doing. Maybe I could throw in a few requests. <laughs> Too bad the only sounds I'm capable of making right now are variants of his name and wordless groans of pleasure. If only I could truly convey what this man does with his tongue— when he's not making me squirm from the way it flicks over my clit in quick little bursts, it's making me writhe from how hard, how satisfyingly it plunges into and fills me. It does things that even his cock can't accomplish. And from how he's looking at me right now, I get the feeling he's thinking about taking his cock out and fucking me with it. Close. He purposely makes me cum on his mouth, my thighs squeezing his cheeks as I arch my back and cry out from the intensity. Two seconds later, he stands, fisting his erect cock and guiding the tip toward my open hole. I close my eyes and await the sweet inevitable. Damn! Nothing prepares me for how hard he plummets into me, instantly taking every little inch I have inside. I have been speared against the bed. Even if I weren't tied up, my body would never be able to move. <laughs> Not that I want it to, mind you. A growl of appreciation rumbles through Julian's body. Perfect, he mutters. Absolutely perfect inside and out. This is the kind of life I could see myself living for many, many glorious years. Me, Julian, and whatever bed we can find to get dirty in. I don't always have to be tied up. In fact, it might be nice to not be tied up once in a while, but I also wouldn't say no to that kind of life. I'm definitely not saying no right now. In fact, I wasn't sure I could say the word yes as much as I do tonight. Of course, the hottest part harkens back to the first time we hooked up in his office. The idea that someone could come walking in at any moment. 
We probably won't. The likelihood is slim to none because the door is locked and there is a huge unspoken but written rule in clubs like this that you do not interrupt people unless they invite you to interrupt them. Or if the building's on fire, I suppose. <laughs> That's the thrill, though, right? That someone might catch us making merry in the most extramarital way. Why does that turn me on? Almost like I want to share this kind of thing with the world. But why would I? This is for Julian and me. This is for us. Our life together. This is what we do to express our love and need for one another. A little while ago, I asked him if he loved me. I didn't expect him to say it. When we first got together, I never expected him to say yes in a million years. Now I realize, as he quickly approaches climax and I'm lying here enjoying every second of it, he does love me, doesn't he? One day I'll want to hear those words, but for now, I am 100% content with feeling it instead. It doesn't always happen, but tonight we orgasm at the same exact moment, my body trembling in pleasure when Julian releases himself inside of me. There's nothing more that I want than to break free of my bonds and wrap my arms around him, embrace him, feel his strength surge through his torso as it crashes upon me. But I can't. This is part of the experience. I have to channel my excitement, my love for him through the rest of my body. I'll start clamping down on his cock so tightly that he won't be able to leave my body for a long, long time. He doesn't even struggle. Chapter 9 Julian I'm just getting out of my shower on a lonely Tuesday night when Preston calls me. This late at night, let alone when I'm about to go to bed, and he knows that. It could be about anything. A crazy idea he suddenly had. He's in jail for drunk and disorderly conduct and needs me to bail him out. He's still drunk and disorderly and wants to bother me. Basically, there's no good reason for my business partner to be calling me this late at night. Not with his track record, anyway. What are you doing this Saturday night? That's all he says the moment I answer. Knows that a cut to the chase, doesn't he? I rub my hairy chin as I continue to dry off in front of my bathroom mirror. I don't need to wrap a towel around my body in my own home. Hell, I'd make a huge spectacle of it if Alyssa were here, but no. She's at a study group for one of her finals and going back to her apartment for the night. Something about being on her period, anyway. I admit, once she starts talking about blood, I tune out. I'll throw all the ibuprofen at her that she wants, but that's the extent of it. All I hear is, I'm not pregnant and we're not having sex for a couple of days, and I'm good. Hopefully I'm going out with my girlfriend this weekend. It's the highlight of my week, isn't it? Spoiling Alyssa silly, that is. But you don't have any meetings or have to go see your parents, right? I squeeze toothpaste onto my brush and hope to wrap this conversation up. Not that I can recall. You should call Vern to find out about that. Is it cold in here? What is with this randomly cold evening in Portland? After a string of early summery days, it's suddenly 60 degrees and rainy again. Even a man like me can start chafing with ridiculous weather extremes like these. I better apply some body powder to my groin. Alyssa appreciates it when her man isn't chafing around the cock. Of course, I'm technically touching my flaccid self when I hear, Excellent. You can come to a small party we're throwing at my place this weekend. I stop, my powdery hand wrapped firmly around my soft shaft. With who? Yeah, so I thought a lot about what you said last week and got in touch with Cher again. She's not an employee anymore, right? There's no issue with us dating. Excuse me? 
I'm not hearing this right. I know for a fact that my dumbass business partner is not continuing to see a woman I had fired because she was acting like a petulant child in my office. Do I have to say it a third time? Cher. Lieberman. Come on, you remember her. The hot fox working with Alyssa before you started tapping that? Yes. I remember her. I growl. Why the hell am I hearing about her again? Because we got back together. And I think it might be a real deal now, Julian. I brace my free hand against my sink and consider my pissed-off countenance in the mirror. You're a fucking idiot, I spit. Following your lead around the office, champ. So, you and Alyssa can stop by my place for dinner around seven on Saturday, right? Thought we'd take advantage of the sunny daylight on the balcony off my dining room. What say you? I say a lot of things. Things I'd rather not repeat here. Chapter 10 Alyssa Life has a funny way of coming full circle, doesn't it? Here Julian and I are, in the back of his car, heading toward Preston's house near Washington Park. It's not our first time going there together. It wouldn't even be my first time coming here by myself, since there have been a few occasions at the office where either Julian or Preston have asked me to come up to this house to pick something up. Or drop it off. The story changes every time. He has a nice house, I guess. Not as big as you may think a billionaire like him would have, although I hear he has a huge playground in the basement. We don't care about that right now, anyway. What we care about is why Julian and I are heading up to Mr. Bradley's house. Apparently, Cher had told the truth when she said that she and Mr. Bradley were once a hot item. Apparently, they still are. Granted, I haven't talked to Cher since that day I bumped into her at the tea house, so who knows what's really going on here. Maybe she and Mr. Bradley had an affair still going on when I last saw her. Or maybe she told the truth when she implied that it had ended with her termination as well. Who knows? I guess we're going to find out. Julian is righteously pissed about the whole situation. Since he told me on Wednesday afternoon what's going on, I've heard nothing but derision hurled at Mr. Bradley behind his back. It's not unusual for Julian to be exasperated with people to the point he's always muttering beneath his breath. But this is a bit much, even for him. I get it. I do. It was bad enough, and super hypocritical, of Mr. Bradley to say what he did about Julian dating me, only to date Cher on the down low. But beyond that, I don't see what the big deal is. I am a huge example of how office romances are apparently a fact of life, especially in Portland although I'm not sure what's supposed to be accomplished by this kind of dinner. Are Cher and I going to become better friends because we're openly dating billionaires we've worked for? Or is this going to create a bigger rivalry between us? Oh, God, what if we don't get along? What if she turns into a bigger diva than usual and decides I'm not good enough to run in her realm? It wouldn't affect my relationship with Julian any, but... It could make parts of my personal life, independent of him, hell. I've almost worked myself up into an anxious furor when the car pulls up before Mr. Bradley's picturesque manor, surrounded by evergreen trees and sporting a colorful flower garden that he may or may not have had a hand in planting. Mr. Bradley immediately comes out to greet us with a large smile on his face. No wonder. Behind him... Lurking in the foyer is Cher, bedecked in a baggy white blouse that somehow enunciates her breasts, and a pretty yellow skirt that may be floor-length, but has a giant slit going all the way up to her thighs. She knows how to dress herself, that's for sure. As for me, I need someone to dress me. Oh, do I wish I could say that this is a normal dinner with Mr. Bradley. Everything about it is lovely, really. The four of us sit at a table on his balcony, overlooking the picturesque hills of West Portland. 
The air is a warm 80 degrees, perfect for me to sit in nothing more than a blue summer dress and a light shawl to go over my shoulders. Julian takes off his jacket and undoes the top button of his dress shirt. At least he didn't wear a tie today. Every once in a while he loosens up. A little. Mr. Bradley and I make the greatest effort. I gush over Cher's sleek hair and the gorgeous diamond tennis bracelet on her wrist. She makes sure we all know that Mr. Bradley gave it to her upon their reunion. I open my big mouth and ask, When was that? They glance at each other. Cher has a smirk of second-hand embarrassment while Mr. Bradley grins like a teenager. A week ago, wasn't it, Snookums? Beside me, Julian grimaces. I don't blame him. Who the hell actually says Snookums? Yes, I was shocked when he came by my apartment Saturday night. Was that the Saturday night Julian and I were in New England? Had to be. He had a bouquet of pink roses and an invitation to take me out to dinner so we could discuss what we really meant to one another. I took the flowers but rebuked his invitation. I didn't want him to take me for the wrong kind of woman. And what kind of woman are you, exactly? Julian asks. Mr. Bradley is the only one not stealing himself. One who would rather hash things out in private, Mr. Marcus. I invited Preston into my apartment. I'd already made dinner anyway and wasn't going to let it go to waste. This woman makes a mean home-cooked lasagna. Mr. Bradley clasps his hand on her shoulder. To her credit, Cher doesn't sway in her seat. I've already got her promising to make me some every week for the rest of my life. That's a long time, Julian says. His tone implies it may be shortened if Mr. Bradley pisses him off enough. But congratulations at already making a commitment like that. These two shuffle in their seats so much that it takes all of my composure not to snicker. Luckily, we're saved by the maid bringing out our dinners. No, it's not Cher's homemade lasagna, but it's as good, I'd wager. Julian doesn't bother beating around the bush now that he's got both Preston and Cher in front of him. So, he begins, cutting into his Parmesan chicken. When's the wedding? Mr. Bradley almost chokes on a piece of chicken. Cher reaches over and pats him on the back until he's swallowed enough water to wash the meat down. Says the man who hasn't once shut up about his girlfriend since he started dating her months ago. Never let it be said that we take the same paths to reach the same destination, Preston. Indeed. Mr. Bradley glances at Cher, who spares him a timid smile. Honestly, I don't believe it for a second. Like you and Alyssa were taking things one day at a time, Mr. Bradley continues. Who knows? Maybe we'll hold a double wedding day in the office where we all met. You tell me the date, Preston, and we'll get right on with it. I'll get back to you about that. I put my champagne glass down before I can choke on it. Anyone mind telling me where the nearest restroom is? I gotta get away from this awkward mess for a few minutes. Cher is the first one to toss her napkin down and scoot her chair back. I'll show you. There's one down the hall. Mr. Bradley only pays her a little attention. The one next to my office? That's the one. It's fine, right? He waves her off and starts talking to Julian about an upcoming meeting and how he thinks they should approach it. I follow Cher back into the airy manor. We see one maid coming with a tray of cut fruit for us to snack on along with dinner, but otherwise, there's no one else here. Meaning nobody interrupts us as we walk down the hall toward Mr. Bradley's office and adjacent bathroom. Cher opens the door from the hallway. I'm careful with this door, she says as I go in. Sometimes it sticks. If that happens, you can go through Preston's office. He won't care. I don't think anything about it as I shut the door behind me and lock it for good measure. I hear Cher's footsteps go back down the hall, and I'm left to do my business. As if it had been planned all along, I can't get the damn door open again when I finish. Trust me, 
I've jiggled this handle a billion times. A time for every dollar in Julian's coffers. Sheesh, you'd think with all his money, Mr. Bradley would be able to get something like this fixed. Oh well, Cher said I could go through the downstairs office, so I think I'll do that. The other door in here, or at least the one that doesn't open to a linen closet, as I discover, leads to the immaculate office of a man who doesn't use it a whole lot. I bet the upstairs office is way messier, based on what Julian has said about Mr. Bradley's cleaning habits. It's small but well-lit thanks to the alcove overlooking a tulip garden. The large desk is cleaned off, aside from a small stack of journals and an assortment of fountain pens. No laptop, not that I should be looking. There is, however, a small box on one of the chairs in front of the desk. A box with a familiar pair of underwear in it. I would know because they're mine. The panties I was wearing when Julian and I first hooked up. I had let him keep them as some stupid token. At the time, I thought he was keeping them as a trophy. And I was so addled from good sex, let alone good virgin sex, that I didn't think twice about it. After all, they were simple undies. But I know they're mine, because of the neon yellow stamp on the back saying who made it, the size, and proudly announcing how they were created right here in America. I doubt they've been washed since then. What in the world are they doing in here? Wait, hadn't Cher said... I had completely dismissed it at the time, and honestly, I hadn't even thought of it until now. What has she said? Something about Mr. Bradley betting Julian that he couldn't bed whatever woman was sent to him? That I was the lucky candidate? That he had kept my panties as proof that he boned me? No way. That was Cher being Cher. But even if she had been right about being in a relationship with Mr. Bradley, I find a small handwritten note beside my underwear. By now, I know it's Mr. Bradley's handwriting. A note to himself. Return to Julian next time he comes by. Don't forget this time press. I feel sick. Really, really sick. Chapter 11 Julian Isn't it wonderful that we can spend time together with our women like this? I roll my eyes. I have a lot of respect for Preston, but the way he talks about the fairer sex is not one of those realms. His mouth is usually much bigger than the feet he shoves into it. It's certainly something, I say. Seriously, Julian... I completely understand how you feel now. I think I may be falling in love with Cher. The women haven't been gone from dinner for five fucking minutes, and Preston is already torturing me with this shit. I never said that I was in love with Alyssa, I remind him. Not like that. Yeah, yeah. And I don't own at least five strip clubs around here. Or is it six? Shit, I can't remember. Cher knows about them, right? The last woman my business partner seriously dated had no idea what she was getting into when it came to Preston's lust for, well, lust. He puts me to shame sometimes. Preston shrugs. Know what I love about her? Nothing phases her. We're talking about going exclusive now, but... When we were having our fling every once in a while, we both saw other people on the side. Didn't phase her in the least. I find that hard to imagine. Lots of women imply that they don't care if men like us continue to see others. And of course I mean sexually, when we're nothing more than an affair. Usually the jealousy on their end explodes sooner than any jealousy on our end. Melissa is the first woman I've ever been with who inspires that level of jealousy in me. She returns with a solemn face. At first, I assume she's feeling ill because of our dinner. 
Then a pair of underwear lands in the middle of the table. The only person to not express immediate shock is Cher, who hides her smirk behind her long fingers. The fuck is this? I've never seen Alyssa like this before. She's so... angry. Whoa. Preston sits up so quickly that I think he's going to give himself motion sickness. Did you get those from my office? It takes a few minutes for it to sink in. This is the pair of underwear my sweet Alyssa had been wearing when I first seduced her. The pair I tossed to Preston and told to get rid of. Someone had not upheld his end of the bargain. What the fuck, Julian? Lissa, I can explain. So it's true. I was a bet. Where the hell did you hear something stupid like that? I looked at Preston, and I'm not sure if it's with burning anger or righteous indignation. Why the hell not both? What the fuck are you telling people? No. It wasn't Preston. He can be dumb, but he's not that dumb. No. No. It was her, wasn't it? The woman on the brink of uproarious laughter from the scene she's indirectly caused. My instincts are correct as usual. And right now my instincts are shouting at me that this is bad. Very fucking bad. I haven't said a damn thing. Apparently, Preston thinks that's him defending himself. Bigger question is, what the hell was she doing snooping around my office? They were lying out in the open. I glare at Cher again. This has her smell all over it. This is, after all, the same woman who was slipping cute little notes to her boyfriend for the past few months. So it's true. Alyssa takes a step back from the table. A breeze rustles the table above us. Napkins fly off into the distance. Champagne glasses almost spill. Nobody at the table cares. I was a bet. What? Did you bet that I was some slut? No, honey, Cher says with an unappreciated laugh. They were betting that you were easy. There's a difference. I slam my hand on the table, knees accomplishing unprecedented feats as I stand up so quickly that I almost knock my chair over behind me. Don't listen to her, I implore my girlfriend. It wasn't like that at all. She shakes her head in disbelief, upper lip trembling and long chestnut brown hair fluttering in the breeze. Then what was it like, Julian? Did you need those files at all? Or had you planned on fucking me the whole time I was afraid of losing my job? I know better than to lie. I'll tell you right now what I told you back then. I intended to seduce you, yes, but... But you had no idea who I even was until that moment, right? I was a nameless, faceless intern you thought you could toy with. But don't you fucking butt me, Julian Marcus! Her cry of anger causes the robins to abandon the trees around us. Red claims her fair face. It takes exactly two seconds for me to know what she's going to say next, yet I don't move to stop her. It's like I want, no, need to hear her rake me over the coals. You're going to fuck me and forget me and give your complicit buddy here a token of my pussy's affection. But I didn't, did I? I fling back at her. You think you would be on this terrace right now if I had felt that way about... She slaps me. My sweet, docile, submissive Alyssa fucking slaps me. You're both trash. She grabs her shawl from the back of her chair and her purse from the ground. Fucking disgusting trash. Who think you can play with peasants like us because it gets your pathetic cocks hard. Alyssa, where is she going? I don't care if she did slap me. For fuck's sake, she's got it all wrong. 
It's not like that at all. Don't. She stops short of knocking over the maid carrying dessert. Don't come after me. Stay away from me. I fucking quit. All of this. I quit it. I'm too shocked by this sudden turn of events to immediately go after her. Preston's mouth is permanently dropped open behind me. His maniacal girlfriend continues to hide her shit-eating grin behind the back of her hand. I don't know who to blame. Who the fuck do I blame? Alyssa. Where is she going? How do I stop her when my feet are glued to this place? How do I make this right? Who the hell do I throw money at to make her come back here right now so I can explain? Explain that her walking out of my life would be the most devastating thing I've ever experienced. Explain that I... that I love her. And now my heart has fucking broken. And I have no idea who the hell to blame. Kill me. I am nothing without Alyssa Pendleton, and now she's gone. By the time I finally regather my bearings, it's too late. She's gone. Part 5 Loved by the Billionaire Chapter 1 Julian I never held any delusions that I would enjoy my brother's bachelor party. It's in a city I don't particularly care for, and is, for lack of a better term, an utter sausage fest. Because that's what happens when a bunch of red-blooded gay men with a shit ton of money get together. But the fact that I was dumped by the woman who could have possibly been the love of my life, that only adds to my misery. I came to this party because, with any luck, it will be the only one my brother hosts for the rest of his life. And, to be fair, I would expect him at my own. Honestly, the fact that he personally came to my penthouse and dragged me onto the family plane played no part. Who the hell told him that Alyssa dumped me? Was it Preston? I bet it was fucking Preston. Or maybe Vern. Someone in my office leaked that precious info to my brother. Come to think of it, I bet it was Preston, because he's always so concerned that I'm not having enough fun. Joke's on him. That obnoxious brat, Cher Lieberman, ended up dumping him, too, shortly after Alyssa walked out on me. It hasn't been that long. Perhaps two weeks. But it's been two long, arduous, lonely weeks of me trying to power through work during the day and getting drunk every night. Pro tip. Getting drunk every night is not conducive to doing good work during the day, but fuck it. I don't care. So what do you do at a gay bachelor party in Tokyo when you're on the mend from your woman dumping you? Get drunk. As fuck. I don't know most of the men here, and I'm not interested in networking. It's a party, anyway. Ted and his best friends are tearing up this small network of clubs in some tiny neighborhood in Shinjuku. There is no shortage of man meat, let alone men attempting to hit on me because... By God, I am a virile young American who looks like he knows what he's about. Hello, gorgeous. A thin man who reeks of too much spicy cologne puts his hand on my shoulder and sways back and forth. I dare say he's drunker than me, but he's the happy kind of drunk. Me? I prefer to be miserable and angry. I'll put on a smile for the pictures to keep my brother placated on one of his big days, but... God, I have to go to a wedding soon. Kill me. Not interested, I mutter. Were I in a better mood, I'd at least be nice about it. After all, knowing that my beautiful Alyssa was waiting for me back in Portland would give me a nice bout of confidence to gently turn down a drunken man. Oh, I'd take his interest as a compliment. I'm comfortable enough in my sexuality to not take a gay man's attraction as a threat. Not tonight. Come on, sugar, just one dance. His breath is coated in gin and sake, the national alcoholic drink of Japan. 
I said that I'm not interested. Please leave me alone. Before the man can turn away in a huff, another figure appears between us, his sober gait a breath of fresh air in this cramped lounge. Peter. Peter, my brother's fiancé says to the drunken guest. Leave poor Julian alone. He's on the mend from a bad breakup. And he's not like you, Mr. Promiscuous. Bah. Peter the drunk stumbles away. Jordan, my knight in shining Armani, leans across the bar and tells the bartender in flawless Japanese to cut Peter off, or to at least severely water down his next shot of sake. Y'all no fun. Jordan takes up residence on the stool next to mine. He props his elbow up on the bar and continues to order himself a cosmopolitan and tells the bartender to top off my beer. As the bartender walks away to fill the order, Jordan says to me, Before you ask, Ted wanted to know where you were before he took his part of the party elsewhere. Told me he didn't think you'd be interested, even though there's going to be girls there. To this day, I'm not sure if my brother personally IDs as bisexual or gay, and honestly, I don't care. But I should have guessed that at least one part of this bachelor party would include a copious amount of pussy. Jordan, as far as I know, is not interested in women like that. Something I will never, ever be able to understand. That doesn't bother you? He shrugs, a consummate gentleman, even at his own bachelor party. No wonder Ted loves him. He probably sees in him what I see, saw, in Alyssa. That eternal innocence in one aspect or another. Not that I think Jordan is innocent by any stretch of the imagination. But he's good at giving off an indifferent, sometimes even more aloof than a natural-born Marcus, heir. Good thing he's the one changing his last name as of next week because he'll fit right in. He knows the rules. No touching. Slobbering is fine. I wish I could have that much faith in my brother. Great. Now I'm thinking about that time. And after what Alyssa put me through, I'd rather not get angry at more than one person. Somebody keep these drinks coming. So, Ted told you what happened. He sort of had to after I saw the state that you're in. What did he say? Something about your business partner having your girlfriend's panties in his office? Thanks, Ted. At least now I know Preston had to have been the one to spill the beans because Vern would have never in a million years shared the detail about the underwear. That's not the whole story, but it's the gist. Jordan chuckles. Sometimes it's too much fun watching you Marcus boys flub your relationships. You know, when I'm not caught up in it. I'm sure. Jordan and Ted have split up before. I know exactly who is at fault, too. My brother can't help himself, you see. Which is why I find it hilarious that Jordan trusts him to be surrounded by female sex workers for the final part of his bachelor party. Because when it comes to Ted and women he's not supposed to touch. Anyway, sorry to hear about you and Alyssa. Real shame. She was the best one I'd seen. Ted begs to differ, though. He says she was second best. Let me guess. Savannah was his favorite. Jordan doesn't say anything. He's changed a lot, you know. You can't really tell in everyday scenarios, but he's done a lot of maturing since those days. My hand clenches my empty glass to the point I should worry I'm about to break it. He should have matured out of stealing his brother's girlfriends after high school. There it is. The nasty truth hanging between us. Because it was never enough that Ted got the bulk of the inheritance while I worked for my own business. It wasn't enough that he gets the family home when mother and father pass. It wasn't even enough that he was the one born with the chiseled jaw and devil-may-care attitude that women, for some stupid reason, fall for every time. No. He had to take my girlfriend, too. 
Savannah wasn't the love of my life, but that wasn't the point. The point was that Ted set his sights on her and couldn't help himself. Or so he said. And so Savannah also swore when I caught them in bed together. So I don't care how much Jordan says my brother has matured since then. Fact of the matter is, Ted has never apologized. And I'm pretty sure that even if he tried, I'd punch him the fuck out. Enough to get me written out of the rest of the will. I still remember the way he looked at Alyssa when they met. Great. Now I'm thinking about Alyssa. Care to tell me what really happened between you two? At first, I think he's asking about my brother. Once I realize he means Alyssa, I sigh and say, Our relationship started with Preston betting me I couldn't seduce her in two hours. Naturally, you proved him wrong. In many ways. She found out. I had almost forgotten it happened that way. Anyway, she left me that day, and I haven't seen her since. Believe you me, I have tried multiple times to contact Alyssa. I've called her non-stop. Left a shit ton of messages. Gone to her apartment, only to find it empty. Sent her messages via couriers. I've basically begged her to at least let me explain my side of the story. Instead, you know what she did? She filed a suit against me and my company. With Cher. Preston and I are both being sued over inappropriate relationships with our employees. Kill me. Jordan must sense the dooming air surrounding me, for he quickly changes the subject. Maybe I should go with Ted and his friends. Mine are treating me to a rousing game of poker. $500,000 buy-in, but it's going to be a lot of bullshitting between us while men in thongs serve the drinks and act out for our amusement. Ted's got women. And he's my brother, so that's weird. Jordan slips off his stool. You two never partied together? Yes, there's too much of an age difference. By the time I was old enough to party, Ted was deciding what grad school to attend. I might go back to the hotel. I'll let him know before he leaves. Thanks. Sorry for being such a downer at your party. Put on a smile for the wedding photos, and we'll forget all about it, Julian. I snort into the back of my hand as I stumble off my stool. Within five minutes, I'm outside hailing a cab and jetting off to my hotel room in downtown Tokyo. I'm in my room for all of five minutes, contemplating how to get my drunken ass into the shower without hurting myself, when someone buzzes my door. And by someone, I mean a very attractive, very raring-to-go beauty wearing hardly any clothes and radiating money and sex. She has Ted written all over her, and that's before I take her timing into consideration. How much does she cost, I wonder? Five grand a night? Ten grand? I'm sure Ted paid her the full rate for her services so I can have whatever I want, and as much as I want for the next twenty-four hours. I never catch her name. The alcohol has inebriated me enough that my reflexes inhibit me from shutting the door in her face. She's inside my suite, unzipping her dress and asking me in perfect English what my poison is. My poison. My poison is Alyssa, the beautiful, sweet, smart-as-a-whip woman I want to make love to right now. I don't even know where she is. Is she in Portland? Is she okay? Has she already moved on with someone else? Sir? The escort bats her fake eyelashes at me. Where do you want me? I reach into my wallet and pull out all of the Japanese bills I possess. I have no idea how much it is. I only hope that handing it to her doesn't insult her. She looks between me and my outstretched hand, confused. She probably thinks I want her to stick the money in her orifices. This is for you coming all the way out here. I'm not interested in your services tonight, but feel free to charge the full amount. She cocks her head, the look in her eyes accepting my challenge. 
I'm very excellent, sir. She erotically puffs out her cheeks. I don't have to ask what she means with that gesture. I'm sure you're one of the best in the city. Oh, I am. But she still isn't better than Alyssa. Please, take it. Consider it my patronage for the night. Eventually, the young escort accepts my wad of bills and shows herself out of my suite. I sit down on the edge of my bed, head in my hands. I don't care how beautiful, how talented, how good at faking it that woman was. I'm sure she would have been the best sex worker I've ever slept with. But what's the point if I'm only doing it to forget Alyssa? How could I forget her? Perhaps it's my drunken brain. Perhaps it's nothing more than my heart refusing to break and crack. Because if it does, I don't think I'll ever be able to recover from it. That's it. The moment I get back to Portland, I'm proving to Alyssa that she's the only one for me. As soon as I sleep this drunken mess out of my system, I'll formulate a plan on the plane ride home. Chapter 2 Alyssa All I can say about my current predicament is this. Cher is a very, very persuasive woman when you're feeling super down and liable to believe anything someone tells you. If you ask me, this was her plan all along. Because not long after I stormed out of Mr. Bradley's house, effectively breaking up with Julian right then and there, she announced that she was as equally appalled by the truth. This is what she told me after dropping by my place later that night. With a few practiced tears, she convinced me that she could no longer go on with a relationship with Mr. Bradley when that was the truth he condoned. Two days later, we filed a suit against Bradley and Marcus for sexual harassment and other inappropriate conduct. See, when I talked to HR at the beginning of my relationship, it was a tenuous agreement that completely hinged on me not saying anything negative enough to spark legal proceedings. After all, I was dating my boss. But once I decided to go ahead with a suit, everything fell apart for Julian and Mr. Bradley. Our lawyer thinks they'll settle out of court to keep this from blowing up and ruining their image. Cher and I are looking at a pair of hefty paydays that will pay our bills for a long, long time if we manage the money right. The thought makes me sick. If it was money I truly wanted, I could have stayed with Julian. At first, I convinced myself that's all I cared about. The money, that is. Because without that job or prestigious internship, I'm looking at a long road ahead of me after I graduate next year. It's not the money I want. It's Julian. I'm such a basket case. A total fucking hack of a woman. What a classic example of a woman who falls for the first guy she fucks. Even after discovering the disgusting truth... I still want him. What's wrong with me? Am I really that pathetic? That man only slept with me because of a stupid bet. Well, I knew deep down that our relationship was a short-term farce that would eventually come to a heartbreaking end. I never in a million years imagined it would be something as cruel as that. Can anyone blame me? One day, when I sit down and write a tell-all memoir of this time in my life, readers will chide me for walking out on a man for doing what men do. Of course, they play with women. Of course, they use us for as long as they want before sending us on our way so they can bone a younger model. Of course, they do. Rich, hot men get away with anything. We're expected to go along with it because they're hot, rich men, and we should feel special that they chose us, even if for a short time. Well, Julian Marcus didn't even choose me. Mr. Bradley did. Ordered me up like I was an escort fit for a billionaire. I can't even be flattered. 
How disgusting. Naturally, Julian came after me. Doke was on him, though. Aside from my phone, and I blocked him, thank you. He couldn't even get through to me because I packed up some of my things and temporarily moved in with Cher. Her parents put her up in a cute one-bedroom apartment in northwest Portland. Even crashing on her couch hasn't been that bad. She said it was a good idea because Julian would try to talk me out of everything, and if we're staying together, she can help protect me from him. Likewise, I could help stop her from going back to Mr. Bradley, should he come back for her. Interestingly enough, Julian has made repeated attempts to contact me, but, as far as I know, Mr. Bradley hasn't done anything. I almost feel bad for her. Lesson learned, I guess. Maybe my next boyfriend will— Who am I kidding? I don't want another boyfriend. I sit in the courtyard of Cher's apartment building. It's on 22nd Street, a residential stretch between the bouncing businesses of Northwest 21st and 23rd. Usually I love coming here and enjoying the sunshine in these touristy areas. But ever since I ran out on Julian, I can barely enjoy anything but sleep. Today is no different. Cher is out with her friends. I should be out with mine, but Selkie went back to California for the summer, and I don't know what happened to the others. Maybe they're avoiding me because they think I'm too busy with my billionaire boyfriend. Eventually, I get up and take a short walk. It's funny how money is such a non-issue for me right now. With Julian having paid my rent since we got together, I was able to save up all my earnings from that internship and subsequent job as his executive assistant. He also gave me a hefty allowance that I never went through. Why would I? When he always gave me his credit card wherever I went. So I don't even think about it when I stop into the tea shop on 23rd, and drop almost ten bucks on an expensive drink and a tiny macaroon that I'll inhale in one bite without thinking. I sink into one of the plush chairs and tell myself I am not going to obsess over Julian any more. I'm not going to think about the money. I'm not going to think about the lawsuit. I'm definitely not going to think about the sex. The cuddling, naked, in bed after making sweet love, the whispers as I fall asleep, waking up to him pressing against my back and saying he wants to start the day off right, the liaisons in his office, and how many times we could get away with having sex at his desk. Nope. Not going to think about it. I want to listen to some music on Spotify, but I forgot my charger at Cher's place, and I'm already down to 50% on my phone. Good thing I like the music they play here. Too bad I can hear all of the conversations going on around me. Two young women sit at the table by the window. They both carry designer purses and walk-in shoes that scream money. Even though one of them is wearing flats and the other stiletto heels, I recognize those brands now. One woman wears a black Chanel dress, simple but radiant on her petite body. The other wears distressed denim shorts, a white tank top, and a blue plaid long-sleeved shirt that accentuates her tomboyish personality. Looks like that don't fool me, though. These are women who could shop at low-class thrift stores and dress their thrifty clothes up with expensive jewelry, hair, and shoes. They carry themselves like they know what they're about. Their mere presence puts a sour taste in my mouth. I really wish I had drained my phone battery on Spotify because their conversation does nothing to make me feel better. Told him going to Mexico City was going to be a huge mess, the woman in the Chanel dress and sunglasses says. She threads her fingers through the stray dark hairs uncoiling from her Audrey Hepburn bun. She's so Portland, I almost want to gag. Half his family is there, and they hate my gringa guts. And that's what you get signing on for that kind of money. I mean, I definitely love his money, but I love him more, you know? 
I almost wish he would cut off contact with that side of his family. Because it's bad enough I have to deal with his mom's boyfriend next door. We spent a whole night arguing about what to name the bed and breakfast. Call it Halls of Fornication, because that's all it's ever going to be. Good. <laughs> I wish. Yeah. So meanwhile, my boyfriend's mom keeps calling me to give me the 411 on how many little heirs she expects me to have. She wants no fewer than three grandsons one day, okay? Honestly, I think I've been cursed. Three boys? Who wants to deal with that? I'm hiring the best nanny in Portland if I ever had a kid. You're going to need five to raise three boys around here. Seriously, I've been cursed. With any luck, they'll want to go to some boarding school. Hope and pray. Listening to their rich lady problems makes me both roll my eyes and want to gag. I can only imagine what Serena Marcus would expect of me had I ever married Julian. Me. Marrying Julian. Having his kids and spending the rest of my life with him, whether I had to deal with his mother or not. I get up before I even get my drink, because if I don't get to the bathroom right now, these rich ladies are going to have to see me cry, and none of us want that. As soon as I latch the door behind me and turn on the loud, grinding fan, I let the waterworks start. Julian. I haven't cried much since I left him. My brain has been too consumed by anger and humiliation to give a fuck about crying out of loss and sadness. But now, I don't know what else to do. I miss him. God, do I miss him. I almost wish he would call me one last time. I want to hear his voice. I want to hear him calling me out of this nightmare. I'm going to wake up in his bed and realize that this is all a terrible dream. He wanted me, damn it. He invited me up to his office for seduction, not because he wanted to win some stupid bet, but because he wanted me. I need to know that none of that was a lie. It takes me a few minutes to regain my composure. By the time I step out of the bathroom, my eyes are swollen and red, but at least it's the right time of year for me to pass it off as allergies. My drink is waiting for me by the rest of my stuff. I can't stay here, not with people glancing at me, wondering if I've been crying. I pick up my to-go cup and purse and leave. It's still a sunny day in this part of Portland. I half trudge back to 22nd Street, bypassing lost tourists and people asking for handouts, only to have the strange feeling that someone might be following me. My head cranes over my shoulder. Nobody except for a woman on her phone and walking her Pekingese. Cold black tea washes over my tongue as I resume my walk. I'm in no particular hurry to get back to Cher's place. What's waiting for me there other than her disinterested cat and my pride? Alyssa. I stop at an intersection. Cars come to a stop. Two different drivers gesturing for me to go ahead and cross the street. But I can't. I'm frozen. Of course, I had been crying pretty hard. It's only natural that I would think I hear Julian's voice. One of the cars honk at me before the other gives up and smashes on the gas pedal. I slowly turn around. Julian. Wearing... Oh my god. Is he wearing a polo shirt and jeans? I'd laugh if I wasn't so freaked out. Chapter 3 Alyssa What are you doing? Instinctively, I hide behind a large tree growing in someone's yard. 
Hey, nobody seems to be home. If someone comes out and asks, I'll say that this man is stalking me. It's a common enough problem in Portland. Are you wearing... jeans? Julian lowers his sunglasses, the sun instantly hitting his... majestic, chiseled, kill-me-now face. He blinks away the glare before finally dropping his arms again. For the love of God, Lissa, can we talk? My sneer can be felt all the way over in Chinatown. No. I mean, my lawyer does not advise that. Neither does my conscience. It says that if I talk to Julian for too long, he might seduce me again, because my pathetic ass can't help itself. Fuck your lawyer. Lissa, you know this whole thing has been blown completely out of proportion. Let's go somewhere to talk. He's still standing on the sidewalk like he owns the whole block. For all I know, he does. And I'm still standing behind this tree like a pathetic basket case. I'm not going anywhere with you, Julian. It's over. You get it? It was over when you seduced me under such disgusting pretenses. Would you at least let me explain? Explain what? That you get off on turning an ordinary girl's life upside down like it's Christmas for you? I know that's how you rich people get your fucking jollies. They can afford any experience in the world, including seducing women like me and taking us on the whirlwind romances of our lives. Then they dump us when they've had their fill and move on. I know it was only a matter of time before that last bit happened to me. He guffaws. You don't seriously believe that, do you? Come on, Lissa. We still haven't resolved the fact that he's not wearing a suit. This is the man who would wear a three-piece suit to the gym if he could get away with it. And now it's all I can think about. In the months I dated him, I rarely saw Julian Marcus wearing anything but slacks and a dress shirt at the very least. For him, going without a jacket and tie was the epitome of casual. He must be dressed like this because he's trying to blend in with the Portland crowd. Go away. I almost falter. I hate to admit it, but I almost falter. If anyone saw Julian the way I do now, they would have that moment of weakness smack them upside the head as well. After all, he's Julian fucking Marcus, one of the handsomest men in this wretched, cursed city, and he's wearing tight jeans. If those same people saw him and knew as well as I did that he could fuck a girl's brains out, nobody would blame them for driving off into the sunset with him. Except me. I would blame them. I would certainly blame myself for getting back into that loveless mess. To think I had told him that I was falling in love with him, that I believed him when he said he might have feelings for me. It's a good thing one of the residents of the house chooses that moment to step out onto his porch, arms crossed and glaring in Julian's direction. The man is middle-aged and nowhere as fit as Julian, but bless him, he puffs himself up as he takes command of his property. Can I help y'all? He asks with a gruff voice. He briefly glances at me and notices the look of panic on my face. You being bothered, miss? Ah, oh, good. I could possibly get Julian arrested for trespassing and harassment. Okay, so he's on the sidewalk and I'm the one on the property, but those are minor details. Oh, fuck it. This is a hopeless situation. I'm fine. I step out from behind the tree and give the man a small wave. I think we're having a misunderstanding here. Sorry. Just like that, I take off down the sidewalk. Hey. Hey. Julian comes after me. That's what I get for taking one second to look over my shoulder instead of booking it like I wanted to. Lissa. Run. Run. 
I'll keep running until I finally put this man behind me and never think about him again. I guess that means I'm going to run forever. Nope. I make it to a park a whole two minutes away before my winded ass needs to plop down on a bench and hope someone doesn't accost me for money. Luckily, on a day like today, most of the park is occupied by dog walkers and kids playing. And Julian Marcus, who caught up to me in about ten seconds. Damn him. He's not even out of breath. Lissa, he growls. I swear to God, you try me. I flash him the most heated look I can muster when I already feel like a winded sack of sorry shit. It's a good thing, too. It sort of puffs me up to brave the man I thought I loved. The strong, handsome, sometimes ironically funny man who had really convinced me that we may have had a chance. For a while, anyway. Not as much as you try me. Would you let me explain myself for two seconds? This whole mess could have been avoided had you ever listened to me. Let me guess, I say with a sniff. If we were still together, you'd give me a good spanking for my current insubordination. Right, sir? I make sure to spit his favorite word. Alyssa... Pendleton, he barks back at me. You are one of the most incorrigible women I have ever... I don't let him finish. I know. You thought I'd be some docile target for you to try out, yes? Oh, wait. Sorry. You didn't even choose me. According to Cher, it was Mr. Bradley who chose me for you. Why in the world are you listening to her? She's a liar. A conniving, scheming, money-hungry... Deep down, I know it's the truth. I know that Cher's endgame, as soon as she saw the opportunity, was to milk these men for as much money as she could get. What better way to do that than to get a nice lawsuit out of them? Once she realized she could bring me down with her, that only solidified her case. I know this. But what am I going to do? Walk away? Go back to Julian so he can continue to string me along and humiliate me? I don't think so. I'd rather keep some shred of dignity and get what I can out of this. Then again, just because I hate what he's done doesn't mean I want his business to be ruined. What does it matter? I finally ask. I'm humiliated. He slowly sits down on the other end of the bench, his arm slinking along the back as if we're real lovers enjoying a nice day at the park. I bristle. What I would give for it to be true. For what it's worth, I do genuinely like you, Lissa. I almost believe him. In fact, I do believe him. All those weeks together letting me see some of the most intimate sides of him. For fuck's sake, this man once walked in on me using the damn bathroom and politely pretended to have not seen a thing while he grabbed a towel and his toothbrush before bed. We were about to reach that part of our relationship where the good kinds of familiarity settle in, knowing we can count on each other, what we like and dislike, seeing the perfect present and awaiting the smile on our lover's face. We were Almost there. Then it was ruined. Tell me the truth, Julian, I say, still unable to bring myself to look at him. Was what Cher said about that night true? Was I really a bet you had with your business partner? His silence is telling enough at first. At least enough for me to get up and walk out of his life forever. No, I don't need him to verbally confirm. I know. He at least has the decency to do it anyway. I was staying in the office late on a Friday night. You know how Preston is. 
always concerned that I'm not having enough fun in my life. I don't know how the conversation turned to it, but I told him that if I wanted to, I could go out and seduce any woman I wanted if I felt like it. I believed it, too. Hell, I still believe it. It's not something I'm ashamed of. I scoff. My whole body turned away from his. A golden retriever runs by with a frisbee in its mouth. A young boy chases after it with shrieks of laughter. This is supposed to be a happy park for families and lovers enjoying the sunshine. Here we are, polluting it with our drama. He disputed the fact. I told him he was full of shit. You know how we are. He ended up making a bet that I couldn't seduce within two hours whatever woman he chose for me. He wanted to use one of our interns for our bet. He, uh, chose you. My body is so tense that I need a million massages to feel normal again. I bet he chose me because I was the ugliest of all the interns. No. He chose you because he thought you were the least like my type. Showed how little he knew me. So, you ordered me up with a false story and then proceeded to lie about always being attracted to me. God, I knew it was bullshit, Julian. All that stuff you told me didn't make sense, but how could I resist you? You're right. You can seduce anyone you want. I highly doubt that. What makes you say that? He looks away. I doubt I could seduce you right now, with you feeling like this. He's right. As much as I wish we could go back to his penthouse and roll around in his California King bed, it wouldn't be right. I would be full of these bitter feelings, and he would be making a huge legal mistake. Thank you for telling me the truth. Lissa, I... Julian moves to touch me, but retracts his hand at the last moment. It's also the truth that I enjoy being with you. I really do think thought of you as my girlfriend. To tell you the truth, I've been fucked up since you left. Dare I believe him. What part of this is a performance? Did Mr. Bradley bet him that he couldn't seduce me again? Get me back? Where do the lies end and the truths finally begin? What do I do? The fact of the matter is, I finally say, you seduced me under those pretenses. You lied to me through omission. I hate that I'm saying this. If we got back together, I would forever wonder if you truly did care for me, or were only putting on appearances to make a point. We already had a precarious relationship, Julian. I'm sorry it's come to this, but I've been left with no choice. So he begins, clearing his throat. That's it, huh? Gone like that? It's over? Guess so. Some other voice in the back of my mind screams that it isn't so. But dare I listen to it? Huh. I don't listen to anything but reason and logic right now. Both are telling me to calm the fuck down before Julian has the chance to woo me with his kind words again. Saying that he truly likes me, wants to be with me. Thinks he's taking me to his brother's wedding. Sorry. Bed made and lie. All right, Lissa. He stands, and I'm already panicking that he's going to walk away out of my life forever. How pathetic of me. I'll leave you alone today. But I'm going to ask you again the next time we meet. And the time after that. If you deny me three times, I'll stay out of your life forever. I stifle a laugh. What? 
deny you three times? Who are you, Jesus? I let my laugh fly loose now. <laughs> Guess that makes me Judas. I didn't mean it that way. Is he flustered? Did accidentally making a religious joke throw him off his game? <laughs> Too good to be true. All right, Jillian. You get two more shots. But you better make them good, because I plan on denying you both times. I have to, for my own sake. I can't live the rest of my life falling for whatever a man tells me. The next man I get involved with might not be as good as Julian. I might end up with a Preston Bradley who orders up girls for his friends. I will, Lissa. You have my word. Julian gives me one last look before turning away, his body swallowed up by the summertime sunshine. Next time, you'll falter more. I wipe a tear from my eye as I go back to Shares. I blame it on allergies. Chapter 4 Julian And I thought, Alyssa was a wonder at scheduling. I sit down at my desk with a huff while Vern attempts to not quiver in his loafers before me. Count your lucky stars that I don't take your head off right here and now. I'm sorry, Mr. Marcus. To its credit, my executive assistant is a wonder at keeping his composure even when I'm pissed as hell at him. There was nothing else I could do. The Monroe meeting was already scheduled in advance and the lawyers couldn't... Whatever. Couldn't do it any other day. I get it. Sighing, I pull a tablet from my top desk drawer and pretend to get ready for my important meeting coming up in ten minutes. There have been worse gaffes before. But do we really have to deal with the lawyers and the Monroes in one day? Actually, sir, the lawyers are already here. I roll my eyes as I stand up and straighten out my tie. Tell the lawyers they have to wait. Monroe isn't going to hang around when there's baby shit to take care of back on the East Coast. For all I know, though, this is the man's first real vacation from a screaming baby. Nanny or no nanny in his house. Vern stiffens where he stands. Ms. Pendleton is with them. My hand hovers above the off switch on my computer monitor. What? I spit. She's here with the lawyers. Should I... Tell them to keep waiting. I have a more important meeting to get to. You'll be happy to know that Ms. Lieberman is not with them. I asked. She doesn't plan on attending. I'm sure Preston will be happy to hear that. Are we really still doing this? Alyssa is here? With her lawyers? With HR? In some damn office we've holed them up in until I can finish signing papers with Monroe and his lawyer? Yeah, his. Sure. It's quite evident of me to say that my guard is already so down with the thought of Alyssa being around that I am less than prepared to see the sophisticated blonde woman sitting in the conference room, flanked by two bodyguards and a timid lawyer. It takes me about five seconds to realize that Mr. Monroe is not in attendance. Instead, I'm graced with the presence of Mrs. Monroe, and she is more than capable of taking care of this meeting on her own. Normally, I wouldn't question a last-minute change like this, especially knowing that she's involved with her husband's enterprises, but didn't she literally give birth recently? The hell is she doing on the other side of the country? Mr. Marcus. She greets me with a smile and the nod of her head. It's only after I've completely entered the conference room that she gets up and offers to shake my hand. Her black dress is tailored in such a way that I would never guess she was still losing the baby weight. The only reason I can tell, if I hadn't known already, that she is in a delicate disposition is from how she carries herself. There's an urgency to her movements that suggests she's in a hurry to get back home. Mrs. Monroe... Forgive me if I'm surprised at your sudden presence. I was expecting your husband. I'm sure. It's my team's fault for not getting back to you about the change. Damon came unexpectedly down with a cold, and his doctor refuses to let him travel, let alone in a plane. So here I am. Hope you don't mind. 
Everyone's given me a thorough rundown on the events here, and I've had quite a bit of time holed up in a hospital room doing my own research and study. We both sit down at the same time. I do hope that it's not too much of a bother. Bother? I flew from the East Coast to Portland, Oregon. Nothing's a bother at the moment. But if we may, I'd like to get started. She then introduces me to her lawyer. Nobody mentions the bodyguard, so neither will I. Quite. Let's get started. This isn't exciting business underway. What it is are lawyers going over the terms and the Monroe camp signing off on them in front of me. After this is taken care of, Bradley and Marcus will have full run of whatever money the Monroes have sent our way. All we have to do is deliver on their investment. Something that I would have said was in the bag a few weeks ago. Now, both Preston and I are in way over our heads with this lawsuit. Well, I'm not sure about Preston. He only comes into work half the time now. The other half he spends at home or finds himself a new weekend-only girlfriend. I'm good at putting my head down and getting work done, however. It's easy for me to charm Alice Monroe and make her laugh while we sign the final papers. I can briefly forget about Alyssa now that the promise of millions of more dollars start coming down the financial pipeline. When this meeting is over, I should be able to wander back to my office and get right back to work. Except I have another appointment after this meeting. With another lawyer. And Alyssa. I can't charm Alyssa. I can't even hold my breath when I walk into the other room and see her sitting between two men in suits, her own dress clinging so tightly, so provocatively to her body that my brain can't handle it. And my cock. God, why doesn't she rip that bodice off right now and taunt me some more? Composure, Julian. Don't be a slobbering, lovesick fool in front of the woman suing you for half of what you have. Alyssa, I say, fingers tightening on the back of the chair I refuse to sit in. I had no idea you would be here today. Her chin only slightly quivers before she speaks. I wanted to make sure that my terms were heard. I want to offer you a deal, Julian. We'll make the lawsuit go away if... One of her lawyers puts a silencing hand on hers. Let us handle this, please, Miss Pendleton. She nods. Forgive me. I would like to see this ended as soon as possible. I finally sit down. Beside me, my company's head lawyer is already taking notes and looking over whatever written terms Alyssa's team has handed him. Mr. Marcus, he mutters. I say we hear them out. Melissa glances at the younger lawyer next to her. The way they exchange glances. Are they sleeping together? It's the first place my head goes. I'm not proud of it. I'm not even dating her right now, so I have no place to get jealous if she flashes the young, somewhat handsome attorney a mild smile, and he grins back at her. He definitely has the hots for my Alyssa. How dare he? I imagine them on a date together, his laugh atrocious and hers forced. I imagine them back at his shabby apartment that he can barely afford, where they have lackluster sex. She realizes that I'll always be the best she's ever had, and he thinks he's scored because he got her to fake an orgasm. My eyes narrow. My arms cross against my chest. Fuck this little asshole. On behalf of Ms. Pendleton, he says with a teenager's voice, we are willing to settle out of court. Miss Pendleton is asking for a meager sum compared to what would be awarded in court. Not what I wanted to hear, but exactly what I expected. I hold Alyssa's pristine gaze as I ask, And how much does Miss Pendleton want? Her mouth doesn't move, and it's not her voice I hear, but I know she's thinking the number anyway. I know her well enough by now. Two million her older lawyer says matter-of-factly, to account for any taxes procured by the government after the settlement is finalized. Miss Pendleton wants at least a million dollars to her name. I lean back in my seat. 
That's quite the amount to get her by for a long time. I blow through a million in two months. So I might have to hold off on getting a couple new suits and jet-setting around the world when Preston inevitably convinces me to go on the rebound. Boo-hoo. What else? What's in it for me if I agree to this? Miss Pendleton will drop her involvement in the suit. Julian, my lawyer says. Without her in the suit, we have a much better chance against Miss Lieberman. He's right. Together, those two ladies could have brought down my company's reputation and some of its income. But without Alyssa sitting in the courtroom to back up Cher's stories, dear Ms. Lieberman has a shallower case against Preston. We could probably convince her to settle out of court, too, but Preston can use his own money for that. Thus far, Bradley and Marcus haven't been drugged too far through the mud. Only a few corners are muttering about our possible sexual harassment and misconduct lawsuit. And they're good old boys. They've been settling out of court with their office mistresses for years. Not a club I ever thought I'd be a part of. Sounds like something that should die with my father. Is she sure that's all she wants? I cock my head to the side. Because it doesn't sound like a lot. Miss Pendleton doesn't want much. Enough to get her by for a while until she can find a more suitable job with her upcoming degree. She would prefer to go peacefully, and does not wish to harm the reputation of Bradley and Marcus. We're sure that this is beneficial for everyone in this room. Is that what you want, Alyssa? The young lawyer lightly touches her arm and whispers something into her ear, probably telling her to not answer me, that rat bastard. Get your hand off her. She catches the frown on my face. It's what I want, Julian. I don't want a lot, and I don't want to cause more drama than I already have. In that case, I stand up. That sounds fine. Take it from here. My lawyer nods as I step out of the conference room, putting Alyssa behind me. It's not the last time I'll see her, though. Not today. I'm going to make sure of that. Because Alyssa and I have another round of begging and groveling and pleading to go through. She's given me three chances, and I fully intend to make my second chance count. First, however, I need to make sure that Mrs. Monroe is professionally sent off before she heads back to her private jet. If only I could find her. Chapter 5 Alyssa Well, I survived seeing Julian not only face to face, but back at the office while he's wearing one of those super hot suits of his. I survived. That's all that matters. However, I am not prepared to walk into the restroom before going back to my place and seeing a beautiful young businesswoman texting on her iPhone. Oh, sorry. I only came in to wash my hands. This time of year, they always feel so grimy thanks to the pollen flying around. I didn't know anyone else would be in here. I say that because, even though we women are notorious for going to the bathroom more than men, there aren't nearly as many female employees at Bradley and Marcus as there are male. Well, not on these floors, anyway. Another reason for me to walk the hell away from Julian and his bullshit. The blonde woman puts her phone away and flashes me a curt smile. No worries. Last I checked, we can share the sinks. Unless things are different in the PNW? Not that I know of. A flashy emerald and diamond ring twinkles on her left hand. Her dress is carefully tailored to hide her stomach. Bloat? Weight gain? Or... Her phone rings. Alice Monroe, she greets, fixing her stray hairs in the mirror. I should be there within ninety minutes. With any luck, I'll walk into my own bedroom by midnight back home. Alice Monroe? Holy shit! That's not bloat she's hiding. That's her post-baby weight. Wait, what is she doing all the way out here? Where's Mr. Monroe? Was that meeting happening today? Why am I somewhat starstruck? Is it because this woman is fancier than I expected? 
younger? Or is it all her money that makes her look younger than she really is? I know that her husband is still in his earlier thirties, but she puts her phone down. And you are? Her whole body is turned toward me. Aside from the curve-hugging black dress adorning her body and the twinkling wedding ring on her hand, her throat is encircled by a sleek and understated... collar. Yes, she is definitely Damon Monroe's wife. Now that I also know how to recognize collars like that, it makes me think of Julian and the tenderness he always showed me even when he was being the dominant one in the bedroom. I admit, I'm half disappointed that he didn't try to get me back right there in the conference room. I was prepared, ready for him to emotionally tear me apart in front of a professional audience. I was going to put my guards up, fight him off, convince myself that we weren't meant to be. Then, nothing. Sorry, I apologize again, fighting back images of Julian and how he always made love to me. I'm Alyssa Pendleton. I used to work here. Oh. Oh. Mrs. Monroe's grin grows wider. I've heard about you. My husband spoke of you the last couple of times he met with Mr. Marcus. Did he, now? I can only imagine what Mr. Monroe had to say about me to his wife. Alice Monroe leans against the sinks, her ring reflecting the soft light of the women's restroom. Only nice things, of course. I thought that you and Mr. Marcus were an item. Uh, could I look any more pathetic? We sort of broke up a little while ago. Oh. Oh, well, that's too bad. Alice is legitimately surprised that I'm no longer with Julian. Apparently, the news hasn't reached the East Coast yet. Guess that means Julian and Mr. Bradley don't have to worry much about their reputation. Especially if I drop my end of the suit after an out-of-court settlement. I didn't mean to drag that up. Sorry. No, it's fine. My eye keeps going back to the dainty, subtle collar wrapped around Mrs. Monroe's throat. Is it something she wears all the time? Is it something she wears only when she travels to have that connection to her husband? What does he wear or do to think about her? Why does it make me so sad? As if she knows what I'm staring at, Mrs. Monroe touches her collar and looks back toward the mirror. Dating men like that isn't easy. Trust me. I know. I met Damon one year ago, and look at me now. I wish I could say it was as simple as love and lust at first sight, but it never works that way. Especially for me. I wasn't born into that world. My mom's a nurse, for Pete's sake. I laugh. I'm not from that world, either. Guess I was too overwhelmed by what they think they can get away with. Felt too much like chattel at times. Yes. Alice studies her image in the mirror for a long moment. Is she thinking back to when she looked a little more beneath her current station? She carries herself well, being the wife of a billionaire and all. But sometimes she gives off a hint of... I practiced this until it was completely second nature. It was the only way to survive being with my husband. Being Mrs. Monroe must carry more responsibility and gravitas than being Mrs. Marcus. Those New England families don't fuck around with their legacies. It's one thing to be a fling or a short-term lover. They pamper you. They show you things you've only dreamed of. They change your life so quickly that you realize... You can never go back to being the humbler woman you used to be. Even so, you know that a man's infatuation is fleeting. There are many days when I seriously worry that I'll wake up and find a new Mrs. Monroe being moved into my house and bedroom. I have to trust my husband when he says I'm the only woman he could possibly want for the rest of his life. I think of how many times Julian came close to saying that he loved me. From what I know of the Monroes, they were already legally married by this point. 
I can't even imagine being married to Julian right now. The closest we got to talking about marriage was him saying we could possibly be together a long time. I always imagined us living together for a few years before broaching marriage. I would want to make sure that it was for real, you know? Plus, I've got stuff I want to do, like possibly going to grad school. How am I supposed to plan for a wedding and be Mrs. Marcus while going to grad school? Why am I even thinking about this? We broke up. It's over. Alice must catch the forlorn look on my face, for she quickly says, I'm so sorry to bring any of that up. If it's any consolation, there was a period of time where I broke things off with Damon as well. Because, like you said, the things billionaires seem to get away with are all too overwhelming. She pulls her bag off the sink and turns toward the door. Take care, Alyssa. If you can't patch things up with Mr. Marcus, I hope you at least get some worth out of that relationship. It's such an odd thing for a woman like her to say to me. But I'm not offended. If anything, I'm relieved. Here I was starting to think that I would never find someone who understood what I've been through with Julian. Because Cher sure as hell didn't understand. She kicked my ass out of her apartment and back to mine the moment she heard I planned on dropping out of the suit. I don't think she counted on me being genuinely in love with Julian. Now, as for the other way around, I step out of the bathroom and right in to Julian. Lissa. He's not overwrought. He's not even emotional. But he is strong powerful. He stands before me like he's about to pick me up and pack me off to his penthouse. I wish he would. Julian? I also stand up straight, spine rigid and face showing no trace of emotion. This is the only way I can deal with him now. Please, Lissa. He doesn't bridge the gap between us. I'm glad he doesn't. I'll give you anything you want. Any promises you want, I'll make. There must be something I can do to make it up to you. I'm not sure, Julian. I don't think it would be a good idea anyway. I push past him. He lets me. That was your second chance, by the way. His hand brushes against my arm. Shivers ripple through me, and I nearly explode. I almost run into his arms and kiss him. That's how powerful he is. That's how good he smells. That's how wonderful he once made me feel. I know, he says before walking away. Third time will be the charm. I watch after him. My heart sinking faster and harder than I ever gave it credit for. Chapter 6 Julian It's the day of my brother's wedding, and I'm the mopiest motherfucker to ever hit a vineyard and not get drunk. As the best man... It's my duty to make sure my brother is well taken care of and gets to the damn altar on time. Last time a Marcus got married, he stumbled to the altar half drunk thirty minutes late. His poor bride then realized that she had set herself up for a life of disappointment. That's how you get Serena Marcus to be my mother. Our mother. My father's been in and out, half drunk, of course. And a few of Ted's other friends have made sure to come in and shake his hand. But I'm the only one who hasn't left the chambers. Ted is all smiles as he claps guys on the back and steals a kiss from some housekeeper who swears she's never seen a happier gay couple get married at that vineyard. Really? How many have been done since it became legal in Oregon? I honestly want to know. Tin up, Jules. Ted approaches me grin so wide that I can count every one of his pearly white teeth. It's my wedding day. The least you could do is pretend to not be a heartbroken sack of shit. 
It must be that graceful tongue that made Jordan fall in love with you. Mister, I have a bachelor's degree in American poetry that my brother is marrying. Oh, it was the tongue, all right. Ted leans against the windowsill I have yet to detach myself from. His cologne is heavier than mine. This is why I change up my scent every few months. I know about olfactory fatigue and how it leads to fine men such as myself to bathe in fragrance so he can smell it again. Also the same tongue that made that housekeeper cry before Jordan and I got back together. He winks at me. Subtle. You don't even remember her name. Doesn't matter. Do you ever remember their names? You know whose name I remember really well right now? Alyssa's. Come on, Jules. I know you're legitimately heartbroken for once, but it's supposed to be a happy day. My only wish is that you could have brought a new date with you. One to scare Mother with, of course. I had lots of lovely ladies offer to come with me to my brother's wedding. But unless Alyssa changed her mind, I wasn't bringing anyone. Besides, I have... Preston, who was here with his new date since, apparently... He wasn't as fallen for Cher as I was for Alyssa. Whatever. Damn it. My big brother ignores his buzzing phone and sits down next to me. We're gonna have to talk about this, huh? About what? I don't recall asking for your opinion about Alyssa. In fact, I haven't told him a damn thing. Jordan told me the details. Of course he did. I had drunkenly said a few things at the bachelor party, hadn't I? It's none of your business, I hastily say. Maybe so, but I don't like seeing my little brother so torn up over a woman. He said that in all seriousness, didn't he? This lying asshole actually had the audacity to say that to my face. I don't think I could possibly broadcast how pissed that makes me to him any more than I have. The hell is that face for? Seriously? I push away from the window, the fresh flower clipped to my front pocket, losing a petal from my irrational movements. Seriously, Ted. What? I lock the door to our chambers before anyone has the bright idea to interrupt us. My brother and I have needed to have this little chat for years now. Perhaps it's not the best idea to have it on his wedding day, but fuck it. I somehow doubt I am ruining this day for him. Savannah. My voice reverberates against the thin window panes. Ted frowns, chiseled chin propped up on his hand. What about Georgia? No, Ted. Savannah. My girlfriend you stole. He doesn't answer. Why, Ted? Why the fuck did you go out of your way to steal one of my girlfriends? I leave out the part where Savannah was the last woman I had a somewhat serious relationship with. Before Alyssa, anyway. You never had enough of your own? For fuck's sake, your dating pool is even bigger than mine. You get any woman or man you want. Like you don't get any woman you want. He snorts. I promise you, Jules, if you ever have a bisexual awakening... I've already paved the way for Marcus men around the world. Stop it. I'm starting to regret not having anything to drink yet. I had been saving it for the open bar at the reception. Join my parents in the alcoholic festivities while my father parties, and my mother washes away her shame for having a queer son. Good God, Jules. You look like you want to rip my throat out. Did that girl really mean that much to you? Are you still harboring that much resentment in your fickle heart? Shut the fuck up. I saw the way you were acting around Alyssa, too. They hadn't only met the one time. They've met since then, whenever we all happened to be in town at the same time. Every meeting was Ted flirting with my girlfriend like he had every right to, and Alyssa eating it up. Either because she didn't realize it, or she wasn't threatened by my brother. As for Jordan... I'll never know what he sees in my playboy brother. Maybe they have an open relationship. I don't care. 
Ted drops his carefree facade. It's not often I see the serious side of my brother, outside of the boardroom anyway. Ted is the type to go hard or go home at work, but outside of it, he wants to be everyone's best friend, even if he doesn't remember their names. As for me, for a guy who never paid any attention to me until we were both adults, I don't know why he thinks we can be best buds. It's not in my personality to have that kind of relationship with anyone in my family. It was never my intention to make you angry, Jules. I acted that way around Alyssa because I genuinely liked her. As a partner for you. My stupid baby brother who wouldn't know love if it crapped on his filet mignon. I hate to think I was the one who got the last of Mom's ability to love in her womb, but seeing how you and her both turned out... I know he's not comparing me to our mother. He is not. Hey... Come on. You're a closed-off guy, Jules. That's why I was excited for you meeting someone like Alyssa. Both Jordan and I thought you might have found someone who actually made you happy. And Savannah? Did you seduce her away from me because she wasn't making me happy enough? Low blow, man. I never stole that woman from you. A man can't steal anyone from someone else. Doesn't work that way, you idiot. Takes two. He catches the look of disdain on my face. All right. It was wrong of me to pursue something with her when she was obviously with you. But I want to clear the air and say that it was a mutual feeling between her and me. I think. I honestly don't remember her well. Oh my god, I am going to clock him on his wedding day. Fuck you. I finally say. Just fuck you, Ted. I've heard that a lot in my life. <laughs> Trust me. I know what a shithead I can be. Great in the office. Not so great in the home. I took on the brunt of our parents' shitty parenting by emulating them instead of figuring shit out on my own. I never even considered marrying someone until Jordan. And I still fucked it up and drove him away for a while. When we got back together, I spent a million years apologizing and making it up to him. I fucked up bad. My head is pounding. As much as I want to lash out at my brother some more, I know it won't do any good. Not for him, not for me, and it sure as hell won't get me Alyssa back. Or Savannah, for that matter. After Ted was quickly done with her, I never heard back from her again. What happened, anyway? He told me that the pressure of dating someone like us got to him. Two things happened. Ted turns off his phone, which continues to blow up with messages from the wedding party and the planner. One was my fuck-up, and the other was mother. Oh, God. I can only imagine... Yep, Mother Dearest tried to rip me a new asshole for flaunting my homosexual tendencies. When it had no effect on me, she went after Jordan. Scared him really good. Of course she did. He wanted me to do something about it. But what the hell could I do? She's my mother. I can't get rid of her. I either put up with or ignore her bigotry. Besides... Father's the one who pulls the legal end of the inheritance, so as long as he doesn't care, I don't care. Jordan, though, he couldn't understand that. He was convinced Mother would make our lives hell. Jordan left that kind of environment when he was a teenager, you know. I didn't, no. Well, he did. Made quite a name of his own after college, but he got there by the skin of his teeth. Was homeless for a while as a teenager. Only reason he didn't end up on the absolute bottom rung of society was because he found a spot in a shelter for homeless LGBT youth. Helped him graduate high school and go off to live in a dorm at college. The rest is history, I guess. I had no idea. So when Mother started behaving that way toward us, Jordan panicked. I didn't take his concerns seriously enough. He was overwhelmed and broke up with me. 
Blah, blah, blah. Your big, heartbroken brother self-medicated with sex and other unhealthy addictions, got cleaned up, and determined to turn his life around, and here came Jordan at a conference we happened to attend. I remember that part. Yep. We were back in bed together that night. Ted clears his throat. I don't even flinch. Been together since. If that's not a sign that we're meant to be together, then I don't know what is. Decided to make an honest man out of him and show Mother that I was serious. And now she self-medicates. She's always done that. He sighs, body sagging in his tailored tux. The point is that I didn't give him the reassurance that he needed to know that a relationship between us could work. No amount of love or sexual attraction was enough in the end. People who have known that level of desperation and poverty will never relate to us on that level. Yes, that's okay, but we have to make it up to them in other ways if they're really the ones we want. Has this whole conversation been a setup to giving me advice? Guess that's where I failed then. Lissa freaked out and ran out on me. I can't convince her to take me back. She says I get one more chance before I'm expected to leave her alone for the rest of her life. Ted kicks himself away from the windowsill. Hope it works out for you, Jules. I like to think that you and I can break that vicious cycle our parents have been in since before we were born. Do you want to be like Dad when we're his age? God, no. I'd like to think I have more self-control than that. Heh. <sighs> Ted swings his arm toward the door with a grin the size of Texas on his face. Yeah, I got that bug from him. And you've got Mom's frigid face. But that doesn't mean we have to become them, you know? Is this supposed to make me feel better about my breakup? No. But it's supposed to make you a bit nicer for my damned wedding, brother. Come on. I'm supposed to be getting married. We open the door to find a team of stylists and wedding party members on the verge of dialing 911 because my big brother locked them out. When they see us, they beg Ted and me to get our asses out to the altar. The wedding is supposed to start in 20 minutes. Believe it or not, I've been to a gay wedding before, although this is my first time being in the wedding party. Every couple does things differently. Some shirk traditional methods altogether because it's rather awkward having one man come down the aisle while the other waits for him. This is especially true for my brother and his groom. People make jokes that Jordan's the woman, whatever that means, and my brother wasn't about to let him be a spectacle like that at his wedding. So last night at the rehearsal, we ran through Ted coming down the aisle first. Jordan was to follow until they were both at the altar. Jordan's parents aren't here. My parents? My mother sits in the front row looking like she'd rather be drinking. My father is drinking and raising a ruckus with some of his buddies in the second row. There's no way in hell my mother would walk with her oldest son down the aisle at his big gay wedding. Jordan and Ted compromise by walking down with their best men. That means me. Flashes go off as cameramen get their shots and retreat back into the rows. Classical music plays in the background. Fresh-cut flowers smell like candy to me. And there are plenty of them at the end of every aisle. An adorable flower girl, the daughter of Jordan's best man, throws down orchid petals like she's scored a touchdown. This would be romantic if I wasn't thinking of... thinking of... Someone must be smoking some Mary Jane and giving me a contact high, because, I swear to God, I see Alyssa sitting at the end of one of the rows, dressed in the lilac-colored tulle dress I had made for her one week before we broke up. Try to keep it together, Jules, Ted says to me halfway down the aisle. I'm too gobsmacked to look away from Alyssa's averting gaze. You can slobber over her. After the ceremony, he smacks my leg when I refuse to pay attention to him. You're welcome, by the way. Chapter 7 
Alyssa. Yes, that's me sitting on the very end of the sixth row, right next to my lawyer, Holden. I hadn't planned on coming to Ted and Jordan's wedding after what happened with Julian. After all, my ex-boyfriend is the one walking his brother down the aisle. Their identical suits and flowers, making the two brothers look more alike than they ever have before. Except Julian looks younger, of course. Ted's reaching forty, and he's gone a little gray already. Julian, on the other hand, barely looks older than thirty, with a full head of dark hair. They both shoot me steel, cool looks. But it's Julian's mouth that drops the moment he realizes it's me. Don't worry, Alyssa, Holden says with his usual legal bravado. If he tries anything, I'm here to slap a restraining order against him. Really? Is that appropriate talk for a wedding? It's sort of a long story how I've come to be at this wedding, and I definitely did not intend to sit at the end of the aisle. But I still had the dress hanging in my closet. What would I do with it anyway? It was too tailor-made to sell anywhere. Too nice to simply throw out. I suppose it's fate that kept me holding on to it, even though it was delivered long after I walked away from Julian. Because a few days ago? Ted called me. Ted Marcus. Not Jordan, of all people. Look, Alyssa, he said. I don't know what my little brother did, but I believe you when you say he royally fucked up. Give him one more chance. At my wedding. It will be poetic. I said no about three times. After all, why the hell would I want to go to Ted's wedding? Not that I have anything against Ted, although I can totally see why he has a reputation as a notorious flirt who is liable to start pissing people off with his devil-may-care attitude. And Jordan had been nothing but kind and understanding with me. But, Julian, he would be there. He would see me and both certainly happened no fewer than ten minutes after Holden and I sat down. I made the mistake of telling Holden, the younger of my two lawyers assigned to my lawsuit, that I planned to still come to this wedding. Not only did he totally object to me doing it, but after I made the decision to still come, he invited himself as my plus one to protect my interests. I dare someone to insult me by implying I don't see that Holden has a crush on me. He's been hovering around me ever since he was assigned to my case. At first, I thought it was nice, because what young woman doesn't like having a younger lawyer who can better explain things to her? But after it became apparent that he was mostly interested in my assets, I learned to grin and bear the foolishness until the settlement is finalized and I can wash my hands of him. No, I'm not going out with him. No, I'm not even leading him on or flirting with him. Honestly, I shouldn't have even let him come with me. I should have come with one of my friends. But I was so thrown off by his insistence that I didn't know what else to say other than, okay. Now here I am. Wishing I could hide under some lady's hats if it means I don't have to face Julian a final time. He's so shocked by my appearance that he almost trips his brother in the middle of the aisle. Ted grabs a hold of his arm and hisses something into his ear. Get a grip, Jules, I imagine him saying. This is my damn wedding you're making a fool of yourself at. The ceremony continues. Jordan flashes me a smile on his way by, but doesn't wave. He saves the waves for his friends and family. That could be me one day, I suppose. Walking down the aisle in a wedding dress that costs more money than my college education. Paid for by my magnanimous husband, Julian Marcus. You know, assuming I'm asked to take him back even though I want to.
even though I look at him and instantly hold back the urge to run up to him and cry that I'm so sorry, that I forgive him, that we can hurry up and get married once his brother's done. I want it so badly, but I must be strong. I came here to support Ted and Jordan, a couple I barely know. I came here to give Julian his final chance. No script, no preparation. He'll either win me back, unlikely, or drive me away forever. More than likely. The fact that today might be the last time I ever see him like this. My heart skips a beat. For a single moment, I allow myself to fantasize that this is my wedding day, and that tonight Julian will slowly strip my white wedding dress away from my body and make me his wife. The moment is over way too soon. So is the ceremony. I spend the next hour between the ceremony outside and the reception inside the vineyard's main building, avoiding Julian. Not hard to do when there are five hundred other people clamoring to shake the newlyweds' hands and regale them with tales of their weddings. Holden and I are able to slip into the reception undetected, although I'm sure Julian is losing his mind trying to find me while still upholding his best man duties. It's his job to stand with his parents beside Ted and shake hands as people enter the reception area. Their father is already making a fool of himself while their mother can only curtly nod and thank people for coming to the spectacle. Holden and I bypass it entirely. I'll give Ted and Jordan my love later. The Marcuses did not hold back on the expenses for this reception. Everything, from the dishes to the silverware to the vases holding whole bouquets of fresh exotic flowers, is made of either pure crystal or gold. The tablecloths are hand-stitched with gold thread. A live jazz band flown in from L.A. performs for most of the night, taking turns between upbeat instrumentals to slow, achingly sweet love ballads as sung by the talented female lead. Every guest is decked out in either designer wear or tailor-made garments. Everyone smells good. Everyone has perfect manners. Everyone takes happy selfies and professional shots with photographers. This kind of wedding doesn't keep disposable cameras on the tables for the guests to fill up. Instead, there are three professional photographers making the rounds, and Holden and I are one of the first to be asked for a casual pose. Holden, of course, puts his arm on the back of my chair and makes it look like we're a couple. I know that Julian is only a few feet away before he even sees me. It's not because I can see him through a small throng of people laughing and carrying on about their trips to Milan and Tahiti. It's because my ex-boyfriend's presence is so strong, so intimidating, that there could be a concrete wall erected between us, and I would still know that he's there, looking for me. Perhaps he's been making his way toward me this whole time. Going to get some punch, I say to Holden. When he moves to accompany me, I hold out a gentle hand and jerk my head toward the ladies' room. Punch is code dude. Be careful, he says, before sitting back down. I want to get away from Julian's overwhelming presence. If it means crossing the room full of people dancing to live jazz music, then I'll do it. Give me some peace for a while, please. Of course, I'm not allowed any peace. The moment I reach the other side of the dance floor, I feel that presence again. Like I did back at the Bradley and Marcus building, and like I did at that park in northwest Portland. Lissa. His voice is so hushed that it's a wonder I can hear him over the happy rabble of wedding attendees. My hands grab the purple tulle on my skirt, because with Julian right next to me like this, I am nothing but a bundle of nerves. What is he going to say? What is he going to do? 
How will I react? This is it. He's using up his third chance to get me back. I knew this moment would come, but I wasn't prepared for possibly never seeing him again. I love you. Wait. Did I hear that right? I fully turned my body toward him, my head cocked to one side. What was that? He takes a step closer to me. This powerful businessman, who almost never wears his heart on his bespoke sleeve, is prepared to show me his whole heart right now. I love you, Lissa. I'm sorry I never told you sooner. I foolishly assumed I would have all the time in the world to tell you how I really feel. You... You love me. I shake my head. You think that's enough to get me back? No. I take a step back. Excuse me? He holds his hand out to me as a new song begins to play. I haven't danced with anyone tonight. Please, let me have the chance to show you how I feel instead of telling you. He chuckles. You know better than almost anyone else that I'm not always the best with words. As if I am possessed, I tentatively take his hand and am led to the dance floor where other well-to-do couples canoodle and network. While half the couples are heterosexual, there are quite a few male pairs snuggling up and laughing with their friends. They all cease to exist the moment I'm in Julian's arms. Don't I remember what this is like? How much I loved being in his hold like this. In the beginning, I couldn't believe that it was true that someone like Julian Marcus could possibly want me to be his girlfriend. And later on, when he talked about us being together for years, I knew it was too good to be true. That's why finding out the truth about why we first hooked up hurt me more than anything else. Now that I'm back in his arms, I almost feel that way again. But I can't succumb to those feelings right now. Julian might want to show me his feelings, but I still need to use logic and reason right now. I can't be that virgin who was summoned to his office based on a stupid bet. God, literally anyone else would have been better than me. Lizzie, Cher, those girls could have handled being seduced by Mr. Marcus, let alone moving on from him the moment he stopped showing them affection. Maybe they would have been pissed if they found out the truth. But heartbroken? Hardly. Only me, young and naive Alyssa, could have fallen into a hole like that. Why me? You are more beautiful than I thought you could be in that dress. It's the first thing he said since bringing me to the dance floor. I couldn't let it go to waste, I say. Good thing you didn't. I was dying to see you in this lovely dress. My hand grows clammy in his. Am I nervous? Of course I am. This man is probably going to continue to confess his love to me, and I'm expected to walk away from him. Don't give in, Alyssa. You and that young lawyer of yours look awfully close. I tense. Jealous, Julian? Of course I am. Didn't I tell you that you belong to me? My eyes furrow without me telling them to. Good to know he can still get this kind of rise out of me. I left you, Julian. We're not together anymore. I can date other men now. He sucks in his lower lip instead of telling me how he really feels. So you are dating him, then? Maybe. I haven't decided yet. He certainly thinks he's dating me, though. We almost bump into another slightly drunk couple. 
Both men apologized before complimenting my dress and going back to their dance. At the large table at the head of the dance floor, Jordan and Ted keep a watchful eye on us. Damn it. They should be enjoying their wedding. They don't need to be following our drama over here. Men like that only want to use you, Lissa. Is that advice from a man looking out for me? Or from my jealous ex-boyfriend? Consider it advice from a man who knows that type of guy well enough. Dancing with Julian was a huge fantasy of mine. We had danced together before, at a couple of functions full of rich people wearing their best designer wear, but those were nothing compared to a wedding like this. Before we broke up, I don't want to think about how many times I fantasized about dancing with a man like this. The rapture of it was going to be overwhelming. Me, him, twirling to live jazz music in his tuxedo in my gorgeous dress. People celebrating love and happiness around us. The cheerful jabs from friends that it was only a matter of time before we got hitched, too. The sense of ownership, of possession... Julian knows how to broadcast to a whole room. I was going to revel in that today. Oh, don't get me wrong. He's doing that. Right. Now. But it's not the same. Because I don't belong to him anymore. I made sure of that. This might be the last chance I ever have to be close to Julian like this. On one hand, I should be making the most of this. On the other, I left this man for a reason. He ultimately made me feel too disposable to deal with. I drop his hand and step away. Lissa. We're awkwardly standing in the middle of these dancing couples. They politely look away and pretend they don't see us making fools of ourselves. I love you. My feet were ready to take me far away from this dance floor. I'd run up and tell the newlyweds how happy I am for them, how I hope they have a wonderful life together. And then I'd run far, far away from Julian Marcus and the pain he leaves in my wake. Then he said that. Suddenly, I can't move. Lissa. Julian grabs my wrist. His touch is hot, sweaty. Did I do that to him? Say something. I finally have my bearings together. Time to run away. I don't look back as I leave the dance floor. I know he's behind me. Julian Marcus is not going to relent until I tell him to back off, that he's used up his third chance to get me back. He's going to follow me as long as he can find me. Do you know why I don't tell him right here and right now that his three strikes are up? Because I don't believe that this chance is up yet. Here it is. The make it or break it moment for our relationship. He said those words. I love you. Did he mean them? Or did he say that in a last-ditch effort to get me back? I'm about to find out. Chapter 8. Julian Was I expecting Alyssa to fall all over me when I said those damned words? No. Was I expecting her to run? No. This is how I know I love her. Because she's the only woman in the world I'll chase after like some lovesick teenage boy trapped in an 80s movie. I half expect Alyssa to hop into a cab and make a break for the airport. In true, romancing fashion, I'll bypass security and show up at the gate right when she's about to board. 
sweep her up in my arms, twirl her around and kiss her until she knows that I'm the man she's staying in America for. That's not happening today. Alyssa isn't going to hop into a car and drive away from me. She'll run, but she won't flee. I'll catch her before that has a chance of happening. I don't call out her name. I don't even ask her to wait for me. She knows what game we're playing right now, and my role demands that I simply catch her. Come to me, Alyssa. I let you run away from me once. It's never happening again. Especially when you're gorgeous enough in that dress to make this grown man weep. Even in those ridiculous heels of hers, she manages to stay quite a few paces ahead of me. It's not until she encounters a dead end in one of the hallways that I finally catch up to her, although I make sure to keep a respectable distance from her. I don't want to overwhelm or frighten her, yet all I want is to wrap her up in my arms and hold her. It's been too long. I'm wasting away without Alyssa Pendleton by my side. She looks like a lost angel standing at the end of this hallway, where a bay window overlooks the vineyard and brings in the early evening sunlight. A golden glow illuminates the lavender and crystals of her hand-stitched dress. She's so ethereal that I'm afraid to breathe around her, lest she disappear in a wisp of smoke. Alyssa. My voice is as soft and delicate as that smoke. Slowly, she turns. Her eyes flash a heavenly mixture of desperation and disbelief, while her feisty countenance dares me to come any closer. I'm not afraid to take up that dare. I step closer. I'll corner her if I have to. Anything that tells her that I'm not ever, ever giving her up. She'll have to shove me away with her own two delicate hands for me to get the hint. Please, Alyssa, let me tell you how much I love you. She shivers. I know, precious. You're cold without your shawl on those bare shoulders of yours. Here, let me give you my jacket. That's what I want to say. But I'm too gobsmacked by what she says first. No, Julian. I don't want to hear anything that you have to say to me. She shakes her head so slowly that I almost miss those slight movements. Your words don't mean anything now that I know what you're willing to lie about. I wish I could say that I don't agree with her. But she's right, isn't she? About all of it. I'm a shill. A man who seduced her under false pretenses. If I could go back and do it all over again, I would have seduced her the moment I met her. But how was I to know that an intern like her was meant to change my life? I only knew her from the work I had to constantly correct. Now I find those memories charming. A story to tell our kids one day. Your mother and I met at my office. She couldn't get her charts and figures sorted to save her life but I fell in love with that beautiful smile and her willingness to get the job done. No. I fell in love with her after Preston convinced me to sleep with her. He chose her for me, as if he opened our employee roster and pointed at the first name he saw. Nothing special. No one special. How can I blame Alyssa for what she feels after learning that? After all, there's a reason I had never told her the truth— not that I ever thought she would find out. I wanted her to keep the fantasy that I had always wanted her until I couldn't take it anymore. That I was willing to punch HR in the face and risk my reputation to be with her, even if for one night. Before, I never cared if my womanizing reputation came back to haunt me. Because here I am now, wishing that I could take all of that back so she and I could be together with not a lick of shame between us. I don't feel any shame. Why should she? Then let me show you what you mean to me. She hesitates before making eye contact with me again. There's desire in those eyes. Not necessarily sexual desire, 
although I certainly wish to see it, the desire to believe me. Please believe me, Alyssa. You don't have to listen to my words, Lyssa. I hold my hand out to her. But I do ask that you feel what I have to share. I don't hide what I mean. Just looking at her turns me into a crazed man of wanton seduction. The intensity of our situation doesn't change it. Hell, probably makes me harder in these tight trousers. She takes my hand, knowing full well what kind of man I am. Chapter 9 Alyssa Good one, Alyssa. Let the man take you into an empty room and slam you against the wall. What is this, your third date with him? It's like he senses how weak I am. All it takes is the insulation that we can have sex one last time. That he can somehow show me how much he loves me with nothing but his body. And I'm like that same thirsty, virgin dumbass all over again. Sure, Julian. Show me what's what with your dick one last time. God knows it might be the last time I have good sex for the rest of my life. Because I will compare every other man I'm ever with to you. I should be embarrassed by how ready I am for him. No foreplay. No stimulation until his hand is between my legs. And that's only to shove my pesky underwear to the side and make sure I'm not wearing any sheer tights beneath my dress. I'm not. I barely touch him aside from grabbing onto his shoulders and wrapping my legs around his waist. For God's sake, what if somebody sees us through the window? He would probably like that. This man has suggested that he has some exhibitionist tendencies before. What better way to show the world that he loves me than by being caught fucking me? There are two sides to going at this quickly. One side says we should do it now before I change my mind. I haven't been with anyone since that day I walked out of Preston Bradley's manor. I don't want to think about what Julian might have done since I told him it was over. He could pine after me all he wants. I know how he is. He probably fucked the first woman he came across, if only to get my taste out of his mouth. Too bad that's my taste in his mouth right now. Do you want me at all, Lyssa? Guess my wet pussy doesn't broadcast that enough. Because like I said, we've had zero foreplay and he's already going for it. The head of his cock prying apart my slick slit and pushing into my crevice. Julian always penetrates me effortlessly. But it doesn't stop me from being shocked over how much I want him every time. The man barely whispers the word sex. And I'm wetter than I've ever been in my life. Yes, Julian. I meet his kiss the moment he enters me. My fingers digging into the back of his head and my body splitting in two for him. I want you. That's... Not an admission that we're getting back together, though. That only means I love having sex with him. One more for the road, if nothing else. Shit, I'm such a slut. Maybe it's best if I debase myself like this the last time we have sex. Maybe it's for the best if I kiss him so hard that I black out. Maybe... I should concentrate on getting a great orgasm out of this encounter so I can at least treasure that for the rest of my life. God knows I've got the front of his shirt unbuttoned so his hard, warm chest presses against me as he completely devours my whole body and attempts to make it his all over again. This is the trouble I fell into the first time we did. This is how I ended up down that destructive path being Julian Marcus's girlfriend. Is this going to be the rest of my life? Trying to move on, only to cross paths with him no matter where I go in the world. Knowing looks, 
flushed cheeks, getting cornered in the hallway and asked for a quickie in an empty room. Will he be married? Will I be married? Will we cheat on our future significant others because we can't keep our hands off each other, even though I'm eternally so pissed off at him that I can't stand the thought of being his Mrs. Marcus? Will he knock me up one day and I've got to explain that to my husband? I told you, I'm a slut. For him. All it took was one look. One insinuation that he wanted to bed me, and there I was, legs spread wide open and breasts popping out of my blouse. On his desk. We didn't even make it to a bed. Now he says he wants me, and I've got my legs wrapped around him at his brother's wedding. Yes, Julian. I can't stop the words coming out of my mouth. Every time he thrusts into me, it's like more words are pulled from my body. I want you. Desperation mounts. Hell, he mounts me. But now I can't control myself. I'm full of my affections for this man I know I'll never be able to shake. He could leave me alone forever. But he'll always be lurking in the corner of my eye and haunting my heart. I guess it's true. The girl never forgets her first. Especially if her first is a man like him. I want you to. He kisses me with such ardor that I almost forget I'm on the verge of coming. I fucking love you, Lissa. That's not a lie. I've been waiting for him to say those words ever since I realized he has genuine affection for me. Now that he's said those words not once, but twice, I'm ready to embrace the fantasy that we're going to be together forever. I don't only want that sweet fantasy. I need it. I crave it. I crave him. He can't control it, for once. Usually, Julian makes a game out of making me come first, or at least letting us come together. Rarely has he ever come first unless that was a part of the game. That's how much control he usually has over himself. So when I feel him come, before I even have the chance... I suppose most women wouldn't understand why I consider that a sign of his feelings for me. If you can't understand, that's fine. But let me say this. Julian would never lose control like this with a woman he didn't genuinely love. He's not a member of the amateur club. His ego would never let him succumb to something like that. Julian... <laughs> I'm pushed over the edge. The realization that he's telling the truth makes me come with a slow, hot burn that drains him of the last of his seed deep, deep within me. The intimate sensation creates a new bond between us that wasn't there before I walked out on him. Still, this doesn't let him off the hook. Still, when I press my forehead to his, the moment I climb down from my climax, I know that I will never be able to love another man the way I love this one. Don't push me away, my love. I give him a sleepy grin. You've still got some groveling to do, Mr. Marcus. He slowly slips out of me. So much for my fancy, expensive dress. Good luck to whatever dry cleaner has to get rid of the brand new stain left when he pulls out his cock and releases the wonderful damage he's done to my, in some ways yet, virginal body. I've got the whole damn day to grovel to you. This is only the beginning of my third chance at groveling, Lissa. I'm going to hold him to it. We are at a wedding, 
after all. Chapter 10 Julian You're damn right that I'm not finished groveling yet. If anyone thinks I'm not going into overdrive making sure Alyssa Pendleton knows that I love the fucking ground she walks on, then they're not paying attention to who I am and what I've been saying for weeks now. I'm so close. I can taste a true reunion with her on the tip of my tongue. But I'm not counting these damned chickens until I'm in Aruba with her, enjoying our first real vacation together. I did promise her that I would take her somewhere before school starts again, didn't I? As soon as we rejoined the reception, cleaned up and cleaned up, I broadcast to the room that I'm back in Alyssa's good graces by putting a firm arm around her waist and directing her to my empty plus-one seat at the head table. The moment they see us, Ted scoffs in great amusement, and his new husband leans in to whisper something to everyone else at the table. Good-natured laughter erupts as soon as Alyssa and I are within earshot again. We were wondering where you'd run off to, Jordan says to my girlfriend. Awful shame seeing this bachelor pollute my nice wedding with his brooding. As long as it's handsome brooding, Alyssa says without missing a beat. She sits down in the chair I pull out for her. But I have it on good authority that both Marcus brothers are fairly handsome. Fairly, she says, Ted mutters. Does she go to the same school of subtle shade as our mother, Jules? That same mother is at the far end of the table, pretending she doesn't see Alyssa. My father slings his arm along the back of my girlfriend's chair and holds up a fresh glass of champagne. Alyssa spares him a cordial smile before turning back toward my brother. Forgive me, but if I fawn over you too much, your brother will get jealous. He's always been jealous of me. That smug smile wants me to punch it off his face, doesn't it? Bless my baby brother's heart. Please, Jordan says. No inciting fraternal bloodshed at our wedding. But other kinds are fine. It would be a boring wedding otherwise. I hear Ethan Cole had a fistfight at his wedding a year ago. I'm sure there's some way we could raise the stakes here. An approaching guest helps change the subject, which helps me focus on Alyssa again. I practically wait on her hand and foot. Whatever she wants, I procure. Wine? Cranberry juice? Finger food from one of the most revered chefs in the PNW. Cake? I'll have her favorite food truck ported down here if it makes her smile. All I know is that she's not getting up unless she absolutely wants to. She is going to see that her darling boyfriend and potential father of her children isn't afraid to lift fingers for her, instead of merely shoving them into her, mind you. One day, she's going to have all the servants she requires. I don't care if it means she goes soft around the middle. If it makes her happy to be waited on, then I'll make sure it happens. But this isn't the end of my groveling, either. After making sure that sniveling lawyer lad gets the idea that she's with me, I return to the banquet table to discover that speeches are being made. As one of the groom's best men, I'm the first up. Let's see. How do I stroke my brother's ridiculously bloated ego while making the speech all about Alyssa? And how I'll make sure we're the next to get married, and soon. When Ted told me that he was getting married and that I was destined to be his best man, I begin, the mic far from trembling in my hand. I thought he was full of shit. Because I don't believe in destiny. A tenuous laugh ripples through the captivated audience. My mother rolls her eyes because of my swearing, although I doubt she cares much about her image anymore. Jordan stifles another laugh. Ted throws his hand up in the air as if I'm the uncontrollable baby brother he never asked for. Alyssa, meanwhile, politely sits without a smile or a frown. Even I can barely tell what she's thinking. Suppose that makes me sound like a Scrooge at a wedding, but it's the truth. Or at least, I didn't used to believe in fate, destiny, whatever you want to call it. 
I'm a man who believes in setting goals and doing everything to achieve them. So as far as I was concerned, Ted had set out to make me his best man simply to spite me. More laughter from the people who know us the best. Others tentatively glanced between us, gauging Ted's reactions. I was the last person on earth surprised to find out that my brother was marrying a man. Even so, I was shocked to find out it was Jordan. Because he's way too good for my brother. Take it from me, Jordan. You have your damn work cut out for you. The ink isn't dry on the marriage license yet, Jules. My brother shouts over my mic. Could you wait until it's filed, at least? And now he's got a baby on the way? I look to their surrogate, who is going on bed rest as soon as this reception is over. Until then, she'll waddle around the reception sipping flavored water and impressing the other guests with her party tricks. Typical Ted. Throws money at a woman to make her do all the gestating work for him. I feel sorry for that kid. He doesn't even get Jordan's good looks. The whole hall erupts into laughter. While it was never made public knowledge, it doesn't take a genius to figure out the kid is genetically a Marcus. My father wouldn't have let the kid into the will otherwise. At least the surrogate is drop-dead gorgeous, with natural blonde hair and the clearest skin a model could ask for. Pretty sure she is a retired model that Ted dated when he was in college. She shrugs at this announcement. Alyssa gives me a look that implies I should change subjects. But the more I look at these two, morning, a lot of incoming corniness, the more I wonder if fate isn't a real thing after all. I know that seeing my big brother in genuine love helped me recognize love in my own life. Boom. Look to Alyssa and focus the whole room's attention on her. She was in the middle of drinking some iced water. Now, Half of it is in her handkerchief. If it weren't for Ted, I wouldn't have realized how much I love my own girlfriend, Alyssa. Somewhere in the midst of all these guests, Preston has ordered another Bloody Mary. Pretty sure my mother has cleared the bar out of tomato juice, however, because those aren't tears of joy spilling down her cheeks. The professional photographs will make sure they look like that, though. Alyssa blushes at my public proclamation. Ted rolls his eyes. Jordan claps. These three actions sum up the personalities of the people around me. As always, I only really have eyes for Alyssa. My beautiful, sweet Alyssa, whom I do not in any way deserve. You know it's fate, when you also know that your overrated ass doesn't deserve anyone. But he'll take it anyway. Until the end of the reception, Alyssa and I dance, eat, and flirt until the whole table tells us to get a room. Little do they know. I can't keep my hand off her knee or wrapped in her own soft hand. It feels completely natural when she leans in and cracks jokes about my family and the other guests at this extravagant party when she offhandedly suggests she wants her wedding completely outdoors. I start coming up with lists of every possible venue. I'm thinking destination wedding. Hawaii, to keep the legality simple. We kiss more than the newlyweds do. She stays close by when we're called for wedding party photos, and for the last one, my brother insists that she pose with me. The lavender of her dress matches our sapphire blue cummerbunds, and the violet-blue roses tucked into our front pockets. It's like we never broke up. Over time, the carefully constructed facade she built around her comes down. One kiss, one laugh at a time. I know this isn't the end of my groveling. I'm going to be groveling for years. Not because I have to, but because I want to. This woman makes me want to act like an utter fool. I want to take out ads declaring my love for her. I want to marry her every single year she'll put up with my foolishness. I want to have all the kids we can because I can't imagine getting sick of bringing life into the world with her. 
I want to pay for the best education for her. If she wants to work with me going forward, she can run her own subsidiary for all I care. Suck it, Preston. Did you mean what you said earlier about fate? She asks me while we enjoy the final dance of the evening. Because that was sweet. I do. You know I'm a no-nonsense kind of guy. Until you, I never entertained fairy tales. She averts her bashful gaze. <laughs> You're too much. As I mentioned before, protocol is sometimes thrown out the window at bashes like my brother's. There's no throwing of the bouquet or tossing of the garter in the end. Instead, the newlyweds give a short parting speech before heading out to the limo waiting to take them back to their honeymoon suite in Portland. But as the bird seed flies outdoors, and it seems that this is the last I have to put up with my brother until his kid is born, Jordan breaks away from his new husband and approaches us as we stand on the sidelines. Thanks for coming. He plucks the violet-blue rose from his pocket and gently places it in Alyssa's hand. For you. Just like that, he's gone again, a wink thrown in our direction. People start talking about what happened. Photographers take candid shots of my girlfriend holding one of the groom's flowers. There may have been no bouquet, but the intent was clear. We're... Next. Epilogue. Alyssa. I can't think of a better way to close out this crazy year than to celebrate Christmas with family. And my boyfriend. The Marcuses don't really do Christmas, per se, but they've managed to schedule a family dinner on the first day of winter. This works out well for our travel plans. Julian and I are about to hop his plane to my family's reunion in San Francisco. All of them. He's going to meet all of them. My mother hasn't stopped talking him up to my second cousins. But today, it's all about the Marcuses in their family home. It's about what you expect. A cold, albeit tastefully decorated, atmosphere. Servants at everyone's beck and call and all of them looking like they can't wait for Mr. and Mrs. Marcus to go on their yearly tropical getaway so they can go home to their own families for Christmas. Serena Marcus is on her second eggnog of the night, and texting all the other bitter old has-been wives of the other well-to-do men. Her husband drinks as much as her, but manages a cheery disposition as he fawns over his five-month-old granddaughter and insists that she has her grandmother's eyes. It's the Marcus boys who bring any warmth to this sad dinner. Jordan and Ted sit close together, their nanny already on her Christmas break and forcing them to be dads. Julian, on the other hand, has never looked so comfortable around his family. Granted, it's the brother and brother-in-law he talks to, but I am confident when I say I've never seen Julian so serene in the home he grew up in, let alone around his parents. We've been together for almost a year. A year. Can anyone but Julian believe it? He's always saying that it's perfectly natural for us to have been together this long, and that we're going to be together even longer. Me? I'm still trying to get used to the whirlwind life I've been living ever since Mr. Bradley made that stupid bet with my boyfriend. Bless him for it, though. By the way... We have an announcement to make, Julian says before dessert is served. Everyone at the table grows quiet if they weren't before. I shift in my seat. Jordan's eyebrows go halfway up his head. Serena braces herself for a marriage announcement. After all, exactly one year ago, Ted announced that he was getting gay married and having his kids via surrogate. Would she count her blessings that at least I'm a woman? Just tell us the date of the wedding so we can clear our schedules now, Ted says, as he accepts his daughter into his arms. Mr. Marcus sits down at the head of the table with a cigar clamped between his teeth. It takes both Serena and Jordan glaring at him for him to not 
light it around a baby. Also, I suggest you name Julian Jr. anything but Julian Jr., because that sounds atrocious. Julian gives me that I-told-you-so look he always gets when I suggest we present things a certain way to his family. <laughs> nope, not happening. Never goes the way I imagine it in my head. It's not that. For fuck's sake. Ted pretends to cover his baby's ears. Language, Jules. Trying to raise a lady here. Julian rolls his eyes while I giggle in my seat. When's he going to make the announcement? I've been dying to tell everyone since I got the news, but Julian made me promise to not share with anyone but my mother until he had a chance to tell his family first. Because they would find out through the grapevine, and he didn't want that. Anyway, Julian proudly wraps his arm around my shoulders. My genius girlfriend has been accepted to UC Berkeley's MBA program. You're looking at a future CEO right here. I grin at Jordan, who grins back at me. Congrats, he says. That's a tough program to get into. Helps to have the right connections, Serena mutters. I don't care if going out with Julian made it easier for me to get into Berkeley. The point is that I made it into Berkeley. It was such a long shot, too. Last list I looked at ranked it as number three in the country for MBA programs and number one on the West Coast. I was hesitant to go somewhere in California, but Julian helped me figure out how to balance that kind of life while he stays based out of Portland. So how's that going to work? You're not commuting, are you? Ted joins in on the party. You finally moving to California, brother? No. Julian puts that to bed as quickly as he put us getting shotgun married to bed. She's getting an apartment near campus for a couple of years, and we're going to split the commute, depending on my schedule. Ah, uh, now that's love, Mr. Marcus says. Quite. Well, don't let the stress of it get to you. Think of all those hot Californian men moving in on your woman, Jules. I'd rather not, thank you. Now it's my turn to roll my eyes. You bet your ass I'm going to have a security detail the entire time I'm in Berkeley. Stu's right-hand man will make sure that nobody flirts with me both on and off campus. Julian will pay to make it so. I admit, I'm nervous about living apart like that again. This October, I moved into Julian's penthouse because my lease was up. Now I'm getting my own apartment again? And we won't have the option of seeing, kissing, and sleeping next to him whatever night I want? We'll meet up on the weekends, and he'll come down to visit for whole weeks at a time if he can. And there are the breaks, of course. But it's going to be hard. Good thing I am confident that we will weather that storm. It's only for two years. Not like we can't see each other at all. What? Julian's a billionaire. He can make anything happen. Like making me his girlfriend. And possibly his wife. One day. I've made it clear that my MBA comes before any serious talks of rings and marriage licenses. Because as soon as I become Mrs. Julian Marcus, the expectations will be wilder than ever before. You know which expectations I'm talking about. Social functions, money management, motherhood. Phew. One thing at a time. We go to bed in one of the guest rooms with further plans on our lips. And the other person's lips, I suppose. It's hard for us to go to bed and not make out, honestly. When your boyfriend smells as good as him, sounds as good as him... And looks as good as him? Good luck getting any sleep, girls. You really okay with me moving to Berkeley? Let alone on his dime? Because I'm not getting financial aid, unless you count my boyfriend's coffers. If it makes you happy, I'm fine with almost anything. Getting into Berkeley is a feat, Lissa. Even if I somehow helped you by existing... You had to be pretty amazing, too. 
I must be, if I got an internship at your place of business. He kisses me. It is rather difficult to get that position, too, yes. I'd say your grades and that alone got your foot in the door at Berkeley. He has no idea how smarmy that sounds, huh? I don't care. I love Julian, despite his flaws. And lordy, does he have a few. Nothing I can't deal with, though. <laughs> I'm flawed, too. As long as he loves me, I know we can face anything together, including distance. Being loved by a billionaire is something else. It may not be for everyone, but it's definitely for me. I'm so glad I gave Julian three chances to win me back. Now watch us prove that by making love three times tonight. Three chances to feel closer to the man I love than I have with anyone else before. The best part? Knowing he feels the same way about me. This is for real. And it's going to be forever. Watch us. The End This has been Blust by the Billionaire, Alpha Billionaire Romance, written by Cynthia Dane, narrated by Sierra Klein, copyright 2017 by Barishu Press, production copyright 2017 by Barishu Press. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.